A Newspaper Story At 8 a.m. it lay on Giuseppe's newsstand, still damp from the presses. Giuseppe, with the cunning of his ilk, philandered on the opposite corner, leaving his patrons to help themselves, no doubt on a theory related to the hypothesis of the watched pot. This particular newspaper was, according to its custom and design, an educator, a guide, a monitor, a champion and a household counselor and vade mecum. From its many excellencies might be selected three editorials. One was in simple and chaste but illuminating language directed to parents and teachers, deprecating corporal punishment for children. Another was an accusive and significant warning addressed to a notorious labor leader who was on the point of instigating his clients to a troublesome strike. The third was an eloquent demand that the police force be sustained and aided in everything that tended to increase its efficiency as public guardians and servants. Besides these more important chidings and requisitions upon the store of good citizenship was a wise prescription or form of procedure laid out by the editor of the heart-to-heart -heart column in the specific case of a young man who had complained of the obduracy of his lady love. Teaching him how he might win her. Again, there was, on the beauty page, a complete answer to a young lady inquirer who desired admonition toward the securing of bright eyes, rosy cheeks, and a beautiful countenance. One other item requiring special cognizance was a brief, personal, running thus. Dear Jack, forgive me. You were right. Meet me corner Madison and, th at 8.30 this morning. We leave at noon. Penitent. At eight o'clock a young man with a haggard look and the feverish gleam of unrest in his eye dropped a penny and picked up the top paper as he passed Giuseppe's stand. A sleepless night had left him a late riser. There was an office to be reached by nine, and a shave and a hasty cup of coffee to be crowded into the interval. He visited his barber shop and then hurried on his way. He pocketed his paper, meditating a belated perusal of it at the luncheon hour. At the next corner it fell from his pocket, carrying with it his pair of new gloves. Three blocks he walked, missed the gloves and turned back fuming. Just on the half-hour he reached the corner where lay the gloves and the paper. But he strangely ignored that which he had come to seek. He was holding two little hands as tightly as ever he could and looking into two penitent brown eyes, while joy rioted in his heart. Dear Jack, she said, I knew you would be here on time. I wonder what she means by that, he was saying to himself, but it's all right, it's all right. A big wind puffed out of the west, picked up the paper from the sidewalk, opened it out and sent it flying and whirling down a side street. Up that street was driving a skittish bay to a spiderwheel buggy, the young man who had written to the heart-to-heart -heart editor for a recipe that he might win her for whom he sighed. The wind, with a prankish flurry, flapped the flying newspaper against the face of the skittish bay. There was a lengthened streak of bay mingled with the red of running gear that stretched itself out for four blocks. Then a water hydrant played its part in the cosmogony, the buggy became matchwood as foreordained. And the driver rested very quietly where he had been flung on the asphalt in front of a certain brownstone mansion. They came out and had him inside very promptly. And there was one who made herself a pillow for his head, and cared for no curious eyes, bending over and saying, Oh, it was you. It was you all the time, Bobby. Couldn't you see it? And if you die, why, so must I, Anne. But in all this wind we must hurry to keep in touch with our paper. Policeman O'Brien arrested it as a character dangerous to traffic. Straightening its disheveled leaves with his big, slow fingers, he stood a few feet from the family entrance of the Shandon Bells Café. One headline he spelled out ponderously, the papers to the front in a move to help the police. But, wished. The voice of Danny, the head bartender, through the crack of the door, here's a nip for ye, Mike, old man. Behind the widespread, Amicable columns of the press policeman O'Brien receives swiftly his nip of the real stuff. He moves away, stalwart, refreshed, fortified, to his duties. Might not the editor man view with pride the early, the spiritual, the literal fruit that had blessed his labors? Policeman O'Brien folded the paper and poked it playfully under the arm of a small boy that was passing. 
That boy was named Johnny, and he took the paper home with him. His sister was named Gladys, and she had written to the beauty editor of the paper asking for the practicable touchstone of beauty. That was weeks ago, and she had ceased to look for an answer. Gladys was a pale girl, with dull eyes and a discontented expression. She was dressing to go up to the avenue to get some braid. Beneath her skirt she pinned two leaves of the paper Johnny had brought. When she walked the rustling sound was an exact imitation of the real thing. On the street she met the brown girl from the flat below and stopped to talk. The brown girl turned green. Only silk at five dollars a yard could make the sound that she heard when Gladys moved. The brown girl, consumed by jealousy, said something spiteful and went her way, with pinched lips. Gladys proceeded toward the avenue. Her eyes now sparkled like jagger fontines. A rosy bloom visited her cheeks, a triumphant, subtle, vivifying, smile transfigured her face. She was beautiful. Could the beauty editor have seen her then? There was something in her answer in the paper, I believe, about cultivating kind feelings toward others in order to make plain features attractive. The labor leader against whom the paper's solemn and weighty editorial injunction was laid was the father of Gladys and Johnny. He picked up the remains of the journal from which Gladys had ravished a cosmetic of silken sounds. The editorial did not come under his eye, but instead it was greeted by one of those ingenious and specious puzzle problems that enthrall alike the simpleton and the sage. The labor leader tore off half of the page, provided himself with table, pencil and paper and glued himself to his puzzle. Three hours later, after waiting vainly for him at the appointed place, other more conservative leaders declared and ruled in favor of arbitration. And the strike with its attendant dangers was averted. Subsequent editions of the paper referred, in colored inks, to the clarion tone of its successful denunciation of the labor leader's intended designs. The remaining leaves of the active journal also went loyally to the proving of its potency. When Johnny returned from school he sought a secluded spot and removed the missing columns from the inside of his clothing. Where they had been artfully distributed so as to successfully defend such areas as are generally attacked during scholastic castigations. Johnny attended a private school and had had trouble with his teacher. As has been said, there was an excellent editorial against corporal punishment in that morning's issue, and no doubt it had its effect. After this can anyone doubt the power of the press? A Madison Square Arabian Night To Carson Chalmers, in his apartment near the square, Phillips brought the evening mail. Beside the routine correspondence there were two items bearing the same foreign postmark. One of the incoming parcels contained a photograph of a woman. The other contained an interminable letter, over which Chalmers hung, absorbed, for a long time. The letter was from another woman. And it contained poisoned barbs, sweetly dipped in honey, and feathered with innuendos concerning the photographed woman. Chalmers tore this letter into a thousand bits and began to wear out his expensive rug by striding back and forth upon it. Thus an animal from the jungle acts when it is caged, and thus a caged man acts when he is housed in a jungle of doubt. By and by the restless mood was overcome. The rug was not an enchanted one. For sixteen feet he could travel along it, three thousand miles was beyond its power to aid. Phillips appeared. He never entered, he invariably appeared, like a well-oiled genie. Will you dine here, sir, or out? he asked. Here, said Chalmers, and in half an hour. He listened glumly to the January blasts making an aeolian trombone of the empty street. Wait, he said to the disappearing genie. As I came home across the end of the square I saw many men standing there in rows. There was one mounted upon something, talking. Why do those men stand in rows, and why are they there? They are homeless men, sir, said Phillips. The man standing on the box tries to get lodging for them for the night. People come around to listen and give him money. Then he sends as many as the money will pay for to some lodging house. That is why they stand in rows, they get sent to bed in order as they come. By the time dinner is served, said Chalmers, have one of those men here. 
he will dine with me. W.W. Which, began Phillips, stammering for the first time during his service. Choose one at random, said Chalmers. You might see that he is reasonably sober, and a certain amount of cleanliness will not be held against him. That is all. It was an unusual thing for Carson Chalmers to play the caliph. But on that night he felt the inefficacy of conventional antidotes to melancholy. Something wanton and egregious, something high-flavored and Arabian, he must have to lighten his mood. On the half-hour Phillips had finished his duties as slave of the lamp. The waiters from the restaurant below had whisked aloft the delectable dinner. The dining table, laid for two, glowed cheerily in the glow of the pink-shaded candles. And now Phillips, as though he ushered a cardinal, or held in charge a burglar, wafted in the shivering guest who had been hailed from the line of mendicant lodgers. It is a common thing to call such men wrecks, if the comparison be used here it is the specific one of a derelict come to grief through fire. Even yet some flickering combustion illuminated the drifting hulk. His face and hands had been recently washed, a rite insisted upon by Phillips as a memorial to the slaughtered conventions. In the candlelight he stood, a flaw in the decorous fittings of the apartment. His face was a sickly white, covered almost to the eyes with a stubble the shade of a red Irish setter's coat. Phillips's comb had failed to control the pale brown hair, long matted and conformed to the contour of a constantly worn hat. His eyes were full of a hopeless, tricky defiance like that seen in a curse that is cornered by his tormentors. His shabby coat was buttoned high, but a quarter inch of redeeming collar showed above it. His manner was singularly free from embarrassment when Chalmers rose from his chair across the round dining table. If you will oblige me, said the host, I will be glad to have your company at dinner. My name is Plumer, said the highway guest, in harsh and aggressive tones. If you're like me, you like to know the name of the party you're dining with. I was going on to say, continued Chalmers somewhat hastily, that mine is Chalmers. Will you sit opposite? Plumer, of the ruffled plumes, bent his knee for Phillips to slide the chair beneath him. He had an air of having sat at attended boards before. Philip set out the anchovies and olives. Good. Barked Plumer, going to be in courses, is it? All right, my jovial ruler of Baghdad. I'm your skirizade all the way to the toothpicks. You're the first caliph with a genuine oriental flavor I've struck since Frost. What luck! And I was forty-third in line. I finished counting, just as your welcome emissary arrived to bid me to the feast. I had about as much chance of getting a bed tonight as I have of being the next president. How will you have the sad story of my life? Mr. L. Raskid, a chapter with each course or the whole edition with the cigars and coffee. The situation does not seem a novel one to you, said Chalmers with a smile. By the chin whiskers of the prophet, no, answered the guest. New York's as full of cheap haroun al Raskids as Baghdad is of fleas. I've been held up for my story with a loaded meal pointed at my head twenty times. Catch anybody in New York giving you something for nothing. They spell curiosity and charity with the same set of building blocks. Lots of them will stake you to a dime and chop suey. And a few of them will play caliph to the tune of a top sirloin. But every one of them will stand over you till they screw your autobiography out of you with footnotes, appendix, and unpublished fragments. Oh, I know what to do when I see vittles coming toward me in little old Baghdad on the subway. I strike the asphalt three times with my forehead and get ready to spiel yarns for my supper. I claim descent from the late Tommy Tucker, who was forced to hand out vocal harmony for his predigested Weatherina and Spookju. I do not ask your story, said Chalmers. I tell you frankly that it was a sudden whim that prompted me to send for some stranger to dine with me. I assure you you will not suffer through any curiosity of mine. Oh, fudge! exclaimed the guest, enthusiastically tackling his soup, I don't mind it a bit. I'm a regular oriental magazine with a red cover and the leaves cut when the caliph walks abroad. In fact, we fellows in the bed line have a sort of union rate for things of this sort. 
somebody's always stopping and wanting to know what brought us down so low in the world. For a sandwich and a glass of beer I tell M that drink did it. For corned beef and cabbage and a cup of coffee I give M the hard-hearted landlord, six months in the hospital lost job story. A sirloin steak and a quarter for a bed gets the Wall Street tragedy of the swept-away fortune and the gradual descent. This is the first spread of this kind I've stumbled against. I haven't got a story to fit it. I'll tell you what, Mr. Chalmers, I'm going to tell you the truth for this, if you'll listen to it. It'll be harder for you to believe than the made-up ones. An hour later the Arabian guest lay back with a sigh of satisfaction while Phillips brought the coffee and cigars and cleared the table. Did you ever hear of Sherard Plumer? He asked, with a strange smile. I remember the name, said Chalmers. He was a painter, I think, of a good deal of prominence a few years ago. Five years, said the guest. Then I went down like a chunk of lead. I'm Sherard Plumer. I sold the last portrait I painted for two thousand dollars. After that I couldn't have found a sitter for a gratis picture. What was the trouble? Chalmers could not resist asking. Funny thing, answered Plumer, grimly. Never quite understood it myself. For a while I swam like a cork. I broke into the swell crowd and got commissions right and left. The newspapers called me a fashionable painter. Then the funny things began to happen. Whenever I finished a picture people would come to see it, and whisper and look queerly at one another. I soon found out what the trouble was. I had a knack of bringing out in the face of a portrait the hidden character of the original. I don't know how I did it, I painted what I saw, but I know it did me. Some of my sitters were fearfully enraged and refused their pictures. I painted the portrait of a very beautiful and popular society dame. When it was finished her husband looked at it with a peculiar expression on his face, and the next week he sued for divorce. I remember one case of a prominent banker who sat to me. While I had his portrait on exhibition in my studio an acquaintance of his came in to look at it. Bless me, says he, does he really look like that? I told him it was considered a faithful likeness. I never noticed that expression about his eyes before, said he, I think I'll drop downtown and change my bank account. He did drop down, but the bank account was gone and so was Mr. Banker. It wasn't long till they put me out of business. People don't want their secret meannesses shown up in a picture. They can smile and twist their own faces and deceive you, but the picture can't. I couldn't get an order for another picture, and I had to give up. I worked as a newspaper artist for a while, and then for a lithographer, but my work with them got me into the same trouble. If I drew from a photograph my drawing showed up characteristics and expressions that you couldn't find in the photo, but I guess they were in the original, all right. The customers raised lively rows, especially the women, and I never could hold a job long. So I began to rest my weary head upon the breast of old booze for comfort. And pretty soon I was in the free bed line and doing oral fiction for handouts among the food bazaars. Does the truthful statement weary thee, O Caliph? I can turn on the Wall Street disaster stop if you prefer, but that requires a tear, and I'm afraid I can't hustle one up after that good dinner. No, no, said Chalmers, earnestly, you interest me very much. Did all of your portraits reveal some unpleasant trait, or were there some that did not suffer from the ordeal of your peculiar brush? Some? Yes, said Plumer. Children generally, a good many women and a sufficient number of men. All people aren't bad, you know. When they were all right the pictures were all right. As I said, I don't explain it, but I'm telling you facts. On Chalmers's writing table lay the photograph that he had received that day in the foreign mail. Ten minutes later he had Plumer at work making a sketch from it in pastels. At the end of an hour the artist rose and stretched wearily. It's done, he yawned. You'll excuse me for being so long. I got interested in the job. Lordy. But I'm tired. No bed last night, you know. Guess it'll have to be good night now, O oh commander of the faithful. 
Chalmers went as far as the door with him and slipped some bills into his hand. Oh. I'll take M, said Plumer. All that's included in the fall. Thanks. And for the very good dinner. I shall sleep on feathers tonight and dream of Baghdad. I hope it won't turn out to be a dream in the morning. Farewell, most excellent Caliph. Again Chalmers paced restlessly upon his rug. But his beat lay as far from the table whereon lay the pastel sketch as the room would permit. Twice, thrice, he tried to approach it, but failed. He could see the dun and gold and brown of the colors, but there was a wall about it built by his fears that kept him at a distance. He sat down and tried to calm himself. He sprang up and rang for Phillips. There is a young artist in this building, he said. A Mr. Reinemann, do you know which is his apartment? Top floor, front, sir, said Phillips. Go up and ask him to favor me with his presence here for a few minutes. Reinemann came at once. Chalmers introduced himself. Mr. Reinemann, said he, there is a little pastel sketch on yonder table. I would be glad if you will give me your opinion of it as to its artistic merits and as a picture. The young artist advanced to the table and took up the sketch. Chalmers half turned away, leaning upon the back of a chair. How, do, you find it? he asked, slowly. As a drawing, said the artist, I can't praise it enough. It's the work of a master, bold and fine and true. It puzzles me a little, I haven't seen any pastel work near as good in years. The face, man, the subject, the original, what would you say of that? The face, said Reinemann, is the face of one of God's own angels. May I ask who? My wife! shouted Chalmers, wheeling and pouncing upon the astonished artist, gripping his hand and pounding his back. She is traveling in Europe. Take that sketch, boy, and paint the picture of your life from it and leave the price to me. The champion of the weather. If you should speak of the Kiowa reservation to the average New Yorker he probably wouldn't know whether you were referring to a new political dodge at Albany or a leitmotif from Parsifal. But out in the Kiowa reservation advices have been received concerning the existence of New York. A party of us were on a hunting trip in the reservation. Bud Kingsbury, our guide, philosopher, and friend, was broiling antelope steaks in camp one night. One of the party, a pinkish-haired young man in a correct hunting costume, sauntered over to the fire to light a cigarette and remarked carelessly to Bud. Nice night. Why, yes, said Bud, as nice as any night could be that ain't received the Broadway stamp of approval. Now, the young man was from New York, but the rest of us wondered how Bud guessed it. So, when the stakes were done, we besought him to lay bare his system of ratiocination. And as Bud was something of a territorial talking machine he made oration as follows. How did I know he was from New York? Well, I figured it out as soon as he sprung them two words on me. I was in New York myself a couple of years ago, and I noticed some of the earmarks and hoof tracks of the Rancho Manhattan. Found New York rather different from the panhandle, didn't you, bud? Asked one of the hunters. Can't say that I did, answered bud, anyways, not more than some. The main trail in that town which they call Broadway is plenty traveled, but they're about the same brand of bipeds that tramp around in Cheyenne and Amarillo. At first I was sort of rattled by the crowds, but I soon says to myself, here, now, bud. They're just plain folks like you and Geronimo and Grover Cleveland and the Watson boys, so don't get all flustered up with consternation under your saddle blanket. And then I feels calm and peaceful, like I was back in the nation again at a ghost dance or a green corn powwow. I'd been saving up for a year to give this New York a whirl. I knew a man named Summers that lived there, but I couldn't find him. So I played a lone hand at enjoying the intoxicating pleasures of the corn-fed metropolis. For a while I was so frivolous and locoed by the electric lights and the noises of the phonographs and the second-story railroads that I forgot one of the crying needs of my western system of natural requirements. 
I never was no hand to deny myself the pleasures of sociable vocal intercourse with friends and strangers. Out in the territories when I meet a man I never saw before, inside of nine minutes I know his income, religion, size of collar, and his wife's temper, and how much he pays for clothes, alimony. And chewing tobacco. It's a gift with me not to be penurious with my conversation. But this here New York was inaugurated on the idea of abstemiousness in regard to the parts of speech. At the end of three weeks nobody in the city had fired even a blank syllable in my direction except the waiter in the grub emporium where I fed. And as his outpourings of syntax wasn't nothing but plagiarisms from the bill of fare, he never satisfied my yearnings, which was to have somebody hit. If I stood next to a man at a bar he'd edge off and give a Baldwin Ziegler look as if he suspected me of having the North Pole concealed on my person. I began to wish that I'd gone to Abilene or Waco for my pasito. For the mayor of them places will drink with you, and the first citizen you meet will tell you his middle name and ask you to take a chance in a raffle for a music box. Well, one day when I was particular hankering for to be gregarious with something more loquacious than a lamp post, a fellow in a cafe says to me, says he. Nice day. He was a kind of a manager of the place, and I reckon he'd seen me in there a good many times. He had a face like a fish and an eye like Judas, but I got up and put one arm around his neck. Pardoner, I says, sure it's a nice day. You're the first gentleman in all New York to observe that the intricacies of human speech might not be altogether wasted on William Kingsbury. But don't you think, says I, that, twas a little cool early in the morning, and ain't there a feeling of rain in the air tonight? But along about noon it sure was galupsious weather. How's all up to the house? You doing right well with the cafe, now? Well, sir, that galut just turns his back and walks off stiff, without a word, after all my trying to be agreeable. I didn't know what to make of it. That night I finds a note from Summers, who'd been away from town, giving the address of his camp. I goes up to his house and has a good, old-time talk with his folks. And I tells Summers about the actions of this coyote in the café, and desires interpretation. Oh, says Summers, he wasn't intending to strike up a conversation with you. That's just the New York style. He'd seen you was a regular customer and he spoke a word or two just to show you he appreciated your custom. You oughtn't to have followed it up. That's about as far as we care to go with a stranger. A word or so about the weather may be ventured, but we don't generally make it the basis of an acquaintance. Billy, says I, the weather and its ramifications is a solemn subject with me. Meteorology is one of my sore points. No man can open up the question of temperature or humidity or the glad sunshine with me, and then turn tail on it without its leading to a falling barometer. I'm going down to see that man again and give him a lesson in the art of continuous conversation. You say New York etiquette allows him two words and no answer. Well, he's going to turn himself into a weather bureau and finish what he begun with me, besides indulging in neighborly remarks on other subjects. Summers talked egg in it, but I was irritated some and I went on the streetcar back to that café. The same fellow was there yet, walking round in a sort of back corral where there was tables and chairs. A few people was sitting around having drinks and sneering at one another. I called that man to one side and herded him into a corner. I unbuttoned enough to show him a thirty-eight I carried stuck under my vest. Pardoner, I says, a brief space ago I was in here and you seized the opportunity to say it was a nice day. When I attempted to corroborate your weather signal, you turned your back and walked off. Now, says I, you frog-hearted, language-shy, stiff-necked cross between a Spitzbergen sea cook and a muzzled oyster, you resume where you left off in your discourse on the weather. The fellow looks at me and tries to grin, but he sees I don't and he comes around serious. Well, says he, eyeing the handle of my gun, it was rather a nice day, some warmish, though. Particulars, you mealy-mouthed snoozer, I says, let's have the specifications, expatiate, fill in the outlines. When you start anything with me in shorthand it's bound to turn out a storm signal. Looked like rain yesterday, says the man, but it cleared off fine in the forenoon. 
I hear the farmers are needing rain right badly upstate. That's the kind of a canter, says I, shake the New York dust off your hoofs and be a real agreeable kind of a centaur. You broke the ice, you know, and we're getting better acquainted every minute. Seems to me I asked you about your family. They're all well, thanks, says he. We, we have a new piano. Now you're coming it, I says. This cold reserve is breaking up at last. That little touch about the piano almost makes us brothers. What's the youngest kid's name? I asks him. Thomas, says he. He's just getting well from the measles. I feel like I'd known you always, says I, now there was just one more, are you doing right well with the cafe, now? Pretty well, he says. I'm putting away a little money. Glad to hear it, says I, now go back to your work and get civilized. Keep your hands off the weather unless you're ready to follow it up in a personal manner, it's a subject that naturally belongs to sociability and the forming of new ties. And I hate to see it handed out in small change in a town like this. So the next day I rolls up my blankets and hits the trail away from New York City. For many minutes after Bud ceased talking we lingered around the fire, and then all hands began to disperse for bed. As I was unrolling my bedding I heard the pinkish-haired young man saying to Bud, with something like anxiety in his voice. As I say, Mr. Kingsbury. There is something really beautiful about this night. The delightful breeze and the bright stars and the clear air unite in making it wonderfully attractive. Yes, said Bud, it's a nice night. On behalf of the management. This is the story of the man-manager, and how he held his own until the very last paragraph. I had it from Sully Magoon, Viva Voci. The words are indeed his. And if they do not constitute truthful fiction my memory should be taxed with the blame. It is not deemed amiss to point out, in the beginning, the stress that is laid upon the masculinity of the manager. For, according to Sully, the term when applied to the feminine division of mankind has precisely an opposite meaning. The woman manager, he says, economizes, saves, oppresses her household with bargains and contrivances and look sourly upon any pence that are cast to the fiddler for even a single jig step on life's arid march. Wherefore her menfolk call her blessed, and praise her, and then sneak out the back door to see the Gilhuli sisters do a buck and wing dance. Now, the man-manager, I still quote Sully, is a Caesar without a Brutus. He is an autocrat without responsibility, a player who imperils no stake of his own. His office is to enact, to reverberate, to boom, to expand, to outcoruscate, profitably, if he can. Bill paying and growing gray hairs over results belong to his principles. It is his to guide the risk, to be the apotheosis of front, the three-tailed bashaw of bluff, the essential oil of razzle-dazzle. We sat at luncheon, and Sully Magoon told me. I asked for particulars. My old friend Denver Galloway was a born manager, said Sully. He first saw the light of day in New York at three years of age. He was born in Pittsburgh, but his parents moved east the third summer afterward. When Denver grew up, he went into the managing business. At the age of eight he managed a newsstand for the Dago that owned it. After that he was manager at different times of a skating rink, a livery stable, a policy game, a restaurant, a dancing academy, a walking match, a burlesque company, a dry goods store. A dozen hotels and summer resorts, an insurance company, and a district leader's campaign. That campaign, when Coughlin was elected on the east side, gave Denver a boost. It got him a job as manager of a Broadway hotel, and for a while he managed Senator O'Grady's campaign in the 19th. Denver was a New Yorker all over. I think he was out of the city just twice before the time I'm going to tell you about. Once he went rabbit shooting in Yonkers. The other time I met him just landing from a North River ferry. Been out west on a big trip, Sully, old boy, says he. Gad. Sully, I had no idea we had such a big country. It's immense. Never conceived of the magnificence of the West before. It's gorgeous and glorious and infinite. 
makes the East seemed cramped and little. It's a grand thing to travel and get an idea of the extent and resources of our country. I'd made several little runs out to California and down to Mexico and up through Alaska, so I sits down with Denver for a chat about the things he saw. Took in the Yosemite, out there, of course? I asks. Well, no, says Denver, I don't think so. At least, I don't recollect it. You see, I only had three days, and I didn't get any farther west than Youngstown, Ohio. About two years ago I dropped into New York with a little flypaper proposition about a Tennessee mica mine that I wanted to spread out in a nice, sunny window, in the hopes of catching a few. I was coming out of a printing shop one afternoon with a batch of fine, sticky prospectuses when I ran against Denver coming round a corner. I never saw him looking so much like a tiger lily. He was as beautiful and new as a trellis of sweet peas, and as rollicking as a clarinet solo. We shook hands, and he asked me what I was doing, and I gave him the outlines of the scandal I was trying to create in mica. Pooh, pooh. For your mica, says Denver. Don't you know better, Sully, than to bump up against the coffers of little old New York with anything as transparent as mica? Now, you come with me over to the Hotel Brunswick. You're just the man I was hoping for. I've got something there in sepia and curled hair that I want you to look at. You putting up at the Brunswick? I asks. Not a cent, says Denver, cheerful. The syndicate that owns the hotel puts up. I'm manager. The Brunswick wasn't one of them Broadway pothouses all full of palms and hyphens and flowers and costumes, kind of a mixture of lawns and laundries. It was on one of the east side avenues. But it was a solid, old-time caravansary such as the mayor of Skaniatles or the governor of Missouri might stop at. Eight stories high it stalked up, with new striped awnings, and the electrics had it as light as day. I've been manager here for a year, says Denver, as we drew nigh. When I took charge, says he, nobody nor nothing ever stopped at the Brunswick. The clock over the clerk's desk used to run for weeks without winding. A man fell dead with heart disease on the sidewalk in front of it one day, and when they went to pick him up he was two blocks away. I figured out a scheme to catch the West Indies and South American trade. I persuaded the owners to invest a few more thousands, and I put every cent of it in electric lights, cayenne pepper, gold leaf, and garlic. I got a Spanish-speaking force of employees and a string band, and there was talk going round of a cockfight in the basement every Sunday. Maybe I didn't catch the Nut Brown Gang. From Havana to Patagonia the Don Senors knew about the Brunswick. We get the high flyers from Cuba and Mexico and the couple of Americas farther south. And they've simply got the boodle to bombard every bullfinch in the bush with. When we got to the hotel, Denver stops me at the door. There's a little liver-colored man, says he, sitting in a big leather chair to your right, inside. You sit down and watch him for a few minutes, and then tell me what you think. I took a chair, while Denver circulates around in the big rotunda. The room was about full of curly-headed Cubans and South American brunettes of different shades. And the atmosphere was international with cigarette smoke, lit up by diamond rings and edged off with a whisper of garlic. That Denver Galloway was sure a relief to the eye. Six feet two he was, red-headed and pink-gilled as a sun perch. And the air he had. Court of St. James, Chauncey Alcott, Kentucky Colonels, Count of Monte Cristo, Grand Opera, all these things he reminded you of when he was doing the honors. When he raised his finger the hotel porters and bellboys skated across the floor like cockroaches, and even the clerk behind the desk looked as meek and unimportant as Andy Carnegie. Denver passed around, shaking hands with his guests, and saying over the two or three Spanish words he knew until it was like a coronation rehearsal or a Brian barbecue in Texas. I watched the little man he told me to. Twas a little foreign person in a double-breasted frock coat, trying to touch the floor with his toes. He was the color of Vichy Kid, and his whiskers was like excelsior made out of mahogany wood. He breathed hard, and he never once took his eyes off of Denver. 
There was a look of admiration and respect on his face like you see on a boy that's following a champion baseball team, or the Kaiser William looking at himself in a glass. After Denver goes his rounds he takes me into his private office. What's your report on the dingy I told you to watch, he asks. Well, says I, if you was as big a man as he takes you to be, nine rooms and bath in the Hall of Fame, rent free till October 1st, would be about your size. You've caught the idea, says Denver. I've given him the wizard grip and the cabalistic eye. The glamour that emanates from yours truly has enveloped him like a North River fog. He seems to think that Senor Galloway is the man who. I guess they don't raise 74-inch sorrel tops with romping ways down in his precinct. Now, Sully, goes on Denver, if you was asked, what would you take the little man to be? Why, says I, the barber around the corner, or, if he's royal, the king of the bootblacks. Never judge by looks, says Denver, he's the dark horse candidate for president of a South American republic. Well, says I, he didn't look quite that bad to me. Then Denver draws his chair up close and gives out his scheme. Sully, says he, with seriousness and levity, I've been a manager of one thing and another for over twenty years. That's what I was cut out for, to have somebody else to put up the money and look after the repairs and the police and taxes while I run the business. I never had a dollar of my own invested in my life. I wouldn't know how it felt to have the dealer rake in a coin of mine. But I can handle other people's stuff and manage other people's enterprises. I've had an ambition to get hold of something big, something higher than hotels and lumberyards and local politics. I want to be manager of something way up, like a railroad or a diamond trust or an automobile factory. Now here comes this little man from the tropics with just what I want, and he's offered me the job. What job? I asks. Is he going to revive the Georgia minstrels or open a cigar store? He's no coon, says Denver. He's General Rompiro, General Josie Alfonso Sapolio Juan Rompiro, he has his cards printed by a news ticker. He's the real thing, Sully, and he wants me to manage his campaign, he wants Denver C. Galloway for a president maker. Think of that, Sully. Old Denver romping down to the tropics, plucking lotus flowers and pineapples with one hand and making presidents with the other. Won't it make Uncle Mark Hanna mad? And I want you to go too, Sully. You can help me more than any man I know. I've been hurting that brown man for a month in the hotel so he wouldn't stray down 14th Street and get roped in by that crowd of refugee tamale eaters down there. And he's landed, and D. C. G is manager of General J. A. S. J. Rompiro's presidential campaign in the Great Republic of, what's its name? Denver gets down an atlas from a shelf, and we have a look at the afflicted country. Twas a dark blue one, on the west coast, about the size of a special delivery stamp. From what the general tells me, says Denver, and from what I can gather from the encyclopedia and by conversing with the janitor of the Astor Library. It'll be as easy to handle the vote of that country as it would be for Tammany to get a man named Geoghan appointed on the White Wings force. Why don't General Rumptero stay at home, says I, and manage his own canvas? You don't understand South American politics, says Denver, getting out the cigars. It's this way. General Rumpiro had the misfortune of becoming a popular idol. He distinguished himself by leading the army in pursuit of a couple of sailors who had stolen the plaza, or the caramba, or something belonging to the government. The people called him a hero and the government got jealous. The president sends for the chief of the Department of Public Edifices. Find me a nice, clean adobe wall, says he, and send Senor Rompiro up against it. Then call out a file of soldiers and, then let him be up against it. Something, goes on Denver, like the way they've treated Hobson and Carey Nation in our country. So the general had to flee. But he was thoughtful enough to bring along his role. He's got sinews of war enough to buy a battleship and float her off in the christening fluid. What chance has he got to be president? Wasn't I just giving you his rating, says Denver. 
his country is one of the few in South America where the presidents are elected by popular ballot. The general can't go there just now. It hurts to be shot against a wall. He needs a campaign manager to go down and whoop things up for him, to get the boys in line and the new $2 bills afloat and the babies kissed and the machine in running order. Sully, I don't want to brag, but you remember how I brought Coughlin under the wire for leader of the 19th? Ours was the Banner District. Don't you suppose I know how to manage a little monkey cage of a country like that? Why, with the dough the general's willing to turn loose I could put two more coats of Japan varnish on him and have him elected governor of Georgia. New York has got the finest lot of campaign managers in the world, Sully. And you give me a feeling of hauteur when you cast doubts on my ability to handle the political situation in a country so small that they have to print the names of the towns in the appendix and footnotes. I argued with Denver some. I told him that politics down in that tropical atmosphere was bound to be different from the 19th district. But I might just as well have been a congressman from North Dakota trying to get an appropriation for a lighthouse and a coast survey. Denver Galloway had ambitions in the manager line, and what I said didn't amount to as much as a fig leaf at the National Dressmakers' Convention. I'll give you three days to cogitate about going, says Denver, and I'll introduce you to General Rompiro tomorrow, so you can get his ideas drawn right from the rosewood. I put on my best reception to Booker Washington Manor the next day and tapped the distinguished rubber plant for what he knew. General Rompiro wasn't so gloomy inside as he appeared on the surface. He was polite enough, and he exuded a number of sounds that made a fair stagger at arranging themselves into language. It was English he aimed at, and when his system of syntax reached your mind it wasn't past you to understand it. If you took a college professor's magazine essay and a Chinese laundryman's explanation of a lost shirt and jumbled M together, you'd have about what the general handed you out for conversation. He told me all about his bleeding country, and what they were trying to do for it before the doctor came. But he mostly talked of Denver C. Galloway. Ah, senor, says he, that is the most fine of mans. Never I have seen one man so magnifico, so grrand, so conformable to make done things so swiftly by other mans. He shall make other mans do the acts and himself to order and regulate, until we arrive at seeing accomplishments of a suddenly. Oh, yes, senor. In my country there is not such mans of so bigness, so good talk, so compliments, so strongness of sense and such. Ah, that senor Galloway. Yes, says I, old Denver is the boy you want. He's managed every kind of business here except filibustering, and he might as well complete the list. Before the three days was up I decided to join Denver in his campaign. Denver got three months vacation from his hotel owners. For a week we lived in a room with the general, and got all the pointers about his country that we could interpret from the noises he made. When we got ready to start, Denver had a pocket full of memorandums, and letters from the general to his friends and a list of names and addresses of loyal politicians who would help along the boom of the exiled popular idol. Besides these liabilities we carried assets to the amount of $20,000 in assorted United States currency. General Rompiro looked like a burnt effigy, but he was B.R.R. Fox himself when it came to the real science of politics. Here is monies, says the general, of a small amount. There is more with me, mucho more. Plenty money shall you be supplied, Senor Galloway. More I shall send you at all times that you need. I shall desire to pay fifty, one hundred thousand pesos, if necessario, to be elect. How no? Sacramento. If that I am president and do not make one million dollar in the one year you shall keep me on that side, Valgame Dios. Denver got a Cuban cigar maker to fix up a little cipher code with English and Spanish words, and gave the general a copy, so we could cable him bulletins about the election, or for more money. And then we were ready to start. General Rompiro escorted us to the steamer. On the pier he hugged Denver around the waist and sobbed. Noble mans, says he, General Rompiro propels you into his confidence and trust. Go in the hands of the saints to do the work for your friend. 
Viva la libertad. Sure, says Denver. And viva la liberality in la soperino and hoc der land of the lotus and the votus. Don't worry, general. We'll have you elected as sure as bananas grow upside down. Make pictures on me, pleads the general, make pictures on me for money as it is needful. Does he want to be tattooed, would you think, asks Denver, wrinkling up his eyes. Stupid, says I, he wants you to draw on him for election expenses. It'll be worse than tattooing. More like an autopsy. Me and Denver steamed down to Panama, and then hiked across the isthmus, and then by steamer again down to the town of Espiritu on the coast of the general's country. That was a town to send J. Howard Payne to the growler. I'll tell you how you could make one like it. Take a lot of Filipino huts and a couple of hundred brick kilns and arrange M in squares in a cemetery. Cart down all the conservatory plants in the Astor and Vanderbilt greenhouses, and stick M about wherever there's room. Turn all the Bellevue patients and the Barber's Convention and the Tuskegee School loose in the streets, and run the thermometer up to 120 in the shade. Set a fringe of the Rocky Mountains around the rear, let it rain, and set the whole business on Rockaway Beach in the middle of January, and you'd have a good imitation of Espiritu. It took me and Denver about a week to get acclimated. Denver sent out the letters the general had given him, and notified the rest of the gang that there was something doing at the captain's office. We set up headquarters in an old dobe house on a side street where the grass was waist high. The election was only four weeks off, but there wasn't any excitement. The home candidate for president was named Rodriguez. This town of Esperitu wasn't the capital any more than Cleveland, Ohio, is the capital of the United States, but it was the political center where they cooked up revolutions, and made up the slates. At the end of the week Denver says the machine is started running. Sully, says he, we've got a walkover. Just because General Rompiro ain't done one on the spot the other crowd ain't at work. They're as full of apathy as a territorial delegate during the chaplain's prayer. Now, we want to introduce a little hot stuff in the way of campaigning, and we'll surprise, M at the polls. How are you going to go about it? I asks. Why, the usual way, says Denver, surprised. We'll get the orators on our side out every night to make speeches in the native lingo, and have torchlight parades under the shade of the palms, and free drinks, and buy up all the brass bands. Of course, Anne, well, I'll turn the baby kissing over to you, Sully, I've seen a lot of them. What else, says I. Why, you know, says Denver. We get the healers out with the crackly two spots, and coal tickets, and orders for groceries, and have a couple of picnics out under the banyan trees. And dances in the fireman's hall, and the usual things. But first of all, Sully, I'm going to have the biggest clam bake down on the beach that was ever seen south of the Tropic of Capricorn. I figured that out from the start. We'll stuff the whole town and the jungle folk for miles around with clams. That's the first thing on the program. Suppose you go out now, and make the arrangements for that. I want to look over the estimates the general made of the vote in the coast districts. I had learned some Spanish in Mexico, so I goes out, as Denver says, and in fifteen minutes I come back to headquarters. If there ever was a clam in this country nobody ever saw it, I says. Great skyrockets, says Denver, with his mouth and eyes open. No clams? How in the, who ever saw a country without clams? What kind of a, how's an election to be pulled off without a clam bake, I'd like to know. Are you sure there's no clams, Sully? Not even a can, says I. Then for God's sake go out and try to find what the people here do eat. We've got to fill em up with grub of some kind. I went out again. Denver was manager. In half an hour I gets back. They eat, says I, tortillas, cassava, carne de chivo, arroz con pollo, aquacates, zapates, yucca, and huevos fritos. A man that would eat them things, says Denver, getting a little mad, ought to have his vote challenged. 
In a few more days the campaign managers from the other towns came sliding into Esperitu. Our headquarters was a busy place. We had an interpreter, and ice water, and drinks, and cigars, and Denver flashed the general's roll so often that it got so small you couldn't have bought a Republican vote in Ohio with it. And then Denver cabled to General Rompiro for $10,000 more and got it. There were a number of Americans in Esperitu, but they were all in business or grafts of some kind, and wouldn't take any hand in politics, which was sensible enough. But they showed me and Denver a fine time, and fixed us up so we could get decent things to eat and drink. There was one American, named Hicks, used to come and loaf at the headquarters. Hicks had had fourteen years of Esperitu. He was six feet four and weighed in at one hundred and thirty-five. Cocoa was his line, and coast fever and the climate had taken all the life out of him. They said he hadn't smiled in eight years. His face was three feet long, and it never moved except when he opened it to take quinine. He used to sit in our headquarters and kill fleas and talk sarcastic. I don't take much interest in politics, says Hicks, one day, but I'd like you to tell me what you're trying to do down here, Galloway? We're boosting General Rompiro, of course, says Denver. We're going to put him in the presidential chair. I'm his manager. Well, says Hicks, if I was you I'd be a little slower about it. You've got a long time ahead of you, you know. Not any longer than I need, says Denver. Denver went ahead and worked things smooth. He dealt out money on the quiet to his lieutenants, and they were always coming after it. There was free drinks for everybody in town, and bands playing every night, and fireworks. And there was a lot of healers going around buying up votes day and night for the new style of politics in Espiritu, and everybody liked it. The day set for the election was November 4th. On the night before Denver and me were smoking our pipes in headquarters, and in comes Hicks and unjoints himself, and sits in a chair, mournful. Denver is cheerful and confident. Rompiro will win in a romp, says he. We'll carry the country by ten thousand. It's all over but the vivas. Tomorrow we'll tell the tale. What's going to happen tomorrow, asks Hicks. Why, the presidential election, of course, says Denver. Say, says Hicks, looking kind of funny, didn't anybody tell you fellows that the election was held a week before you came? Congress changed the date to July 27th. Rodriguez was elected by 17,000. I thought you was booming old Rompiro for next term, two years from now. Wondered if you was going to keep up such a hot lick that long. I dropped my pipe on the floor. Denver bit the stem off of his. Neither of us said anything. And then I heard a sound like somebody ripping a clabbered off of a barn roof. Twas Hicks laughing for the first time in eight years. Sully Magoon paused while the waiter poured us a black coffee. Your friend was, indeed, something of a manager, I said. Wait a minute, said Sully, I haven't given you any idea of what he could do yet. That's all to come. When we got back to New York there was General Rompiro waiting for us on the pier. He was dancing like a cinnamon bear, all impatient for the news, for Denver had just cabled him when we would arrive and nothing more. Am I elect, he shouts. Am I elect, friend of mine? Is that mine country have demand General Rompiro for the president? The last dollar of mine have I sent you that last time. It is necessario that I am elect. I have not more money. Am I elect, Senor Galloway? Denver turns to me. Leave me with old Rompey, Sully, he says. I've got to break it to him gently. Twould be indecent for other eyes to witness the operation. This is the time, Sully, says he, when old Denver has got to make good as a jollier and a silver-tongued sorcerer, or else give up all the medals he's earned. A couple of days later I went around to the hotel. There was Denver in his old place, looking like the hero of two historical novels, and telling them what a fine time he'd had down on his orange plantation in Florida. Did you fix things up with the general? I asks him. Did I? says Denver. Come and see. 
he takes me by the arm and walks me to the dining room door. There was a little chocolate brown fat man in a dress suit, with his face shining with joy as he swelled himself and skipped about the floor. Dongate if Denver hadn't made General Rompiro head waiter of the Hotel Brunswick. Is Mr. Galloway still in the managing business? I asked, as Mr. Magoon ceased. Sully shook his head. Denver married an auburn-haired widow that owns a big hotel in Harlem. He just helps around the place. The Enchanted Kiss But a clerk in the cut-rate drugstore was Samuel Tansy, yet his slender frame was a pad that enfolded the passion of Romeo, the gloom of Laura, the romance of D'Artagnan. And the desperate inspiration of Melnot. Pity, then, that he had been denied expression, that he was doomed to the burden of utter timidity and diffidence. That fate had set him tongue-tied and scarlet before the muslin-clad angels whom he adored and vainly longed to rescue, clasp, comfort, and subdue. The clock's hands were pointing close upon the hour of ten while Tansy was playing billiards with a number of his friends. On alternate evenings he was released from duty at the store after seven o'clock. Even among his fellow men Tansy was timorous and constrained. In his imagination he had done valiant deeds and performed acts of distinguished gallantry, but in fact he was a sallow youth of twenty-three, with an overmodest demeanor and scant vocabulary. When the clock struck ten, Tansy hastily laid down his cue and struck sharply upon the showcase with a coin for the attendant to come and receive the pay for his score. What's your hurry, Tansy, called one. Got another engagement? Tansy got an engagement, echoed another. Not on your life. Tansy's got to get home at Maudon by her peak's orders. It's no such thing, chimed in a pale youth, taking a large cigar from his mouth, Tansy's afraid to be late because Miss Katie might come downstairs to unlock the door, and kiss him in the hall. This delicate piece of raillery sent a fiery tingle into Tansy's blood, for the indictment was true, barring the kiss. That was a thing to dream of, to wildly hope for. But too remote and sacred a thing to think of lightly. Casting a cold and contemptuous look at the speaker, a punishment commensurate with his own diffident spirit, Tansy left the room, descending the stairs into the street. For two years he had silently adored Miss Peake, worshipping her from a spiritual distance through which her attractions took on stellar brightness and mystery. Mrs. Peake kept a few choice boarders, among whom was Tansy. The other young men romped with Katie, chased her with crickets in their fingers, and jollied her with an irreverent freedom that turned Tansy's heart into cold lead in his bosom. The signs of his adoration were few, a tremulous, good morning, stealthy glances at her during meals, and occasionally, oh, rapture. A blushing, delirious game of cribbage with her in the parlor on some rare evening when a miraculous lack of engagement kept her at home. Kiss him in the hall. I, he feared it, but it was an ecstatic fear such as Elijah must have felt when the chariot lifted him into the unknown. But tonight the jibes of his associates had stung him to a feeling of forward, lawless mutiny, a defiant, challenging, atavistic recklessness. Spirit of corsair, adventurer, lover, poet, bohemian, possessed him. The stars he saw above him seemed no more unattainable, no less high, than the favor of Miss Peak or the fearsome sweetness of her delectable lips. His fate seemed to him strangely dramatic and pathetic, and to call for a solace consonant with its extremity. A saloon was nearby, and to this he flitted, calling for absinthe, beyond doubt the drink most adequate to his mood, the tipple of the roué, the abandoned, the vainly sighing lover. Once he drank of it, and again, and then again until he felt a strange, exalted sense of non-participation in worldly affairs pervade him. Tansy was no drinker. His consumption of three absinthe anisettes within almost as few minutes proclaimed his unproficiency in the art, Tansy was merely flooding with unproven liquor his sorrows. Which record and tradition alleged to be drownable. Coming out upon the sidewalk, he snapped his fingers defiantly in the direction of the peak homestead, turned the other way, and voyaged, Columbus-like into the wilds of an enchanted street. Nor is the figure exorbitant, for— Beyond his store the foot of Tansy had scarcely been set for years, store and boarding house. 
Between these ports he was chartered to run, and contrary currents had rarely deflected his prow. Tansy aimlessly protracted his walk, and, whether it was his unfamiliarity with the district, his recent accession of audacious errantry, or the sophistical whisper of a certain green-eyed fairy. He came at last to tread a shuttered, blank, and echoing thoroughfare, dark and unpeopled. And, suddenly, this way came to an end, as many streets do in the Spanish-built, archaic town of San Antone, butting its head against an imminent, high, brick wall. No, the street still lived. To the right and to the left it breathed through slender tubes of exit, narrow, somnolent ravines, cobble-paved and unlighted. Accommodating a rise in the street to the right was reared a phantom flight of five luminous steps of limestone, flanked by a wall of the same height and of the same material. Upon one of these steps Tansy seated himself and bethought him of his love, and how she might never know she was his love. And of Mother Peak, fat, vigilant and kind. Not unpleased, Tansy thought, that he and Katie should play cribbage in the parlor together. For the cut rate had not cut his salary, which, sordidly speaking, ranked him star boarder at the peaks. And he thought of Captain Peak, Katie's father, a man he dreaded and abhorred. A genteel loafer and spendthrift, battening upon the labor of his womenfolk, a very queer fish, and, according to repute, not of the freshest. The night had turned chill and foggy. The heart of the town, with its noises, was left behind. Reflected from the high vapors, its distant lights were manifest in quivering, cone-shaped streamers, in questionable blushes of unnamed colors, in unstable, ghostly waves of far, electric flashes. Now that the darkness was become more friendly, the wall against which the street splintered developed a stone coping topped with an armature of spikes. Beyond it loomed what appeared to be the acute angles of mountain peaks, pierced here and there by little lambent parallelograms. Considering this vista, Tansy at length persuaded himself that the seeming mountains were, in fact, the convent of Santa Mercedes. With which ancient and bulky pile he was better familiar from different coins of view. A pleasant note of singing in his ears reinforced his opinion. High, sweet, holy caroling, far and harmonious and uprising, as of sanctified nuns at their responses. At what hour did the sisters sing? He tried to think, was it six, eight, twelve? Tansy leaned his back against the limestone wall and wondered. Strange things followed. The air was full of white, fluttering pigeons that circled about, and settled upon the convent wall. The wall blossomed with a quantity of shining green eyes that blinked and peered at him from the solid masonry. A pink, classic nymph came from an excavation in the cavernous road and danced, barefoot and airy, upon the ragged flints. The sky was traversed by a company of beribboned cats, marching in stupendous, aerial procession. The noise of singing grew louder. An illumination of unseasonable fireflies danced past, and strange whispers came out of the dark without meaning or excuse. Without amazement Tansy took note of these phenomena. He was on some new plane of understanding, though his mind seemed to him clear and, indeed, happily tranquil. A desire for movement and exploration seized him, he rose and turned into the black gash of street to his right. For a time the high wall formed one of its boundaries. But further on, Two rows of black-windowed houses closed it in. Here was the city's quarter once given over to the Spaniard. Here were still his forbidding abodes of concrete and adobe, standing cold and indomitable against the century. From the murky fissure, the eye saw, flung against the sky, the tangled filigree of his Moorish balconies. Through stone archways breaths of dead, vault-chilled air coughed upon him. His feet struck jingling iron rings in staple stone buried for half a cycle. Along these paltry avenues had swaggered the arrogant Don, had caracoled and serenaded and blustered while the tomahawk and the pioneer's rifle were already uplifted to expel him from a continent. And Tansy, stumbling through this old world dust, looked up, dark as it was, and saw Andalusian beauties glimmering on the balconies. Some of them were laughing and listening to the goblin music that still followed. Others harked fearfully through the night, 
trying to catch the hoof beats of caballeros whose last echoes from those stones had died away a century ago. Those women were silent, but Tansy heard the jangle of horseless bridle bits, the whir of riderless rowels, and, now and then, a muttered malediction in a foreign tongue. But he was not frightened. Shadows, nor shadows of sounds could daunt him. Afraid? No. Afraid of Mother Peak? Afraid to face the girl of his heart? Afraid of tipsy Captain Peak? Nay. Nor of these apparitions, nor of that spectral singing that always pursued him. Singing. He would show them. He lifted up a strong and untuneful voice. When you hear them bells go tinglingling. Serving notice upon those mysterious agencies that if it should come to a face-to-face -face encounter. There'll be a hot time. In the old town. Tonight. How long Tansy consumed in treading this haunted byway was not clear to him, but in time he emerged into a more commodious avenue. When within a few yards of the corner he perceived, through a window, that a small confectionery of mean appearance was set in the angle. His same glance that estimated its meager equipment, its cheap soda water fountain and stock of tobacco and sweets, took cognizance of Captain Peak within lighting a cigar at a swinging gaslight. As Tansy rounded the corner Captain Peak came out, and they met vis a vis. An exultant joy filled Tansy when he found himself sustaining the encounter with implicit courage. Peak, indeed. He raised his hand, and snapped his fingers loudly. It was Peak himself who quailed guiltily before the valiant mien of the drug clerk. Sharp surprise and a palpable fear burgeoned upon the captain's face. And, verily, that face was one to rather call up such expressions on the faces of others. The face of a libidinous heathen idol, small-eyed, with carven folds in the heavy jowls, and a consuming, pagan license in its expression. In the gutter just beyond the store Tansy saw a closed carriage standing with its back toward him and a motionless driver perched in his place. Why, it's Tansy, exclaimed Captain Peak. How are you, Tansy? H. Have a cigar, Tansy? Why, it's Peak, cried Tansy, jubilant at his own temerity. What deviltry are you up to now, Peak? Back streets and a closed carriage. Fie. Peak. There's no one in the carriage, said the captain, smoothly. Everybody out of it is in luck, continued Tansy, aggressively. I'd love for you to know, Peak, that I'm not stuck on you. You're a bottlenosed scoundrel. Why, the little rat's drunk, cried the captain, joyfully, only drunk, and I thought he was on. Go home, Tansy, and quit bothering grown persons on the street. But just then a white-clad figure sprang out of the carriage, and a shrill voice, Katie's voice, sliced the air, Sam. Sam, help me, Sam. Tansy sprung toward her, but Captain Peak interposed his bulky form. Wonder of wonders. The whilom spiritless youth struck out with his right, and the hulking captain went over in a swearing heap. Tansy flew to Katie, and took her in his arms like a conquering knight. She raised her face, and he kissed her, violets. Electricity. Caramels. Champagne. Here was the attainment of a dream that brought no disenchantment. Oh, Sam, cried Katie, when she could, I knew you would come to rescue me. What do you suppose the mean things were going to do with me? Have your picture taken, said Tansy, wondering at the foolishness of his remark. No, they were going to eat me. I heard them talking about it. Eat you, said Tansy, after pondering a moment. That can't be, there's no plates. But a sudden noise warned him to turn. Down upon him were bearing the captain and a monstrous long-bearded dwarf in a spangled cloak and red trunk hose. The dwarf leaped twenty feet and clutched them. The captain seized Katie and hurled her, shrieking, back into the carriage, himself followed, and the vehicle dashed away. The dwarf lifted Tansy high above his head and ran with him into the store. Holding him with one hand, he raised the lid of an enormous chest half filled with cakes of ice, flung Tansy inside, and closed down the cover. 
The force of the fall must have been great, for Tansy lost consciousness. When his faculties revived his first sensation was one of severe cold along his back and limbs. Opening his eyes, he found himself to be seated upon the limestone steps still facing the wall and convent of Santa Mercedes. His first thought was of the ecstatic kiss from Katie. The outrageous villainy of Captain Peake, the unnatural mystery of the situation, his preposterous conflict with the improbable dwarf, these things roused and angered him. But left no impression of the unreal. I'll go back there tomorrow, he grumbled aloud, and knock the head off that comic opera squab. Running out and picking up perfect strangers, and shoving them into cold storage. But the kiss remained uppermost in his mind. I might have done that long ago, he mused. She liked it, too. She called me, Sam, four times. I'll not go up that street again. Too much scrapping. Guess I'll move down the other way. Wonder what she meant by saying they were going to eat her. Tansy began to feel sleepy, but after a while he decided to move along again. This time he ventured into the street to his left. It ran level for a distance, and then dipped gently downward, opening into a vast, dim, barren space, the old military plaza. To his left, some hundred yards distant, he saw a cluster of flickering lights along the plaza's border. He knew the locality at once. Huddled within narrow confines were the remnants of the once-famous purveyors of the celebrated Mexican national cookery. A few years before, their nightly encampments upon the historic Alamo Plaza, in the heart of the city, had been a carnival, a Saturnalia that was renowned throughout the land. Then the caterers numbered hundreds, the patrons thousands. Drawn by the coquettish senoritas, the music of the weird Spanish minstrels, and the strange piquant Mexican dishes served at a hundred competing tables, crowds thronged the Alamo Plaza all night. Travelers, rancheros, family parties, gay gasconading rounders, sightseers and prowlers of polyglot, olish San Antonio mingled there at the center of the city's fun and frolic. The popping of corks, pistols, and questions, the glitter of eyes, jewels and daggers, the ring of laughter and coin, these were the order of the night. But now no longer. To some half-dozen tents, fires, and tables had dwindled the picturesque festival, and these had been relegated to an ancient disused plaza. Often had Tansy strolled down to these stands at night to partake of the delectable chili con carne, a dish evolved by the genius of Mexico. Composed of delicate meats minced with aromatic herbs and the poignant chili Colorado, a compound full of singular flavor and a fiery zest delightful to the Southern's palate. The titillating odor of this concoction came now, on the breeze, to the nostrils of Tansy, awakening in him hunger for it. As he turned in that direction he saw a carriage dash up to the Mexicans' tents out of the gloom of the plaza. Some figures moved back and forward in the uncertain light of the lanterns, and then the carriage was driven swiftly away. Tansy approached, and sat at one of the tables covered with gaudy oilcloth. Traffic was dull at the moment. A few half-grown boys noisily fared at another table. The Mexicans hung listless and phlegmatic about their wares. And it was still. The night hum of the city crowded to the wall of dark buildings surrounding the plaza. And subsided to an indefinite buzz through which sharply perforated the crackle of the languid fires and the rattle of fork and spoon. A sedative wind blew from the southeast. The starless firmament pressed down upon the earth like a leaden cover. In all that quiet Tansy turned his head suddenly, and saw, without disquietude, a troop of spectral horsemen deploy into the plaza and charge a luminous line of infantry that advanced to sustain the shock. He saw the fierce flame of cannon and small arms, but heard no sound. The careless vittlers lounged vacantly, not deigning to view the conflict. Tansy mildly wondered to what nations these mute combatants might belong, turned his back to them and ordered his chili and coffee from the Mexican woman who advanced to serve him. This woman was old and careworn, her face was lined like the rind of a cantaloupe. She fetched the viands from a vessel set by the smoldering fire, and then retired to a tent, dark within, that stood nearby. Presently Tansy heard a turmoil in the tent. 
a wailing, broken-hearted pleading in the harmonious Spanish tongue, and then two figures tumbled out into the light of the lanterns. One was the old woman. The other was a man clothed with a sumptuous and flashing splendor. The woman seemed to clutch and beseech from him something against his will. The man broke from her and struck her brutally back into the tent, where she lay, whimpering and invisible. Observing Tansy, he walked rapidly to the table where he sat. Tansy recognized him to be Ramon Torres, a Mexican, the proprietor of the stand he was patronizing. Torres was a handsome, nearly full-blooded descendant of the Spanish, seemingly about thirty years of age, and of a haughty, but extremely courteous demeanor. Tonight he was dressed with signal magnificence. His costume was that of a triumphant matador, made of purple velvet almost hidden by jeweled embroidery. Diamonds of enormous size flashed upon his garb and his hands. He reached for a chair, and, seating himself at the opposite side of the table, began to roll a finical cigarette. Ah, Mr. Tansy, he said, with a sultry fire in his silky, black eyes, I give myself pleasure to see you this evening. Mr. Tansy, you have many times come to eat at my table. I think you a safe man, a very good friend. How much would it please you to leave forever? Not come back any more, inquired Tansy. No, not leave, leave, the not to die. I would call that, said Tansy, a snap. Torres leaned his elbows upon the table, swallowed a mouthful of smoke, and spake, each word being projected in a little puff of gray. How old do you think I am, Mr. Tansy? Oh, twenty-eight, or thirty. This day, said the Mexican, E.E.S. my birthday. I am four hundred and three years of old today. Another proof, said Tansy, airily, of the healthfulness of our climate. E.E.T. is not the air. I am to relate to you a secret of very fine value. Listen me, Mr. Tansy. At the age of twenty-three I arrive in Mexico from Spain. When? In the year 1519, with the soldados of Hernando Cortes. I come to this country 1715. I saw your Alamo reduced. It was like yesterday to me. 396 year ago I learned the secret always to leave. Look at these clothes I wore, at these diamantes. Do you think I buy them with the money I make with selling the chili con carne, Mr. Tansy? I should think not, said Tansy, promptly. Torres laughed loudly. Valgame Dios. But I do. But it not the kind you eating now. I make a different kind, the eating of which makes men to always leave. What do you think? One thousand people I supply, diez pesos each one pays me the month. You see. Ten thousand pesos every month. K. Diable. How not I wear the fine ropa. You see that old woman try to hold me back a little while ago? That E.E.S. my wife. When I marry her she is young, seventeen year, bonita. Like the rest she E.E.S. become old and, what you say, tough. I am the same, young all the time. Tonight I resolve to dress myself and find another wife befitting my age. This old woman try to scrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
The words of Katie reverberated in his ears, they're going to eat me, Sam. This, then, was the monstrous fate to which she had been delivered by her unnatural parent. The carriage he had seen drive up from the plaza was Captain Peake's. Where was Katie? Perhaps already. Before he could decide what to do a loud scream came from the tent. The old Mexican woman ran out, a flashing knife in her hand. I have released her, she cried. You shall kill no more. They will hang you, Ingrato, and Catador. Torres, with a hissing exclamation, sprang at her. Ramon Cito, she shrieked, once you loved me. The Mexican's arm raised and descended. You are old, he cried, and she fell and lay motionless. Another scream, the flaps of the tent were flung aside, and there stood Katie, white with fear, her wrist still bound with a cruel cord. Sam, she cried, save me again. Tansy rounded the table, and flung himself, with superb nerve, upon the Mexican. Just then a clangor began, the clocks of the city were tolling the midnight hour. Tansy clutched at Torres, and, for a moment, felt in his grasp the crunch of velvet and the cold facets of the glittering gems. The next instant, the bedecked caballero turned in his hands to a shrunken, leather-visaged, white-bearded, old, old, screaming mummy, sandaled, ragged, and four hundred and three. The Mexican woman was crawling to her feet, and laughing. She shook her brown hand in the face of the whining viejo. Go, now, she cried, and seek your senorita. It was I, Ramon Cito, who brought you to this. Within each moon you eat of the life-giving chili. It was I that kept the wrong time for you. You should have eaten yesterday instead of tomorrow. It is too late. Off with you, hombre. You are too old for me. This, decided Tansy, releasing his hold of the greybeard, is a private family matter concerning age, and no business of mine. With one of the table knives he hastened to saw asunder the fetters of the fair captive. And then, for the second time that night he kissed Katie Peak, tasted again the sweetness, the wonder, the thrill of it, attained once more the maximum of his incessant dreams. The next instant an icy blade was driven deep between his shoulders, he felt his blood slowly congeal, heard the senile cackle of the perennial Spaniard. Saw the plaza rise and reel till the zenith crashed into the horizon, and knew no more. When Tansy opened his eyes again he was sitting upon those selfsame steps gazing upon the dark bulk of the sleeping convent. In the middle of his back was still the acute, chilling pain. How had he been conveyed back there again? He got stiffly to his feet and stretched his cramped limbs. Supporting himself against the stonework he revolved in his mind the extravagant adventures that had befallen him each time he had strayed from the steps that night. In reviewing them certain features strained his credulity. Had he really met Captain Peak or Katie or the unparalleled Mexican in his wanderings, had he really encountered them under commonplace conditions and his overstimulated brain had supplied the incongruities? However that might be, a sudden, elating thought caused him an intense joy. Nearly all of us have, at some point in our lives, either to excuse our own stupidity or to placate our consciences, promulgated some theory of fatalism. We have set up an intelligent fate that works by codes and signals. Tansy had done likewise, and now he read, through the night's incidents, the fingerprints of destiny. Each excursion that he had made had led to the one paramount finale, to Katie and that kiss, which survived and grew strong and intoxicating in his memory. Clearly, fate was holding up to him the mirror that night, calling him to observe what awaited him at the end of whichever road he might take. He immediately turned, and hurried homeward. Clothed in an elaborate, pale blue wrapper, cut to fit, Miss Katie Peake reclined in an armchair before a waning fire in her room. Her little, bare feet were thrust into house shoes rimmed with swan's down. By the light of a small lamp she was attacking the society news of the latest Sunday paper. Some happy substance, seemingly indestructible, was being rhythmically crushed between her small white teeth. Miss Katie read of functions and furbelows, 
but she kept a vigilant ear for outside sounds and a frequent eye upon the clock over the mantel. At every footstep upon the asphalt sidewalk her smooth, round chin would cease for a moment its regular rise and fall, and a frown of listening would pucker her pretty brows. At last she heard the latch of the iron gate click. She sprang up, tripped softly to the mirror, where she made a few of those feminine, flickering passes at her front hair and throat which are warranted to hypnotize the approaching guest. The doorbell rang. Miss Katie, in her haste, turned the blaze of the lamp lower instead of higher, and hastened noiselessly downstairs into the hall. She turned the key, the door opened, and Mr. Tansy sidestepped in. Why, the Ida A, eh? exclaimed Miss Katie, is this you, Mr. Tansy? It's after midnight. Aren't you ashamed to wake me up at such an hour to let you in? You're just awful. I was late, said Tansy, brilliantly. I should think you were. Ma was awfully worried about you. When you weren't in by ten, that hateful Tom McGill said you were out calling on another, said you were out calling on some young lady. I just despise Mr. McGill. Well, I'm not going to scold you any more, Mr. Tansy, if it is a little late, oh. I turned it the wrong way. Miss Katie gave a little scream. Absent-mindedly she had turned the blaze of the lamp entirely out instead of higher. It was very dark. Tansy heard a musical, soft giggle, and breathed an entrancing odor of heliotrope. A groping light hand touched his arm. How awkward I was. Can you find your way, Sam? I, I think I have a match, Miss K. Katie. A scratching sound, a flame. A glow of light held at arm's length by the recreant follower of destiny illuminating a tableau which shall end the ignominious chronicle, a maid with unkissed, curling, contemptuous lips slowly lifting the lamp chimney and allowing the wick to ignite. Then waving a scornful and abjuring hand toward the staircase, the unhappy Tansy, erstwhile champion in the prophetic lists of fortune, ingloriously ascending to his just and certain doom. While, let us imagine, Half within the wing stands the imminent figure of fate jerking wildly at the wrong strings, and mixing things up in her usual able manner. The Adventures of Shamrock Jones I am so fortunate as to count Shamrock Jones, the great New York detective, among my muster of friends. Jones is what is called the inside man of the city detective force. He is an expert in the use of the typewriter, and it is his duty, whenever there is a murder mystery to be solved. To sit at a desk telephone at headquarters and take down the messages of cranks who phone in their confessions to having committed the crime. But on certain off days when confessions are coming in slowly and three or four newspapers have run to earth as many different guilty persons, Jones will knock about the town with me, exhibiting. To my great delight and instruction, his marvelous powers of observation and deduction. The other day I dropped in at headquarters and found the great detective gazing thoughtfully at a string that was tied tightly around his little finger. Good morning, what's up, he said, without turning his head. I'm glad to notice that you've had your house fitted up with electric lights at last. Will you please tell me, I said, in surprise, how you knew that. I am sure that I never mentioned the fact to anyone, and the wiring was a rush order not completed until this morning. Nothing easier, said Jones, genially. As you came in I caught the odor of the cigar you are smoking. I know an expensive cigar. And I know that not more than three men in New York can afford to smoke cigars and pay gas bills too at the present time. That was an easy one. But I am working just now on a little problem of my own. Why have you that string on your finger? I asked. That's the problem, said Jones. My wife tied that on this morning to remind me of something I was to send up to the house. Sit down, what's up, and excuse me for a few moments. The distinguished detective went to a wall telephone, and stood with the receiver to his ear for probably ten minutes. Were you listening to a confession? I asked, when he had returned to his chair. Perhaps, said Jones, with a smile, it might be called something of the sort. To be frank with you, what's up, I've cut out the dope. 
I've been increasing the quantity for so long that morphine doesn't have much effect on me anymore. I've got to have something more powerful. That telephone I just went to is connected with a room in the Waldorf where there's an author's reading in progress. Now, to get at the solution of this string. After five minutes of silent pondering, Jones looked at me, with a smile, and nodded his head. Wonderful man! I exclaimed, already? It is quite simple, he said, holding up his finger. You see that knot? That is to prevent my forgetting. It is, therefore, a forget-me-not. A forget-me-not is a flower. It was a sack of flour that I was to send home. Beautiful! I could not help crying out in admiration. Suppose we go out for a ramble, suggested Jones. There is only one case of importance on hand just now. Old man McCarty, 104 years old, died from eating too many bananas. The evidence points so strongly to the mafia that the police have surrounded the 2nd Avenue Katzenjammer Gambrinus Club No. 2, and the capture of the assassin is only the matter of a few hours. The detective force has not yet been called on for assistance. Jones and I went out and up the street toward the corner, where we were to catch a surface car. Halfway up the block we met Rangelder, an acquaintance of ours, who held a city hall position. Good morning, Rangelder, said Jones, halting. Nice breakfast that was you had this morning. Always on the lookout for the detective's remarkable feats of deduction. I saw Jones as I flash for an instant upon a long yellow splash on the shirt bosom and a smaller one upon the chin of Rangelder, both undoubtedly made by the yolk of an egg. Oh, dot is some of your detectiveness, said Rangelder, shaking all over with a smile. Vel, I pet you trinks you and cigars all round that you cannot tell VOT I half eaten for breakfast. Done, said Jones. Sausage, pumpernickel and coffee. Rangelder admitted the correctness of the surmise and paid the bet. When we had proceeded on our way I said to Jones. I thought you looked at the egg spilled on his chin and shirt front. I did, said Jones. That is where I began my deduction. Rangelder is a very economical, saving man. Yesterday eggs dropped in the market to 28 cents per dozen. Today they are quoted at 42. Rangelder ate eggs yesterday, and today he went back to his usual fare. A little thing like this isn't anything, what's up, it belongs to the primary arithmetic class. When we boarded the streetcar we found the seats all occupied, principally by ladies. Jones and I stood on the rear platform. About the middle of the car there sat an elderly man with a short, gray beard, who looked to be the typical, well-dressed New Yorker. At successive corners other ladies climbed aboard, and soon three or four of them were standing over the man, clinging to straps and glaring meaningly at the man who occupied the coveted seat. But he resolutely retained his place. We New Yorkers, I remarked to Jones, have about lost our manners, as far as the exercise of them in public goes. Perhaps so, said Jones, lightly. But the man you evidently refer to happens to be a very chivalrous and courteous gentleman from old Virginia. He is spending a few days in New York with his wife and two daughters, and he leaves for the South tonight. You know him, then? I said, in amazement. I never saw him before we stepped on the car, declared the detective, smilingly. By the gold tooth of the Witch of Ender. I cried if you can construe all that from his appearance you are dealing in nothing else than black art. The habit of observation, nothing more, said Jones. If the old gentleman gets off the car before we do, I think I can demonstrate to you the accuracy of my deduction. Three blocks farther along the gentleman rose to leave the car. Jones addressed him at the door. Pardon me, sir, but are you not Colonel Hunter, of Norfolk, Virginia? No, Sue, was the extremely courteous answer. My name, Sue, is Ellison, Major Winfield R. Ellison, from Fairfax County, in the same state. I know a good many people, Sue, in Norfolk, the Goodriches, the Tollivers, and the Crabtrees, Sue, but I never had the pleasure of meeting your friend, Colonel Hunter. 
I am happy to say, Sue, that I am going back to Virginia tonight, after having spent a week in Yo City with my wife and three daughters. I shall be in Norfolk in about ten days, and if you will give me your name, Sue, I will take pleasure in looking up Colonel Hunter and telling him that you inquired after him, Sue. Thank you, said Jones, tell him that Reynolds sent his regards, if you will be so kind. I glanced at the great New York detective and saw that a look of intense chagrin had come upon his clear-cut features. Failure in the slightest point always galled Shamrock Jones. Did you say your three daughters, he asked of the Virginia gentleman. Yes, Sue, my three daughters, all as fine girls as there are in Fairfax County, was the answer. With that Major Ellison stopped the car and began to descend the step. Shamrock Jones clutched his arm. One moment, sir, he begged, in an urbane voice in which I alone detected the anxiety, am I not right in believing that one of the young ladies is an adopted daughter? You are, Sue, admitted the Major, from the ground, but how the devil you knew it, Sue, is M.O., then I can tell. And M.O., then I can tell, too, I said, as the car went on. Jones was restored to his calm, observant serenity by having wrested victory from his apparent failure. So after we got off the car he invited me into a café, promising to reveal the process of his latest wonderful feat. In the first place, he began after we were comfortably seated, I knew the gentleman was no New Yorker because he was flushed and uneasy and restless on account of the ladies that were standing. Although he did not rise and give them his seat. I decided from his appearance that he was a Southerner rather than a Westerner. Next I began to figure out his reason for not relinquishing his seat to a lady when he evidently felt strongly, but not overpoweringly, impelled to do so. I very quickly decided upon that. I noticed that one of his eyes had received a severe jab in one corner, which was red and inflamed, and that all over his face were tiny round marks about the size of the end of an uncut lead pencil. Also upon both of his patent leather shoes were a number of deep imprints shaped like ovals cut off square at one end. Now, there is only one district in New York City where a man is bound to receive scars and wounds and indentations of that sort, and that is along the sidewalks of 23rd Street and a portion of 6th Avenue south of there. I knew from the imprints of trampling French heels on his feet and the marks of countless jabs in the face from umbrellas and parasols carried by women in the shopping district that he had been in. Conflict with the Amazonian troops. And as he was a man of intelligent appearance, I knew he would not have braved such dangers unless he had been dragged thither by his own womenfolk. Therefore, when he got on the car his anger at the treatment he had received was sufficient to make him keep his seat in spite of his traditions of southern chivalry. That is all very well, I said, but why did you insist upon daughters, and especially two daughters? Why couldn't a wife alone have taken him shopping? There had to be daughters, said Jones, calmly. If he had only a wife, and she near his own age, he could have bluffed her into going alone. If he had a young wife she would prefer to go alone. So there you are. I'll admit that, I said, but, now, why two daughters? And how, in the name of all the prophets, did you guess that one was adopted when he told you he had three? Don't say guess, said Jones, with a touch of pride in his air, there is no such word in the lexicon of ratiocination. In Major Ellison's buttonhole there was a carnation and a rosebud backed by a geranium leaf. No woman ever combined a carnation and a rosebud into a boutonniere. Close your eyes, what's up, and give the logic of your imagination a chance. Cannot you see the lovely Adele fastening the carnation to the lapel so that Papa may be gay upon the street? And then the romping Edith may dancing up with sisterly jealousy to add her rosebud to the adornment? And then, I cried, beginning to feel enthusiasm, when he declared that he had three daughters. I could see, said Jones, one in the background who added no flower. And I knew that she must be. Adopted. I broke in. I give you every credit, but how did you know he was leaving for the South tonight? In his breast pocket, said the great detective, something large and oval made a protuberance. Good liquor is scarce on trains, and it is a long journey from New York to Fairfax County. 
Again, I must bow to you, I said. And tell me this, so that my last shred of doubt will be cleared away, why did you decide that he was from Virginia? It was very faint, I admit, answered Shamrock Jones, but no trained observer could have failed to detect the odor of mint in the car. After twenty years. The policeman on the beat moved up the avenue impressively. The impressiveness was habitual and not for show, for spectators were few. The time was barely ten o'clock at night, but chilly gusts of wind with a taste of rain in them had well nigh depeopled the streets. Trying doors as he went, twirling his club with many intricate and artful movements, turning now and then to cast his watchful eye adown the Pacific thoroughfare, the officer. With his stalwart form and slight swagger, made a fine picture of a guardian of the peace. The vicinity was one that kept early hours. Now and then you might see the lights of a cigar store or of an all-night lunch counter. But the majority of the doors belonged to business places that had long since been closed. When about midway of a certain block the policeman suddenly slowed his walk. In the doorway of a darkened hardware store a man leaned, with an unlighted cigar in his mouth. As the policeman walked up to him the man spoke up quickly. It's all right, officer, he said, reassuringly. I'm just waiting for a friend. It's an appointment made twenty years ago. Sounds a little funny to you, doesn't it? Well, I'll explain if you'd like to make certain it's all straight. About that long ago there used to be a restaurant where this store stands, Big Joe Brady's Restaurant. Until five years ago, said the policeman. It was torn down then. The man in the doorway struck a match and lit his cigar. The light showed a pale, square-jawed face with keen eyes, and a little white scar near his right eyebrow. His scarf pin was a large diamond, oddly set. Twenty years ago tonight, said the man, I dined here at Big Joe Brady's with Jimmy Wells, my best chum, and the finest chap in the world. He and I were raised here in New York, just like two brothers, together. I was eighteen and Jimmy was twenty. The next morning I was to start for the West to make my fortune. You couldn't have dragged Jimmy out of New York, he thought it was the only place on earth. Well, we agreed that night that we would meet here again exactly twenty years from that date and time, no matter what our conditions might be or from what distance we might have to come. We figured that in twenty years each of us ought to have our destiny worked out and our fortunes made, whatever they were going to be. It sounds pretty interesting, said the policeman. Rather a long time between meets, though, it seems to me. Haven't you heard from your friend since you left? Well, yes, for a time we corresponded, said the other. But after a year or two we lost track of each other. You see, the West is a pretty big proposition, and I kept hustling around over it pretty lively. But I know Jimmy will meet me here if he's alive, for he always was the truest, stanchest old chap in the world. He'll never forget. I came a thousand miles to stand in this door tonight, and it's worth it if my old partner turns up. The waiting man pulled out a handsome watch, the lids of it set with small diamonds. Three minutes to ten, he announced. It was exactly ten o'clock when we parted here at the restaurant door. Did pretty well out west, didn't you? asked the policeman. You bet. I hope Jimmy has done half as well. He was a kind of plotter, though, good fellow as he was. I've had to compete with some of the sharpest wits going to get my pile. A man gets in a groove in New York. It takes the West to put a razor edge on him. The policeman twirled his club and took a step or two. I'll be on my way. Hope your friend comes around all right. Going to call time on him sharp? I should say not, said the other. I'll give him half an hour at least. If Jimmy is alive on earth he'll be here by that time. So long, officer. Good night, sir, said the policeman, passing on along his beat, trying doors as he went. There was now a fine, cold drizzle falling, and the wind had risen from its uncertain puffs into a steady blow. The few foot passengers astir in that quarter hurried dismally and silently along with coat collars turned high and pocketed hands. 
and in the door of the hardware store the man who had come a thousand miles to fill an appointment, uncertain almost to absurdity, with the friend of his youth, smoked his cigar and waited. About twenty minutes he waited, and then a tall man in a long overcoat, with collar turned up to his ears, hurried across from the opposite side of the street. He went directly to the waiting man. Is that you, Bob? he asked, doubtfully. Is that you, Jimmy Wells? cried the man in the door. Bless my heart, exclaimed the new arrival, grasping both the other's hands with his own. It's Bob, sure as fate. I was certain I'd find you here if you were still in existence. Well, 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 twenty years is a long time. The old restaurant's gone, Bob. I wish it had lasted, so we could have had another dinner there. How has the West treated you, old man? Bully, it has given me everything I asked it for. You've changed lots, Jimmy. I never thought you were so tall by two or three inches. Oh, I grew a bit after I was twenty. Doing well in New York, Jimmy? Moderately. I have a position in one of the city departments. Come on, Bob, we'll go around to a place I know of, and have a good long talk about old times. The two men started up the street, arm in arm. The man from the West, his egotism enlarged by success, was beginning to outline the history of his career. The other, submerged in his overcoat, listened with interest. At the corner stood a drug store, brilliant with electric lights. When they came into this glare each of them turned simultaneously to gaze upon the other's face. The man from the West stopped suddenly and released his arm. You're not Jimmy Wells, he snapped. Twenty years is a long time, but not long enough to change a man's nose from a Roman to a pug. It sometimes changes a good man into a bad one, said the tall man. You've been under arrest for ten minutes, silky Bob. Chicago thinks you may have dropped over our way and wires us she wants to have a chat with you. Going quietly, are you? That's sensible. Now, before we go on to the station here's a note I was asked to hand you. You may read it here at the window. It's from Patrolman Wells. The man from the West unfolded the little piece of paper handed him. His hand was steady when he began to read, but it trembled a little by the time he had finished. The note was rather short. Bob, I was at the appointed place on time. When you struck the match to light your cigar I saw it was the face of the man wanted in Chicago. Somehow I couldn't do it myself, so I went around and got a plain clothes man to do the job. Jimmy. The Sparrows in Madison Square. The young man in straitened circumstances who comes to New York City to enter literature has but one thing to do. Provided he has studied carefully his field in advance. He must go straight to Madison Square, write an article about the sparrows there, and sell it to the Sun for fifteen dollars. I cannot recall either a novel or a story dealing with the popular theme of the young writer from the provinces who comes to the metropolis to win fame and fortune with his pen in which the hero does not get his start that way. It does seem strange that some author, in casting about for startlingly original plots, has not hit upon the idea of having his hero write about the bluebirds in Union Square and sell it to the Herald. But a search through the files of metropolitan fiction counts up overwhelmingly for the sparrows and the old garden square, and the sun always writes the check. Of course it is easy to understand why this first city venture of the budding author is always successful. He is primed by necessity to a superlative effort. Mid the iron and stone and marble of the roaring city he has found this spot of singing birds and green grass and trees. Every tender sentiment in his nature is baffling with the sweet pain of homesickness, his genius is aroused as it never may be again. The birds chirp, the tree branches sway, the noise of wheels is forgotten, he writes with his soul in his pen, and he sells it to the sun for fifteen dollars. I had read of this custom during many years before I came to New York. When my friends were using their strongest arguments to dissuade me from coming, I only smiled serenely. They did not know of that sparrow graft I had up my sleeve. When I arrived in New York, and the car took me straight from the ferry up 23rd Street to Madison Square, 
I could hear that $15 check rustling in my inside pocket. I obtained lodging at an unhyphenated hostelry, and the next morning I was on a bench in Madison Square almost by the time the sparrows were awake. Their melodious chirping, the benignant spring foliage of the noble trees and the clean, fragrant grass reminded me so potently of the old farm I had left that tears almost came into my eyes. Then, all in a moment, I felt my inspiration. The brave, piercing notes of those cheerful small birds formed a keynote to a wonderful, light, fanciful song of hope and joy and altruism. Like myself, they were creatures with hearts pitched to the tune of woods and fields. As I was, so were they captives by circumstance in the discordant, dull city, yet with how much grace and glee they bore the restraint. And then the early morning people began to pass through the square to their work, sullen people, with sidelong glances and glum faces, hurrying, hurrying, hurrying. And I got my theme cut out clear from the bird notes, and wrought it into a lesson, and a poem, and a carnival dance, and a lullaby, and then translated it all into prose and began to write. For two hours my pencil travelled over my pad with scarcely a rest. Then I went to the little room I had rented for two days, and there I cut it to half, and then mailed it, white hot, to the sun. The next morning I was up by daylight and spent two cents of my capital for a paper. If the word, sparrow, was in it I was unable to find it. I took it up to my room and spread it out on the bed and went over it, column by column. Something was wrong. Three hours afterward the postman brought me a large envelope containing my MS. And a piece of inexpensive paper, about three inches by four, I suppose some of you have seen them, upon which was written in violet ink, with the sun's thanks. I went over to the square and sat upon a bench. No, I did not think it necessary to eat any breakfast that morning. The confounded pests of sparrows were making the square hideous with their idiotic, cheap, cheap. I never saw birds so persistently noisy, impudent, and disagreeable in all my life. By this time, according to all traditions, I should have been standing in the office of the editor of the Sun. That personage, a tall, grave, white-haired man, would strike a silver bell as he grasped my hand and wiped a suspicious moisture from his glasses. Mr. McChesney, he would be saying when a subordinate appeared, this is Mr. Henry, the young man who sent in that exquisite gem about the sparrows in Madison Square. You may give him a desk at once. Your salary, sir, will be eighty dollars a week, to begin with. This was what I had been led to expect by all writers who have evolved romances of literary New York. Something was decidedly wrong with tradition. I could not assume the blame, so I fixed it upon the sparrows. I began to hate them with intensity and heat. At that moment an individual wearing an excess of whiskers, two hats, and a pestilential air slid into the seat beside me. Say, Willie, he muttered cajolingly, could you cough up a dime out of your coffers for a cup of coffee this morning? I'm lung weary, my friend, said I, the best I can do is three cents. And you look like a gentleman, too, said he. What brung you down, boozer? Birds, I said fiercely. The brown-throated songsters caroling songs of hope and cheer to weary man toiling amid the city's dust and din. The little feathered couriers from the meadows and woods chirping sweetly to us of blue skies and flowering fields. The confounded little squint-eyed nuisances yawping like a flock of steam pianos, and stuffing themselves like aldermen with grass seeds and bugs. While a man sits on a bench and goes without his breakfast. Yes, sir, birds. Look at them. As I spoke I picked up a dead tree branch that lay by the bench, and hurled it with all my force into a close congregation of the sparrows on the grass. The flock flew to the trees with a babble of shrill cries, but two of them remained prostrate upon the turf. In a moment my unsavory friend had leaped over the row of benches and secured the fluttering victims, which he thrust hurriedly into his pockets. Then he beckoned me with a dirty forefinger. Come on, Cully, he said hoarsely. You're in on the feed. Thank you very much. Weakly I followed my dingy acquaintance. 
He led me away from the park down a side street and through a crack in a fence into a vacant lot where some excavating had been going on. Behind a pile of old stones and lumber he paused, and took out his birds. I got matches, said he. You got any paper to start a fire with? I drew forth my manuscript story of the sparrows, and offered it for burnt sacrifice. There were old planks, splinters, and chips for our fire. My frozy friend produced from some interior of his frayed clothing half a loaf of bread, pepper, and salt. In ten minutes each of us was holding a sparrow spitted upon a stick over the leaping flames. Say, said my fellow bivouacker, this ain't so bad when a fellow's hungry. It reminds me of when I struck New York first, about fifteen years ago. I come in from the West to see if I could get a job on a newspaper. I hit the Madison Square Park the first morning after, and was sitting around on the benches. I noticed the sparrows chirpin', and the grass and trees so nice and green that I thought I was back in the country again. Then I got some papers out of my pocket, and— I know, I interrupted. You sent it to the sun and got fifteen dollars. Say, said my friend, suspiciously, you seem to know a good deal. Where was you? I went to sleep on the bench there, in the sun, and somebody touched me for every cent I had, dollar fifteen. Lost on dress parade. Mr. Towers Chandler was pressing his evening suit in his hall bedroom. One iron was heating on a small gas stove. The other was being pushed vigorously back and forth to make the desirable crease that would be seen later on extending in straight lines from Mr. Chandler's patent leather shoes to the edge of his low-cut vest. So much of the hero's toilet may be entrusted to our confidence. The remainder may be guessed by those whom genteel poverty has driven to ignoble expedient. Our next view of him shall be as he descends the steps of his lodging house immaculately and correctly clothed. Calm, assured, handsome, in appearance the typical New York young clubman setting out, slightly bored, to inaugurate the pleasures of the evening. Chandler's honorarium was $18 per week. He was employed in the office of an architect. He was 22 years old, he considered architecture to be truly an art. And he honestly believed, though he would not have dared to admit it in New York, that the flat iron building was inferior in design to the great cathedral in Milan. Out of each week's earnings Chandler set aside one dollar. At the end of each ten weeks with the extra capital thus accumulated, he purchased one gentleman's evening from the bargain counter of stingy old father time. He arrayed himself in the regalia of millionaires and presidents, he took himself to the quarter where life is brightest and showiest, and there dined with taste and luxury. With ten dollars a man may, for a few hours, play the wealthy idler to perfection. The sum is ample for a well-considered meal, a bottle bearing a respectable label, commensurate tips, a smoke, cab fare and the ordinary etc. This one delectable evening culled from each dull seventy was to Chandler a source of renascent bliss. To the society bud comes but one debut. It stands alone sweet in her memory when her hair has whitened, but to Chandler each ten weeks brought a joy as keen, as thrilling, as new as the first had been. To sit among bon vivants under palms in the swirl of concealed music. To look upon the habitues of such a paradise and to be looked upon by them, what is a girl's first dance and short-sleeved tool compared with this? Up Broadway Chandler moved with the Vespertine dress parade. For this evening he was an exhibit as well as a gazer. For the next sixty-nine evenings he would be dining in Cheviot and worsted at dubious table d'hôtes, at whirlwind lunch counters, on sandwiches, and beer in his hall bedroom. He was willing to do that, for he was a true son of the great city of Razzle Dazzle, and to him one evening in the limelight made up for many dark ones. Chandler protracted his walk until the forties began to intersect the great and glittering Primrose Way, for the evening was yet young, and when one is of the beau monde only one day in seventy. One loves to protract the pleasure. Eyes bright, sinister, curious, admiring, provocative, alluring were bent upon him, for his garb and air proclaimed him a devotee to the hour of solace and pleasure. At a certain corner he came to a standstill. 
proposing to himself the question of turning back toward the showy and fashionable restaurant in which he usually dined on the evenings of his especial luxury. Just then a girl scuttled lightly around the corner, slipped on a patch of icy snow and fell plump upon the sidewalk. Chandler assisted her to her feet with instant and solicitous courtesy. The girl hobbled to the wall of the building, leaned against it, and thanked him demurely. I think my ankle is strained, she said. It twisted when I fell. Does it pain you much? inquired Chandler. Only when I rest my weight upon it. I think I will be able to walk in a minute or two. If I can be of any further service, suggested the young man, I will call a cab, or— Thank you, said the girl, softly but heartily. I am sure you need not trouble yourself any further. It was so awkward of me. And my shoe heels are horridly common sense, I can't blame them at all. Chandler looked at the girl and found her swiftly drawing his interest. She was pretty in a refined way, and her eye was both merry and kind. She was inexpensively clothed in a plain black dress that suggested a sort of uniform such as shop girls wear. Her glossy dark brown hair showed its coils beneath a cheap hat of black straw whose only ornament was a velvet ribbon and bow. She could have posed as a model for the self-respecting working girl of the best type. A sudden idea came into the head of the young architect. He would ask this girl to dine with him. Here was the element that his splendid but solitary periodic feasts had lacked. His brief season of elegant luxury would be doubly enjoyable if he could add to it a lady's society. This girl was a lady, he was sure, her manner and speech settled that. And in spite of her extremely plain attire he felt that he would be pleased to sit at table with her. These thoughts passed swiftly through his mind, and he decided to ask her. It was a breach of etiquette, of course, but oftentimes wage-earning girls waived formalities in matters of this kind. They were generally shrewd judges of men, and thought better of their own judgment than they did of useless conventions. His ten dollars, discreetly expended, would enable the two to dine very well indeed. The dinner would no doubt be a wonderful experience thrown into the dull routine of the girl's life and her lively appreciation of it would add to his own triumph and pleasure. I think, he said to her, with frank gravity, that your foot needs a longer rest than you suppose. Now, I am going to suggest a way in which you can give it that and at the same time do me a favor. I was on my way to dine all by my lonely self when you came tumbling around the corner. You come with me and we'll have a cozy dinner and a pleasant talk together, and by that time your game ankle will carry you home very nicely, I am sure. The girl looked quickly up into Chandler's clear, pleasant countenance. Her eyes twinkled once very brightly, and then she smiled ingenuously. But we don't know each other, it wouldn't be right, would it? she said, doubtfully. There is nothing wrong about it, said the young man, candidly. I'll introduce myself, permit me, Mr. Towers Chandler. After our dinner, which I will try to make as pleasant as possible, I will bid you good evening, or attend you safely to your door, whichever you prefer. But, dear me! said the girl, with a glance at Chandler's faultless attire. In this old dress and hat. Never mind that, said Chandler, cheerfully. I'm sure you look more charming in them than anyone we shall see in the most elaborate dinner toilette. My ankle does hurt yet admitted the girl, attempting a limping step. I think I will accept your invitation, Mr. Chandler. You may call me, Miss Marion. Come then, Miss Marion, said the young architect, gaily, but with perfect courtesy. You will not have far to walk. There is a very respectable and good restaurant in the next block. You will have to lean on my arm, so, and walk slowly. It is lonely dining all by oneself. I'm just a little bit glad that you slipped on the ice. When the two were established at a well-appointed table, with a promising waiter hovering in attendance, Chandler began to experience the real joy that his regular outing always brought to him. The restaurant was not so showy or pretentious as the one further down Broadway, which he always preferred, but it was nearly so. The tables were well filled with prosperous-looking diners, 
there was a good orchestra, playing softly enough to make conversation a possible pleasure. And the cuisine and service were beyond criticism. His companion, even in her cheap hat and dress, held herself with an air that added distinction to the natural beauty of her face and figure. And it is certain that she looked at Chandler, with his animated but self-possessed manner and his kindling and frank blue eyes, with something not far from admiration in her own charming face. Then it was that the madness of Manhattan, the frenzy of fuss and feathers, the bacillus of Bragg, the provincial plague of Poe's seized upon Towers Chandler. He was on Broadway, surrounded by pomp and style, and there were eyes to look at him. On the stage of that comedy he had assumed to play the one-night part of a butterfly of fashion and an idler of means and taste. He was dressed for the part, and all his good angels had not the power to prevent him from acting it. So he began to prate to Miss Marion of clubs, of teas, of golf and riding in kennels and cotillions and tours abroad and threw out hints of a yacht lying at Larchmont. He could see that she was vastly impressed by this vague talk, so he endorsed his pose by random insinuations concerning great wealth. And mentioned familiarly a few names that are handled reverently by the proletariat. It was Chandler's short little day, and he was wringing from it the best that could be had, as he saw it. And yet once or twice he saw the pure gold of this girl shine through the mist that his egotism had raised between him and all objects. This way of living that you speak of, she said, sounds so futile and purposeless. Haven't you any work to do in the world that might interest you more? My dear Miss Marion, he exclaimed, work. Think of dressing every day for dinner, of making half a dozen calls in an afternoon, with a policeman at every corner ready to jump into your auto and take you to the station. If you get up any greater speed than a donkey cart's gait. We do-nothings are the hardest workers in the land. The dinner was concluded, the waiter generously fed, and the two walked out to the corner where they had met. Miss Marion walked very well now. Her limp was scarcely noticeable. Thank you for a nice time, she said, frankly. I must run home now. I liked the dinner very much, Mr. Chandler. He shook hands with her, smiling cordially, and said something about a game of bridge at his club. He watched her for a moment, walking rather rapidly eastward, and then he found a cab to drive him slowly homeward. In his chilly bedroom Chandler laid away his evening clothes for a sixty-nine days rest. He went about it thoughtfully. That was a stunning girl, he said to himself. She's all right, too, I'd be sworn, even if she does have to work. Perhaps if I'd told her the truth instead of all that razzle-dazzle we might, but, confound it. I had to play up to my clothes. Thus spoke the brave who was born and reared in the wigwams of the tribe of the Manhattans. The girl, after leaving her entertainer, sped swiftly cross down until she arrived at a handsome and sedate mansion two squares to the east. Facing on that avenue which is the highway of Mammon and the auxiliary gods. Here she entered hurriedly and ascended to a room where a handsome young lady in an elaborate house dress was looking anxiously out the window. Oh, you madcap! exclaimed the elder girl, when the other entered. When will you quit frightening us this way? It is two hours since you ran out in that rag of an old dress and Marie's hat. Mama has been so alarmed. She sent Louis in the auto to try to find you. You are a bad, thoughtless puss. The elder girl touched a button, and a maid came in a moment. Marie, tell Mama that Miss Marion has returned. Don't scold, sister. I only ran down to Madame Theo's to tell her to use mauve insertion instead of pink. My costume and Marie's hat were just what I needed. Everyone thought I was a shop girl, I am sure. Dinner is over, dear, you stayed so late. I know. I slipped on the sidewalk and turned my ankle. I could not walk, so I hobbled into a restaurant and sat there until I was better. That is why I was so long. The two girls sat in the window seat, looking out at the lights and the stream of hurrying vehicles in the avenue. The younger one cuddled down with her head in her sister's lap. We will have to marry some day, she said dreamily, both of us. 
we have so much money that we will not be allowed to disappoint the public. Do you want me to tell you the kind of a man I could love, sis? Go on, you scatterbrain, smiled the other. I could love a man with dark and kind blue eyes, who is gentle and respectful to poor girls, who is handsome and good and does not try to flirt. But I could love him only if he had an ambition, an object, some work to do in the world. I would not care how poor he was if I could help him build his way up. But, sister dear, the kind of man we always meet, the man who lives an idle life between society and his clubs, I could not love a man like that. Even if his eyes were blue and he were ever so kind to poor girls whom he met in the street. The Reformation of Calliope Calliope Catesby was in his humors again. Ennui was upon him. This goodly promontory, the earth, particularly that portion of it known as quicksand, was to him no more than a pestilent congregation of vapors. Overtaken by the megrims, the philosopher may seek relief in soliloquy, my lady finds solace in tears, the flaccid easterner scold at the millinery bills of his womenfolk. Such recourse was insufficient to the denizens of quicksand. Calliope, especially, was wont to express his ennui according to his lights. Overnight Calliope had hung out signals of approaching low spirits. He had kicked his own dog on the porch of the Occidental Hotel, and refused to apologize. He had become capricious and fault-finding in conversation. While strolling about he reached often for twigs of mesquite and chewed the leaves fiercely. That was always an ominous act. Another symptom alarming to those who were familiar with the different stages of his doldrums was his increasing politeness and a tendency to use formal phrases. A husky softness succeeded the usual penetrating drawl in his tones. A dangerous courtesy marked his manners. Later, his smile became crooked, the left side of his mouth slanting upward, and quicksand got ready to stand from under. At this stage Calliope generally began to drink. Finally, about midnight, he was seen going homeward, saluting those whom he met with exaggerated but inoffensive courtesy. Not yet was Calliope's melancholy at the danger point. He would seat himself at the window of the room he occupied over Sylvester's tonsorial parlors and their chant lugubrious and tuneless ballads until morning, accompanying the noises by appropriate maltreatment of a jangling guitar. More magnanimous than Nero, he would thus give musical warning of the forthcoming municipal upheaval that Quicksand was scheduled to endure. A quiet, amiable man was Calliope Catesby at other times, quiet to indolence, and amiable to worthlessness. At best he was a loafer and a nuisance, at worst he was the terror of Quicksand. His ostensible occupation was something subordinate in the real estate line, he drove the beguiled Easterner in buckboards out to look over lots and ranch property. Originally he came from one of the Gulf states, his lank six feet, slurring rhythm of speech, and sectional idioms giving evidence of his birthplace. And yet, after taking on western adjustments, this languid pine box whittler, cracker barrel hugger, shady corner lounger of the cotton fields and sumac hills of the south became famed as a bad man among men who had made a lifelong study of the art of truculence. At nine the next morning Calliope was fit. Inspired by his own barbarous melodies and the contents of his jug, he was ready primed to gather fresh laurels from the diffident brow of quicksand. Encircled and crisscrossed with cartridge belts, abundantly garnished with revolvers, and copiously drunk, he poured forth into Quicksand's main street. Too chivalrous to surprise and capture a town by silent sortie, he paused at the nearest corner and emitted his slogan, that fearful, brassy yell, so reminiscent of the steam piano. That had gained for him the classic appellation that had superseded his own baptismal name. Following close upon his vociferation came three shots from his forty-five by way of limbering up the guns and testing his aim. A yellow dog, the personal property of Colonel Swazi, the proprietor of the Occidental, fell feet upward in the dust with one farewell yelp. A Mexican who was crossing the street from the blue front grocery carrying in his hand a bottle of kerosene, was stimulated to a sudden and admirable burst of speed. Still grasping the neck of the shattered bottle. The new gilt weathercock on Judge Riley's lemon and ultramarine two-story residence shivered, flapped, and hung by a splinter, 
the sport of the wanton breezes. The artillery was in trim. Calliope's hand was steady. The high, calm ecstasy of habitual battle was upon him, though slightly embittered by the sadness of Alexander in that his conquests were limited to the small world of quicksand. Down the street went Calliope, shooting right and left. Glass fell like hail, dogs vamosed, chickens flew, squawking, feminine voices shrieked concernedly to youngsters at large. The din was perforated at intervals by the staccato of the terror's guns, and was drowned periodically by the brazen screech that Quicksand knew so well. The occasions of Calliope's low spirits were legal holidays in Quicksand. All along the main street in advance of his coming clerks were putting up shutters and closing doors. Business would languish for a space. The right of way was Calliope's, and as he advanced, observing the dearth of opposition and the few opportunities for distraction, his ennui perceptibly increased. But some four squares farther down lively preparations were being made to minister to Mr. Catesby's love for interchange of compliments and repartee. On the previous night numerous messengers had hastened to advise Buck Patterson, the city marshal, of Calliope's impending eruption. The patience of that official, often strained in extending leniency toward the disturber's misdeeds, had been overtaxed. In quicksand some indulgence was accorded the natural ebullition of human nature. Providing that the lives of the more useful citizens were not recklessly squandered, or too much property needlessly laid waste. The community sentiment was against a too strict enforcement of the law. But Calliope had raised the limit. His outbursts had been too frequent and too violent to come within the classification of a normal and sanitary relaxation of spirit. Buck Patterson had been expecting and awaiting in his little ten by twelve frame office that preliminary yell announcing that Calliope was feeling blue. When the signal came the city marshal rose to his feet and buckled on his guns. Two deputy sheriffs and three citizens who had proven the edible qualities of fire also stood up, ready to bandy with Calliope's leaden jocularities. Gather that fellow in, said Buck Patterson, setting forth the lines of the campaign. Don't have no talk, but shoot as soon as you can get a show. Keep behind cover and bring him down. He's a no good un. It's up to Calliope to turn up his toes this time, I reckon. Go to him all spraddled out, boys. And don't get too reckless, for what Calliope shoots at he hits. Buck Patterson, tall, muscular, and solemn-faced, with his bright, city marshal, badge shining on the breast of his blue flannel shirt, gave his posse directions for the onslaught upon Calliope. The plan was to accomplish the downfall of the quicksand terror without loss to the attacking party, if possible. The splenetic Calliope, unconscious of retributive plots, was steaming down the channel, cannonading on either side, when he suddenly became aware of breakers ahead. The city marshal and one of the deputies rose up behind some dry goods boxes half a square to the front and opened fire. At the same time the rest of the posse, divided, shelled him from two side streets up which they were cautiously maneuvering from a well-executed detour. The first volley broke the lock of one of Calliope's guns, cut a neat underbit in his right ear, and exploded a cartridge in his crossbelt, scorching his ribs as it burst. Feeling braced up by this unexpected tonic to his spiritual depression, Calliope executed a fortissimo note from his upper register, and returned the fire like an echo. The upholders of the law dodged at his flash, but a trifle too late to save one of the deputies a bullet just above the elbow. And the marshal a bleeding cheek from a splinter that a ball tore from the box he had ducked behind. And now Calliope met the enemy's tactics in kind. Choosing with a rapid eye the street from which the weakest and least accurate fire had come, he invaded it at a double quick, abandoning the unprotected middle of the street. With rare cunning the opposing force in that direction, one of the deputies and two of the valorous volunteers, waited, concealed by beer barrels, until Calliope had passed their retreat. And then peppered him from the rear. In another moment they were reinforced by the marshal and his other men. And then Calliope felt that in order to successfully prolong the delights of the controversy he must find some means of reducing the great odds against him. His eye fell upon a structure that seemed to hold out this promise, providing he could reach it. 
Not far away was the little railroad station, its building a strong box house, ten by twenty feet, resting upon a platform four feet above ground. Windows were in each of its walls. Something like a fort it might become to a man thus sorely pressed by superior numbers. Calliope made a bold and rapid spurt for it, the marshal's crowd smoking him as he ran. He reached the haven in safety, the station agent leaving the building by a window, like a flying squirrel, as the garrison entered the door. Patterson and his supporters halted under protection of a pile of lumber and held consultations. In the station was an unterrified desperado who was an excellent shot and carried an abundance of ammunition. For thirty yards on either side of the besieged was a stretch of bare, open ground. It was a sure thing that the man who attempted to enter that unprotected area would be stopped by one of Calliope's bullets. The city marshal was resolved. He had decided that Calliope Catesby should no more wake the echoes of quicksand with his strident whoop. He had so announced. Officially and personally he felt imperatively bound to put the soft pedal on that instrument of discord. It played bad tunes. Standing near was a hand truck used in the manipulation of small freight. It stood by a shed full of sacked wool, a consignment from one of the sheep ranches. On this truck the marshal and his men piled three heavy sacks of wool. Stooping low, Buck Patterson started for Calliope's fort, slowly pushing this loaded truck before him for protection. The posse, scattering broadly, stood ready to nip the besieged in case he should show himself in an effort to repel the juggernaut of justice that was creeping upon him. Only once did Calliope make demonstration. He fired from a window, and some tufts of wool spurted from the marshal's trustworthy bulwark. The return shots from the posse pattered against the window frame of the fort. No loss resulted on either side. The marshal was too deeply engrossed in steering his protected battleship to be aware of the approach of the morning train until he was within a few feet of the platform. The train was coming up on the other side of it. It stopped only one minute at quicksand. What an opportunity it would offer to Calliope. He had only to step out the other door, mount the train, and away. Abandoning his breastwork, Buck, with his gun ready, dashed up the steps and into the room, driving upon the closed door with one heave of his weighty shoulder. The members of the posse heard one shot fired inside, and then there was silence. At length the wounded man opened his eyes. After a blank space he again could see and hear and feel and think. Turning his eyes about, he found himself lying on a wooden bench. A tall man with a perplexed countenance, wearing a big badge with, City Marshal, engraved upon it, stood over him. A little old woman in black, with a wrinkled face and sparkling black eyes, was holding a wet handkerchief against one of his temples. He was trying to get these facts fixed in his mind and connected with past events, when the old woman began to talk. There now, great, big, strong man. That bullet never touched ye. Just skeet along the side of your head and sort of paralyzed ye for a spell. I've heard of sec things afore, see you and cushion is what they names it. Abel Watkins used to kill squirrels that way, bark and m, Abe called it. You just been barked, sir, and you'll be all right in a little bit. Feel lots better already, don't ye? You just lay still a while longer and let me bathe your head. You don't know me, I reckon, and taint sir prison, that you shouldn't. I come in on that train from Alabama to see my son. Big son, ain't he? Lands. You wouldn't hardly think he'd ever been a baby, would ye? This is my son, sir. Half turning, the old woman looked up at the standing man, her worn face lighting with a proud and wonderful smile. She reached out one veined and calloused hand and took one of her sons. Then smiling cheerily down at the prostrate man, she continued to dip the handkerchief in the waiting-room tin wash basin and gently apply it to his temple. She had the benevolent garrulity of old age. I ain't seen my son before, she continued, in eight years. One of my nephews, Elkana Price, he's a conductor on one of them railroads and he got me a pass to come out here. I can stay a whole week on it, and then it'll take me back again. Just think, 
now, that little boy of mine has got to be a officer, a city marshal of a whole town. That's something like a constable, ain't it? I never knowed he was a officer. He didn't say nothin' about it in his letters. I reckon he thought his old mother'd be scared about the danger he was in. But, laws. I never was much of a hand to get scared. Tain't no use. I heard them guns a shootin' while I was gettin' off them cars, and I see smoke a comin' out of the depot, but I jest walked right along. Then I see son's face lookin' out through the window. I knowed him at once it. He met me at the door, and squeezes me most to death. And there you was, sir, a lion, there jest like you was dead, and I, load we'd see what might be done to help sot you up. I think I'll sit up now, said the concussion patient. I'm feeling pretty fair by this time. He sat, somewhat weakly yet, leaning against the wall. He was a rugged man, big-boned and straight. His eyes, steady and keen, seemed to linger upon the face of the man standing so still above him. His look wandered often from the face he studied to the marshal's badge upon the other's breast. Yes, yes, you'll be all right, said the old woman, patting his arm, if you don't get to cuttin' up Agin, and havin' folks shooting at you. Son told me about you, sir, while you was layin' senseless on the floor. Don't you take it as meddlesome fair an old woman with a son as big as you to talk about it. And you mustn't hold no grudge a g in my son for havin' to shoot at ye. A officer has got to take up for the law, it's his duty, and them that acts bad and lives wrong has to suffer. Don't blame my son any, sir, taint his fault. He's always been a good boy, good when he was growin' up, and kind and obedient and well-behaved. Won't you let me advise you, sir, not to do so no more? Be a good man, and leave liquor alone and live peaceably and goodly. Keep away from bad company and work honest and sleep sweet. The black mitt hand of the old pleader gently touched the breast of the man she addressed. Very earnest and candid her old, worn face looked. In her rusty black dress and antique bonnet she sat, near the close of a long life, and epitomized the experience of the world. Still the man to whom she spoke gazed above her head, contemplating the silent son of the old mother. What does the marshal say, he asked. Does he believe the advice is good? Suppose the marshal speaks up and says if the talk's all right? The tall man moved uneasily. He fingered the badge on his breast for a moment, and then he put an arm around the old woman and drew her close to him. She smiled the unchanging mother smile of threescore years, and patted his big brown hand with her crooked, mittened fingers while her son spake. I says this, he said, looking squarely into the eyes of the other man, that if I was in your place I'd follow it. If I was a drunken, desperate character, without shame or hope, I'd follow it. If I was in your place and you was in mine I'd say, Marshal, I'm willin' to swear if you'll give me the chance I'll quit the racket. I'll drop the tanglefoot and the gun play, and won't play hoss no more. I'll be a good citizen and go to work and quit my foolishness. So help me God. That's what I'd say to you if you was marshal and I was in your place. Hear my son talkin', said the old woman softly. Hear him, sir. You promise to be good and he won't do you no harm. Forty-one year ago his heart first beat a g into mine, and it's beat true ever since. The other man rose to his feet, trying his limbs and stretching his muscles. Then, said he, if you was in my place and said that, and I was marshal, I'd say, go free, and do your best to keep your promise. Lazy! exclaimed the old woman, in a sudden flutter, if I didn't clear forget that trunk of mine. I see a man set tin, it on the platform just as I seen son's face in the window, and it went plumb out of my head. There's eight jars of homemade quince jam in that trunk that I made myself. I wouldn't have nothin' happen to them jars for a red apple. Away to the door she trotted, spry and anxious, and then Calliope Catesby spoke out to Buck Patterson. I just couldn't help it, Buck. I seen her through the window a comin' in. She never had heard a word about my tough ways. 
I didn't have the nerve to let her know I was a worthless cuss being hunted down by the community. There you was lying where my shot laid you, like you was dead. The idea struck me sudden, and I just took your badge off and fastened it onto myself, and I fastened my reputation onto you. I told her I was the marshal and you was a holy terror. You can take your badge back now, Buck. With shaking fingers Calliope began to unfasten the disc of metal from his shirt. Easy there. Said Buck Patterson. You keep that badge right where it is, Calliope Catesby. Don't you dare to take it off till the day your mother leaves this town. You'll be city marshal of quicksand as long as she's here to know it. After I stir around town a bit and put M on I'll guarantee that nobody won't give the thing away to her. And say, you leather-headed, rip-roaring, low-down son of a low-coed cyclone, you follow that advice she give me. I'm going to take some of it myself, too. Buck, said Calliope feelingly, E.F. I don't I hope I may. Shut up, said Buck. She's a comin' back. Which is loaves. Miss Martha Meacham kept the little bakery on the corner, the one where you go up three steps, and the bell tinkles when you open the door. Miss Martha was forty, her bank book showed a credit of two thousand dollars, and she possessed two false teeth and a sympathetic heart. Many people have married whose chances to do so were much inferior to Miss Martha's. Two or three times a week a customer came in in whom she began to take an interest. He was a middle-aged man, wearing spectacles and a brown beard trimmed to a careful point. He spoke English with a strong German accent. His clothes were worn and darned in places, and wrinkled and baggy in others. But he looked neat, and had very good manners. He always bought two loaves of stale bread. Fresh bread was five cents a loaf. Stale ones were two for five. Never did he call for anything but stale bread. Once Miss Martha saw a red and brown stain on his fingers. She was sure then that he was an artist and very poor. No doubt he lived in a garret, where he painted pictures and ate stale bread and thought of the good things to eat in Miss Martha's bakery. Often when Miss Martha sat down to her chops and light rolls and jam and tea she would sigh, and wish that the gentle-mannered artist might share her tasty meal instead of eating his dry crust in that drafty attic. Miss Martha's heart, as you have been told, was a sympathetic one. In order to test her theory as to his occupation, she brought from her room one day a painting that she had bought at a sale, and set it against the shelves behind the bread counter. It was a Venetian scene. A splendid marble palazzo, so it said on the picture, stood in the foreground, or rather for water. For the rest there were gondolas, with the lady trailing her hand in the water, clouds, sky, and chiaroscuro in plenty. No artist could fail to notice it. Two days afterward the customer came in. Two loaves of stale bread, if you please. You have here a fine picture, madam, he said while she was wrapping up the bread. Yes, says Miss Martha, reveling in her own cunning. I do so admire art and, no, it would not do to say, artists thus early, and paintings, she substituted. You think it is a good picture? Der balance, said the customer, is not in good drawing. Der perspective of it is not true. Good morning, madam. He took his bread, bowed, and hurried out. Yes, he must be an artist. Miss Martha took the picture back to her room. How gentle and kindly his eyes shone behind his spectacles. What a broad brow he had. To be able to judge perspective at a glance, and to live on stale bread. But genius often has to struggle before it is recognized. What a thing it would be for art and perspective if genius were backed by two thousand dollars in bank, a bakery, and a sympathetic heart to, but these were daydreams, Miss Martha. Often now when he came he would chat for a while across the showcase. He seemed to crave Miss Martha's cheerful words. He kept on buying stale bread. Never a cake, never a pie, never one of her delicious Sally Lunds. She thought he began to look thinner and discouraged. Her heart ached to add something good to eat to his meager purchase, but her courage failed at the act. 
she did not dare affront him. She knew the pride of artists. Miss Martha took to wearing her blue dotted silk waist behind the counter. In the back room she cooked a mysterious compound of quince seeds and borax. Ever so many people use it for the complexion. One day the customer came in as usual, laid his nickel on the showcase, and called for his stale loaves. While Miss Martha was reaching for them there was a great tooting and clanging, and a fire engine came lumbering past. The customer hurried to the door to look, as anyone will. Suddenly inspired, Miss Martha seized the opportunity. On the bottom shelf behind the counter was a pound of fresh butter that the dairyman had left ten minutes before. With a bread knife Miss Martha made a deep slash in each of the stale loaves, inserted a generous quantity of butter, and pressed the loaves tight again. When the customer turned once more she was tying the paper around them. When he had gone, after an unusually pleasant little chat, Miss Martha smiled to herself, but not without a slight fluttering of the heart. Had she been too bold? Would he take offense? But surely not. There was no language of edibles. Butter was no emblem of unmaidenly forwardness. For a long time that day her mind dwelt on the subject. She imagined the scene when he should discover her little deception. He would lay down his brushes and palette. There would stand his easel with the picture he was painting in which the perspective was beyond criticism. He would prepare for his luncheon of dry bread and water. He would slice into a loaf, ah. Miss Martha blushed. Would he think of the hand that placed it there as he ate? Would he? The front door bell jangled viciously. Somebody was coming in, making a great deal of noise. Miss Martha hurried to the front. Two men were there. One was a young man smoking a pipe, a man she had never seen before. The other was her artist. His face was very red, his hat was on the back of his head, his hair was wildly rumpled. He clinched his two fists and shook them ferociously at Miss Martha. At Miss Martha. Dumbkopf. He shouted with extreme loudness, and then, Tausendonfer, or something like it in German. The young man tried to draw him away. I will not go, he said angrily, else I shall told her. He made a bass drum of Miss Martha's counter. You have spoilt me, he cried, his blue eyes blazing behind his spectacles. I will tell you. You vas von metting some old cat. Miss Martha leaned weakly against the shelves and laid one hand on her blue dotted silk waist. The young man took the other by the collar. Come on, he said, you've said enough. He dragged the angry one out at the door to the sidewalk, and then came back. Guess you ought to be told, ma'am, he said, what the row is about. That's Bloomberger. He's an architectural draftsman. I work in the same office with him. He's been working hard for three months drawing a plan for a new city hall. It was a prize competition. He finished inking the lines yesterday. You know, a draftsman always makes his drawing in pencil first. When it's done he rubs out the pencil lines with handfuls of stale bread crumbs. That's better than India rubber. Bloomberger's been buying the bread here. Well, today, well, you know, ma'am, that butter isn't. Well, Bloomberger's plan isn't good for anything now except to cut up into railroad sandwiches. Miss Martha went into the back room. She took off the blue dotted silk waist and put on the old brown serge she used to wear. Then she poured the quince seed and borax mixture out of the window into the ash can. New York by Campfire Light Away out in the Creek Nation we learned things about New York. We were on a hunting trip and were camped one night on the bank of a little stream. Bud Kingsbury was our skilled hunter and guide, and it was from his lips that we had explanations of Manhattan and the queer folks that inhabit it. Bud had once spent a month in the metropolis, and a week or two at other times, and he was pleased to discourse to us of what he had seen. Fifty yards away from our camp was pitched the teepee of a wandering family of Indians that had come up and settled there for the night. An old, old Indian woman was trying to build a fire under an iron pot hung upon three sticks. 
Bud went over to her assistance, and soon had her fire going. When he came back we complimented him playfully upon his gallantry. Oh, said Bud, don't mention it. It's a way I have. Whenever I see a lady trying to cook things in a pot and having trouble I always go to the rescue. I done the same thing once in a high-toned house in New York City. Heap big society teepee on Fifth Avenue. That Injun lady kind of recalled it to my mind. Yes, I endeavors to be polite and help the ladies out. The camp demanded the particulars. I was manager of the Triangle B Ranch in the Panhandle, said Bud. It was owned at that time by Old Man Sterling, of New York. He wanted to sell out, and he wrote for me to come on to New York and explain the ranch to the syndicate that wanted to buy. So I sends to Fort Worth and has a $40 suit of clothes made, and hits the trail for the big village. Well, when I got there, old man Sterling and his outfit certainly laid themselves out to be agreeable. We had business and pleasure so mixed up that you couldn't tell whether it was a treat or a trade half the time. We had trolley rides, and cigars, and theater roundups, and rubber parties. Rubber parties, said a listener, inquiringly. Sure, said Bud. Didn't you never attend them? You walk around and try to look at the tops of the skyscrapers. Well, we sold the ranch, and old man Sterling asks me round to his house to take grub on the night before I started back. It wasn't any high-collared affair, just me and the old man and his wife and daughter. But they was a fine-haired outfit all right, and the lilies of the field wasn't in it. They made my Fort Worth clothes carpenter look like a dealer in horse blankets and G-strings. And then the table was all pompous with flowers, and there was a whole kit of tools laid out beside everybody's plate. You'd have thought you was fixed out to burglarize a restaurant before you could get your grub. But I'd been in New York over a week then, and I was getting on to stylish ways. I kind of trailed behind and watched the others use the hardware supplies, and then I tackled the chuck with the same weapons. It ain't much trouble to travel with the high flyers after you find out their gate. I got along fine. I was feeling cool and agreeable, and pretty soon I was talking away fluent as you please, all about the ranch and the west, and telling them how the Indians eat grasshopper stew and snakes. And you never saw people so interested. But the real joy of that feast was that Miss Sterling. Just a little trick she was, not bigger than two bits worth of chewing plug. But she had a way about her that seemed to say she was the people, and you believed it. And yet, she never put on any airs, and she smiled at me the same as if I was a millionaire while I was telling about a creek dog feast and listened like it was news from home. By and by, after we had eat oysters and some watery soup and truck that never was in my repertory, a Methodist preacher brings in a kind of camp stove arrangement, all silver, on long legs. With a lamp under it. Miss Sterling lights up and begins to do some cooking right on the supper table. I wondered why old man Sterling didn't hire a cook, with all the money he had. Pretty soon she dished out some cheesy-tasting truck that she said was rabbit, but I swear there had never been a molly cotton tail in a mile of it. The last thing on the program was lemonade. It was brought around in little flat glass bowls and set by your plate. I was pretty thirsty, and I picked up mine and took a big swig of it. Right there was where the little lady had made a mistake. She had put in the lemon all right, but she'd forgot the sugar. The best housekeepers slip up sometimes. I thought maybe Miss Sterling was just learning to keep house and cook, that rabbit would surely make you think so, and I says to myself, little lady, sugar or no sugar I'll stand by you. And I raises up my bowl again and drinks the last drop of the lemonade. And then all the balance of them picks up their bowls and does the same. And then I gives Miss Sterling the laugh proper, just to carry it off like a joke, so she wouldn't feel bad about the mistake. After we all went into the sitting room she sat down and talked to me quite a while. It was so kind of you, Mr. Kingsbury, says she, to bring my blunder off so nicely. It was so stupid of me to forget the sugar. Never you mind, says I, some lucky man will throw his rope over a mighty elegant little housekeeper some day, not far from here. 
If you mean me, Mr. Kingsbury, says she, laughing out loud, I hope you will be as lenient with my poor housekeeping as you have been. Don't mention it, says I. Anything to oblige the ladies. Bud ceased his reminiscences. And then someone asked him what he considered the most striking and prominent trait of New Yorkers. The most visible and peculiar trait of New York folks, answered Bud, is New York. Most of them has New York on the brain. They have heard of other places, such as Waco, and Paris, and Hot Springs, and London, but they don't believe in them. They think that town is all Marino. Now to show you how much they care for their village I'll tell you about one of them that strayed out as far as the Triangle be while I was working there. This New Yorker come out there looking for a job on the ranch. He said he was a good horseback rider, and there was pieces of tanbark hanging on his clothes yet from his riding school. Well, for a while they put him to keeping books in the ranch store, for he was a devil at figures. But he got tired of that, and asked for something more in the line of activity. The boys on the ranch liked him all right, but he made us tired shouting New York all the time. Every night he'd tell us about East River and J.P. Morgan and the Eden Musee and Hetty Green and Central Park till we used to throw tin plates and branding irons at him. One day this chap gets on a pitching pony, and the pony kind of sidled up his back and went to eating grass while the New Yorker was coming down. He come down on his head on a chunk of mesquite wood, and he didn't show any designs toward getting up again. We laid him out in a tent, and he begun to look pretty dead. So Gideon Pease saddles up and burns the wind for old Doc Sleeper's residence in Dogtown, thirty miles away. The doctor comes over and he investigates the patient. Boys, says he, you might as well go to playing seven-up for his saddle and clothes, for his head's fractured and if he lives ten minutes it will be a remarkable case of longevity. Of course we didn't gamble for the poor rooster's saddle, that was one of Doc's jokes. But we stood around feeling solemn, and all of us forgive him for having talked us to death about New York. I never saw anybody about to hand in his checks act more peaceful than this fellow. His eyes were fixed, way up in the air, and he was using rambling words to himself all about sweet music and beautiful streets and white-robed forms, and he was smiling like dying was a pleasure. He's about gone now, said Document whenever they begin to think they see heaven it's all off. Blamed if that New York man didn't sit right up when he heard the doc say that. Say, says he, kind of disappointed, was that heaven? Confound it all, I thought it was Broadway. Some of you fellows get my clothes. I'm going to get up. And I'll be blamed, concluded Bud, if he wasn't on the train with a ticket for New York in his pocket four days afterward. The Romance of a Busy Broker Pitcher confidential clerk in the office of Harvey Maxwell, broker. Allowed a look of mild interest and surprise to visit his usually expressionless countenance when his employer briskly entered at half-past nine in company with his young lady stenographer. With a snappy, good morning, pitcher, Maxwell dashed at his desk as though he were intending to leap over it, and then plunged into the great heap of letters and telegrams waiting there for him. The young lady had been Maxwell's stenographer for a year. She was beautiful in a way that was decidedly unstenographic. She forewent the pomp of the alluring pompadour. She wore no chains, bracelets, or lockets. She had not the air of being about to accept an invitation to luncheon. Her dress was gray and plain, but it fitted her figure with fidelity and discretion. In her neat black turban hat was the gold-green wing of a macaw. On this morning she was softly and shyly radiant. Her eyes were dreamily bright, her cheeks genuine peach blow, her expression a happy one, tinged with reminiscence. Pitcher, still mildly curious, noticed a difference in her ways this morning. Instead of going straight into the adjoining room, where her desk was, she lingered, slightly irresolute, in the outer office. Once she moved over by Maxwell's desk, near enough for him to be aware of her presence. The machine sitting at that desk was no longer a man. It was a busy New York broker, moved by buzzing wheels and uncoiling springs. Well, what is it? Anything? asked Maxwell sharply. 
His opened mail lay like a bank of staged snow on his crowded desk. His keen gray eye, impersonal and brusque, flashed upon her half impatiently. Nothing, answered the stenographer, moving away with a little smile. Mr. Pitcher, she said to the confidential clerk, did Mr. Maxwell say anything yesterday about engaging another stenographer? He did, answered Pitcher. He told me to get another one. I notified the agency yesterday afternoon to send over a few samples this morning. It's 9.45 o'clock, and not a single picture hat or piece of pineapple chewing gum has showed up yet. I will do the work as usual, then, said the young lady, until someone comes to fill the place. And she went to her desk at once and hung the black turban hat with the gold-green macaw wing in its accustomed place. He who has been denied the spectacle of a busy Manhattan broker during a rush of business is handicapped for the profession of anthropology. The poet sings of the crowded hour of glorious life. The broker's hour is not only crowded, but the minutes and seconds are hanging to all the straps and packing both front and rear platforms. And this day was Harvey Maxwell's busy day. The ticker began to reel out jerkily its fitful coils of tape, the desk telephone had a chronic attack of buzzing. Men began to throng into the office and call at him over the railing, jovially, sharply, viciously, excitedly. Messenger boys ran in and out with messages and telegrams. The clerks in the office jumped about like sailors during a storm. Even Pitcher's face relaxed into something resembling animation. On the exchange there were hurricanes and landslides and snowstorms and glaciers and volcanoes, and those elemental disturbances were reproduced in miniature in the broker's offices. Maxwell shoved his chair against the wall and transacted business after the manner of a toe dancer. He jumped from ticker to phone, from desk to door with the trained agility of a harlequin. In the midst of this growing and important stress the broker became suddenly aware of a high-rolled fringe of golden hair under a nodding canopy of velvet and ostrich tips. An imitation sealskin sack K and a string of beads as large as hickory nuts, ending near the floor with a silver heart. There was a self-possessed young lady connected with these accessories, and Pitcher was there to construe her. Lady from the stenographer's agency to see about the position, said Pitcher. Maxwell turned half around, with his hands full of papers and ticker tape. What position? he asked, with a frown. Position of stenographer, said Pitcher. You told me yesterday to call them up and have one sent over this morning. You are losing your mind, Pitcher, said Maxwell. Why should I have given you any such instructions? Miss Leslie has given perfect satisfaction during the year she has been here. The place is hers as long as she chooses to retain it. There's no place open here, madam. Countermand that order with the agency, pitcher, and don't bring any more of them in here. The silver heart left the office, swinging and banging itself independently against the office furniture as it indignantly departed. Pitcher seized a moment to remark to the bookkeeper that the old man seemed to get more absent-minded and forgetful every day of the world. The rush and pace of business grew fiercer and faster. On the floor they were pounding half a dozen stocks in which Maxwell's customers were heavy investors. Orders to buy and sell were coming and going as swift as the flight of swallows. Some of his own holdings were imperiled, and the man was working like some high-geared, delicate, strong machine, strung to full tension, going at full speed, accurate, never hesitating with the proper word and decision and act ready and prompt as clockwork. Stocks and bonds, loans and mortgages, margins and securities, here was a world of finance, and there was no room in it for the human world or the world of nature. When the luncheon hour drew near there came a slight lull in the uproar. Maxwell stood by his desk with his hands full of telegrams and memoranda, with a fountain pen over his right ear and his hair hanging in disorderly strings over his forehead. His window was open, for the beloved Janitress Spring had turned on a little warmth through the waking registers of the earth. And through the window came a wandering, perhaps a lost, odor, a delicate, sweet odor of lilac that fixed the broker for a moment immovable. For this odor belonged to Miss Leslie. It was her own, and hers only. 
The odor brought her vividly, almost tangibly before him. The world of finance dwindled suddenly to a speck. And she was in the next room, twenty steps away. By George, I'll do it now, said Maxwell, half aloud. I'll ask her now. I wonder I didn't do it long ago. He dashed into the inner office with the haste of a short trying to cover. He charged upon the desk of the stenographer. She looked up at him with a smile. A soft pink crept over her cheek, and her eyes were kind and frank. Maxwell leaned one elbow on her desk. He still clutched fluttering papers with both hands and the pen was above his ear. Miss Leslie, he began hurriedly, I have but a moment to spare. I want to say something in that moment. Will you be my wife? I haven't had time to make love to you in the ordinary way, but I really do love you. Talk quick, please, those fellows are clubbing the stuffing out of Union Pacific. Oh, what are you talking about? exclaimed the young lady. She rose to her feet and gazed upon him, round eyed. Don't you understand? said Maxwell, restively. I want you to marry me. I love you, Miss Leslie. I wanted to tell you, and I've snatched a minute when things had slackened up a bit. They're calling me for the phone now. Tell M to wait a minute, pitcher. Won't you, Miss Leslie? The stenographer acted very queerly. At first she seemed overcome with amazement, then tears flowed from her wondering eyes. And then she smiled sunnily through them, and one of her arms slid tenderly about the broker's neck. I know now, she said, softly. It's this old business that has driven everything else out of your head for the time. I was frightened at first. Don't you remember, Harvey? We were married last evening at eight o'clock in the little church around the corner. A matter of mean elevation. One winter the Alcazar Opera Company of New Orleans made a speculative trip along the Mexican, Central American and South American coasts. The venture proved a most successful one. The music-loving, impressionable Spanish-Americans deluged the company with dollars and vivas. The manager waxed plump and amiable. But for the prohibitive climate he would have put forth the distinctive flower of his prosperity, the overcoat of fur, braided, frogged and opulent. Almost was he persuaded to raise the salaries of his company. But with a mighty effort he conquered the impulse toward such an unprofitable effervescence of joy. At Makuto, on the coast of Venezuela, the company scored its greatest success. Imagine Coney Island translated into Spanish and you will comprehend Makuto. The fashionable season is from November to March. Down from La Guerra and Caracas and Valencia and other interior towns flock the people for their holiday season. There are bathing and fiestas and bullfights and scandal. And then the people have a passion for music that the bands in the plaza and on the sea beach stir but do not satisfy. The coming of the Alcazar Opera Company aroused the utmost ardor and zeal among the pleasure seekers. The illustrious Guzman Blanco, president and dictator of Venezuela, sojourned in Makuto with his court for the season. That potent ruler, who himself paid a subsidy of 40,000 pesos each year to Grand Opera in Caracas, ordered one of the government warehouses to be cleared for a temporary theater. A stage was quickly constructed and rough wooden benches made for the audience. Private boxes were added for the use of the president and the notables of the army and government. The company remained in Makuto for two weeks. Each performance filled the house as closely as it could be packed. Then the music-mad people fought for room in the open doors and windows, and crowded about, hundreds deep, on the outside. Those audiences formed a brilliantly diversified patch of color. The hue of their faces ranged from the clear olive of the pure-blood Spaniards down through the yellow and brown shades of the mestizos to the coal-black Carib and the Jamaica Negro. Scattered among them were little groups of Indians with faces like stone idols. Wrapped in gaudy fiber-woven blankets, Indians down from the mountain states of Zamora and Los Andes and Miranda to trade their gold dust in the coast towns. The spell cast upon these denizens of the interior fastnesses was remarkable. They sat in petrified ecstasy, 
conspicuous among the excitable Macutians, who wildly strove with tongue and hand to give evidence of their delight. Only once did the somber rapture of these aboriginals find expression. During the rendition of Faust, Guzman Blanco, extravagantly pleased by the jewel song, cast upon the stage a purse of gold pieces. Other distinguished citizens followed his lead to the extent of whatever loose coin they had convenient, while some of the fair and fashionable senoras were moved, in imitation. To fling a jewel or a ring or two at the feet of the Marguerite, who was, according to the bills, Mli. Nina Giroux. Then, from different parts of the house rose sundry of the stolid hillmen and cast upon the stage little brown and dun bags that fell with soft, thumps, and did not rebound. It was, no doubt, pleasure at the tribute to her art that caused Mli. Giroux's eyes to shine so brightly when she opened these little deerskin bags in her dressing room and found them to contain pure gold dust. If so, the pleasure was rightly hers, for her voice in song, pure, strong and thrilling with the feeling of the emotional artist, deserved the tribute that it earned. But the triumph of the Alcazar Opera Company is not the theme, it but leans upon and colors it. There happened in Makuto a tragic thing, an unsolvable mystery, that sobered for a time the gaiety of the happy season. One evening between the short twilight and the time when she should have whirled upon the stage in the red and black of the ardent Carmen, Mli. Nina Giroux disappeared from the sight and ken of six thousand pairs of eyes and as many minds in Makuto. There was the usual turmoil and hurrying to seek her. Messengers flew to the little French-kept hotel where she stayed. Others of the company hastened here or there where she might be lingering in some tienda or unduly prolonging her bath upon the beach. All search was fruitless. Mademoiselle had vanished. Half an hour passed and she did not appear. The dictator, unused to the caprices of prime dawn, became impatient. He sent an aide from his box to say to the manager that if the curtain did not at once rise he would immediately hail the entire company to the calabosa, though it would desolate his heart, indeed. To be compelled to such an act. Birds in Makuto could be made to sing. The manager abandoned hope for the time of Mlle Giroux. A member of the chorus, who had dreamed hopelessly for years of the blessed opportunity, quickly carminized herself and the opera went on. Afterward, when the lost cantatrice appeared not, the aid of the authorities was invoked. The president at once set the army, the police, and all citizens to the search. Not one clue to Mli. Giroux's disappearance was found. The Alcazar left to fill engagements farther down the coast. On the way back the steamer stopped at Makuto and the manager made anxious inquiry. Not a trace of the lady had been discovered. The Alcazar could do no more. The personal belongings of the missing lady were stored in the hotel against her possible later reappearance and the opera company continued upon its homeward voyage to New Orleans. On the Camino reel along the beach the two saddle mules and the four pack mules of Don Senor Johnny Armstrong stood, patiently awaiting the crack of the whip of the arriero, Luis. That would be the signal for the start on another long journey into the mountains. The pack mules were loaded with a varied assortment of hardware and cutlery. These articles Don Johnny traded to the interior Indians for the gold dust that they washed from the Andean streams and stored in quills and bags against his coming. It was a profitable business, and Senor Armstrong expected soon to be able to purchase the coffee plantation that he coveted. Armstrong stood on the narrow sidewalk, exchanging garbled Spanish with old Peralto, the rich native merchant who had just charged him four prices for half a gross of pot metal hatchets and abridged English with Rucker, the little German who was consul for the United States. Take with you, senor, said Peralto, the blessings of the saints upon your journey. Better try quinine, growled Rucker through his pipe. Take two grains every night. And don't make your trip too long, Johnny, because we half needs of you. It is e-i-n villainous game. Melville play of whist, and deer is no odor substitute. Auf Wiedersehen, und keep your eyes. Mule's ears between when you under edge of der precipices ride. The bells of Luis's mule jingled and the pack train filed after the warning note. Armstrong, 
waved a goodbye and took his place at the tail of the procession. Up the narrow street they turned, and passed the two-story wooden hotel Ingalls, where Ives and Dawson and Richards and the rest of the chaps were dawdling on the broad piazza. Reading week-old newspapers. They crowded to the railing and shouted many friendly and wise and foolish farewells after him. Across the plaza they trotted slowly past the bronze statue of Guzman Blanco, within its fence of bayonet rifles captured from revolutionists. And out of the town between the rows of thatched huts swarming with the unclothed youth of Makuto. They plunged into the damp coolness of banana groves at length to emerge upon a bright stream, where brown women in scant raiment laundered clothes destructively upon the rocks. Then the pack train, fording the stream, attacked the sudden ascent, and bade adieu to such civilization as the coast afforded. For weeks Armstrong, guided by Luis, followed his regular route among the mountains. After he had collected an aroba of the precious metal, winning a profit of nearly five thousand dollars, the heads of the lightened mules were turned down trail again. Where the head of the Guarico River springs from a great gash in the mountainside, Luis halted the train. Half a day's journey from here, senor, said he, is the village of Takazama, which we have never visited. I think many ounces of gold may be procured there. It is worth the trial. Armstrong concurred, and they turned again upward toward Takazama. The trail was abrupt and precipitous, mounting through a dense forest. As night fell, dark and gloomy, Luis once more halted. Before them was a black chasm, bisecting the path as far as they could see. Luis dismounted. There should be a bridge, he called, and ran along the cleft a distance. It is here, he cried, and remounting, led the way. In a few moments Armstrong, heard a sound as though a thunderous drum were beating somewhere in the dark. It was the falling of the mule's hoofs upon the bridge made of strong hides lashed to poles and stretched across the chasm. Half a mile further was Takazama. The village was a congregation of rock and mud huts set in the profundity of an obscure wood. As they rode in a sound inconsistent with that brooding solitude met their ears. From a long, low mud hut that they were nearing rose the glorious voice of a woman in song. The words were English, the air familiar to Armstrong's memory, but not to his musical knowledge. He slipped from his mule and stole to a narrow window in one end of the house. Peering cautiously inside, he saw, within three feet of him, a woman of marvelous, imposing beauty, clothed in a splendid loose robe of leopard skins. The hut was packed close to the small space in which she stood with the squatting figures of Indians. The woman finished her song and seated herself close to the little window, as if grateful for the unpolluted air that entered it. When she had ceased several of the audience rose and cast little softly falling bags at her feet. A harsh murmur, no doubt a barbarous kind of applause and comment, went through the grim assembly. Armstrong, was used to seizing opportunities promptly. Taking advantage of the noise he called to the woman in a low but distinct voice, do not turn your head this way, but listen. I am an American. If you need assistance tell me how I can render it. Answer as briefly as you can. The woman was worthy of his boldness. Only by a sudden flush of her pale cheek did she acknowledge understanding of his words. Then she spoke, scarcely moving her lips. I am held a prisoner by these Indians. God knows I need help. In two hours come to the little hut twenty yards toward the mountainside. There will be a light and a red curtain in the window. There is always a guard at the door, whom you will have to overcome. For the love of heaven, do not fail to come. The story seems to shrink from adventure and rescue and mystery. The theme is one too gentle for those brave and quickening tones. And yet it reaches as far back as time itself. It has been named, environment, which is as weak a word as any to express the unnameable kinship of man to nature. That queer fraternity that causes stones and trees and salt water and clouds to play upon our emotions. Why are we made serious and solemn and sublime by mountain heights, grave and contemplative by an abundance of overhanging trees? 
reduced to inconstancy and monkey capers by the ripples on a sandy beach? Did the protoplasm, but enough. The chemists are looking into the matter, and before long they will have all life in the table of the symbols. Briefly, then, in order to confine the story within scientific bounds, John Armstrong, went to the hut, choked the Indian guard and carried away Mlle Giroux. With her was also conveyed a number of pounds of gold dust she had collected during her six months' forced engagement in Takazama. The Carabobo Indians are easily the most enthusiastic lovers of music between the Equator and the French Opera House in New Orleans. They are also strong believers that the advice of Emerson was good when he said, The thing thou wantest, O discontented man, take it, and pay the price. A number of them had attended the performance of the Alcazar Opera Company in Makuto, and found Mlle Giroux's style and technique satisfactory. They wanted her, so they took her one evening suddenly and without any fuss. They treated her with much consideration, exacting only one song recital each day. She was quite pleased at being rescued by Mr. Armstrong. So much for mystery and adventure. Now to resume the theory of the protoplasm. John Armstrong and Lee. Giroux rode among the Andean peaks, enveloped in their greatness and sublimity. The mightiest cousins, furthest removed, in nature's great family become conscious of the tie. Among those huge piles of primordial upheaval. Amid those gigantic silences and elongated fields of distance the littlenesses of men are precipitated as one chemical throws down a sediment from another. They moved reverently, as in a temple. Their souls were uplifted in unison with the stately heights. They traveled in a zone of majesty and peace. To Armstrong the woman seemed almost a holy thing. Yet bathed in the white, still dignity of her martyrdom that purified her earthly beauty and gave out, it seemed, an aura of transcendent loveliness. In those first hours of companionship she drew from him an adoration that was half human love, half the worship of a descended goddess. Never yet since her rescue had she smiled. Over her dress she still wore the robe of leopard skins, for the mountain air was cold. She looked to be some splendid princess belonging to those wild and awesome altitudes. The spirit of the region chimed with hers. Her eyes were always turned upon the somber cliffs, the blue gorges and the snow-clad turrets, looking a sublime melancholy equal to their own. At times on the journey she sang thrilling te deums and miseraries that struck the true note of the hills, and made their route seem like a solemn march down a cathedral aisle. The rescued one spoke but seldom, her mood partaking of the hush of nature that surrounded them. Armstrong looked upon her as an angel. He could not bring himself to the sacrilege of attempting to woo her as other women may be wooed. On the third day they had descended as far as the Tierra Templada, the zona of the tablelands and foothills. The mountains were receding in their rear, but still towered, exhibiting yet impressively their formidable heads. Here they met signs of man. They saw the white houses of coffee plantations gleam across the clearings. They struck into a road where they met travelers and pack mules. Cattle were grazing on the slopes. They passed a little village where the round-eyed niños shrieked and called at sight of them. Mlle Giroux laid aside her leopard-skin robe. It seemed to be a trifle incongruous now. In the mountains it had appeared fitting and natural. And if Armstrong was not mistaken she laid aside with it something of the high dignity of her demeanor. As the country became more populous and significant of comfortable life he saw, with a feeling of joy, that the exalted princess and priestess of the Andean peaks was changing to a woman, an earth woman, but no less enticing. A little color crept to the surface of her marble cheek. She arranged the conventional dress that the removal of the robe now disclosed with the solicitous touch of one who is conscious of the eyes of others. She smoothed the careless sweep of her hair. A mundane interest, long latent in the chilling atmosphere of the ascetic peaks, showed in her eyes. This thaw in his divinity sent Armstrong's heart going faster. So might an Arctic explorer thrill at his first ken of green fields and liquescent waters. They were on a lower plane of earth and life and were succumbing to its peculiar, subtle influence. 
The austerity of the hills no longer thinned the air they breathed. About them was the breath of fruit and corn and builded homes. The comfortable smell of smoke and warm earth and the consolations man has placed between himself and the dust of his brother earth from which he sprung. While traversing those awful mountains, mile. Giroux had seemed to be wrapped in their spirit of reverent reserve. Was this that same woman, now palpitating, warm, eager, throbbing with conscious life and charm, feminine to her fingertips? Pondering over this, Armstrong felt certain misgivings intrude upon his thoughts. He wished he could stop there with this changing creature, descending no farther. Here was the elevation and environment to which her nature seemed to respond with its best. He feared to go down upon the man-dominated levels. Would her spirit not yield still further in that artificial zone to which they were descending? Now from a little plateau they saw the sea flash at the edge of the green lowlands. Mile. Giroux gave a little, catching sigh. Oh. Look, Mr. Armstrong, there is the sea. Isn't it lovely? I'm so tired of mountains. She heaved a pretty shoulder in a gesture of repugnance. Those horrid Indians. Just think of what I suffered. Although I suppose I attained my ambition of becoming a stellar attraction, I wouldn't care to repeat the engagement. It was very nice of you to bring me away. Tell me, Mr. Armstrong, honestly, now, do I look such an awful, awful fright? I haven't looked into a mirror, you know, for months. Armstrong made answer according to his changed moods. Also he laid his hand upon hers as it rested upon the horn of her saddle. Luis was at the head of the pack train and could not see. She allowed it to remain there, and her eyes smiled frankly into his. Then at sundown they dropped upon the coast level under the palms and lemons among the vivid greens and scarlets and ochres of the Tierra Caliente. They rode into Makuto, and saw the line of volatile bathers frolicking in the surf. The mountains were very far away. Mli. Giroux's eyes were shining with a joy that could not have existed under the chaperonage of the mountaintops. There were other spirits calling to her, nymphs of the orange groves, pixies from the chattering surf, imps, born of the music, the perfumes, colors, and the insinuating presence of humanity. She laughed aloud, musically, at a sudden thought. Won't there be a sensation, she called to Armstrong. Don't I wish I had an engagement just now, though. What a picnic the press agent would have. Held a prisoner by a band of savage Indians subdued by the spell of her wonderful voice, wouldn't that make great stuff? But I guess I quit the game winner, anyhow, there ought to be a couple of thousand dollars in that sack of gold dust I collected as encores, don't you think? He left her at the door of the little hotel de Bune Descanser, where she had stopped before. Two hours later he returned to the hotel. He glanced in at the open door of the little combined reception room and café. Half a dozen of Makuto's representative social and official caballeros were distributed about the room. Senor Villablanca, the wealthy rubber concessionist, reposed his fat figure on two chairs, with an emollient smile beaming upon his chocolate-colored face. Gilbert, the French mining engineer, leered through his polished nose glasses. Colonel Mendez, of the regular army, in gold-laced uniform and fatuous grin, was busily extracting corks from champagne bottles. Other patterns of Mercutian gallantry and fashion pranced and posed. The air was hazy with cigarette smoke. Wine dripped upon the floor. Perched upon a table in the center of the room in an attitude of easy preeminence was Mlle Giroux. A chic costume of white lawn and cherry ribbons supplanted her traveling garb. There was a suggestion of lace, and a frill or two, with a discreet, small implication of hand-embroidered pink hosiery. Upon her lap rested a guitar. In her face was the light of resurrection, the peace of Elysium attained through fire and suffering. She was singing to a lively accompaniment a little song. When you see de big round moon. Comin' up like a balloon. Dis nigger skips fur to kiss de lips. Ob his stylish. Black-faced coon. The singer caught sight of Armstrong. Hi. There, Johnny, 
she called, I've been expecting you for an hour. What kept you? Gee. But these smoked guys are the slowest you ever saw. They ain't on, at all. Come along in, and I'll make this coffee-colored old sport with the gold epaulets open one for you right off the ice. Thank you, said Armstrong. Not just now, I believe. I've several things to attend to. He walked out and down the street, and met Rucker coming up from the consulate. Play you a game of billiards, said Armstrong. I want something to take the taste of the sea level out of my mouth. The Brief Debut of Tildy If you do not know Bogle's Chop House and Family Restaurant it is your loss. For if you are one of the fortunate ones who dine expensively you should be interested to know how the other half consumes provisions. And if you belong to the half to whom waiters' checks are things of moment, you should know Bogle's, for there you get your money's worth, in quantity, at least. Bogle's is situated in that highway of bourgeoisie, that boulevard of Brown Jones and Robinson, 8th Avenue. There are two rows of tables in the room, six in each row. On each table is a caster stand, containing cruets of condiments and seasons. From the pepper cruet you may shake a cloud of something tasteless and melancholy, like volcanic dust. From the salt cruet you may expect nothing. Though a man should extract a sanguinary stream from the pallid turnip, yet will his prowess be balked when he comes to rest salt from Bogle's cruets. Also upon each table stands the counterfeit of that benign sauce made from the recipe of a nobleman in India. At the cashier's desk sits Bogle, cold, sordid, slow, smoldering, and takes your money. Behind a mountain of toothpicks he makes your change, files your check, and ejects at you, like a toad, a word about the weather. Beyond a corroboration of his meteorological statement you would better not venture. You are not Bogle's friend. You are a fed, transient customer, and you and he may not meet again until the blowing of Gabriel's dinner horn. So take your change and go, to the devil if you like. There you have Bogle's sentiments. The needs of Bogle's customers were supplied by two waitresses and a voice. One of the waitresses was named Aileen. She was tall, beautiful, lively, gracious and learned in persiflage. Her other name? There was no more necessity for another name at Bogle's than there was for finger bowls. The name of the other waitress was Tildy. Why do you suggest Matilda? Please listen this time, Tildy, Tildy. Tildy was dumpy, plain-faced, and too anxious to please to please. Repeat the last clause to yourself once or twice, and make the acquaintance of the duplicate infinite. The voice at Bogle's was invisible. It came from the kitchen, and did not shine in the way of originality. It was a heathen voice, and contented itself with vain repetitions of exclamations emitted by the waitresses concerning food. Will it tire you to be told again that Aileen was beautiful? Had she donned a few hundred dollars worth of clothes and joined the Easter parade, and had you seen her, you would have hastened to say so yourself. The customers at Bogle's were her slaves. Six tables full she could wait upon at once. They who were in a hurry restrained their impatience for the joy of merely gazing upon her swiftly moving, graceful figure. They who had finished eating ate more that they might continue in the light of her smiles. Every man there, and they were mostly men, tried to make his impression upon her. Aileen could successfully exchange repartee against a dozen at once. And every smile that she sent forth lodged, like pellets from a scatter gun, in as many hearts. And all this while she would be performing astounding feats with orders of pork and beans, pot roasts, ham and, sausage and the wheats. And any quantity of things on the iron and in the pan and straight up and on the side. With all this feasting and flirting and merry exchange of wit bogles came mighty near being a salon, with Aileen for its Madame Recamier. If the transients were entranced by the fascinating Aileen, the regulars were her adorers. There was much rivalry among many of the steady customers. Aileen could have had an engagement every evening. At least twice a week someone took her to a theater or to a dance. One stout gentleman whom she and Tildy had privately christened, the hog, presented her with a turquoise ring. 
Another one known as, Freshy, who rode on the traction company's repair wagon, was going to give her a poodle as soon as his brother got the hauling contract in the ninth. And the man who always ate spare ribs and spinach and said he was a stockbroker asked her to go to Parsifal with him. I don't know where this place is, said Aileen while talking it over with Tildy, but the wedding ring's got to be on before I put a stitch into a traveling dress, ain't that right? Well, I guess. But, Tildy. In steaming, chattering, cabbage-scented bogles there was almost a heart tragedy. Tildy with the blunt nose, the hay-colored hair, the freckled skin, the bagomiel figure, had never had an admirer. Not a man followed her with his eyes when she went to and fro in the restaurant save now and then when they glared with the beast hunger for food. None of them bantered her gaily to coquettish interchanges of wit. None of them loudly jollied her of mornings as they did Aileen, accusing her, when the eggs were slow in coming, of late hours in the company of envied swains. No one had ever given her a turquoise ring or invited her upon a voyage to mysterious, distant Parsifal. Tildy was a good waitress, and the men tolerated her. They who sat at her table spoke to her briefly with quotations from the bill of fare. And then raised their voices in honeyed and otherwise flavored accents, eloquently addressed to the fair Aileen. They writhed in their chairs to gaze around and over the impending form of Tildy, that Aileen's pulchritude might season and make ambrosia of their bacon and eggs. And Tildy was content to be the unwood drudge if Aileen could receive the flattery and the homage. The blunt nose was loyal to the short Grecian. She was Aileen's friend. And she was glad to see her rule hearts and wean the attention of men from smoking pot pie and lemon meringue. But deep below our freckles and hay colored hair, the unhandsomest of us dream of a prince or a princess, not vicarious, but coming to us alone. There was a morning when Aileen tripped in to work with a slightly bruised eye, and Tildy's solicitude was almost enough to heal any optic. Fresh guy, explained Aileen, last night as I was going home at 23rd and 6th. Sashayed up, so he did, and made a break. I turned him down, cold, and he made a sneak. But followed me down to 18th, and tried his hot air again. Gee! But I slapped him a good one, side of the face. Then he give me that eye. Does it look real awful, Till? I should hate that Mr. Nicholson should see it when he comes in for his tea and toast at ten. Tildy listened to the adventure with breathless admiration. No man had ever tried to follow her. She was safe abroad at any hour of the twenty-four. What bliss it must have been to have had a man follow one and black one's eye for love. Among the customers at Bogle's was a young man named Cedars, who worked in a laundry office. Mr. Cedars was thin and had light hair, and appeared to have been recently rough-dried and starched. He was too diffident to aspire to Eileen's notice, so he usually sat at one of Tildy's tables, where he devoted himself to silence and boiled weakfish. One day when Mr. Cedars came in to dinner he had been drinking beer. There were only two or three customers in the restaurant. When Mr. Cedars had finished his weakfish he got up, put his arm around Tildy's waist, kissed her loudly and impudently, walked out upon the street, snapped his fingers in the direction of the laundry, and hide himself to play pennies in the slot machines at the amusement arcade. For a few moments Tildy stood petrified. Then she was aware of Aileen shaking at her an arch forefinger, and saying, Why, Till, you naughty girl! Ain't you getting to be awful, Miss Slyboots? First thing I know you'll be stealing some of my fellows. I must keep an eye on you, my lady. Another thing dawned upon Tildy's recovering wits. In a moment she had advanced from a hopeless, lowly admirer to be an Eve sister of the potent Aileen. She herself was now a man-charmer, a mark for Cupid, a Sabine who must be coy when the Romans were at their banquet boards. Man had found her waist achievable and her lips desirable. The sudden and amatory cedars had, as it were, performed for her a miraculous piece of one-day laundry work. He had taken the sackcloth of her uncomeliness, had washed, dried, starched and ironed it, and returned it to her sheer embroidered lawn, the robe of Venus herself. The freckles on Tildy's cheeks merged into a rosy flush. 
now both Circe and Psyche peeped from her brightened eyes. Not even Aileen herself had been publicly embraced and kissed in the restaurant. Tildy could not keep the delightful secret. When trade was slack she went and stood at Bogle's desk. Her eyes were shining, she tried not to let her words sound proud and boastful. A gentleman insulted me today, she said. He hugged me around the waist and kissed me. That's so, said Bogle, cracking open his business armor. After this week you get a dollar a week more. At the next regular meal when Tildy set food before customers with whom she had acquaintance she said to each of them modestly. As one whose merit needed no bolstering. A gentleman insulted me today in the restaurant. He put his arm around my waist and kissed me. The diners accepted the revelation in various ways, some incredulously, some with congratulations. Others turned upon her the stream of badinage that had hitherto been directed at Aileen alone. And Tildy's heart swelled in her bosom, for she saw at last the towers of romance rise above the horizon of the grey plain in which she had for so long travelled. For two days Mr. Cedars came not again. During that time Tildy established herself firmly as a woman to be wooed. She bought ribbons, and arranged her hair like Aileen's, and tightened her waist two inches. She had a thrilling but delightful fear that Mr. Cedars would rush in suddenly and shoot her with a pistol. He must have loved her desperately, and impulsive lovers are always blindly jealous. Even Aileen had not been shot at with a pistol. And then Tildy rather hoped that he would not shoot at her, for she was always loyal to Aileen, and she did not want to overshadow her friend. At four o'clock on the afternoon of the third day Mr. Cedars came in. There were no customers at the tables. At the back end of the restaurant Tildy was refilling the mustard pots and Aileen was quartering pies. Mr. Cedars walked back to where they stood. Tildy looked up and saw him, gasped, and pressed the mustard spoon against her heart. A red hair bow was in her hair. She wore Venus's Eighth Avenue badge, the blue bead necklace with the swinging silver symbolic heart. Mr. Cedars was flushed and embarrassed. He plunged one hand into his hip pocket and the other into a fresh pumpkin pie. Miss Tildy, said he, I want to apologize for what I'd done the other evening. Tell you the truth, I was pretty well tanked up or I wouldn't have done it. I wouldn't do no lady that away when I was sober. So I hope, Miss Tildy, you'll accept my apology, and believe that I wouldn't have done it if I'd known what I was doing and hadn't have been drunk. With this handsome plea Mr. Cedars backed away, and departed, feeling that reparation had been made. But behind the convenient screen Tildy had thrown herself flat upon a table among the butter chips and the coffee cups. And was sobbing her heart out, out and back again to the grey plain wherein travel they with blunt noses and hay-coloured hair. From her knot she had torn the red hair bow and cast it upon the floor. Cedars she despised utterly. She had but taken his kiss as that of a pioneer and prophetic prince who might have set the clocks going and the pages to running in fairyland. But the kiss had been maudlin and unmeant. The court had not stirred at the false alarm, she must forevermore remain the sleeping beauty. Yet not all was lost. Eileen's arm was around her. And Tildy's red hand groped among the butter chips till it found the warm clasp of her friends. Don't you fret. Till, said Aileen, who did not understand entirely. That turnip-faced little clothespin of a cedar's ain't worth it. He ain't anything of a gentleman or he wouldn't ever have apologized. Holding up a train. Note. The man who told me these things was for several years an outlaw in the southwest and a follower of the pursuit he so frankly describes. His description of the modus operandi should prove interesting, his counsel of value to the potential passenger in some future hold-up. While his estimate of the pleasures of train robbing will hardly induce anyone to adopt it as a profession. I give the story in almost exactly his own words. O. H. Most people would say, if their opinion was asked for, that holding up a train would be a hard job. Well, it isn't, it's easy. I have contributed some to the uneasiness of railroads and the insomnia of express companies. 
and the most trouble I ever had about a holdup was in being swindled by unscrupulous people while spending the money I got. The danger wasn't anything to speak of, and we didn't mind the trouble. One man has come pretty near robbing a train by himself, two have succeeded a few times. Three can do it if they are hustlers, but five is about the right number. The time to do it and the place depend upon several things. The first stick-up I was ever in happened in 1890. Maybe the way I got into it will explain how most train robbers start in the business. Five out of six Western outlaws are just cowboys out of a job and gone wrong. The sixth is a tough from the East who dresses up like a bad man and plays some low-down trick that gives the boys a bad name. Wire fences and nesters made five of them, a bad heart made the sixth. Jim S. and I were working on the 101 Ranch in Colorado. The nesters had the cowmen on the go. They had taken up the land and elected officers who were hard to get along with. Jim and I rode into La Junta one day, going south from a roundup. We were having a little fun without malice toward anybody when a farmer administration cut in and tried to harvest us. Jim shot a deputy marshal, and I kind of corroborated his side of the argument. We skirmished up and down the main street, the boomers having bad luck all the time. After a while we leaned forward and shoved for the ranch down on the Ceriso. We were riding a couple of horses that couldn't fly, but they could catch birds. A few days after that, a gang of the La Junta boomers came to the ranch and wanted us to go back with them. Naturally, we declined. We had the house on them, and before we were done refusing, that old dobe was plumb full of lead. When dark came we faggied them a batch of bullets and shoved out the back door for the rocks. They sure smoked us as we went. We had to drift, which we did, and rounded up down in Oklahoma. Well, there wasn't anything we could get there, and, being mighty hard up, we decided to transact a little business with the railroads. Jim and I joined forces with Tom and Ike Moore, two brothers who had plenty of sand they were willing to convert into dust. I can call their names, for both of them are dead. Tom was shot while robbing a bank in Arkansas, Ike was killed during the more dangerous pastime of attending a dance in the Creek Nation. We selected a place on the Santa Fe where there was a bridge across a deep creek surrounded by heavy timber. All passenger trains took water at the tank close to one end of the bridge. It was a quiet place, the nearest house being five miles away. The day before it happened, we rested our horses and made medicine as to how we should get about it. Our plans were not at all elaborate, as none of us had ever engaged in a holdup before. The Santa Fe flyer was due at the tank at 11.15 p.m. At 11, Tom and I lay down on one side of the track, and Jim and Ike took the other. As the train rolled up, the headlight flashing far down the track and the steam hissing from the engine, I turned weak all over. I would have worked a whole year on the ranch for nothing to have been out of that affair right then. Some of the nerviest men in the business have told me that they felt the same way the first time. The engine had hardly stopped when I jumped on the running board on one side, while Jim mounted the other. As soon as the engineer and fireman saw our guns they threw up their hands without being told, and begged us not to shoot, saying they would do anything we wanted them to. Hit the ground, I ordered, and they both jumped off. We drove them before us down the side of the train. While this was happening, Tom and Ike had been blazing away, one on each side of the train, yelling like Apaches, so as to keep the passengers herded in the cars. Some fellow stuck a little twenty-two caliber out one of the coach windows and fired it straight up in the air. I let drive and smashed the glass just over his head. That settled everything like resistance from that direction. By this time all my nervousness was gone. I felt a kind of pleasant excitement as if I were at a dance or a frolic of some sort. The lights were all out in the coaches, and, as Tom and I gradually quit firing and yelling, it got to be almost as still as a graveyard. I remember hearing a little bird chirping in a bush at the side of the track, as if it were complaining at being waked up. I made the fireman get a lantern, and then I went to the express car and yelled to the messenger to open up or get perforated. He slid the door back and stood in it with his hands up. 
Jump overboard, son, I said, and he hit the dirt like a lump of lead. There were two safes in the car, a big one and a little one. By the way, I first located the messenger's arsenal, a double-barreled shotgun with buckshot cartridges and a thirty-eight in a drawer. I drew the cartridges from the shotgun, pocketed the pistol, and called the messenger inside. I shoved my gun against his nose and put him to work. He couldn't open the big safe, but he did the little one. There was only nine hundred dollars in it. That was mighty small winnings for our trouble, so we decided to go through the passengers. We took our prisoners to the smoking car, and from there sent the engineer through the train to light up the coaches. Beginning with the first one, we placed a man at each door and ordered the passengers to stand between the seats with their hands up. If you want to find out what cowards the majority of men are, all you have to do is rob a passenger train. I don't mean because they don't resist, I'll tell you later on why they can't do that, but it makes a man feel sorry for them the way they lose their heads. Big, burly drummers and farmers and ex-soldiers and high-collar dudes and sports that, a few moments before, were filling the car with noise and bragging, get so scared that their ears flop. There were very few people in the day coaches at that time of night, so we made a slim haul until we got to the sleeper. The Pullman conductor met me at one door while Jim was going round to the other one. He very politely informed me that I could not go into that car, as it did not belong to the railroad company, and, besides, the passengers had already been greatly disturbed by the shouting and firing. Never in all my life have I met with a finer instance of official dignity and reliance upon the power of Mr. Pullman's great name. I jabbed my six-shooter so hard against Mr. Conductor's front that I afterward found one of his vest buttons so firmly wedged in the end of the barrel that I had to shoot it out. He just shut up like a weak springed knife and rolled down the car steps. I opened the door of the sleeper and stepped inside. A big, fat old man came wobbling up to me, puffing and blowing. He had one coat sleeve on and was trying to put his vest on over that. I don't know who he thought I was. Young man, young man, says he, you must keep cool and not get excited. Above everything, keep cool. I can't, says I, excitement's just eating me up. And then I let out a yell and turned loose my forty-five through the skylight. That old man tried to dive into one of the lower berths, but a screech came out of it and a bare foot that took him in the breadbasket and landed him on the floor. I saw Jim coming in the other door, and I hollered for everybody to climb out and line up. They commenced to scramble down, and for a while we had a three-ringed circus. The men looked as frightened and tame as a lot of rabbits in a deep snow. They had on, on an average, about a quarter of a suit of clothes and one shoe apiece. One chap was sitting on the floor of the aisle, looking as if he were working a hard sum in arithmetic. He was trying, very solemn, to pull a lady's number two shoe on his number nine foot. The ladies didn't stop to dress. They were so curious to see a real, live train robber, bless them, that they just wrapped blankets and sheets around themselves and came out, squeaky and fidgety looking. They always show more curiosity and sand than the men do. We got them all lined up and pretty quiet, and I went through the bunch. I found very little on them, I mean in the way of valuables. One man in the line was a sight. He was one of those big, overgrown, solemn snoozers that sit on the platform at lectures and look wise. Before crawling out he had managed to put on his long, frock-tailed coat and his high silk hat. The rest of him was nothing but pajamas and bunions. When I dug into that Prince Albert, I expected to drag out at least a block of gold mine stock or an armful of government bonds, but all I found was a little boy's French harp about four inches long. What it was there for, I don't know. I felt a little mad because he had fooled me so. I stuck the harp up against his mouth. If you can't pay, play, I says. I can't play, says he. Then learn right off quick, says I, letting him smell the end of my gun barrel. He caught hold of the harp, turned red as a beet, and commenced to blow. He blew a dinky little tune I remembered hearing when I was a kid. Prettiest little gal in the country, oh. 
Mammy and Daddy told me so. I made him keep on playing it all the time we were in the car. Now and then he'd get weak and off the key, and I'd turn my gun on him and ask what was the matter with that little gal, and whether he had any intention of going back on her. Which would make him start up again like sixty. I think that old boy standing there in his silk hat and bare feet, playing his little French harp, was the funniest sight I ever saw. One little red-headed woman in the line broke out laughing at him. You could have heard her in the next car. Then Jim held them steady while I searched the berths. I grappled around in those beds and filled a pillowcase with the strangest assortment of stuff you ever saw. Now and then I'd come across a little popgun pistol, just about right for plugging teeth with, which I'd throw out the window. When I finished with the collection, I dumped the pillowcase load in the middle of the aisle. There were a good many watches, bracelets, rings, and pocketbooks, with a sprinkling of false teeth, whiskey flasks, face powder boxes, chocolate caramels, and heads of hair of various colors and lengths. There were also about a dozen lady stockings into which jewelry, watches, and rolls of bills had been stuffed and then wadded up tight and stuck under the mattresses. I offered to return what I called the scalps, saying that we were not Indians on the warpath, but none of the ladies seemed to know to whom the hair belonged. One of the women, and a good looker she was, wrapped in a striped blanket, saw me pick up one of the stockings that was pretty chunky and heavy about the toe, and she snapped out. That's mine. Sir. You're not in the business of robbing women, are you? Now, as this was our first holdup, we hadn't agreed upon any code of ethics, so I hardly knew what to answer. But, anyway, I replied, well, not as a specialty. If this contains your personal property you can have it back. It just does, she declared eagerly, and reached out her hand for it. You'll excuse my taking a look at the contents, I said, holding the stocking up by the toe. Out dumped a big gent's gold watch, worth two hundred, a gent's leather pocketbook that we afterward found to contain six hundred dollars, a point three two caliber revolver. And the only thing of the lot that could have been a lady's personal property was a silver bracelet worth about fifty cents. I said, Madam, here's your property, and handed her the bracelet. Now, I went on, how can you expect us to act square with you when you try to deceive us in this manner? I'm surprised at such conduct. The young woman flushed up as if she had been caught doing something dishonest. Some other woman down the line called out, the mean thing. I never knew whether she meant the other lady or me. When we finished our job we ordered everybody back to bed, told M good night very politely at the door, and left. We rode forty miles before daylight and then divided the stuff. Each one of us got $1,752.85 in money. We lumped the jewelry around. Then we scattered, each man for himself. That was my first train robbery and it was about as easily done as any of the ones that followed. But that was the last and only time I ever went through the passengers. I don't like that part of the business. Afterward I stuck strictly to the express car. During the next eight years I handled a good deal of money. The best haul I made was just seven years after the first one. We found out about a train that was going to bring out a lot of money to pay off the soldiers at a government post. We stuck that train up in broad daylight. Five of us lay in the sand hills near a little station. Ten soldiers were guarding the money on the train, but they might just as well have been at home on a furlough. We didn't even allow them to stick their heads out the windows to see the fun. We had no trouble at all in getting the money, which was all in gold. Of course, a big howl was raised at the time about the robbery. It was government stuff, and the government got sarcastic and wanted to know what the convoy of soldiers went along for. The only excuse given was that nobody was expecting an attack among those bare sand hills in daytime. I don't know what the government thought about the excuse, but I know that it was a good one. The surprise, that is the keynote of the train robbing business. The papers published all kinds of stories about the loss, finally agreeing that it was between $9,000 and $10,000. The government sawed wood. Here are the correct figures, printed for the first time, 
$48,000. If anybody will take the trouble to look over Uncle Sam's private accounts for that little debit to profit and loss, he will find that I am right to assent. By that time we were expert enough to know what to do. We rode due west twenty miles, making a trail that a Broadway policeman could have followed, and then we doubled back, hiding our tracks. On the second night after the holdup, while posses were scouring the country in every direction. Jim and I were eating supper in the second story of a friend's house in the town where the alarm started from. Our friend pointed out to us, in an office across the street, a printing press at work striking off handbills offering a reward for our capture. I have been asked what we do with the money we get. Well, I never could account for a tenth part of it after it was spent. It goes fast and freely. An outlaw has to have a good many friends. A highly respected citizen may, and often does, get along with very few, but a man on the dodge has got to have sidekickers. With angry posses and reward-hungry officers cutting out a hot trail for him. He must have a few places scattered about the country where he can stop and feed himself and his horse and get a few hours sleep without having to keep both eyes open. When he makes a haul he feels like dropping some of the coin with these friends, and he does it liberally. Sometimes I have, at the end of a hasty visit at one of these havens of refuge, flung a handful of gold and bills into the laps of the kids playing on the floor. Without knowing whether my contribution was a hundred dollars or a thousand. When old-timers make a big haul they generally go far away to one of the big cities to spend their money. Green hands, however successful a hold-up they make, nearly always give themselves away by showing too much money near the place where they got it. I was in a job in 94 where we got $20,000. We followed our favorite plan for a getaway, that is, doubled on our trail, and laid low for a time near the scene of the train's bad luck. One morning I picked up a newspaper and read an article with big headlines stating that the marshal, with eight deputies and a posse of thirty armed citizens, had the train robbers surrounded in a mesquite thicket on the Cimarron, and that it was a question of only a few hours when they would be dead men or prisoners. While I was reading that article I was sitting at breakfast in one of the most elegant private residences in Washington City, with a flunky in knee pants standing behind my chair. Jim was sitting across the table talking to his half-uncle, a retired naval officer, whose name you have often seen in the accounts of doings in the capital. We had gone there and bought rattling outfits of good clothes, and were resting from our labors among the nabobs. We must have been killed in that mesquite thicket, for I can make an affidavit that we didn't surrender. Now I propose to tell why it is easy to hold up a train, and, then, why no one should ever do it. In the first place, the attacking party has all the advantage. That is, of course, supposing that they are old-timers with the necessary experience and courage. They have the outside and are protected by the darkness, while the others are in the light, hemmed into a small space, and exposed, the moment they show a head at a window or door. To the aim of a man who is a dead shot and who won't hesitate to shoot. But, in my opinion, the main condition that makes train robbing easy is the element of surprise in connection with the imagination of the passengers. If you have ever seen a horse that has eaten loco weed you will understand what I mean when I say that the passengers get locoed. That horse gets the awfulest imagination on him in the world. You can't coax him to cross a little branch stream two feet wide. It looks as big to him as the Mississippi River. That's just the way with the passenger. He thinks there are a hundred men yelling and shooting outside, when maybe there are only two or three. And the muzzle of a forty-five looks like the entrance to a tunnel. The passenger is all right, although he may do mean little tricks, like hiding a wad of money in his shoe and forgetting to dig up until you jostle his rib some with the end of your six-shooter. But there's no harm in him. As to the train crew, we never had any more trouble with them than if they had been so many sheep. I don't mean that they are cowards, I mean that they have got sense. They know they're not up against a bluff. It's the same way with the officers. I've seen Secret Service men, marshals, and railroad detectives fork over their change as meek as Moses. 
I saw one of the bravest marshals I ever knew hide his gun under his seat and dig up along with the rest while I was taking toll. He wasn't afraid. He simply knew that we had the drop on the whole outfit. Besides, many of those officers have families and they feel that they oughtn't to take chances. Whereas death has no terrors for the man who holds up a train. He expects to get killed some day, and he generally does. My advice to you, if you should ever be in a holdup, is to line up with the cowards and save your bravery for an occasion when it may be of some benefit to you. Another reason why officers are backward about mixing things with a train robber is a financial one. Every time there is a scrimmage and somebody gets killed, the officers lose money. If the train robber gets away they swear out a warrant against John Doe et al. And travel hundreds of miles and sign vouchers for thousands on the trail of the fugitives, and the government foots the bills. So, with them, it is a question of mileage rather than courage. I will give one instance to support my statement that the surprise is the best card in playing for a holdup. Along in 92 the Daltons were cutting out a hot trail for the officers down in the Cherokee Nation, those were their lucky days, and they got so reckless and sandy. That they used to announce beforehand what job they were going to undertake. Once they gave it out that they were going to hold up the M, K, and T flyer on a certain night at the station of Prior Creek, in Indian Territory. That night the railroad company got fifteen deputy marshals in Muskogee and put them on the train. Beside them they had fifty armed men hid in the depot at Prior Creek. When the Katy flyer pulled in not a Dalton showed up. The next station was Adair, six miles away. When the train reached there, and the deputies were having a good time explaining what they would have done to the Dalton gang if they had turned up. All at once it sounded like an army firing outside. The conductor and brakeman came running into the car yelling, train robbers. Some of those deputies lit out of the door, hit the ground, and kept on running. Some of them hid their Winchesters under the seats. Two of them made a fight and were both killed. It took the Daltons just ten minutes to capture the train and whip the escort. In twenty minutes more they robbed the express car of $27,000 and made a clean getaway. My opinion is that those deputies would have put up a stiff fight at Prior Creek, where they were expecting trouble, but they were taken by surprise and locoed at Adair, just as the Daltons. Who knew their business, expected they would. I don't think I ought to close without giving some deductions from my experience of eight years, on the Dodge. It doesn't pay to rob trains. Leaving out the question of right and morals, which I don't think I ought to tackle, there is very little to envy in the life of an outlaw. After a while money ceases to have any value in his eyes. He gets to looking upon the railroads and express companies as his bankers, and his six-shooter as a check-book good for any amount. He throws away money right and left. Most of the time he is on the jump, riding day and night, and he lives so hard between times that he doesn't enjoy the taste of high life when he gets it. He knows that his time is bound to come to lose his life or liberty, and that the accuracy of his aim, the speed of his horse, and the fidelity of his cider, are all that postpone the inevitable. It isn't that he loses any sleep over danger from the officers of the law. In all my experience I never knew officers to attack a band of outlaws unless they outnumbered them at least three to one. But the outlaw carries one thought constantly in his mind, and that is what makes him so sore against life, more than anything else, he knows where the marshals get their recruits of deputies. He knows that the majority of these upholders of the law were once lawbreakers, horse thieves, rustlers, highwaymen, and outlaws like himself. And that they gained their positions and immunity by turning state's evidence, by turning traitor and delivering up their comrades to imprisonment and death. He knows that some day, unless he is shot first, his Judas will set to work, the trap will be laid, and he will be the surprised instead of a surpriser at a stick-up. That is why the man who holds up trains picks his company with a thousand times the care with which a careful girl chooses a sweetheart. That is why he raises himself from his blanket of nights and listens to the tread of every horse's hoofs on the distant road. That is why he broods suspiciously for days upon a jesting remark or an unusual movement of a tried comrade, 
or the broken mutterings of his closest friend, sleeping by his side. And it is one of the reasons why the train-robbing profession is not so pleasant a one as either of its collateral branches, politics or cornering the market. The Easter of the Soul It is hardly likely that a goddess may die. Then Easter, the old Saxon goddess of spring, must be laughing in her muslin sleeve at people who believe that Easter, her namesake, exists only along certain strips of Fifth Avenue pavement after church service. I. It belongs to the world. The ptarmigan in Chilkoot Pass discards his winter white feathers for brown. The Patagonian Beau Brummel oils his chignon and clubs him another sweetheart to drag to his skull-strewn flat. And down in Christie Street. Mr. Tiger McQuirk arose with a feeling of disquiet that he did not understand. With a practiced foot he rolled three of his younger brothers like logs out of his way as they lay sleeping on the floor. Before a footsquare looking glass hung by the window he stood and shaved himself. If that may seem to you a task too slight to be thus impressively chronicled, I bear with you. You do not know of the areas to be accomplished in traversing the cheek and chin of Mr. McQuirk. McQuirk, Sr., had gone to work long before. The big son of the house was idle. He was a marble cutter, and the marble cutters were out on a strike. What ails ye? asked his mother, looking at him curiously, are ye not feeling well the morning, maybe now? He's thinking along of Annie Maria Doyle, impudently explained younger brother Tim, ten years old. Tiger reached over the hand of a champion and swept the small McQuirk from his chair. I feel fine, said he, beyond a touch of the I don't know what you call it's. I feel like there was going to be earthquakes or music or a trifle of chills and fever or maybe a picnic. I don't know how I feel. I feel like knocking the face off a policeman, or else maybe like playing Coney Island straight across the board from popcorn to the elephant howdahs. It's the spring in your bones, said Mrs. McQuirk. It's the sap risin'. Time was when I couldn't keep me feet still nor me head cool when the earthworms began to crawl out in the dew of the morning. Tis a bit of tea will do ye good, made from pipsasua and gentian bark at the druggists. Back up, said Mr. McQuirk, impatiently. There's no spring in sight. There's snow yet on the shed in Donovan's backyard. And yesterday they puts open cars on the Sixth Avenue lines, and the janitors have quit ordering coal. And that means six weeks more of winter, by all the signs that be. After breakfast Mr. McQuirk spent fifteen minutes before the corrugated mirror. Subjugating his hair and arranging his green and purple ascot with its amethyst tombstone pin, eloquent of his chosen calling. Since the strike had been called it was this particular striker's habit to hie himself each morning to the corner saloon of Flaherty Brothers, and there establish himself upon the sidewalk. With one foot resting on the bootblack stand, observing the panorama of the street until the pace of time brought twelve o'clock and the dinner hour. And Mr. Tiger McQuirk, with his athletic seventy inches, well trained in sport and battle, his smooth, pale, solid, amiable face, blue where the razor had traveled. His carefully considered clothes and air of capability, was himself a spectacle not displeasing to the eye. But on this morning Mr. McQuirk did not hasten immediately to his post of leisure and observation. Something unusual that he could not quite grasp was in the air. Something disturbed his thoughts, ruffled his senses, made him at once languid, irritable, elated, dissatisfied and sportive. He was no diagnostician, and he did not know that Lent was breaking up physiologically in his system. Mrs. McQuirk had spoken of spring. Skeptically Tiger looked about him for signs. Few they were. The organ grinders were at work, but they were always precocious harbingers. It was near enough spring for them to go penny hunting when the skating ball dropped at the park. In the milliner's windows Easter hats, grave, gay and jubilant, blossomed. There were green patches among the sidewalk debris of the grocers. On a third-story windowsill the first elbow cushion of the season, old gold stripes on a crimson ground, supported the kimonoed arms of a pensive brunette. The wind blew cold from the East River, but the sparrows were flying to the eaves with straws. A second-hand store, 
combining foresight with faith, had set out an ice chest and baseball goods. And then, tigers, I, discrediting these signs, fell upon one that bore a bud of promise. From a bright, new lithograph the head of Capricornus confronted him, betokening the forward and heady brew. Mr. McQuirk entered the saloon and called for his glass of Bach. He threw his nickel on the bar, raised the glass, set it down without tasting it and strolled toward the door. What's the matter, Lord Bolinbroke, inquired the sarcastic bartender. Want a chiny vase or a gold-lined ipern to drink it out of, hey? Say, said Mr. McQuirk, wheeling and shooting out a horizontal hand and a forty-five-degree chin, you know your place only when it comes for given titles. I've changed me mind about drinkin', see? You got your money, ain't you? Wait till you get stung before you get the droop to your lip, will you? Thus Mr. Quirk added mutability of desires to the strange humors that had taken possession of him. Leaving the saloon, he walked away twenty steps and leaned in the open doorway of Lutz, the barber. He and Lutz were friends, masking their sentiments behind abuse and bludgeons of repartee. Irish loafer, roared Lutz, how do you do? So, not yet hafter policeman's order catcher of dogs done dare duty. Hello, Dutch, said Mr. McQuirk. Can't get your mind off of Frankfurters, can you? Bah! exclaimed the German, coming and leaning in the door. I half a soul above Frankfurters today. Dear is springtime in der air. I can feel it coming in over der mud of der streets and das ice in der river. Soon will dear be bicknicks in der islands, mit kegs of beer under der trees. Say, said Mr. McQuirk, setting his hat on one side, is everybody kiddin' me about gentle spring? There ain't any more spring in the air than there is in a horsehair sofa in a Second Avenue furnished room. For me the winter underwear yet and the buckwheat cakes. You have no boetry, said Lutz. True, it is yet cold, und in der city we have not many of der signs, but dear are dree kinds of beable that should always feel der approach of spring first, day are boets, lovers and poor widows. Mr. McQuirk went on his way, still possessed by the strange perturbation that he did not understand. Something was lacking to his comfort, and it made him half angry because he did not know what it was. Two blocks away he came upon a foe, one Conover, whom he was bound in honor to engage in combat. Mr. McQuirk made the attack with the characteristic suddenness and fierceness that had gained for him the endearing sobriquet of Tiger. The defense of Mr. Conover was so prompt and admirable that the conflict was protracted until the onlookers unselfishly gave the warning cry of, cheese it, the cop. The principals escaped easily by running through the nearest open doors into the communicating backyards at the rear of the houses. Mr. McQuirk emerged into another street. He stood by a lamppost for a few minutes engaged in thought and then he turned and plunged into a small notion and news shop. A red-haired young woman, eating gumdrops, came and looked freezingly at him across the ice-bound steps of the counter. Say, lady, he said, have you got a song book with this in it? Let's see how it leads off. When the springtime comes we'll wander in the dale, love. And whisper of those days of yore. I'm having a friend, explained Mr. McQuirk. Laid up with a broken leg, and he sent me after it. He's a devil for songs and poetry when he can't get out to drink. We have not, replied the young woman, with unconcealed contempt. But there is a new song out that begins this way. Let us sit together in the old armchair. And while the firelight flickers we'll be comfortable there. There will be no profit in following Mr. Tiger McQuirk through his further vagaries of that day until he comes to stand knocking at the door of Annie Maria Doyle. The goddess Easter, it seems, had guided his footsteps aright at last. Is that you now, Jimmy McQuirk, she cried, smiling through the open door, Annie Maria had never accepted the tiger. Well, whatever. Come out in the hall, said Mr. McQuirk. I want to ask your opinion of the weather, on the level. Are you crazy, sure, said Annie Maria. I am, said the tiger. They've been telling me all day there was spring in the air. Were they liars? 
or am I? Dear me, said Annie Maria, haven't you noticed it? I can almost smell the violets. And the green grass. Of course, there ain't any yet, it's just a kind of feeling, you know. That's what I'm getting at, said Mr. McQuirk. I've had it. I didn't recognize it at first. I thought maybe it was ennui, contracted the other day when I stepped above 14th Street. But the Katzenjammer I've got don't spell violets. It spells your own name, Annie Maria, and it's you I want. I go to work next Monday, and I make four dollars a day. Spiel up, old girl, do we make a team? Jimmy, sighed Annie Maria, suddenly disappearing in his overcoat, don't you see that spring is all over the world right this minute? But you yourself remember how that day ended. Beginning with so fine a promise of vernal things, late in the afternoon the air chilled and an inch of snow fell, even so late in March. On Fifth Avenue the ladies drew their winter furs close about them. Only in the florist's windows could be perceived any signs of the morning smile of the coming goddess Easter. At six o'clock her Lutz began to close his shop. He heard a well-known shout, Hello, Dutch. Tiger, McQuirk, in his shirt sleeves, with his hat on the back of his head, stood outside in the whirling snow, puffing at a black cigar. Donner Wetter. Shouted Lutz, Der Winter, he has gone back again yet. You're a liar, Dutch, called back Mr. McQuirk, with friendly geniality, it's springtime, by the watch. Ulysses and the Dogman. Do you know the time of the Dogmen? When the forefinger of twilight begins to smudge the clear-drawn lines of the big city there is inaugurated an hour devoted to one of the most melancholy sights of urban life. Out from the towering flat crags and apartment peaks of the cliff dwellers of New York steals an army of beings that were once men. Even yet they go upright upon two limbs and retain human form and speech, but you will observe that they are behind animals in progress. Each of these beings follows a dog, to which he is fastened by an artificial ligament. These men are all victims to Circe. Not willingly do they become flunkies to Fido, bellboys to bull terriers, and toddlers after Towser. Modern Circe, instead of turning them into animals, has kindly left the difference of a six-foot leash between them. Every one of those dogmen has been either cajoled, bribed, or commanded by his own particular Circe to take the dear household pet out for an airing. By their faces and manner you can tell that the dogmen are bound in a hopeless enchantment. Never will there come even a dog-catcher Ulysses to remove the spell. The faces of some are stonily set. They are past the commiseration, the curiosity, or the jeers of their fellow beings. Years of matrimony, of continuous compulsory canine constitutionals, have made them callous. They unwind their beasts from lamp posts, or the ensnared legs of profane pedestrians, with the stolidity of mandarins manipulating the strings of their kites. Others, more recently reduced to the ranks of rovers' retinue, take their medicine sulkily and fiercely. They play the dog on the end of their line with the pleasure felt by the girl out fishing when she catches a sea robin on her hook. They glare at you threateningly if you look at them, as if it would be their delight to let slip the dogs of war. These are half-mutinous dogmen, not quite circeized, and you will do well not to kick their charges, should they sniff around your ankles. Others of the tribe do not seem to feel so keenly. They are mostly unfresh youths, with gold caps and drooping cigarettes, who do not harmonize with their dogs. The animals they attend wear satin bows in their collars. And the young men steer them so assiduously that you are tempted to the theory that some personal advantage, contingent upon satisfactory service, waits upon the execution of their duties. The dogs thus personally conducted are of many varieties, but they are one in fatness, in pampered, diseased vileness of temper, in insolent, snarling capriciousness of behavior. They tug at the leash fractiously, they make leisurely nasal inventory of every door step, railing, and post. They sit down to rest when they choose. They wheeze like the winner of a Third Avenue beefsteak eating contest, they blunder clumsily into open cellars and coal holes, they lead the dogmen a merry dance. These unfortunate dry nurses of dogdom, the cur-cuddlers, 
mongrel managers, spit stalkers, poodle pullers, skyscrapers, dachshund dandlers. Terrier trailers and Pomeranian pushers of the cliff-dwelling Circes follow their charges meekly. The doggies neither fear nor respect them. Masters of the house these men whom they hold in leash may be, but they are not masters of them. From cozy corner to fire escape, from divan to dumbwaiter, Doggy's snarl easily drives this two-legged being who is commissioned to walk at the other end of his string during his outing. One twilight the dogmen came forth as usual at their Circe's pleading, guerdon, or crack of the whip. One among them was a strong man, apparently of two solid virtues for this airy vocation. His expression was melancholic, his manner depressed. He was leashed to a vile white dog, loathsomely fat, fiendishly ill-natured, gloatingly intractable toward his despised conductor. At a corner nearest to his apartment house the dogman turned down a side street, hoping for fewer witnesses to his ignominy. The surfeited beast waddled before him, panting with spleen and the labor of motion. Suddenly the dog stopped. A tall, brown, long-coated, wide-brimmed man stood like a colossus blocking the sidewalk and declaring, Well, I'm a son of a gun. Jim Barry. Breathed the dogman, with exclamation points in his voice. Sam Telfair, cried wide brim again, you ding-basted old willy Wallow, give us your hoof. Their hands clasped in the brief, tight greeting of the West that is death to the handshake microbe. You old fat rascal, continued wide brim, with a wrinkled brown smile. It's been five years since I seen you. I been in this town a week but you can't find nobody in such a place. Well, you dinged old married man, how are they coming? Something mushy and heavily soft like raised dough leaned against Jim's leg and chewed his trousers with a yeasty growl. Get to work, said Jim, and explain this yard-wide hydrophobia yearling you've throwed your lasso over. Are you the pound master of this burg? Do you call that a dog or what? I need a drink, said the dogman, dejected at the reminder of his old dog of the sea. Come on. Hard by was a cafe. Tis ever so in the big city. They sat at a table, and the bloated monster yelped and scrambled at the end of his leash to get at the cafe cat. Whiskey, said Jim to the waiter. Make it too, said the dogman. You're fatter, said Jim, and you look subjugated. I don't know about the East agreeing with you. All the boys asked me to hunt you up when I started. Sandy King, he went to the Klondike. Watson Burrell, he married the oldest Peter's girl. I made some money buying beeves, and I bought a lot of wild land up on the Little Powder. Going to fence next fall. Bill Rollins, he's gone to farming. You remember Bill, of course, he was courting Marcella, excuse me, Sam, I mean the lady you married, while she was teaching school at Prairie View. But you was the lucky man. How is Mrs. Telfair? Tsch, said the dogman, signaling the waiter, give it a name. Whiskey, said Jim. Make it too, said the dogman. She's well, he continued, after his chaser. She refused to live anywhere but in New York, where she came from. We live in a flat. Every evening at six I take that dog out for a walk. It's Marcella's pet. There never were two animals on earth, Jim, that hated one another like me and that dog does. His name's Lufkins. Marcella dresses for dinner while we're out. We eat table d'hote. Ever try one of them, Jim? No, I never, said Jim. I seen the signs, but I thought they said, table de hole. I thought it was French for pool tables. How does it taste? If you're going to be in the city for a while we will. No, sirree. I'm starting for home this evening on the 725. Like to stay longer, but I can't. I'll walk down to the ferry with you, said the dogman. The dog had bound a leg each of Jim and the chair together, and had sunk into a comatose slumber. Jim stumbled and the leash was slightly wrenched. The shrieks of the awakened beast rang for a block around. If that's your dog, said Jim, when they were on the street again, 
what's to hinder you from running that habeas corpus you've got around his neck over a limb and walking off and forgetting him? I'd never dare to, said the dogman, awed at the bold proposition. He sleeps in the bed, I sleep on a lounge. He runs howling to Marcella if I look at him. Some night, Jim, I'm going to get even with that dog. I've made up my mind to do it. I'm going to creep over with a knife and cut a hole in his mosquito bar so they can get into him. See if I don't do it. You ain't yourself, Sam Telfair. You ain't what you was once. I don't know about these cities and flats over here. With my own eyes I seen you stand off both the tillets and boys in prairie view with the brass faucet out of a molasses barrel. And I seen you rope and tie the wildest steer on little powder in thirty-nine and a half. I did, didn't I, said the other, with a temporary gleam in his eye. But that was before I was dogmatized. Does Mrs. Telfair, began Jim. Hush, said the dogman. Here's another café. They lined up at the bar. The dog fell asleep at their feet. Whiskey, said Jim. Make it two, said the dogman. I thought about you, said Jim, when I bought that wild land. I wished you was out there to help me with the stock. Last Tuesday, said the dogman, he bit me on the ankle because I asked for cream in my coffee. He always gets the cream. You'd like Prairie View now, said Jim. The boys from the roundups for fifty miles around ride in there. One corner of my pasture is in sixteen miles of the town. There's a straight forty miles of wire on one side of it. You pass through the kitchen to get to the bedroom, said the dogman, and you pass through the parlor to get to the bathroom. And you back out through the dining room to get into the bedroom so you can turn around and leave by the kitchen. And he snores and barks in his sleep, and I have to smoke in the park on account of his asthma. Don't Mrs. Telfair, began Jim. Oh, shut up, said the dogman. What is it this time? Whiskey, said Jim. Make it too, said the dogman. Well, I'll be racking along down toward the ferry, said the other. Come on, there, you mangy, turtle-backed, snake-headed, bench-legged ton and a half of soap grease, shouted the dogman, with a new note in his voice and a new hand on the leash. The dog scrambled after them, with an angry whine at such unusual language from his guardian. At the foot of 23rd Street the dogman led the way through swinging doors. Last chance, said he. Speak up. Whiskey, said Jim. Make it too, said the dogman. I don't know, said the ranchman, where I'll find the man I want to take charge of the little powder outfit. I want somebody I know something about. Finest stretch of prairie and timber you ever squinted your eye over, Sam. Now if you was. Speaking of hydrophobia, said the dogman, the other night he chewed a piece out of my leg because I knocked a fly off of Marcella's arm. It ought to be cauterized, says Marcella, and I was thinking so myself. I telephones for the doctor, and when he comes Marcella says to me, help me hold the poor dear while the doctor fixes his mouth. Oh, I hope he got no virus on any of his toofies when he bit you. Now what do you think of that? Does Mrs. Telfair, began Jim. Oh, drop it, said the dogman. Come again. Whiskey, said Jim. Make it too, said the dogman. They walked on to the ferry. The ranchman stepped to the ticket window. Suddenly the swift landing of three or four heavy kicks was heard, the air was rent by piercing canine shrieks, and a pained, outraged, lubberly. Bow-legged pudding of a dog ran frenziedly up the street alone. Ticket to Denver, said Jim. Make it too, shouted the ex-dogman, reaching for his inside pocket. The Complete Life of John Hopkins there is a saying that no man has tasted the full flavor of life until he has known poverty, love and war. The justness of this reflection commends it to the lover of condensed philosophy. The three conditions embrace about all there is in life worth knowing. A surface thinker might deem that wealth should be added to the list. Not so. When a poor man finds a long-hidden quarter-dollar that has slipped through a rip into his vest lining, 
he sounds the pleasure of life with a deeper plummet than any millionaire can hope to cast. It seems that the wise executive power that rules life has thought best to drill man in these three conditions, and none may escape all three. In rural places the terms do not mean so much. Poverty is less pinching, love is temperate, war shrinks to contests about boundary lines and the neighbor's hens. It is in the cities that our epigram gains in truth and vigor. And it has remained for one John Hopkins to crowd the experience into a rather small space of time. The Hopkins flat was like a thousand others. There was a rubber plant in one window. A flea-bitten terrier sat in the other, wondering when he was to have his day. John Hopkins was like a thousand others. He worked at twenty dollars per week in a nine-story, red-brick building at either insurance, buckles hoisting engines, caropody, loans, pulleys, boas renovated, waltz guaranteed in five lessons. Or artificial limbs. It is not for us to wring Mr. Hopkins's avocation from these outward signs that be. Mrs. Hopkins was like a thousand others. The auriferous tooth, the sedentary disposition, the Sunday afternoon wanderlust, the draft upon the delicatessen store for homemade comforts, the furor for department store markdown sales. The feeling of superiority to the lady in the third floor front who wore genuine ostrich tips and had two names over her bell. The mucilaginous hours during which she remained glued to the window sill, the vigilant avoidance of the installment man. The tireless patronage of the acoustics of the dumbwaiter shaft, all the attributes of the Gotham flat dweller were hers. One moment yet of sententiousness and the story moves. In the big city large and sudden things happen. You round a corner and thrust the rib of your umbrella into the eye of your old friend from Kootenay Falls. You stroll out to pluck a sweet William in the park, and lo! Bandits attack you, you are ambulance to the hospital you marry your nurse, are divorced, get squeezed while short on UPS and DOWNS. Stand in the breadline, marry an heiress, take out your laundry and pay your club dues, seemingly all in the wink of an eye. You travel the streets, and a finger beckons to you, a handkerchief is dropped for you, a brick is dropped upon you, the elevator cable or your bank breaks. A table d'hote or your wife disagrees with you, and fate tosses you about like cork crumbs in wine opened by an unfeed waiter. The city is a sprightly youngster, and you are red paint upon its toy, and you get licked off. John Hopkins sat, after a compressed dinner, in his glove-fitting straight-front flat. He sat upon a hornblende couch and gazed, with satiated eyes, at art brought home to the people in the shape of, the storm, tacked against the wall. Mrs. Hopkins discoursed droningly of the dinner smells from the flat across the hall. The flea-bitten terrier gave Hopkins a look of disgust, and showed a man-hating tooth. Here was neither poverty, love, nor war, but upon such barren stems may be grafted those essentials of a complete life. John Hopkins sought to inject a few raisins of conversation into the tasteless dough of existence. Putting a new elevator in at the office, he said, discarding the nominative noun, and the boss has turned out his whiskers. You don't mean it, commented Mrs. Hopkins. Mr. Whipples, continued John, wore his new spring suit down today. I liked it fine it's a gray with, he stopped, suddenly stricken by a need that made itself known to him. I believe I'll walk down to the corner and get a five-cent cigar, he concluded. John Hopkins took his hat and picked his way down the musty halls and stairs of the flat house. The evening air was mild, and the streets shrill with the careless cries of children playing games controlled by mysterious rhythms and phrases. Their elders held the doorways and steps with leisurely pipe and gossip. Paradoxically, the fire escape supported lovers in couples who made no attempt to fly the mounting conflagration they were there to fan. The corner cigar store aimed at by John Hopkins was kept by a man named Freshmayer, who looked upon the earth as a sterile promontory. Hopkins, unknown in the store, entered and called genially for his, bunch of spinach, carfare grade. This imputation deepened the pessimism of Freshmayer. But he set out a brand that came perilously near to filling the order. Hopkins bit off the roots of his purchase, and lighted up at the swinging gas jet. 
feeling in his pockets to make payment, he found not a penny there. Say, my friend, he explained, frankly, I've come out without any change. Hand you that nickel first time I pass. Joy surged in Freshmayer's heart. Here was corroboration of his belief that the world was rotten and man a peripatetic evil. Without a word he rounded the end of his counter and made earnest onslaught upon his customer. Hopkins was no man to serve as a punching bag for a pessimistic tobacconist. He quickly bestowed upon Freshmayer a Colorado Maduro eye in return for the ardent kick that he received from that dealer in goods for cash only. The impetus of the enemy's attack forced the Hopkins line back to the sidewalk. There the conflict raged. The Pacific wooden Indian, with his carven smile, was overturned, and those of the street who delighted in carnage pressed round to view the zealous joust. But then came the inevitable cop and imminent inconvenience for both the attacker and attacked. John Hopkins was a peaceful citizen, who worked at rebuses of nights in a flat, but he was not without the fundamental spirit of resistance that comes with the battle rage. He knocked the policeman into a grocer's sidewalk display of goods and gave Fresh Mayor a punch that caused him temporarily to regret that he had not made it a rule to extend a five cent line of credit to certain customers. Then Hopkins took spiritedly to his heels down the sidewalk, closely followed by the cigar dealer and the policeman, whose uniform testified to the reason in the grocer's sign that read, Eggs cheaper than anywhere else in the city. As Hopkins ran he became aware of a big, low, red, racing automobile that kept abreast of him in the street. This auto steered into the side of the sidewalk, and the man guiding it motioned to Hopkins to jump into it. He did so without slackening his speed, and fell into the turkey-red upholstered seat beside the chauffeur. The big machine, with a diminuendo cough, flew away like an albatross down the avenue into which the street emptied. The driver of the auto sped his machine without a word. He was masked beyond guess in the goggles and diabolic garb of the chauffeur. Much obliged, old man, called Hopkins, gratefully. I guess you've got sporting blood in you, all right, and don't admire the sight of two men trying to soak one. Little more and I'd have been pinched. The chauffeur made no sign that he had heard. Hopkins shrugged a shoulder and chewed at his cigar, to which his teeth had clung grimly throughout the melee. Ten minutes and the auto turned into the open carriage entrance of a noble mansion of brown stone, and stood still. The chauffeur leaped out, and said. Come quick. The lady, she will explain. It is the great honor you will have, monsieur. Ah, that milady could call upon Armand to do this thing. But, no, I am only one chauffeur. With vehement gestures the chauffeur conducted Hopkins into the house. He was ushered into a small but luxurious reception chamber. A lady, young, and possessing the beauty of visions, rose from a chair. In her eyes smoldered a becoming anger. Her high-arched, thread-like brows were ruffled into a delicious frown. Milady, said the chauffeur, bowing low, I have the honor to relate to you that I went to the house of Monsieur Long and found him to be not at home. As I came back I see this gentleman in combat against, how you say, greatest odds. He is fighting with five, ten, thirty men, gendarmes, Aussie. Yes, milady, he what you call, swat, one, three, eight policemen's. If that Monsieur Long is out I say to myself this gentleman he will serve milady so well, and I bring him here. Very well, Armand, said the lady, you may go. She turned to Hopkins. I sent my chauffeur, she said, to bring my cousin, Walter Long. There is a man in this house who has treated me with insult and abuse. I have complained to my aunt, and she laughs at me. Armand says you are brave. In these prosaic days men who are both brave and chivalrous are few. May I count upon your assistance? John Hopkins thrust the remains of his cigar into his coat pocket. He looked upon this winning creature and felt his first thrill of romance. It was a knightly love, and contained no disloyalty to the flat with the flea-bitten terrier and the lady of his choice. He had married her after a picnic of the Lady Label Stickers Union, Lodge No. 2, 
on a dare and a bet of new hats and chowder all around with his friend, Billy McManus. This angel who was begging him to come to her rescue was something too heavenly for chowder, and as for hats, golden, jeweled crowns for her. Say, said John Hopkins, just show me the guy that you've got the grouch at. I've neglected my talents as a scrapper heretofore, but this is my busy night. He is in there, said the lady, pointing to a closed door. Come. Are you sure that you do not falter or fear? Me, said John Hopkins. Just give me one of those roses in the bunch you are wearing, will you? The lady gave him a red, red rose. John Hopkins kissed it, stuffed it into his vest pocket, opened the door and walked into the room. It was a handsome library, softly but brightly lighted. A young man was there, reading. Books on etiquette is what you want to study, said John Hopkins, abruptly. Get up here, and I'll give you some lessons. Be rude to a lady, will you? The young man looked mildly surprised. Then he arose languidly, dexterously caught the arms of John Hopkins and conducted him irresistibly to the front door of the house. Beware, Ralph Branscombe, cried the lady, who had followed, what you do to the gallant man who has tried to protect me. The young man shoved John Hopkins gently out the door and then closed it. Bess, he said calmly, I wish you would quit reading historical novels. How in the world did that fellow get in here? Armand brought him, said the young lady. I think you are awfully mean not to let me have that street Bernard. I sent Armand for Walter. I was so angry with you. Be sensible, Bess, said the young man, taking her arm. That dog isn't safe. He has bitten two or three people around the kennels. Come now, let's go tell Auntie we are in good humor again. Arm in arm, they moved away. John Hopkins walked to his flat. The janitor's five-year-old daughter was playing on the steps. Hopkins gave her a nice, red rose and walked upstairs. Mrs. Hopkins was philandering with curl papers. Get your cigar. She asked, disinterestedly. Sure, said Hopkins, and I knocked around a while outside. It's a nice night. He sat upon the hornblende sofa, took out the stump of his cigar, lighted it, and gazed at the graceful figures in The Storm on the opposite wall. I was telling you, said he, about Mr. Whipple's suit. It's a gray, with an invisible check, and it looks fine. The Caliph and the Cad Surely there is no pastime more diverting than that of mingling, incognito, with persons of wealth and station. Where else but in those circles can one see life in its primitive, crude state unhampered by the conventions that bind the dwellers in a lower sphere? There was a certain caliph of Baghdad who was accustomed to go down among the poor and lowly for the solace obtained from the relation of their tales and histories. Is it not strange that the humble and poverty-stricken have not availed themselves of the pleasure they might glean by donning diamonds and silks and playing caliph among the haunts of the upper world? There was one who saw the possibilities of thus turning the tables on Haroun al raskid His name was Corny Brannigan, and he was a truck driver for a Canal Street importing firm. And if you read further you will learn how he turned Upper Broadway into Baghdad and learned something about himself that he did not know before. Many people would have called Corny a snob, preferably by means of a telephone. His chief interest in life, his chosen amusement, and his sole diversion after working hours, was to place himself in juxtaposition, since he could not hope to mingle, with people of fashion and means. Every evening after Corny had put up his team and dined at a lunch counter at made immediateness a specialty. He would clothe himself in evening raiment as correct as any you will see in the palm rooms. Then he would betake himself to that ravishing, radiant roadway devoted to Thespis, Thais, and Bacchus. For a time he would stroll about the lobbies of the best hotels, his soul steeped in blissful content. Beautiful women, cooing like doves, but feathered like birds of paradise, flicked him with their robes as they passed. Courtly gentlemen attended them, gallant and assiduous. And Corny's heart within him swelled like Sir Lancelot's, for the mirror spoke to him as he passed and said, Corny, lad, 
there's not a guy among em that looks a bit the sweller than yourself. And you drive in of a truck and them swearin' off their taxes and playin' the red in art galleries with the best in the land. And the mirrors spake the truth. Mr. Corney Brannigan had acquired the outward polish, if nothing more. Long and keen observation of polite society had gained for him its manner, its genteel air, and, most difficult of acquirement, its repose and ease. Now and then in the hotels Corney had managed conversation and temporary acquaintance with substantial, if not distinguished, guests. With many of these he had exchanged cards, and the ones he received he carefully treasured for his own use later. Leaving the hotel lobbies, Corney would stroll leisurely about, lingering at the theater entrance, dropping into the fashionable restaurants as if seeking some friend. He rarely patronized any of these places, he was no bee come to suck honey, but a butterfly flashing his wings among the flowers whose calices held no sweets for him. His wages were not large enough to furnish him with more than the outside garb of the gentleman. To have been one of the beings he so cunningly imitated, Corny Brannigan would have given his right hand. One night Corny had an adventure. After absorbing the delights of an hour's lounging in the principal hotels along Broadway, he passed up into the stronghold of Thespis. Cab drivers hailed him as a likely fare, to his prideful content. Languishing eyes were turned upon him as a hopeful source of lobsters and the delectable, ascendant globules of effervescence. These overtures and unconscious compliments Corny swallowed as manna, and hoped Bill, the off-horse, would be less lame in the left forefoot in the morning. Beneath a cluster of milky globes of electric light Corny paused to admire the sheen of his low-cut patent leather shoes. The building occupying the angle was a pretentious café. Out of this came a couple, a lady in a white, cobwebby evening gown, with a lace wrap like a wreath of mist thrown over it, and a man, tall, faultless, assured, too assured. They moved to the edge of the sidewalk and halted. Corny Sai, ever alert for, pointers, in, swell, behavior, took them in with a sidelong glance. The carriage is not here, said the lady. You ordered it to wait? I ordered it for 9.30, said the man. It should be here now. A familiar note in the lady's voice drew a more especial attention from Corny. It was pitched in a key well known to him. The soft electric shone upon her face. Sisters of Sorrow have no quarters fixed for them. In the index to the Book of Breaking Hearts you will find that Broadway follows very soon after the Bowery. This lady's face was sad, and her voice was attuned with it. They waited, as if for the carriage. Corny waited too, for it was out of doors, and he was never tired of accumulating and profiting by knowledge of gentlemanly conduct. Jack, said the lady, don't be angry. I've done everything I could to please you this evening. Why do you act so? Oh, you're an angel, said the man. Depend upon woman to throw the blame upon a man. I'm not blaming you. I'm only trying to make you happy. You go about it in a very peculiar way. You have been cross with me all the evening without any cause. Oh, there isn't any cause except, you make me tired. Corny took out his card case and looked over his collection. He selected one that read, Mr. R. Lionel White Melville, Bloomsbury Square, London. This card he had inveigled from a tourist at the King Edward Hotel. Corny stepped up to the man and presented it with a correctly formal air. May I ask why I am selected for the honor? asked the lady's escort. Now, Mr. Corny Brannigan had a very wise habit of saying little during his imitations of the Caliph of Baghdad. The advice of Lord Chesterfield, wear a black coat and hold your tongue, he believed in without having heard. But now speech was demanded and required of him. No gent, said Corny, would talk to a lady like you done. Fie upon you, Willie. Even if she happens to be your wife you ought to have more respect for your clothes than to chin her back that way. Maybe it ain't my butt in, but it goes, anyhow, you strike me as being a whole lot to the wrong. The lady's escort indulged in more elegantly expressed but fetching repartee. Corny, eschewing his truck driver's vocabulary, retorted as nearly as he could in polite phrases. 
then diplomatic relations were severed. There was a brief but lively set to with other than oral weapons, from which Corny came forth easily victor. A carriage dashed up, driven by a tardy and solicitous coachman. Will you kindly open the door for me? asked the lady. Corny assisted her to enter, and took off his hat. The escort was beginning to scramble up from the sidewalk. I beg your pardon, ma'am, said Corny, if he's your man. He's no man of mine, said the lady. Perhaps he, but there's no chance of his being now. Drive home, Michael. If you care to take this, with my thanks. Three red roses were thrust out through the carriage window into Corny's hand. He took them, and the hand for an instant, and then the carriage sped away. Corny gathered his foe's hat and began to brush the dust from his clothes. Come along, said Corny, taking the other man by the arm. His late opponent was yet a little dazed by the hard knocks he had received. Corny led him carefully into a saloon three doors away. The drinks for us, said Corny, me and my friend. You're a queer feller, said the lady's late escort, lick a man and then want to set em up. You're my best friend, said Corny exultantly. You don't understand? Well, listen. You just put me wise to something. I'd been playin' gent a long time, thinkin' it was just the glad rags I had and nothin' else. Say, you're a swell, ain't you? Well, you trot in that class, I guess. I don't, but I found out one thing, I'm a gentleman, bye, and I know it now. What'll you have to drink? The door of unrest. I sat an hour by sun, in the editor's room of the Montopolis Weekly Bugle. I was the editor. The saffron rays of the declining sunlight filtered through the cornstalks in Mikaja Widdop's garden patch, and cast an amber glory upon my pastepot. I sat at the editorial desk in my non-rotary revolving chair, and prepared my editorial against the oligarchies. The room, with its one window, was already a prey to the twilight. One by one, with my trenchant sentences, I lopped off the heads of the political hydra, while I listened, full of kindly peace. To the homecoming cowbells and wondered what Mrs. Flanagan was going to have for supper. Then in from the dusky, quiet street there drifted and perched himself upon a corner of my desk old father Time's younger brother. His face was beardless and as gnarled as an English walnut. I never saw clothes such as he wore. They would have reduced Joseph's coat to a monochrome. But the colors were not the dyers. Stains and patches and the work of sun and rust were responsible for the diversity. On his coarse shoes was the dust, conceivably, of a thousand leagues. I can describe him no further, except to say that he was little and weird and old, old I began to estimate in centuries when I saw him. Yes, and I remember that there was an odor, a faint odor like aloes, or possibly like myrrh or leather, and I thought of museums. And then I reached for a pad and pencil, for business is business, and visits of the oldest inhabitants are sacred and honorable, requiring to be chronicled. I am glad to see you, sir, I said. I would offer you a chair, but, you see, sir, I went on, I have lived in Montopolis only three weeks, and I have not met many of our citizens. I turned a doubtful eye upon his dust-stained shoes, and concluded with a newspaper phrase, I suppose that you reside in our midst. My visitor fumbled in his raiment, drew forth a soiled card, and handed it to me. Upon it was written, in plain but unsteadily formed characters, the name Mitcha Bader. I am glad you called, Mr. Ader, I said. As one of our older citizens, you must view with pride the recent growth and enterprise of Montopolis. Among other improvements, I think I can promise that the town will now be provided with a live, enterprising new spa. Do you know the name on that card? asked my caller, interrupting me. It is not a familiar one to me, I said. Again he visited the depths of his ancient vestments. This time he brought out a torn leaf of some book or journal, brown and flimsy with age. The heading of the page was the Turkish spy in old-style type, the printing upon it was this. There is a man come to Paris in this year 1643 who pretends to have lived these 1600 years. 
He says of himself that he was a shoemaker in Jerusalem at the time of the crucifixion, that his name is Michabater. And that when Jesus, the Christian Meshes, was condemned by Pontius Pilate, the Roman president, he paused to rest while bearing his cross to the place of crucifixion before the door of Michabater. The shoemaker struck Jesus with his fist, saying, Go, why tarriest thou? The Meshes answered him, I indeed am going, but thou shalt tarry until I come. Thereby condemning him to live until the day of judgment. He lives forever but at the end of every hundred years he falls into a fit or trance, on recovering from which he finds himself in the same state of youth in which he was when Jesus suffered. Being then about thirty years of age. Such is the story of the wandering Jew, as told by Michabater, who relates, here the printing ended. I must have muttered aloud something to myself about the wandering Jew, for the old man spake up, bitterly and loudly. Tis a lie, said he, like nine-tenths of what ye call history. Tis a Gentile I am, and no Jew. I am after footing it out of Jerusalem, my son, but if that makes me a Jew, then everything that comes out of a bottle is baby's milk. Ye have my name on the card ye hold. And ye have read the bit of paper they call the Turkish spy that printed the news when I stepped into their office on the twelfth day of June, in the year 1643, just as I have called upon ye today. I laid down my pencil and pad. Clearly it would not do. Here was an item for the local column of the bugle that, but it would not do. Still, fragments of the impossible, personal, began to flit through my conventionalized brain. Uncle Michib is as spry on his legs as a young chap of only a thousand or so. Our venerable caller relates with pride that George Wash, no, Ptolemy the Great, once dandled him on his knee at his father's house. Uncle Michib says that our wet spring was nothing in comparison with the dampness that ruined the crops around Mount Ararat when he was a boy, but no, no, it would not do. I was trying to think of some conversational subject with which to interest my visitor, and was hesitating between walking matches and the Pliocene age. When the old man suddenly began to weep poignantly and distressfully. Cheer up, Mr. Ader, I said, a little awkwardly this matter may blow over in a few hundred years more. There has already been a decided reaction in favor of Judas Iscariot and Colonel Burr and the celebrated violinist, Senior Nero. This is the age of whitewash. You must not allow yourself to become downhearted. Unknowingly, I had struck a chord. The old man blinked belligerently through his senile tears. Tis time, he said, that the liars be doing justice to somebody. Your historians are no more than a pack of old women gablin at a wake. A finer man than the Emperor Nero Niver wore sandals. Man, I was at the Burnin of Rome. I knowed the Emperor well, for in them days I was a well-known character. In them days they had respect for a man that lived forever. But, twas of the Emperor Nero I was going to tell ye. I struck into Rome, up the Appian Way on the night of July the 16th, the year 64. I had just stepped down by way of Siberia and Afghanistan. And one foot of me had a frostbite, and the other a blister burned by the sand of the desert. And I was feeling a bit blue from doing patrol duty from the North Pole down to the last chance corner in Patagonia, and being miscalled a Jew in the bargain. Well, I'm tellin' ye I was passin' the Circus Maximus, and it was dark as pitch over the way, and then I heard somebody sing out, Is that you, Michib? Over Aegean's the wall, hid out amongst a pile of barrels and old dry goods boxes, was the Emperor Nero with his toggy wrapped around his toes, smoking a long, black seeger. Have one, Michib? says he. None of the weeds for me, says I, neither pipe nor seeger. What's the use? says I, of smokin, when ye ve not got the ghost of a chance of killin' yeself by doin' it? True for ye, Michabater, my perpetual Jew, says the emperor, ye re not always wandering. Sure, tis danger gives the spice of our pleasures, next to their bein' forbidden. And for what, says I, do ye smoke be night in dark places without even a centurion in plain clothes to attend ye? Have ye ever heard, Michab, says the emperor, of predestinarianism? 
I've had the cousin of it, says I, I've been on the trot with pedestrianism for many a year, and more to come, as ye well know. The longer word, says me friend Nero, is the tacken of this new sect of people they call the Christians. Tis them that's responsible for me smokin' be night in holes and corners of the dark. And then I sets down and takes off a shoe and rubs me foot that is frosted, and the emperor tells me about it. It seems that since I passed that way before, the emperor had mandamus the impress with a divorce suit, and Mrs. Papia, a celebrated lady, was engaged, without references. As housekeeper at the palace. All in one day, says the emperor, she puts up new lace windy curtains in the palace and joins the anti-tobacco society. And when I feels the need of a smoke I must be after sneakin' out to these piles of lumber in the dark. So there in the dark me and the emperor sat, and I told him of me travels. And when they say the emperor was an incendiary, they lie. Twas that night the fire started that burnt the city. Tis my opinion that it began from a stump of seeger that he threw down among the boxes. And tis a lie that he fiddled. He did all he could for six days to stop it, sir. And now I detected a new flavor to Mr. Mitchabader. It had not been myrrh or balm or hyssop that I had smelled. The emanation was the odor of bad whiskey, and, worse still, of low comedy, the sort that small humorists manufacture by clothing the grave and reverend things of legend and history in the vulgar. Topical frippery that passes for a certain kind of wit. Mitch Bader as an impostor, claiming nineteen hundred years, and playing his part with the decency of respectable lunacy, I could endure. But as a tedious wag, cheapening his egregious story with songbook levity, his importance as an entertainer grew less. And then, as if he suspected my thoughts, he suddenly shifted his key. You'll excuse me, sir, he whined, but sometimes I get a little mixed in my head. I am a very old man, and it is hard to remember everything. I knew that he was right, and that I should not try to reconcile him with Roman history, so I asked for news concerning other ancients with whom he had walked familiar. Above my desk hung an engraving of Raphael's cherubs. You could yet make out their forms, though the dust blurred their outline strangely. Ye calls them cherubs, cackled the old man. Babes, ye fancy they are, with wings. And there's one with legs and a bow and arrow that ye call Cupid, I know where they was found. The great 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 grandfather of them all was a billy goat. Be in an editor, sir, do ye happen to know where Solomon's temple stood? I fancied that it was in, in Persia? Well, I did not know. Tis not in history nor in the Bible where it was. But I saw it, myself. The first pictures of cherubs and cupids was sculptured upon thin walls and pillars. Two of the biggest, sir, stood in the adytum to form the baldachin over the ark. But the wings of thin sculptures was intended for horns. And the faces was the faces of goats. Ten thousand goats there was in and about the temple. And your cherubs was billy goats in the days of King Solomon, but the painters misconstrued the horns into wings. And I knew Tamerlane, the lame Timur, sir, very well. I saw him at Keghut and at Zaranj. He was a little man no larger than yourself, with hair the color of an amber pipe stem. They buried him at Samarkand. I was at the wake, sir. Oh, he was a fine-built man in his coffin, six feet long, with black whiskers to his face. And I see M. throw turnips at the Emperor Vespasian in Africa. All over the world I have tramped, sir, without the body of me finned in any rest. Twas so commanded. I saw Jerusalem destroyed, and Pompeii go up in the fireworks. And I was at the coronation of Charlemagne and the lynchin of Joan of Arc. And everywhere I go there come storms and revolutions and plagues and fires. Twas so commanded. Ye have heard of the wandering Jew. Tis also, except that divil a bit am I a Jew. But history lies, as I have told ye. Are ye quite sure, sir, that ye haven't a drop of whiskey convenient? Ye well know that I have many miles of walking before me. I have none, said I, 
and, if you please, I am about to leave for my supper. I pushed my chair back creakingly. This ancient landlubber was becoming as great an affliction as any cross-bowed mariner. He shook a musty effluvium from his piebald clothes, overturned my inkstand, and went on with his insufferable nonsense. I wouldn't mind it so much, he complained, if it wasn't for the work I must do on Good Fridays. Ye know about Pontius Pilate, sir, of course. His body, when he killed himself, was pitched into a lake on the Alps mountains. Now, listen to the job that tis mine to perform on the night of Ivory Good Friday. The old divil goes down in the pool and drags up Pontius, and the water is bilin' and spewin' like a washpot. And the old divil sets the body on top of a throne on the rocks, and thin comes me share of the job. Oh, sir, ye would pity me thin, ye would pray for the poor wandering Jew that niver was a Jew if ye could see the horror of the thing that I must do. Tis I that must fetch a bowl of water and kneel down before it till it washes its hands. I declare to ye that Pontius Pilate, a man dead two hundred years, dragged up with the lake slime coverin' him and fishes wrigglin' inside of him without eyes, and in the discomposition of the body. Sits there, sir, and washes his hands in the bowl I hold for him on Good Fridays. Twas so commanded. Clearly, the matter had progressed far beyond the scope of the bugle's local column. There might have been employment here for the alienist or for those who circulate the pledge, but I had had enough of it. I got up, and repeated that I must go. At this he seized my coat, groveled upon my desk, and burst again into distressful weeping. Whatever it was about, I said to myself that his grief was genuine. Come now, Mr. Ader, I said, soothingly, what is the matter? The answer came brokenly through his racking sobs. Because I would not, let the poor Christ, rest, upon the step. His hallucination seemed beyond all reasonable answer, yet the effect of it upon him scarcely merited disrespect. But I knew nothing that might assuage it. And I told him once more that both of us should be leaving the office at once. Obedient at last, he raised himself from my disheveled desk, and permitted me to half lift him to the floor. The gale of his grief had blown away his words, his freshet of tears had soaked away the crust of his grief. Reminiscence died in him, at least, the coherent part of it. Twas me that did it, he muttered, as I led him toward the door, me, the shoemaker of Jerusalem. I got him to the sidewalk, and in the augmented light I saw that his face was seared and lined and warped by a sadness almost incredibly the product of a single lifetime. And then high up in the firmamental darkness we heard the clamant cries of some great, passing birds. My wandering Jew lifted his hand, with side-tilted head. The seven whistlers. He said, as one introduces well-known friends. Wild geese, said I, but I confess that their number is beyond me. They follow me everywhere, he said. Twas so commanded. What ye hear is the souls of the seven Jews that helped with the crucifixion. Sometimes they're plovers and sometimes geese, but ye'll find them always flying where I go. I stood, uncertain how to take my leave. I looked down the street, shuffled my feet, looked back again, and felt my hair rise. The old man had disappeared. And then my capillaries relaxed, for I dimly saw him footing it away through the darkness. But he walked so swiftly and silently in contrary to the gait promised by his age that my composure was not all restored, though I knew not why. That night I was foolish enough to take down some dust-covered volumes from my modest shelves. I searched Hermippus Redivis and Salathiel and the Peeps Collection in vain. And then in a book called The Citizen of the World, and in one two centuries old, I came upon what I desired. Mitchab Ader had indeed come to Paris in the year 1643, and related to the Turkish spy an extraordinary story. He claimed to be the wandering Jew, and that. But here I fell asleep, for my editorial duties had not been light that day. Judge Hoover was the bugle's candidate for Congress. Having to confer with him, I sought his home early the next morning, and we walked together downtown through a little street with which I was unfamiliar. Did you ever hear of Mitchabader? 
I asked him, smiling. Why, yes, said the judge. And that reminds me of my shoes he has for mending. Here is his shop now. Judge Hoover stepped into a dingy, small shop. I looked up at the sign, and saw, Micah Batter, Boot and Shoemaker, on it. Some wild geese passed above, hunking clearly. I scratched my ear and frowned, and then trailed into the shop. There sat my wandering Jew on his shoemaker's bench, trimming a half-sole. He was drabbled with dew, grass-stained, unkempt, and miserable. And on his face was still the unexplained wretchedness, the problematic sorrow, the esoteric woe, that had been written there by nothing less, it seemed, than the stylus of the centuries. Judge Hoover inquired kindly concerning his shoes. The old shoemaker looked up, and spoke sanely enough. He had been ill, he said, for a few days. The next day the shoes would be ready. He looked at me, and I could see that I had no place in his memory. So out we went, and on our way. Old Mike, remarked the candidate, has been on one of his sprees. He gets crazy drunk regularly once a month. But he's a good shoemaker. What is his history? I inquired. Whiskey, epitomized Judge Hoover. That explains him. I was silent, but I did not accept the explanation. And so, when I had the chance, I asked old man sellers, who browsed daily on my exchanges. Micah Batter, said he, was makin' shoes in Montopolis when I come here goin' on fifteen year ago. I guess whiskey's his trouble. Once a month he gets off the track, and stays so a week. He's got a rigmarole something about his bein' a Jew peddler that he tells everybody. Nobody won't listen to him any more. When he's sober he ain't sich a fool, he's got a sight of books in the back room of his shop that he reads. I guess you can lay all his trouble to whiskey. But again I would not. Not yet was my wandering Jew rightly construed for me. I trust that women may not be allowed a title to all the curiosity in the world. So when Montopolis's oldest inhabitant, some ninety score years younger than Mitch Abader, dropped in to acquire promulgation in print, I siphoned his perpetual trickle of reminiscence in the direction of the uninterpreted maker of shoes. Uncle Abner was the complete history of Montopolis, bound in butternut. A batter, he quavered, come here in sixty-nine. He was the first shoemaker in the place. Folks generally considers him crazy at times now. But he don't harm nobody. I suppose drinkin' upset his mind, yes, drinkin' very likely done it. It's a powerful bad thing, drinkin'. I'm an old, old man, sir, and I never see no good in drinkin'. Dot. I felt disappointment. I was willing to admit drink in the case of my shoemaker, but I preferred it as a recourse instead of a cause. Why had he pitched upon his perpetual, strange note of the wandering Jew? Why his unutterable grief during his aberration? I could not yet accept whiskey as an explanation. Did Micah Batter ever have a great loss or trouble of any kind? I asked. Let me see. About thirty year ago there was something of the kind, I recollect. Montopolis, sir, in them days used to be a mighty strict place. Well, Micah Batter had a daughter then, a right pretty girl. She was too gay a sort for Montopolis, so one day she slips off to another town and runs away with a circus. It was two years before she comes back, all fixed up in fine clothes and rings and jewelry, to see Mike. He wouldn't have nothing to do with her, so she stays around town a while, anyway. I reckon the men folks wouldn't have raised no objections, but the women egged M on to order her to leave town. But she had plenty of spunk, and told M to mind their own business. So one night they decided to run her away. A crowd of men and women drove her out of her house, and chased her with sticks and stones. She run to her father's door, Callan, for help. Mike opens it, and when he sees who it is he hits her with his fist and knocks her down and shuts the door. And then the crowd kept on chunkin' her till she run clear out of town. And the next day they finds her drowned dead in Hunter's Mill Pond. 
I mind it all now. That was thirty year ago. I leaned back in my non-rotary revolving chair and nodded gently, like a mandarin, at my paste pot. When old Mike has a spell, went on Uncle Abner, tepidly garrulous, he thinks he's the wandering Jew. He is, said I, nodding away. And Uncle Abner cackled insinuatingly at the editor's remark, for he was expecting at least a stickful in the personal notes of the bugle. The Emancipation of Billy In the old, old, square porticoed mansion, with the rye window shutters and the paint peeling off in discolored flakes, lived one of the last of the war governors. The South has forgotten the enmity of the great conflict, but it refuses to abandon its old traditions and idols. In Governor Pemberton, as he was still fondly called, the inhabitants of Elmville saw the relic of their state's ancient greatness and glory. In his day he had been a man large in the eye of his country. His state had pressed upon him every honor within its gift. And now when he was old, and enjoying a richly merited repose outside the swift current of public affairs, his townsmen loved to do him reverence for the sake of the past. The governor's decaying mansion stood upon the main street of Elmville within a few feet of its rickety paling fence. Every morning the governor would descend the steps with extreme care and deliberation, on account of his rheumatism, and then the click of his gold-headed cane would be heard as he slowly proceeded. Up the rugged brick sidewalk. He was now nearly seventy-eight, but he had grown old gracefully and beautifully. His rather long, smooth hair and flowing, parted whiskers were snow-white. His full-skirted frock-croak was always buttoned snugly about his tall, spare figure. He wore a high, well-kept silk hat, known as a plug, in Elmville, and nearly always gloves. His manners were punctilious, and somewhat overcharged with courtesy. The governor's walks up Lee Avenue, the principal street, developed in their course into a sort of memorial, triumphant procession. Everyone he met saluted him with profound respect. Many would remove their hats. Those who were honored with his personal friendship would pause to shake hands, and then you would see exemplified the genuine beau ideal Southern courtesy. Upon reaching the corner of the second square from the mansion, the governor would pause. Another street crossed the venue there, and traffic, to the extent of several farmers' wagons and a peddler's cart or two, would rage about the junction. Then the falcon eye of General Deffenbaugh would perceive the situation, and the general would hasten, with ponderous solicitude. From his office in the First National Bank building to the assistance of his old friend. When the two exchanged greetings the decay of modern manners would become accusingly apparent. The general's bulky and commanding figure would bend lissomely at a point where you would have regarded its ability to do so with incredulity. The governor would take the general's arm and be piloted safely between the hay wagons and the sprinkling cart to the other side of the street. Proceeding to the post office in the care of his friend, the esteemed statesman would there hold an informal levy among the citizens who were come for their morning mail. Here, gathering two or three prominent in law, politics, or family, the pageant would make a stately progress along the avenue, stopping at the Palace Hotel, where, perhaps, would be found upon the register the name of some guest deemed worthy of an introduction to the state's venerable and illustrious son. If any such were found, an hour or two would be spent in recalling the faded glories of the governor's long-vanished administration. On the return march the general would invariably suggest that, his excellency being no doubt fatigued, it would be wise to recuperate for a few minutes at the drug emporium of Mr. Appleby R. Fentress, an elegant gentleman, sir, one of the Chatham County Fentresses, so many of our best-blooded families have had to go into trade, sir, since the war. Mr. Appleby R. Fentress was a connoisseur in fatigue. Indeed, if he had not been, his memory alone should have enabled him to prescribe, for the majestic invasion of his pharmacy was a casual happening that had surprised him almost daily for years. Mr. Fentress knew the formula of, and possessed the skill to compound, a certain potion antagonistic to fatigue. The salient ingredient of which he described, no doubt in pharmaceutical terms, as genuine old handmade clover leaf 59, private stock. Nor did the ceremony of administering the potion ever vary. 
Mr. Fentress would first compound two of the celebrated mixtures, one for the governor, and the other for the general to sample. Then the governor would make this little speech in his high, piping, quavering voice. No, sir, not one drop until you have prepared one for yourself and join us, Mr. Fentress. Your father, sir, was one of my most valued supporters and friends during my administration, and any mark of esteem I can confer upon his son is not only a pleasure but a duty, sir. Blushing with delight at the royal condescension, the druggist would obey, and all would drink to the general's toast, the prosperity of our grand old state. Gentlemen, the memory of her glorious past, the health of her favorite son. Someone of the old guard was always at hand to escort the governor home. Sometimes the general's business duties denied him the privilege, and then Judge Broomfield or Colonel Titus, or one of the Ashford County slaughters would be on hand to perform the rite. Such were the observances attendant upon the governor's morning stroll to the post office. How much more magnificent, impressive, and spectacular, then, was the scene at public functions when the general would lead forth the silver-haired relic of former greatness. Like some rare and fragile waxwork figure, and trumpet his pristine eminence to his fellow citizens. General Deffenbaugh was the voice of Elmville. Some said he was Elmville. At any rate, he had no competitor as the mouthpiece. He owned enough stock in the Daily Banner to dictate its utterance, enough shares in the First National Bank to be the referee of its loans. And a war record that left him without a rival for first place at barbecues, school commencements, and decoration days. Besides these acquirements, he was possessed with endowments. His personality was inspiring and triumphant. Undisputed sway had molded him to the likeness of a fatted Roman emperor. The tones of his voice were not otherwise than clarion. To say that the general was public spirited would fall short of doing him justice. He had spirit enough for a dozen publics. And as a sure foundation for it all, he had a heart that was big and stanch. Yes, General Deffenbaugh was Elmville. One little incident that usually occurred during the governor's morning walk has had its chronicling delayed by more important matters. The procession was accustomed to halt before a small brick office on the avenue, fronted by a short flight of steep wooden steps. A modest tin sign over the door bore the words, William B. Pemberton, Attorney at Law. Looking inside, the general would roar, Hello, Billy, my boy. The less distinguished members of the escort would call, Morning, Billy. The governor would pipe, Good morning, William. Then a patient-looking little man with hair turning gray along the temples would come down the steps and shake hands with each one of the party. All Elmville shook hands when it met. The formalities concluded, the little man would go back to his table, heaped with law books and papers, while the procession would proceed. Billy Pemberton was, as his sign declared, a lawyer by profession. By occupation and common consent he was the son of his father. This was the shadow in which Billy lived, the pit out of which he had unsuccessfully striven for years to climb and, he had come to believe the grave in which his ambitions were destined to be buried. Filial respect and duty he paid beyond the habit of most sons, but he aspired to be known and appraised by his own deeds and worth. After many years of tireless labor he had become known in certain quarters far from Elmville as a master of the principles of the law. Twice he had gone to Washington and argued cases before the highest tribunal with such acute logic and learning that the silken gowns on the bench had rustled from the force of it. His income from his practice had grown until he was able to support his father, in the old family mansion, which neither of them would have thought of abandoning. Rickety as it was, in the comfort and almost the luxury of the old extravagant days. Yet, he remained to Elmville as only Billy Pemberton, the son of our distinguished and honored fellow townsman, ex-Governor Pemberton. Thus was he introduced at public gatherings where he sometimes spoke, haltingly and prosily, for his talents were too serious and deep for extempore brilliancy. Thus was he presented to strangers and to the lawyers who made the circuit of the courts, and so the daily banner referred to him in print. To be, the son of, was his doom. 
whatever he should accomplish would have to be sacrificed upon the altar of this magnificent but fatal parental precedence. The peculiarity and the saddest thing about Billy's ambition was that the only world he thirsted to conquer was Elmville. His nature was diffident and unassuming. National or state honors might have oppressed him. But, above all things, he hungered for the appreciation of the friends among whom he had been born and raised. He would not have plucked one leaf from the garlands that were so lavishly bestowed upon his father, he merely rebelled against having his own wreaths woven from those dried and selfsame branches. But Elmville billied and sawned him to his concealed but lasting chagrin, until at length he grew more reserved and formal and studious than ever. There came a morning when Billy found among his mail a letter from a very high source, tendering him the appointment to an important judicial position in the new island possessions of our country. The honor was a distinguished one, for the entire nation had discussed the probable recipients of these positions, and had agreed that the situation demanded only men of the highest character. Ripe learning, an evenly balanced mind. Billy could not subdue a certain exultation at this token of the success of his long and arduous labors, but, at the same time, a whimsical smile lingered around his mouth. For he foresaw in which column Elmville would place the credit. We congratulate Governor Pemberton upon the mark of appreciation conferred upon his son, Elmville rejoices with our honored citizen, Governor Pemberton, at his son's success, put her there. Billy. Judge Billy Pemberton, sir, son of our state's war hero and the people's pride. These were the phrases, printed and oral, conjured up by Billy's prophetic fancy. Grandson of his state, and stepchild to Elmville, thus had fate fixed his kinship to the body politic. Billy lived with his father in the old mansion. The two and an elderly lady, a distant relative, comprised the family. Perhaps, though, old Jeff, the governor's ancient colored body servant, should be included. Without doubt, he could have claimed the honor. There were other servants, but Thomas Jefferson Pemberton, Sa, was a member of de family. Jeff was the one Elmvillian who gave to Billy the gold of approval unmixed with the alloy of paternalism. To him, Mars William was the greatest man in Talbot County. Beaten upon though he was by the shining light that emanates from an ex-war governor, and loyal as he remained to the old regime, his faith and admiration were Billy's. As valet to a hero, and a member of the family, he may have had superior opportunities for judging. Jeff was the first one to whom Bill revealed the news. When he reached home for supper Jeff took his plug hat and smoothed it before hanging it upon the hall rack. Dar now, said the old man, I knowed it was er comin'. I knowed it was gwine ter happen. Air judge, you says, Mars William? Dem Yankees done made you er judge? It's high time, sa, day was doin', sumpen to make up for day rascality endurin' de war. I bound day holds a confab and says, lees make Mars William Pemberton er judge, and dat'll settle it. Does you have to go way down to dem Philly Pines, Mars William, or kin you judge em from here? I'd have to live there most of the time, of course, said Billy. I wonder what did Governor Gwine say, bout dat, speculated Jeff. Billy wondered too. After supper, when the two sat in the library, according to their habit, the governor smoking his clay pipe and Billy his cigar, the son dutifully confessed to having been tendered the appointment. For a long time the governor sat, smoking, without making any comment. Billy reclined in his favorite rocker, waiting, perhaps still flushed with satisfaction over the tender that had come to him, unsolicited, in his dingy little office. Above the heads of the intriguing, time-serving, clamorous multitude. At last the governor spoke, and, though his words were seemingly irrelevant, they were to the point. His voice had a note of martyrdom running through its senile quaver. My rheumatism has been growing steadily worse these past months, William. I am sorry, father, said Billy, gently. And I am nearly seventy-eight. I am getting to be an old man. I can recall the names of but two or three who were in public life during my administration. What did you say is the nature of this position that is offered you, William? A federal judgeship, father. 
I believe it is considered to be a somewhat flattering tender. It is outside of politics and wire pulling, you know. No doubt, no doubt. Few of the Pembertons have engaged in professional life for nearly a century. None of them have ever held federal positions. They have been landholders, slave owners, and planters on a large scale. One of two of the Derwents, your mother's family, were in the law. Have you decided to accept this appointment, William? I am thinking it over, said Billy, slowly, regarding the ash of his cigar. You have been a good son to me, continued the governor, stirring his pipe with the handle of a penholder. I've been your son all my life, said Billy, darkly. I am often gratified, piped the governor, betraying a touch of complacency, by being congratulated upon having a son with such sound and sterling qualities. Especially in this, our native town, is your name linked with mine in the talk of our citizens. I never knew anyone to forget the vinculum, murmured Billy, unintelligibly. Whatever prestige, pursued the parent, I may be possessed of, by virtue of my name and services to the state, has been yours to draw upon freely. I have not hesitated to exert it in your behalf whenever opportunity offered. And you have deserved it, William. You've been the best of sons. And now this appointment comes to take you away from me. I have but a few years left to live. I am almost dependent upon others now, even in walking and dressing. What would I do without you, my son? The governor's pipe dropped to the floor. A tear trickled from his eye. His voice had risen, and crumbled to a weakling falsetto, and ceased. He was an old, old man about to be bereft of a son that cherished him. Billy rose, and laid his hand upon the governor's shoulder. Don't worry, father, he said, cheerfully. I'm not going to accept. Elmville is good enough for me. I'll write tonight and decline it. At the next interchange of devoirs between the governor and General Deffenbaugh on Lee Avenue, His Excellency, with a comfortable air of self-satisfaction, spoke of the appointment that had been tendered to Billy. The general whistled. That's a plum for Billy, he shouted. Who'd have thought that Billy, but, confound it, it's been in him all the time. It's a boost for Elmville. It'll send real estate up. It's an honor to our state. It's a compliment to the South. We've all been blind about Billy. When does he leave? We must have a reception. Great Gatlings. That job's eight thousand a year. There's been a carload of lead pencils worn to Stubbs figuring on those appointments. Think of it. Our little, wood-sawing, mealy-mouthed Billy. Angel unawares doesn't begin to express it. Elmville is disgraced forever until she lines up in a hurry for ratification and apology. The venerable Moloch smiled fatuously. He carried the fire with which to consume all these tributes to Billy, the smoke of which would ascend as an incense to himself. William, said the governor, with modest pride, has declined the appointment. He refuses to leave me in my old age. He is a good son. The general swung round, and laid a large forefinger upon the bosom of his friend. Much of the general's success had been due to his dexterity in establishing swift lines of communication between cause and effect. Governor, he said, with a keen look in his big, ox-like eyes, you've been complaining to Billy about your rheumatism. My dear general, replied the governor, stiffly, my son is forty-two. He is quite capable of deciding such questions for himself. And I, as his parent, feel it my duty to state that your remark about rheumatism is a mighty poor shot from a very small bore, sir, aimed at a purely personal and private affliction. If you will allow me, retorted the general, you've afflicted the public with it for some time, and, t'was no small bore, at that. This first tiff between the two old comrades might have grown into something more serious. But for the fortunate interruption caused by the ostentatious approach of Colonel Titus and another one of the court retinue from the right county, to whom the general confided the coddled statesman and went his way. After Billy had so effectually entombed his ambitions, and taken the veil, so to speak, 
in a sonnery, he was surprised to discover how much lighter of heart and happier he felt. He realized what a long, restless struggle he had maintained, and how much he had lost by failing to cull the simple but wholesome pleasures by the way. His heart warmed now to Elmville and the friends who had refused to set him upon a pedestal. It was better, he began to think, to be Billy and his father's son, and to be hailed familiarly by cheery neighbors and grown-up playmates, than to be your honor and sit among strangers. Hearing, maybe, through the arguments of learned counsel, that old man's feeble voice crying, What would I do without you, my son? Billy began to surprise his acquaintances by whistling as he walked up the street. Others he astounded by slapping them disrespectfully upon their backs and raking up old anecdotes he had not had the time to recollect for years. Though he hammered away at his law cases as thoroughly as ever, he found more time for relaxation and the company of his friends. Some of the younger set were actually after him to join the golf club. A striking proof of his abandonment to obscurity was his adoption of a most undignified, rakish, little soft hat, reserving the plug for Sundays and state occasions. Billy was beginning to enjoy Elmville, though that irreverent burg had neglected to crown him with bay and myrtle. All the while uneventful peace pervaded Elmville. The governor continued to make his triumphal parades to the post office with the general as chief marshal, for the slight squall that had rippled their friendship had, to all indications, been forgotten by both. But one day Elmville woke to sudden excitement. The news had come that a touring presidential party would honor Elmville by a twenty-minute stop. The executive had promised a five-minute address from the balcony of the Palace Hotel. Elmville arose as one man, that man being, of course, General Deffenbaugh, to receive becomingly the chieftain of all the clans. The train with the tiny stars and stripes fluttering from the engine pilot arrived. Elmville had done her best. There were bands, flowers, carriages, uniforms, banners, and committees without end. High school girls in white frocks impeded the steps of the party with roses strewn nervously in bunches. The chieftain had seen it all before, scores of times. He could have pictured it exactly in advance, from the blue and gray speech down to the smallest rosebud. Yet his kindly smile of interest greeted Elmville's display as if it had been the only and original. In the upper rotunda of the Palace Hotel the town's most illustrious were assembled for the honor of being presented to the distinguished guests previous to the expected address. Outside, Elmville's inglorious but patriotic masses filled the streets. Here, in the hotel General Deffenbaugh was holding in reserve Elmville's trump card. Elmville knew. For the trump was a fixed one, and its lead consecrated by archaic custom. At the proper moment Governor Pemberton, beautifully venerable, magnificently antique, tall, paramount, stepped forward upon the arm of the general. Elmville watched and harked with bated breath. Never until now, when a northern president of the United States should clasp hands with ex-war Governor Pemberton would the breach be entirely closed, would the country be made one and indivisible, no north. Not much south, very little east, and no west to speak of. So Elmville excitedly scraped calcimine from the walls of the Palace Hotel with its Sunday best, and waited for the voice to speak. And Billy. We had nearly forgotten Billy. He was cast for son, and he waited patiently for his cue. He carried his plug in his hand, and felt serene. He admired his father's striking air and pose. After all, it was a great deal to be a son of a man who could so gallantly hold the position of a sinusure for three generations. General Deffenbaugh cleared his throat. Elmville opened its mouth, and squirmed. The chieftain with the kindly, fateful face was holding out his hand, smiling. Ex-war Governor Pemberton extended his own across the chasm. But what was this the general was saying? Mr. President, allow me to present to you one who has the honor to be the father of our foremost, distinguished citizen, learned and honored jurist, beloved townsman. And model Southern gentleman, the Honorable William B. Pemberton. A Harlem Tragedy. Harlem. Mrs. Fink had dropped into Mrs. Cassidy's flat one flight below. 
Ain't it a beaut? said Mrs. Cassidy. She turned her face proudly for her friend Mrs. Fink to see. One eye was nearly closed, with a great, greenish-purple bruise around it. Her lip was cut and bleeding a little and there were red finger marks on each side of her neck. My husband wouldn't ever think of doing that to me, said Mrs. Fink, concealing her envy. I wouldn't have a man, declared Mrs. Cassidy, that didn't beat me up at least once a week. Shows he thinks something of you. Say. But that last dose Jack gave me wasn't no homeopathic one. I can see stars yet. But he'll be the sweetest man in town for the rest of the week to make up for it. This eye is good for theater tickets and a silk shirt waist at the very least. I should hope, said Mrs. Fink, assuming complacency, that Mr. Fink is too much of a gentleman ever to raise his hand against me. Oh, go on, Maggie. Said Mrs. Cassidy, laughing and applying which Hazel, you're only jealous. Your old man is too frappéd and slow to ever give you a punch. He just sits down and practices physical culture with a newspaper when he comes home, now ain't that the truth? Mr. Fink certainly peruses of the papers when he comes home, acknowledged Mrs. Fink, with a toss of her head. But he certainly don't ever make no Steve O'Donnell out of me just to amuse himself, that's a sure thing. Mrs. Cassidy laughed the contented laugh of the guarded and happy matron. With the air of Cornelia exhibiting her jewels, she drew down the collar of her kimono and revealed another treasured bruise, maroon-colored, edged with olive and orange, a bruise now nearly well. But still to memory dear. Mrs. Fink capitulated. The formal light in her eye softened to envious admiration. She and Mrs. Cassidy had been chums in the downtown paper box factory before they had married, one year before. Now she and her man occupied the flat above Mame and her man. Therefore she could not put on airs with Mame. Don't it hurt when he soaks you? asked Mrs. Fink, curiously. Hurt. Mrs. Cassidy gave a soprano scream of delight. Well, say, did you ever have a brick house fall on you? Well, that's just the way it feels, just like when they're digging you out of the ruins. Jack's got a left that spells two matinees and a new pair of Oxfords, and his right, well, it takes a trip to Coney and six pairs of openwork, silk lisle threads to make that good. But what does he beat you for, inquired Mrs. Fink, with wide-open eyes. Silly, said Mrs. Cassidy, indulgently. Why, because he's full. It's generally on Saturday nights. But what cause do you give him, persisted the seeker after knowledge. Why, didn't I marry him? Jack comes and tanked up, and I'm here, ain't I? Who else has he got a right to beat? I'd just like to catch him once beating anybody else. Sometimes it's because supper ain't ready, and sometimes it's because it is. Jack ain't particular about causes. He just lushes till he remembers he's married, and then he makes for home and does me up. Saturday nights I just move the furniture with sharp corners out of the way, so I won't cut my head when he gets his work in. He's got a left swing that jars you. Sometimes I take the count in the first round, but when I feel like having a good time during the week or want some new rags I come up again for more punishment. That's what I done last night. Jack knows I've been wanting a black silk waist for a month, and I didn't think just one black I would bring it. Tell you what, Mag, I'll bet you the ice cream he brings it tonight. Mrs. Fink was thinking deeply. My Mart, she said, never hit me a lick in his life. It's just like you said, Mame, he comes in grouchy and ain't got a word to say. He never takes me out anywhere. He's a chairwarmer at home for fair. He buys me things, but he looks so glum about it that I never appreciate M. Mrs. Cassidy slipped an arm around her chum. You poor thing, she said. But everybody can't have a husband like Jack. Marriage wouldn't be no failure if they was all like him. These discontented wives you hear about, what they need is a man to come home and kick their slats in once a week, and then make it up in kisses, and chocolate creams. That'd give M some interest in life. What I want is a masterful man that slugs you when he's jagged and hugs you when he ain't jagged. 
preserve me from the man that ain't got the sand to do neither. Mrs. Fink sighed. The hallways were suddenly filled with sound. The door flew open at the kick of Mr. Cassidy. His arms were occupied with bundles. Mame flew and hung about his neck. Her sound eye sparkled with the love light that shines in the eye of the Maori maid when she recovers consciousness in the hut of the wooer who has stunned and dragged her there. Hello, old girl! shouted Mr. Cassidy. He shed his bundles and lifted her off her feet in a mighty hug. I got tickets for Barnum and Bailey's, and if you'll bust the string of one of them bundles I guess you'll find that silk waist, why, good evening, Mrs. Fink, I didn't see you at first. How's old Mark coming along? He's very well, Mr. Cassidy, thanks, said Mrs. Fink. I must be going along up now. Mart'll be home for supper soon. I'll bring you down that pattern you wanted tomorrow, Mame. Mrs. Fink went up to her flat and had a little cry. It was a meaningless cry, the kind of cry that only a woman knows about, a cry from no particular cause, altogether an absurd cry. The most transient and the most hopeless cry in the repertory of grief. Why had Martin never thrashed her? He was as big and strong as Jack Cassidy. Did he not care for her at all? He never quarreled, he came home and lounged about, silent, glum, idle. He was a fairly good provider, but he ignored the spices of life. Mrs. Fink's ship of dreams was becalmed. Her captain ranged between Plum Duff and his hammock. If only he would shiver his timbers or stamp his foot on the quarterdeck now and then. And she had thought to sail so merrily, touching at ports in the delectable isles. But now, to vary the figure, she was ready to throw up the sponge, tired out, without a scratch to show for all those tame rounds with her sparring partner. For one moment she almost hated Mame, Mame, with her cuts and bruises, her salve of presents and kisses, her stormy voyage with her fighting, brutal, loving mate. Mr. Fink came home at seven. He was permeated with the curse of domesticity. Beyond the portals of his cozy home he cared not to roam, to roam. He was the man who had caught the street car, the anaconda that had swallowed its prey, the tree that lay as it had fallen. Like the supper, Mart, asked Mrs. Fink, who had striven over it. Mm yep, grunted Mr. Fink. After supper he gathered his newspapers to read. He sat in his stocking feet. Arise, some new Dante and sing me the befitting corner of perdition for the man who sitteth in the house in his stockinged feet. Sisters of patience who by reason of ties or duty have endured it in silk, yarn, cotton, lyle thread or woolen, does not the new canto belong? The next day was Labor Day. The occupations of Mr. Cassidy and Mr. Fink ceased for one passage of the sun. Labor, triumphant, would parade and otherwise disport itself. Mrs. Fink took Mrs. Cassidy's pattern down early. Mame had on her new silk waist. Even her damaged eye managed to emit a holiday gleam. Jack was fruitfully penitent, and there was a hilarious scheme for the day afoot, with parks and picnics and pilsner in it. A rising, indignant jealousy seized Mrs. Fink as she returned to her flat above. Oh, happy Mame, with her bruises and her quick-following balm. But was Mame to have a monopoly of happiness? Surely Martin Fink was as good a man as Jack Cassidy. Was his wife to go always unbelabored and uncaressed? A sudden, brilliant, breathless idea came to Mrs. Fink. She would show Mame that there were husbands as able to use their fists and perhaps to be as tender afterward as any Jack. The holiday promised to be a nominal one with the Finks. Mrs. Fink had the stationary washtubs in the kitchen filled with a two-weeks wash that had been soaking overnight. Mr. Fink sat in his stockinged feet reading a newspaper. Thus Labor Day presaged to speed. Jealousy surged high in Mrs. Fink's heart, and higher still surged an audacious resolve. If her man would not strike her, if he would not so far prove his manhood, his prerogative and his interest in conjugal affairs, he must be prompted to his duty. Mr. Fink lit his pipe and peacefully rubbed an ankle with a stocking toe. 
he reposed in the state of matrimony like a lump of unblended suet in a pudding. This was his level Elysium, to sit at ease vicariously girdling the world in print amid the wifely splashing of suds and the agreeable smells of breakfast dishes departed and dinner ones to come. Many ideas were far from his mind, but the furthest one was the thought of beating his wife. Mrs. Fink turned on the hot water and set the washboards in the suds. Up from the flat below came the gay laugh of Mrs. Cassidy. It sounded like a taunt, a flaunting of her own happiness in the face of the unslugged bride above. Now was Mrs. Fink's time. Suddenly she turned like a fury upon the man reading. You lazy loafer, she cried, must I work my arms off washing and toiling for the ugly likes of you? Are you a man or are you a kitchen hound? Mr. Fink dropped his paper, motionless from surprise. She feared that he would not strike, that the provocation had been insufficient. She leaped at him and struck him fiercely in the face with her clenched hand. In that instant she felt a thrill of love for him such as she had not felt for many a day. Rise up, Martin Fink, and come into your kingdom. Oh, she must feel the weight of his hand now, just to show that he cared, just to show that he cared. Mr. Fink sprang to his feet. Maggie caught him again on the jaw with a wide swing of her other hand. She closed her eyes in that fearful, blissful moment before his blow should come, she whispered his name to herself, she leaned to the expected shock, hungry for it. In the flat below Mr. Cassidy, with a shamed and contrite face was powdering Mame's eye in preparation for their junket. From the flat above came the sound of a woman's voice, high raised, a bumping, a stumbling and a shuffling, a chair overturned, unmistakable sounds of domestic conflict. Mart and Mag scrapping? Postulated Mr. Cassidy. Didn't know they ever indulged. Shall I trot up and see if they need a sponge holder? One of Mrs. Cassidy's eyes sparkled like a diamond. The other twinkled at least like paste. Oh, oh, she said, softly and without apparent meaning, in the feminine ejaculatory manner. I wonder if, wonder if. Wait, Jack, till I go up and see. Up the stairs she sped. As her foot struck the hallway above out from the kitchen door of her flat wildly flounced Mrs. Fink. Oh, Maggie, cried Mrs. Cassidy, in a delighted whisper, did he? Oh, did he? Mrs. Fink ran and laid her face upon her chum's shoulder and sobbed hopelessly. Mrs. Cassidy took Maggie's face between her hands and lifted it gently. Tear-stained it was, flushing and paling, but its velvety, pink and white, becomingly freckled surface was unscratched, unbruised, unmarred by the recreant fist of Mr. Fink. Tell me, Maggie, pleaded Mame, or I'll go in there and find out. What was it? Did he hurt you, what did he do? Mrs. Fink's face went down again despairingly on the bosom of her friend. For God's sake don't open that door, Mame, she sobbed. And don't ever tell nobody, keep it under your hat. He, he never touched me, and, he's, oh, God, he's washin', the clothes, he's washin', the clothes. Doherty's eye-opener. Big Jim Doherty was a sport. He belonged to that race of men. In Manhattan it is a distinct race. They are the Caribs of the North, strong, artful, self-sufficient, clannish, honorable within the laws of their race. Holding in lenient contempt neighboring tribes who bow to the measure of society's tape line. I refer, of course, to the titled nobility of sportdom. There is a class which bears as a qualifying adjective the substantive belonging to a wind instrument made of a cheap and base metal. But the tin mines of Cornwall never produced the material for manufacturing descriptive nomenclature for Big Jim Doherty. The habitat of the sport is the lobby or the outside corner of certain hotels and combination restaurants and cafes. They are mostly men of different sizes, running from small to large. But they are unanimous in the possession of a recently shaven, blue-black cheek and chin and dark overcoats, in season, with black velvet collars. Of the domestic life of the sport little is known. It has been said that Cupid and Hymen sometimes take a hand in the game and copper the Queen of Hearts to lose. 
Daring theorists have averred, not content with simply saying, that a sport often contracts a spouse, and even incurs descendants. Sometimes he sits in the game of politics. And then at chowder picnics there is a revelation of a Mrs. Sport and Little Sports in glazed hats with tin pails. But mostly the sport is oriental. He believes his womenfolk should not be too patent. Somewhere behind grills or flower-ornamented fire escapes they await him. There, no doubt, they tread on rugs from Tehran and are diverted by the bulbul and play upon the dulcimer and feed upon sweetmeats. But away from his home the sport is an integer. He does not, as men of other races in Manhattan do, become the convoy in his unoccupied hours of fluttering laces and high heels that tick off delectably the happy seconds of the evening parade. He herds with his own race at corners, and delivers a commentary in his carib lingo upon the passing show. Big Jim Doherty had a wife, but he did not wear a button portrait of her upon his lapel. He had a home in one of those brownstone, iron-railed streets on the west side that looked like a recently excavated bowling alley of Pompeii. To this home of his Mr. Doherty repaired each night when the hour was so late as to promise no further diversion in the arch domains of sport. By that time the occupant of the monogamistic harem would be in dreamland, the bulbul silenced and the hour propitious for slumber. Big Jim always arose at twelve, meridian, for breakfast, and soon afterward he would return to the rendezvous of his, crowd. He was always vaguely conscious that there was a Mrs. Doherty. He would have received without denial the charge that the quiet, neat, comfortable little woman across the table at home was his wife. In fact, he remembered pretty well that they had been married for nearly four years. She would often tell him about the cute tricks of Spot, the canary, and the light-haired lady that lived in the window of the flat across the street. Big Jim Doherty even listened to this conversation of hers sometimes. He knew that she would have a nice dinner ready for him every evening at seven when he came for it. She sometimes went to matinees, and she had a talking machine with six dozen records. Once when her uncle Amos blew in on a wind from upstate, she went with him to the Eden Musee. Surely these things were diversions enough for any woman. One afternoon Mr. Doherty finished his breakfast, put on his hat and got away fairly for the door. When his hand was on the knob he heard his wife's voice. Jim, she said, firmly, I wish you would take me out to dinner this evening. It has been three years since you have been outside the door with me. Big Jim was astounded. She had never asked anything like this before. It had the flavor of a totally new proposition. But he was a game sport. All right, he said. You be ready when I come at seven. None of this wait two minutes till I primp an hour or two kind of business, now, Delhi. I'll be ready, said his wife, calmly. At seven she descended the stone steps in the Pompeian bowling alley at the side of Big Jim Doherty. She wore a dinner gown made of a stuff that the spiders must have woven, and of a color that a twilight sky must have contributed. A light coat with many admirably unnecessary capes and adorably inutile ribbons floated downward from her shoulders. Fine feathers do make fine birds. And the only reproach in the saying is for the man who refuses to give up his earnings to the ostrich tip industry. Big Jim Doherty was troubled. There was a being at his side whom he did not know. He thought of the sober-hued plumage that this bird of paradise was accustomed to wear in her cage, and this winged revelation puzzled him. In some way she reminded him of the Delia Cullen that he had married four years before. Shyly and rather awkwardly he stalked at her right hand. After dinner I'll take you back home, Delhi, said Mr. Doherty, and then I'll drop back up to Seltzer's with the boys. You can have swell chuck tonight if you want it. I made a winning on Anaconda yesterday, so you can go as far as you like. Mr. Doherty had intended to make the outing with his unwanted wife an inconspicuous one. Uxoriousness was a weakness that the precepts of the Caribs did not countenance. If any of his friends of the track, the billiard cloth or the square circle had wives they had never complained of the fact in public. There were a number of table d'hote places on the cross streets near the broad and shining way. And to one of these he had purposed to escort her, 
so that the bushel might not be removed from the light of his domesticity. But while on the way Mr. Doherty altered those intentions. He had been casting stealthy glances at his attractive companion and he was seized with the conviction that she was no selling plater. He resolved to parade with his wife past Seltzer's Café, where at this time a number of his tribe would be gathered to view the daily evening procession. Yes. And he would take her to dine at Hoogley's, the swellest slow lunch warehouse on the line, he said to himself. The congregation of smooth-faced tribal gentlemen were on watch at Seltzer's. As Mr. Doherty and his reorganized Delia passed they stared, momentarily petrified. And then removed their hats, a performance as unusual to them as was the astonishing innovation presented to their gaze by Big Jim. On the latter gentleman's impassive face there appeared a slight flicker of triumph, a faint flicker. No more to be observed than the expression called there by the draft of Little Casino to a four-card spade flush. Hoogley's was animated. Electric lights shone as, indeed, they were expected to do. And the napery, the glassware, and the flowers also meritoriously performed the spectacular duties required of them. The guests were numerous, well-dressed and gay. A waiter, not necessarily obsequious, conducted Big Jim Doherty and his wife to a table. Play that menu straight across for what you like, Delhi, said Big Jim. It's you for a trough of the gilded oats tonight. It strikes me that maybe we've been sticking too fast to home fodder. Big Jim's wife gave her order. He looked at her with respect. She had mentioned truffles, and he had not known that she knew what truffles were. From the wine list she designated an appropriate and desirable brand. He looked at her with some admiration. She was beaming with the innocent excitement that woman derives from the exercise of her gregariousness. She was talking to him about a hundred things with animation and delight. And as the meal progressed her cheeks, colorless from a life indoors, took on a delicate flush. Big Jim looked around the room and saw that none of the women there had her charm. And then he thought of the three years she had suffered immurement, uncomplaining, and a flush of shame warmed him, for he carried fair play as an item in his creed. But when the Honorable Patrick Corrigan, leader in Doherty's district and a friend of his, saw them and came over to the table, matters got to the three-quarter stretch. The Honorable Patrick was a gallant man, both in deeds and words. As for the Blarney Stone, his previous actions toward it must have been pronounced. Heavy damages for breach of promise could surely have been obtained had the Blarney Stone seen fit to sue the Honorable Patrick. Jimmy, old man, he called, he clapped Doherty on the back. He shone like a midday sun upon Delia. Honorable Mr. Corrigan, Mrs. Doherty, said Big Jim. The Honorable Patrick became a fountain of entertainment and admiration. The waiter had to fetch a third chair for him, he made another at the table, and the wine glasses were refilled. You selfish old rascal! He exclaimed, shaking an arch finger at Big Jim, to have kept Mrs. Doherty a secret from us. And then Big Jim Doherty, who was no talker, sat dumb, and saw the wife who had dined every evening for three years at home, blossom like a fairy flower. Quick, witty, charming, full of light and ready talk, she received the experienced attack of the Honorable Patrick on the field of repartee and surprised, vanquished, delighted him. She unfolded her long-closed petals and around her the room became a garden. They tried to include Big Jim in the conversation, but he was without a vocabulary. And then a stray bunch of politicians and good fellows who lived for sport came into the room. They saw Big Jim and the leader and over they came and were made acquainted with Mrs. Doherty. And in a few minutes she was holding a salon. Half a dozen men surrounded her, courtiers all, and six found her capable of charming. Big Jim sat, grim, and kept saying to himself, three years, three years. The dinner came to an end. The Honorable Patrick reached for Mrs. Doherty's cloak. But that was a matter of action instead of words, and Doherty's big hand got it first by two seconds. While the farewells were being said at the door the Honorable Patrick smote Doherty mightily between the shoulders. Jimmy, me boy, he declared, 
in a giant whisper, the madam is a jewel of the first water. Yiri a lucky dog. Big Jim walked homeward with his wife. She seemed quite as pleased with the lights and show windows in the streets as with the admiration of the men in Hooglies. As they passed seltzers they heard the sound of many voices in the café. The boys would be starting the drinks around now and discussing past performances. At the door of their home Delia paused. The pleasure of the outing radiated softly from her countenance. She could not hope for Jim of evenings, but the glory of this one would lighten her lonely hours for a long time. Thank you for taking me out, Jim, she said, gratefully. You'll be going back up to Seltzer's now, of course. Two, with Seltzer's, said Big Jim, emphatically. And D, Pat Corrigan. Does he think I haven't got any eyes? And the door closed behind both of them. The Rubber Plant Story We rubber plants form the connecting link between the vegetable kingdom and the decorations of a Waldorf Astoria scene in a Third Avenue theater. I haven't looked up our family tree, but I believe we were raised by grafting a gum overshoe on to a 30-cent table d'oat stalk of asparagus. You take a white bulldog with a Burt Cochran air of independence about him and a rubber plant and there you have the fauna and flora of a flat. What the shamrock is to Ireland the rubber plant is to the dweller in flats and furnished rooms. We get moved from one place to another so quickly that the only way we can get our picture taken is with a kinetoscope. We are the vagrant vine and the flitting fig tree. You know the proverb where the rubber plant sits in the window the moving van draws up to the door. We are the city equivalent to the woodbine and the honeysuckle. No other vegetable except the Pittsburgh stogie can withstand as much handling as we can. When the family to which we belong moves into a flat they set us in the front window and we become Lara's and Panades, flypaper and the peripatetic emblem of home sweet home. We aren't as green as we look. I guess we are about what you would call the soubrettes of the conservatory. You try sitting in the front window of a $40 flat in Manhattan and looking out into the street all day, and back into the flat at night, and see whether you get wise or not, hey? Talk about the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden, say. Suppose there had been a rubber plant there when Eve, but I was going to tell you a story. The first thing I can remember I had only three leaves and belonged to a member of the Pony Ballet. I was kept in a sunny window, and was generally watered with seltzer and lemon. I had plenty of fun in those days. I got cross-eyed trying to watch the numbers of the automobiles in the street and the dates on the labels inside at the same time. Well, then the angel that was molting for the musical comedy lost his last feather and the company broke up. The ponies trotted away and I was left in the window ownerless. The janitor gave me to a refined comedy team on the eighth floor, and in six weeks I had been set in the window of five different flats I took on experience and put out two more leaves. Miss Carruthers, of the refined comedy team, did you ever see her cross both feet back of her neck, gave me to a friend of hers who had made an unfortunate marriage with a man in a store. Consequently I was placed in the window of a furnished room, rent in advance, water two flights up, gas extra after ten o'clock at night. Two of my leaves withered off here. Also, I was moved from one room to another so many times that I got to liking the odor of the pipes the expressmen smoked. I don't think I ever had so dull a time as I did with this lady. There was never anything amusing going on inside, she was devoted to her husband, and, besides leaning out the window and flirting with the iceman, she never did a thing toward breaking the monotony. When the couple broke up they left me with the rest of their goods at a second-hand store. I was put out in front for sale along with the jobbiest lot you ever heard of being lumped into one bargain. Think of this little cornucopia of wonders, all for $1.89, Henry James's works, six talking machine records, one pair of tennis shoes, two bottles of horseradish, and a rubber plant, that was me. One afternoon a girl came along and stopped to look at me. She had dark hair and eyes, and she looked slim, and sat around the mouth. Oh, oh, she says to herself. I never thought to see one up here. She pulls out a little purse about as thick as one of my leaves and fingers over some small silver in it. 
Old Coon, always on the lockout, is ready, rubbing his hands. This girl proceeds to turn down Mr. James and the other commodities. Rubber plants or nothing is the burden of her song. And at last Coon and she come together at thirty-nine cents, and away she goes with me in her arms. She was a nice girl, but not my style. Too quiet and sober looking. Thinks I to myself, I'll just about land on the fire escape of a tenement, six stories up. And I'll spend the next six months looking at clothes on the line. But she carried me to a nice little room only three flights up in quite a decent street. And she put me in the window, of course. And then she went to work and cooked dinner for herself. And what do you suppose she had? Bread and tea and a little dab of jam. Nothing else. Not a single lobster, nor so much as one bottle of champagne. The Carruthers comedy team had both every evening, except now and then when they took a notion for pig's knuckle and kraut. After she had finished her dinner my new owner came to the window and leaned down close to my leaves and cried softly to herself for a while. It made me feel funny. I never knew anybody to cry that way over a rubber plant before. Of course, I've seen a few of them turn on the tears for what they could get out of it, but she seemed to be crying just for the pure enjoyment of it. She touched my leaves like she loved M, and she bent down her head and kissed each one of M. I guess I'm about the toughest specimen of a peripatetic orchid on earth, but I tell you it made me feel sort of queer. Home never was like that to me before. Generally I used to get chewed by poodles and have shirtwaists hung on me to dry, and get watered with coffee grounds and peroxide of hydrogen. This girl had a piano in the room, and she used to disturb it with both hands while she made noises with her mouth for hours at a time. I suppose she was practicing vocal music. One day she seemed very much excited and kept looking at the clock. At eleven somebody knocked and she let in a stout, dark man with toast-led black hair. He sat down at once at the piano and played while she sang for him. When she finished she laid one hand on her bosom and looked at him. He shook his head, and she leaned against the piano. Two years already, she said, speaking slowly, do you think in two more, or even longer? The man shook his head again. You waste your time, he said, roughly I thought. The voice is not there. And then he looked at her in a peculiar way. But the voice is not everything, he went on. You have looks. I can place you, as I told you if. The girl pointed to the door without saying anything, and the dark man left the room. And then she came over and cried around me again. It's a good thing I had enough rubber in me to be waterproof. About that time somebody else knocked at the door. Thank goodness, I said to myself. Here's a chance to get the waterworks turned off. I hope it's somebody that's game enough to stand a bird and a bottle to liven things up a little. Tell you the truth, this little girl made me tired. A rubber plant likes to see a little sport now and then. I don't suppose there's another green thing in New York that sees as much of gay life unless it's the chartreuse or the sprigs of parsley around the dish. When the girl opens the door and steps a young chap in a traveling cap and picks her up in his arms, and she sings out, oh, dick. And stays there long enough to, well, you've been a rubber plant too, sometimes, I suppose. Good thing, says I to myself. This is livelier than scales and weeping. Now there'll be something doing. You've got to go back with me, says the young man. I've come two thousand miles for you. Aren't you tired of it yet? Bess? You've kept all of us waiting so long. Haven't you found out yet what is best? The bubble burst only today, says the girl. Come here, Dick, and see what I found the other day on the sidewalk for sale. She brings him by the hand and exhibits yours truly. How one ever got away up here who can tell? I bought it with almost the last money I had. He looked at me but he couldn't keep his eyes off her for more than a second. Do you remember the night, Bess, he said, when we stood under one of those on the bank of the bayou and what you told me then? Gulikins. I said to myself. 
both of them stand under a rubber plant. Seems to me they are stretching matters somewhat. Do I not, says she, looking up at him and sneaking close to his vest, and now I say it again, and it is to last forever. Look, Dick, at its leaves, how wet they are. Those are my tears, and it was thinking of you that made them fall. The dear old magnolias, says the young man, pinching one of my leaves. I love them all. Magnolia. Well, wouldn't that, say? Those innocents thought I was a magnolia. What the, well, wasn't that tough on a genuine little old New York rubber plant? The gold that glittered. A story with a moral appended is like the bill of a mosquito. It bores you, and then injects a stinging drop to irritate your conscience. Therefore let us have the moral first and be done with it. All is not gold that glitters, but it is a wise child that keeps the stopper in his bottle of testing acid. Where Broadway skirts the corner of the square presided over by George the Voracious is the little Rialto. Here stand the actors of that quarter, and this is their shibboleth, knit, says I to Froman, you can't touch me for a kopeck less than two fifty per, and out I walks. Westward and southward from the thespian glare are one or two streets where a Spanish-American colony has huddled for a little tropical warmth in the nipping north. The center of life in this precinct is, El Refugio, a café and restaurant that caters to the volatile exiles from the south. Up from Chile, Bolivia, Colombia, the rolling republics of Central America and the ireful islands of the western Indies flit the cloaked and sombreroed seniors who are scattered like burning lava by the political eruptions of their several countries. Hither they come to lay counterplots, to bide their time, to solicit funds, to enlist filibusterers, to smuggle out arms and ammunitions, to play the game at long taw. In El Refugio, they find the atmosphere in which they thrive. In the restaurant of El Refugio are served compounds delightful to the palate of the man from Capricorn or Cancer. Altruism must halt the story thus long. On, diner, weary of the culinary subterfuges of the Gallic chef, hie thee to El Refugio. There only will you find a fish, bluefish, shad or pompano from the gulf, baked after the Spanish method. Tomatoes give it color, individuality, and soul. Chile Colorado bestows upon its zest, originality, and fervor, unknown herbs furnish piquancy and mystery, and, but its crowning glory deserves a new sentence. Around it, above it, beneath it, in its vicinity, but never in it, hovers an ethereal aura, an effluvium so rarefied and delicate that only the Society for Psychical Research could note its origin. Do not say that garlic is in the fish at El Refugio. It is not otherwise than as if the spirit of garlic, flitting past, has wafted one kiss that lingers in the parsley crown dish as haunting as those kisses in life by hopeless fancy feigned on lips that are for others. And then, when Conchito, the waiter, brings you a plate of brown frijoles and a carafe of wine that has never stood still between Oporto and El Refugio, ah, Dios! One day a Hamburg American liner deposited upon Pier No. 55 General Perico Ziminish Villa Blanca Falcon, a passenger from Cartagena. The general was between a clay bank and a bay in complexion, had a forty-two-inch waist and stood five feet four with his dewberry heels. He had the mustache of a shooting gallery proprietor, he wore the full dress of a Texas congressman and had the important aspect of an uninstructed delegate. Jen. Falcon had enough English under his hat to enable him to inquire his way to the street in which El Refugio stood. When he reached that neighborhood he saw a sign before a respectable red-brick house that read, Hotel Español. In the window was a card in Spanish, Acquiesce habla español. The general entered, sure of a congenial port. In the cozy office was Mrs. O'Brien, the proprietress. She had blonde, oh, unimpeachably blonde hair. For the rest she was amiability, and ran largely to inches around. Jen. Falcon brushed the floor with his broad-brimmed hat, and emitted a quantity of Spanish, the syllables sounding like firecrackers gently popping their way down the string of a bunch. Spanish or Dago? asked Mrs. O'Brien, pleasantly. I am a Colombian, madam, said the general, 
proudly. I speak the Spanish. The advisement in your window say the Spanish he is spoken here. How is that? Well, you've been speaking it, ain't you, said the madam. I'm sure I can't. At the Hotel Espanol General Falcon engaged rooms and established himself. At dusk he sauntered out upon the streets to view the wonders of this roaring city of the north. As he walked he thought of the wonderful golden hair of Madame O'Brien. It is here, said the general to himself, no doubt in his own language, that one shall find the most beautiful senoras in the world. I have not in my Columbia viewed among our beauties one so fair. But no. It is not for the General Falcon to think of beauty. It is my country that claims my devotion. At the corner of Broadway and the little Rialto the general became involved. The streetcars bewildered him, and the fender of one upset him against a pushcart laden with oranges. A cab driver missed him an inch with a hub, and poured barbarous execrations upon his head. He scrambled to the sidewalk and skipped again in terror when the whistle of a peanut roaster puffed a hot scream in his ear. Valgame Dios! What devil city is this? As the general fluttered out of the streamers of passers like a wounded snipe he was marked simultaneously as game by two hunters. One was Bully Maguire, whose system of sport required the use of a strong arm and the misuse of an eight-inch piece of lead pipe. The other nimrod of the asphalt was Spider, Kelly, a sportsman with more refined methods. In pouncing upon their self-evident prey, Mr. Kelly was a shade the quicker. His elbow fended accurately the onslaught of Mr. Maguire. Guan, he commanded harshly. I saw it first. Maguire slunk away, awed by superior intelligence. Pardon me, said Mr. Kelly, to the general, but you got balled up in the shuffle didn't you? Let me assist you. He picked up the general's hat and brushed the dust from it. The ways of Mr. Kelly could not but succeed. The general, bewildered and dismayed by the resounding streets, welcomed his deliverer as a caballero with a most disinterested heart. I have a desire, said the general, to return to the hotel of O'Brien, in which I am stop. Carumba. Senor, there is a loudness and rapidness of going and coming in the city of this Nueva York. Mr. Kelly's politeness would not suffer the distinguished Colombian to brave the dangers of the return unaccompanied. At the door of the Hotel Espanol they paused. A little lower down on the opposite side of the street shone the modest illuminated sign of El Refugio. Mr. Kelly, to whom few streets were unfamiliar, knew the place exteriorly as a Dago joint. All foreigners Mr. Kelly classed under the two heads of Dagos and Frenchmen. He proposed to the general that they repair thither and substantiate their acquaintance with a liquid foundation. An hour later found General Falcon and Mr. Kelly seated at a table in the conspirators' corner of El Refugio. Bottles and glasses were between them. For the tenth time the general confided the secret of his mission to the Estados Unidos. He was here, he declared, to purchase arms, 2,000 stands of Winchester rifles, for the Colombian revolutionists. He had drafts in his pocket drawn by the Cartagena Bank on its New York correspondent for $25,000. At other tables other revolutionists were shouting their political secrets to their fellow plotters. But none was as loud as the general. He pounded the table, he hallooed for some wine, he roared to his friend that his errand was a secret one, and not to be hinted at to a living soul. Mr. Kelly himself was stirred to sympathetic enthusiasm. He grasped the general's hand across the table. Monsieur, he said, earnestly, I don't know where this country of yours is, but I'm for it. I guess it must be a branch of the United States, though, for the poetry guys and the schoolmarms call us Columbia, too, sometimes. It's a lucky thing for you that you butted into me tonight. I'm the only man in New York that can get this gun deal through for you. The Secretary of War of the United States is me best friend. He's in the city now, and I'll see him for you tomorrow. In the meantime, Monser, you keep them drafts tight in your inside pocket. I'll call for you tomorrow, and take you to see him. Say! That ain't the District of Columbia you're talking about, 
is it? Concluded Mr. Kelly, with a sudden qualm. You can't capture that with no 2,000 guns, it's been tried with more. No, 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 exclaimed the general. It is the Republic of Colombia, it is a gr Reet republic on the top side of America of the South. Yes. Yes. All right, said Mr. Kelly, reassured. Now suppose we trek along home and go bye-bye. I'll write to the secretary tonight and make a date with him. It's a ticklish job to get guns out of New York. McCluskey himself can't do it. They parted at the door of the Hotel Espanol. The general rolled his eyes at the moon and sighed. It is a great country, your Nueva York, he said. Truly the cars in the streets devastate one, and the engine that cooks the nuts terribly makes a squeak in the ear. But, ah, uh, Senor Kelly, the senoras with hair of much goldness, and admirable fatness, they are magnificas. Mui magnificas. Kelly went to the nearest telephone booth and called up McCrary's Café, far up on Broadway. He asked for Jimmy Dunn. Is that Jimmy Dunn? asked Kelly. Yes, came the answer. You're a liar, sang back Kelly, joyfully. You're the Secretary of War. Wait there till I come up. I've got the finest thing down here in the way of a fish you ever baited for. It's a Colorado Maduro, with a gold band around it and free coupons enough to buy a red hall lamp and a statuette of Psyche rubbering in the brook. I'll be up on the next car. Jimmy Dunn was an A. M. of Crook Dom. He was an artist in the confidence line. He never saw a bludgeon in his life, and he scorned knockout drops. In fact, he would have set nothing before an intended victim but the purest of drinks, if it had been possible to procure such a thing in New York. It was the ambition of Spider Kelly to elevate himself into Jimmy's class. These two gentlemen held a conference that night at McCrary's. Kelly explained. He's as easy as a gumshoe. He's from the island of Columbia, where there's a strike, or a feud, or something going on, and they've sent him up here to buy two thousand Winchesters to arbitrate the thing with. He showed me two drafts for ten thousand dollars each, and one for five thousand dollars on a bank here. S. Truth, Jimmy, I felt real mad with him because he didn't have it in thousand dollar bills, and hand it to me on a silver waiter. Now, we've got to wait till he goes to the bank and gets the money for us. They talked it over for two hours, and then Dunn said, bring him to know. Broadway, at four o'clock tomorrow afternoon. In due time Kelly called at the Hotel Espanol for the general. He found the wily warrior engaged in delectable conversation with Mrs. O'Brien. The Secretary of War is waiting for us, said Kelly. The general tore himself away with an effort. I, senor, he said, with a sigh, duty makes a call. But, senor, the senoras of your Estados Unidos, how beauties! For exemplification, take you la Madame O'Brien, que magnifica! She is one goddess, one Juno, what you call one ox-eyed Juno. Now Mr. Kelly was a wit, and better men have been shriveled by the fire of their own imagination. Sure, he said with a grin, but you mean a peroxide Juno, don't you? Mrs. O'Brien heard, and lifted an auriferous head. Her businesslike eye rested for an instant upon the disappearing form of Mr. Kelly. Except in streetcars one should never be unnecessarily rude to a lady. When the gallant Colombian and his escort arrived at the Broadway address, they were held in an anteroom for half an hour. And then admitted into a well-equipped office where a distinguished-looking man, with a smooth face, wrote at a desk. General Falcon was presented to the Secretary of War of the United States, and his mission made known by his old friend, Mr. Kelly. Ah, Columbia! said the Secretary, significantly, when he was made to understand, I'm afraid there will be a little difficulty in that case. The President and I differ in our sympathies there. He prefers the established government, while I, the Secretary gave the General a mysterious but encouraging smile. You, of course, know, General Falcon, that since the Tammany War. 
An act of Congress has been passed requiring all manufactured arms and ammunition exported from this country to pass through the War Department. Now, if I can do anything for you I will be glad to do so to oblige my old friend, Mr. Kelly. But it must be in absolute secrecy, as the President, as I have said, does not regard favorably the efforts of your revolutionary party in Colombia. I will have my orderly bring a list of the available arms now in the warehouse. The secretary struck a bell, and an orderly with the letters ADT on his cap stepped promptly into the room. Bring me Schedule B of the small arms inventory, said the secretary. The orderly quickly returned with a printed paper. The secretary studied it closely. I find, he said, that in Warehouse 9, of government stores, there is shipment of 2,000 stands of Winchester rifles that were ordered by the Sultan of Morocco who forgot to send the cash with his order. Our rule is that legal tender money must be paid down at the time of purchase. My dear Kelly, your friend, General Falcon, shall have this lot of arms, if he desires it, at the manufacturer's price. And you will forgive me, I am sure, if I curtail our interview. I am expecting the Japanese minister and Charles Murphy every moment. As one result of this interview, the general was deeply grateful to his esteemed friend, Mr. Kelly. As another, the nimble Secretary of War was extremely busy during the next two days buying empty rifle cases and filling them with bricks, which were then stored in a warehouse rented for that purpose. As still another, when the general returned to the Hotel Espanol, Mrs. O'Brien went up to him, plucked a thread from his lapel, and said, Say, senor, I don't want to, but in. But what does that monkey-faced, cat-eyed, rubbernecked tin horn tough want with you? Sangre de mi vida, exclaimed the general. Impossible it is that you speak of my good friend, Senor Kelly. Come into the summer garden, said Mrs. O'Brien. I want to have a talk with you. Let us suppose that an hour has elapsed. And you say, said the general, that for the sum of eighteen dollars. 000 can be purchased the furnishment of the house and the lease of one year with this garden so lovely, so resembling unto the patios of my care Columbia? And dirt cheap at that, sighed the lady. Ah, Dios, breathed General Falcon. What to me is war and politics? This spot is one paradise. My country it have other brave heroes to continue the fighting. What to me should be glory and the shooting of mans? Ah. No. It is here I have found one angel. Let us buy the Hotel Espanol and you shall be mine, and the money shall not be waste on guns. Mrs. O'Brien rested her blonde pompadour against the shoulder of the Colombian patriot. Oh, senor, she sighed, happily, ain't you terrible. Two days later was the time appointed for the delivery of the arms to the general. The boxes of supposed rifles were stacked in the rented warehouse, and the Secretary of War sat upon them, waiting for his friend Kelly to fetch the victim. Mr. Kelly hurried, at the hour, to the Hotel Espanol. He found the general behind the desk adding up accounts. I have decided, said the general, to buy not guns. I have today by the insides of this hotel, and there shall be marrying of the General Perico Zimanish Villablanca Falcon with La Madame O'Brien. Mr. Kelly almost strangled. Say, you old bald-headed bottle of shoe polish, he spluttered, you're a swindler, that's what you are. You've bought a boarding house with money belonging to your infernal country, wherever it is. Ah, said the general, footing up a column, that is what you call politics. War and revolution they are not nice. Yes. It is not best that one shall always follow Minerva. No. It is of quite desirable to keep hotels and be with that Juno, that oxide Juno. Ah! What hair of the gold it is that she have! Mr. Kelly choked again. Ah, Senor Kelly! said the general, feelingly and finally, is it that you have never eaten of the corned beef hash that Madame O'Brien she make? A lickpenny lover. There, were three thousand girls in the biggest store. Macy was one of them. She was eighteen and a saleslady in the gents' gloves. 
Here she became versed in two varieties of human beings, the kind of gents who buy their gloves in department stores and the kind of women who buy gloves for unfortunate gents. Besides this wide knowledge of the human species, Macy had acquired other information. She had listened to the promulgated wisdom of the 2,999 other girls and had stored it in a brain that was as secretive and wary as that of a Maltese cat. Perhaps nature, foreseeing that she would lack wise counselors, had mingled the saving ingredient of shrewdness along with her beauty. As she has endowed the silver fox of the priceless fur above the other animals with cunning. For Macy was beautiful. She was a deep-tinted blonde, with the calm poise of a lady who cooks butter cakes in a window. She stood behind her counter in the biggest store. And as you closed your hand over the tape line for your glove measure you thought of Hebe, and as you looked again you wondered how she had come by Minerva's eyes. When the floorwalker was not looking Macy chewed tutti fruity, when he was looking she gazed up as if at the clouds and smiled wistfully. That is the shopgirl smile, and I enjoin you to shun it unless you are well fortified with callosity of the heart, caramels, and a congeniality for the capers of Cupid. This smile belonged to Macy's recreation hours and not to the store, but the floorwalker must have his own. He is the Shylock of the stores. When he comes nosing around the bridge of his nose is a toll bridge. It is goo goo eyes or git when he looks toward a pretty girl. Of course not all floorwalkers are thus. Only a few days ago the papers printed news of one over eighty years of age. One day Irving Carter, painter, millionaire, traveler, poet, automobilist, happened to enter the biggest store. It is due to him to add that his visit was not voluntary. Filial duty took him by the collar and dragged him inside, while his mother philandered among the bronze and terracotta statuettes. Carter strolled across to the glove counter in order to shoot a few minutes on the wing. His need for gloves was genuine, he had forgotten to bring a pair with him. But his action hardly calls for apology, because he had never heard of glove counter flirtations. As he neared the vicinity of his fate he hesitated, suddenly conscious of this unknown phase of Cupid's less worthy profession. Three or four cheap fellows, sonorously garbed, were leaning over the counters, wrestling with the mediatorial hand coverings. While giggling girls played vivacious seconds to their lead upon the strident string of coquetry. Carter would have retreated, but he had gone too far. Macy confronted him behind her counter with a questioning look in eyes as coldly, beautifully, warmly blue as the glint of summer sunshine on an iceberg drifting in southern seas. And then Irving Carter, painter, millionaire, etc., felt a warm flush rise to his aristocratically pale face. But not from diffidence. The blush was intellectual in origin. He knew in a moment that he stood in the ranks of the ready-made youths who wooed the giggling girls at other counters. Himself leaned against the oaken trysting place of a cockney cupid with a desire in his heart for the favor of a glove salesgirl. He was no more than Bill and Jack and Mickey. And then he felt a sudden tolerance for them, and an elating, courageous contempt for the conventions upon which he had fed. And an unhesitating determination to have this perfect creature for his own. When the gloves were paid for and wrapped Carter lingered for a moment. The dimples at the corners of Macy's damask mouth deepened. All gentlemen who bought gloves lingered in just that way. She curved an arm, showing like psyches through her shirtwaist sleeve, and rested an elbow upon the showcase edge. Carter had never before encountered a situation of which he had not been perfect master. But now he stood far more awkward than Bill or Jack or Mickey. He had no chance of meeting this beautiful girl socially. His mind struggled to recall the nature and habits of shopgirls as he had read or heard of them. Somehow he had received the idea that they sometimes did not insist too strictly upon the regular channels of introduction. His heart beat loudly at the thought of proposing an unconventional meeting with this lovely and virginal being. But the tumult in his heart gave him courage. After a few friendly and well-received remarks on general subjects, he laid his card by her hand on the counter. Will you please pardon me, he said, if I seem too bold. But I earnestly hope you will allow me the pleasure of seeing you again. There is my name. 
I assure you that it is with the greatest respect that I ask the favor of becoming one of your fr. acquaintances. May I not hope for the privilege? Macy knew men, especially men who buy gloves. Without hesitation she looked him frankly and smilingly in the eyes, and said. Sure. I guess you're all right. I don't usually go out with strange gentlemen, though. It ain't quite late alike. When should you want to see me again? As soon as I may, said Carter. If you would allow me to call at your home, I. Macy laughed musically. Oh, gee, no, she said, emphatically. If you could see our flat once. There's five of us in three rooms. I'd just like to see Ma's face if I was to bring a gentleman friend there. Anywhere, then, said the enamored Carter, that will be convenient to you. Say, suggested Macy, with a bright idea look in her peach blow face, I guess Thursday night will about suit me. Suppose you come to the corner of 8th Avenue and 48th Street at 7.30. I live right near the corner. But I've got to be back home by 11. Ma never lets me stay out after 11. Carter promised gratefully to keep the tryst, and then hastened to his mother, who was looking about for him to ratify her purchase of a bronze Diana. A salesgirl, with small eyes and an obtuse nose, strolled near Macy, with a friendly leer. Did you make a hit with his knobs, Maze? she asked, familiarly. The gentleman asked permission to call, answered Macy, with the grand air, as she slipped Carter's card into the bosom of her waist. Permission to call, echoed small eyes, with a snigger. Did he say anything about dinner in the Waldorf and a spin in his auto afterward? Oh, cheese it, said Macy, wearily. You've been used to swell things, I don't think. You've had a swelled head ever since that hosecart driver took you out to a chop suey joint. No, he never mentioned the Waldorf. But there's a Fifth Avenue address on his card, and if he buys the supper you can bet your life there won't be no pigtail on the waiter what takes the order. As Carter glided away from the biggest store with his mother in his electric runabout, he bit his lip with a dull pain at his heart. He knew that love had come to him for the first time in all the twenty-nine years of his life. And that the object of it should make so readily an appointment with him at a street corner, though it was a step toward his desires, tortured him with misgivings. Carter did not know the shopgirl. He did not know that her home is often either a scarcely habitable tiny room or a domicile filled to overflowing with kith and kin. The street corner is her parlor, the park is her drawing room. The avenue is her garden walk, yet for the most part she is as inviolate mistress of herself in them as is my lady inside her tapestried chamber. One evening at dusk, two weeks after their first meeting, Carter and Macy strolled arm in arm into a little, dimly lit park. They found a bench, tree shadowed and secluded, and sat there. For the first time his arm stole gently around her. Her golden bronze head slid restfully against his shoulder. Gee, sighed Macy, thankfully. Why didn't you ever think of that before? Macy, said Carter, earnestly, you surely know that I love you. I ask you sincerely to marry me. You know me well enough by this time to have no doubts of me. I want you, and I must have you. I care nothing for the difference in our stations. What is the difference? asked Macy, curiously. Well, there isn't any said Carter, quickly, except in the minds of foolish people. It is in my power to give you a life of luxury. My social position is beyond dispute, and my means are ample. They all say that, remarked Macy. It's the kid they all give you. I suppose you really work in a delicatessen or follow the races. I ain't as green as I look. I can furnish you all the proofs you want, said Carter, gently. And I want you, Macy. I loved you the first day I saw you. They all do, said Macy, with an amused laugh, to hear M talk. If I could meet a man that got stuck on me the third time he'd see me I think I'd get mashed on him. Please don't say such things, pleaded Carter. Listen to me, dear. Ever since I first looked into your eyes you have been the only woman in the world for me. 
Oh, ain't you the kidder, smiled Macy. How many other girls did you ever tell that? But Carter persisted. And at length he reached the flimsy, fluttering little soul of the shop girl that existed somewhere deep down in her lovely bosom. His words penetrated the heart whose very lightness was its safest armor. She looked up at him with eyes that saw. And a warm glow visited her cool cheeks. Tremblingly, awfully, her moth wings closed, and she seemed about to settle upon the flower of love. Some faint glimmer of life and its possibilities on the other side of her glove counter dawned upon her. Carter felt the change and crowded the opportunity. Marry me, Macy, he whispered softly, and we will go away from this ugly city to beautiful ones. We will forget work and business, and life will be one long holiday. I know where I should take you, I have been there often. Just think of a shore where summer is eternal, where the waves are always rippling on the lovely beach and the people are happy and free as children. We will sail to those shores and remain there as long as you please. In one of those faraway cities there are grand and lovely palaces and towers full of beautiful pictures and statues. The streets of the city are water, and one travels about in. I know, said Macy, sitting up suddenly. Gondolas. Yes, smiled Carter. I thought so, said Macy. And then, continued Carter, we will travel on and see whatever we wish in the world. After the European cities we will visit India and the ancient cities there. And ride on elephants and see the wonderful temples of the Hindus and Brahmins and the Japanese gardens and the camel trains and chariot races in Persia. And all the queer sights of foreign countries. Don't you think you would like it, Macy? Macy rose to her feet. I think we had better be going home, she said, coolly. It's getting late. Carter humored her. He had come to know her varying, thistle-down moods, and that it was useless to combat them. But he felt a certain happy triumph. He had held for a moment, though but by a silken thread, the soul of his wild psyche, and hope was stronger within him. Once she had folded her wings and her cool hand had closed about his own. At the biggest store the next day Macy's chum, Lulu, waylaid her in an angle of the counter. How are you and your swell friend making it, she asked. Oh, him? Said Macy, patting her side curls. He ain't in it any more. Say, Lou, what do you think that fellow wanted me to do? Go on the stage, guessed Lulu, breathlessly. Knit. He's too cheap a guy for that. He wanted me to marry him and go down to Coney Island for a wedding tour. The Missing Cord. I stopped overnight at the sheep ranch of Rush Kinney, on the sandy fork of the Nueces. Mr. Kinney and I had been strangers up to the time when I called, hello. At his hitching rack, but from that moment until my departure on the next morning we were, according to the Texas Code, undeniable friends. After supper the ranchman and I lugged our chairs outside the two-room house, to its floorless gallery roofed with chaparral and sequista grass. With the rear legs of our chairs sinking deep into the hard-packed loam, each of us reposed against an elm pillar of the structure and smoked El Toro tobacco. While we wrangled amicably concerning the affairs of the rest of the world. As for conveying adequate conception of the engaging charm of that prairie evening, despair waits upon it. It is a bold chronicler who will undertake the description of a Texas night in the early spring. An inventory must suffice. The ranch rested upon the summit of a lenient slope. The ambient prairie, diversified by arroyos and murky patches of brush and pear, lay around us like a darkened bowl at the bottom of which we reposed as dregs. Like a turquoise cover the sky pinned us there. The miraculous air, heady with ozone and made memorably sweet by leagues of wild flowerets, gave tang and savor to the breath. In the sky was a great, round, mellow searchlight which we knew to be no moon, but the dark lantern of summer, who came to hunt northward the cowering spring. In the nearest corral a flock of sheep lay silent until a groundless panic would send a squad of them huddling together with a drumming rush. For other sounds a shrill family of coyotes yapped beyond the shearing pen, and whippoorwills twittered in the long grass. 
But even these dissonances hardly rippled the clear torrent of the mockingbird's notes that fell from a dozen neighboring shrubs and trees. It would not have been preposterous for one to tiptoe and essay to touch the stars, they hung so bright and imminent. Mr. Kinney's wife, a young and capable woman, we had left in the house. She remained to busy herself with the domestic round of duties, in which I had observed that she seemed to take a buoyant and contented pride. In one room we had supped. Presently, from the other, as Kinney and I sat without, there burst a volume of sudden and brilliant music. If I could justly estimate the art of piano playing, the construer of that rollicking fantasia had creditably mastered the secrets of the keyboard. A piano, and one so well played, seemed to me to be an unusual thing to find in that small and unpromising ranch house. I must have looked my surprise at Rush Kinney, for he laughed in his soft, southern way, and nodded at me through the moonlit haze of our cigarettes. You don't often hear as agreeable a noise as that on a sheep ranch, he remarked. But I never see any reason for not playing up to the arts and graces just because we happen to live out in the brush. It's a lonesome life for a woman. And if a little music can make it any better, why not have it? That's the way I look at it. A wise and generous theory, I assented. And Mrs. Kinney plays well. I am not learned in the science of music, but I should call her an uncommonly good performer. She has technique and more than ordinary power. The moon was very bright, you will understand, and I saw upon Kinney's face a sort of amused and pregnant expression, as though there were things behind it that might be expounded. You came up the trail from the double elm fork, he said promisingly. As you crossed it you must have seen an old deserted jackal to your left under a comma mot. I did, said I. There was a drove of javelis rooting around it. I could see by the broken corrals that no one lived there. That's where this music proposition started, said Kinney. I don't mind telling you about it while we smoke. That's where old Cal Adams lived. He had about eight hundred graded merinos and a daughter that was solid silk and as handsome as a new stake rope on a thirty-dollar pony. And I don't mind telling you that I was guilty in the second degree of hanging around old Cal's ranch all the time I could spare away from lambing and shearing. Miss Marilla was her name. And I had figured it out by the rule of two that she was destined to become the chatelaine and lady superior of Rancho Lamato, belonging to our, Kinney, E.S.Q. Where you are now a welcome and honored guest. I will say that old Cal wasn't distinguished as a sheepman. He was a little, old stoop-shouldered hombre about as big as a gun scabbard, with scraggy white whiskers, and condemned to the continuous use of language. Old Cal was so obscure in his chosen profession that he wasn't even hated by the cowmen. And when a sheepman don't get eminent enough to acquire the hostility of the cattlemen, he is mighty apt to die unwept and considerably unsung. But that Marilla girl was a benefit to the eye. And she was the most elegant kind of a housekeeper. I was the nearest neighbor. And I used to ride over to the double elm anywhere from nine to sixteen times a week with fresh butter or a quarter of venison or a sample of new sheep dip just as a frivolous excuse to see Marilla. Marilla and me got to be extensively inveigled with each other and I was pretty sure I was going to get my rope around her neck and lead her over to the Lamato. Only she was so everlastingly permeated with filial sentiments toward old Cal that I never could get her to talk about serious matters. You never saw anybody in your life that was as full of knowledge and had less sense than old Cal. He was advised about all the branches of information contained in learning, and he was up to all the rudiments of doctrines and enlightenment. You couldn't advance him any ideas on any of the parts of speech or lines of thought. You would have thought he was a professor of the weather and politics and chemistry and natural history and the origin of derivations. Any subject you brought up old Cal could give you an abundant synopsis of it from the Greek root up to the time it was sacked and on the market. One day just after the fall shearing I rides over to the double elm with a ladies magazine about fashions for Marilla and a scientific paper for old Cal. While I was tying my pony to a mesquite, out runs Marilla, tickled to death with some news that couldn't wait. Oh, Rush, she says, all flushed up with esteem and gratification, what do you think? Dad's going to buy me a piano. 
ain't it grand? I never dreamed I'd ever have one. It's sure joyful, says I, I always admired the agreeable uproar of a piano. It'll be lots of company for you. That's mighty good of Uncle Cal to do that. I'm all undecided, says Marilla, between a piano and an organ. A parlor organ is nice. Either of them, says I, is first class for mitigating the lack of noise around a sheep ranch. For my part, I says, I shouldn't like anything better than to ride home of an evening and listen to a few waltzes and jigs. With somebody about your size sitting on the piano stool and rounding up the notes. Oh, hush about that, says Marilla, and go on in the house. Dad hasn't rode out today. He's not feeling well. Old Cal was inside, lying on a cot. He had a pretty bad cold and cough. I stayed to supper. Going to get Marilla a piano, I hear, says I to him. Why, yes, something of the kind, Rush, says he. She's been hankering for music for a long spell. And I allow to fix her up with something in that line right away. The sheep sheared six pounds all round this fall. And I'm going to get Marilla an instrument if it takes the price of the whole clip to do it. Star Wayno, says I, the little girl deserves it. I'm going to San Antone on the last load of wool, says Uncle Cal, and select an instrument for her myself. Wouldn't it be better, I suggests, to take Marilla along and let her pick out one that she likes? I might have known that would set Uncle Cal going. Of course, a man like him, that knew everything about everything, would look at that as a reflection on his attainments. No, sir, it wouldn't, says he, pulling at his white whiskers. There ain't a better judge of musical instruments in the whole world than what I am. I had an uncle, says he, that was a partner in a piano factory, and I've seen thousands of them put together. I know all about musical instruments from a pipe organ to a cornstalk fiddle. There ain't a man lives, sir, that can tell me any news about any instrument that has to be pounded, blowed, scraped, grinded, picked, or wound with a key. You get me what you like, dad, says Marilla, who couldn't keep her feet on the floor from joy. Of course you know what to select. I just as leaf it was a piano or a organ or what. I see in St. Louis once what they call a orchestrion, says Uncle Cal, that I judged was about the finest thing in the way of music ever invented. But there ain't room in this house for one. Anyway, I imagine they'd cost a thousand dollars. I reckon something in the piano line would suit Marilla the best. She took lessons in that respect for two years over at Bird's Tail. I wouldn't trust the buying of an instrument to anybody else but myself. I reckon if I hadn't took up sheep raising I'd have been one of the finest composers or piano and organ manufacturers in the world. That was Uncle Cal's style. But I never lost any patience with him, on account of his thinking so much of Marilla. And she thought just as much of him. He sent her to the academy over at Bird's Tail for two years when it took nearly every pound of wool to pay the expenses. Along about Tuesday Uncle Cal put out for San Antone on the last wagon load of wool. Marilla's Uncle Ben, who lived in Bird's Tail, come over and stayed at the ranch while Uncle Cal was gone. It was ninety miles to San Antone, and forty to the nearest railroad station, so Uncle Cal was gone about four days. I was over at the Double Elm when he came rolling back one evening about sundown. And up there in the wagon, sure enough, was a piano or a organ, we couldn't tell which, all wrapped up in wool sacks, with a wagon sheet tied over it in case of rain. And out skips Marilla, hollering, oh, oh, with her eyes shining and her hair a-flying. Dad, Dad, she sings out, have you brought it, have you brought it? And it right there before her eyes, as women will do. Finest piano in San Antone, says Uncle Cal, waving his hand, proud. Genuine rosewood, and the finest, loudest tone you ever listened to. I heard the storekeeper play it, and I took it on the spot and paid cash down. Me and Ben and Uncle Cal and a Mexican lifted it out of the wagon and carried it in the house and set it in a corner. It was one of them upright instruments, and not very heavy or very big. 
And then all of a sudden Uncle Cal flops over and says he's mighty sick. He's got a high fever, and he complains of his lungs. He gets into bed, while me and Ben goes out to unhitch and put the horses in the pasture, and Marilla flies around to get Uncle Cal something hot to drink. But first she puts both arms on that piano and hugs it with a soft kind of a smile, like you see kids doing with their Christmas toys. When I came in from the pasture, Marilla was in the room where the piano was. I could see by the strings and wool sacks on the floor that she had had it unwrapped. But now she was tying the wagon sheet over it again, and there was a kind of solemn, whitish look on her face. Ain't wrapping up the music again, are you, Marilla? I asks. What's the matter with just a couple of tunes for to see how she goes under the saddle? Not tonight, Rush, says she. I don't want to play any tonight. Dad's too sick. Just think, Rush, he paid three hundred dollars for it, nearly a third of what the wool clip brought. Well, it ain't anyways in the neighborhood of a third of what you are worth, I told her. And I don't think Uncle Cal is too sick to hear a little agitation of the piano keys just to christen the machine. Not tonight, Rush, says Marilla, in a way that she had when she wanted to settle things. But it seems that Uncle Cal was plenty sick, after all. He got so bad that Ben saddled up and rode over to Bird's Tail for Doc Simpson. I stayed around to see if I'd be needed for anything. When Uncle Cal's pain let up on him a little he called Marilla and says to her, Did you look at your instrument, honey? And do you like it? It's lovely, Dad, says she, leaning down by his pillow, I never saw one so pretty. How dear and good it was of you to buy it for me. I haven't heard you play on it any yet, says Uncle Cal, and I've been listening. My side don't hurt quite so bad now, won't you play a piece, Marilla? But no. She puts Uncle Cal off and soothes him down like you've seen women do with a kid. It seems she's made up her mind not to touch that piano at present. When Doc Simpson comes over he tells us that Uncle Cal has pneumonia the worst kind. And as the old man was past sixty and nearly on the lift anyhow, the odds was against his walking on grass any more. On the fourth day of his sickness he calls for Marilla again and wants to talk piano. Doc Simpson was there, and so was Ben and Mrs. Ben, trying to do all they could. I'd have made a wonderful success in anything connected with music, says Uncle Cal, I got the finest instrument for the money in San Antone. Ain't that piano all right in every respect, Marilla? It's just perfect, Dad, says she. It's got the finest tone I ever heard. But don't you think you could sleep a little while now, Dad? No, I don't, says Uncle Cal, I want to hear that piano. I don't believe you've even tried it yet. I went all the way to San Antone and picked it out for you myself. It took a third of the fall clip to buy it, but I don't mind that if it makes my good girl happier. Won't you play a little bit for Dad, Marilla? Doc Simpson beckoned Marilla to one side and recommended her to do what Uncle Cal wanted, so it would get him quieted. And her Uncle Ben and his wife asked her, too. Why not hit out a tune or two with the soft pedal on? I asks Marilla. Uncle Cal has begged you so often. It would please him a good deal to hear you touch up the piano he's bought for you. Don't you think you might? But Marilla stands there with big tears rolling down from her eyes and says nothing. And then she runs over and slips her arm under Uncle Cal's neck and hugs him tight. Why, last night, Dad, we heard her say, I played it ever so much. Honest, I have been playing it. And it's such a splendid instrument, you don't know how I love it. Last night I played Bonnie Dundee and the Anvil Polka and the Blue Danube and lots of pieces. You must surely have heard me playing a little, didn't you, Dad? I didn't like to play loud when you was so sick. Well, well, says Uncle Cal, maybe I did. Maybe I did and forgot about it. My head is a little cranky at times. I heard the man in the store play it fine. I'm mighty glad you like it, Marilla. Yes, I believe I could go to sleep a while if you'll stay right beside me till I do. There was where Marilla had me guessing. 
Much as she thought of that old man, she wouldn't strike a note on that piano that he'd bought her. I couldn't imagine why she told him she'd been playing it, for the wagon sheet hadn't ever been off of it since she put it back on the same day it come. I knew she could play a little anyhow, for I'd once heard her snatch some pretty fair dance music out of an old piano at the Charco Largo Ranch. Well, in about a week the pneumonia got the best of Uncle Cal. They had the funeral over at Bird's Tail, and all of us went over. I brought Marilla back home in my buckboard. Her Uncle Ben and his wife were going to stay there a few days with her. That night Marilla takes me in the room where the piano was, while the others were out on the gallery. Come here, Rush, says she, I want you to see this now. She unties the rope and drags off the wagon sheet. If you ever rode a saddle without a horse, or fired off a gun that wasn't loaded, or took a drink out of an empty bottle, why? Then you might have been able to scare an opera or two out of the instrument Uncle Cal had bought. Instead of a piano, it was one of the machines they've invented to play the piano with. By itself it was about as musical as the holes of a flute without the flute. And that was the piano that Uncle Cal had selected, and standing by it was the good, fine, all-wool girl that never let him know it. And what you heard playing a while ago, concluded Mr. Kinney, was that same deputy piano machine. Only just at present it's shoved up against a $600 piano that I bought for Marilla as soon as we was married. A dinner at, 3. The Adventures of an Author with His Own Hero. All that day, in fact from the moment of his creation, Van Sweller had conducted himself fairly well in my eyes. Of course I had had to make many concessions, but in return he had been no less considerate. Once or twice we had had sharp, brief contentions over certain points of behavior. But, prevailingly, give and take had been our rule. His morning toilet provoked our first tilt. Van Sweller went about it confidently. The usual thing, I suppose, old chap, he said, with a smile and a yawn. I ring for a B and S, and then I have my tub. I splash a good deal in the water, of course. You are aware that there are two ways in which I can receive Tommy Carmichael when he looks in to have a chat about polo. I can talk to him through the bathroom door, or I can be picking at a grilled bone which my man has brought in. Which would you prefer? I smiled with diabolic satisfaction at his coming discomfiture. Neither, I said. You will make your appearance on the scene when a gentleman should, after you are fully dressed, which indubitably private function shall take place behind closed doors. And I will feel indebted to you if, after you do appear, your deportment and manners are such that it will not be necessary to inform the public, in order to appease its apprehension. That you have taken a bath. Van Sweller slightly elevated his brows. Oh, very well, he said, a trifle piqued. I rather imagine it concerns you more than it does me. Cut the tub, by all means, if you think best. But it has been the usual thing, you know. This was my victory, but after Van Sweller emerged from his apartments in the Beaujolais, I was vanquished in a dozen small but well contested skirmishes. I allowed him a cigar, but routed him on the question of naming its brand. But he worsted me when I objected to giving him a coat unmistakably English in its cut. I allowed him to stroll down Broadway and even permitted, passers-by, God knows there's nowhere to pass but by, to, turn their heads and gaze with evident admiration at his erect figure. I demeaned myself, and, as a barber, gave him a, smooth, dark face with its keen, frank eye, and firm jaw. Later on he looked in at the club and saw Freddy Vavasour, polo team captain, dawdling over grilled bone number one. Dear old boy, began Van Sweller. But in an instant I had seized him by the collar and dragged him aside with the scantiest courtesy. For heaven's sake talk like a man, I said, sternly. Do you think it is manly to use those mushy and inane forms of address? That man is neither dear nor old nor a boy. To my surprise Van Sweller turned upon me a look of frank pleasure. I am glad to hear you say that, he said, heartily. I use those words because I have been forced to say them so often. They really are contemptible. 
Thanks for correcting me, dear old boy. Still I must admit that Van Sweller's conduct in the park that morning was almost without flaw. The courage, the dash, the modesty, the skill, and fidelity that he displayed atoned for everything. This is the way the story runs. Van Sweller has been a gentleman member of the Rugged Riders, the company that made a war with a foreign country famous. Among his comrades was Lawrence Arun, a man whom Van Sweller liked. A strange thing, and a hazardous one in fiction, was that Van Sweller and Arun resembled each other mightily in face, form, and general appearance. After the war Van Sweller pulled wires, and Arun was made a mounted policeman. Now, one night in New York there are commemorations and libations by old comrades, and in the morning, mounted policeman Arun. Unused to potent liquids, another premise hazardous in fiction, finds the earth bucking and bounding like a bronco, with no stirrup into which he may insert foot and save his honor and his badge. Noblesse oblige? Surely. So out along the driveways and bridle paths trots Hudson Van Sweller in the uniform of his incapacitated comrade, as like unto him as one French pea is unto a petit poise. It is, of course, jolly larks for Van Sweller, who has wealth and social position enough for him to masquerade safely even as a police commissioner doing his duty, if he wished to do so. But society, not given to scanning the countenances of mounted policemen, sees nothing unusual in the officer on the beat. And then comes the runaway. That is a fine scene, the swaying Victoria, the impetuous, daft horses plunging through the line of scattering vehicles, the driver stupidly holding his broken reins. And the ivory-white face of Amy Folliot, as she clings desperately with each slender hand. Fear has come and gone, it has left her expression pensive and just a little pleading, for life is not so bitter. And then the clatter and swoop of mounted policeman Van Sweller. Oh, it was, but the story has not yet been printed. When it is you shall learn bow he sent his bay like a bullet after the imperiled Victoria. A Crichton, a Croesus, and a Centaur in one, he hurls the invincible combination into the chase. When the story is printed you will admire the breathless scene where Van Sweller checks the headlong team. And then he looks into Amy Folliot's eyes and sees two things, the possibilities of a happiness he has long sought, and a nascent promise of it. He is unknown to her. But he stands in her sight illuminated by the hero's potent glory, she his and he hers by all the golden, fond, unreasonable laws of love and light literature. Ay, that is a rich moment. And it will stir you to find Van Sweller in that fruitful nick of time thinking of his comrade Orun. Who is cursing his gyrating bed and incapable legs in an unsteady room in a west side hotel while Van Sweller holds his badge and his honor. Van Sweller hears Miss Folliot's voice thrillingly asking the name of her preserver. If Hudson Van Sweller, in policeman's uniform, has saved the life of palpitating beauty in the park, where is mounted policeman Orun, in whose territory the deed is done. How quickly by a word can the hero reveal himself, thus discarding his masquerade of ineligibility and doubling the romance. But there is his friend. Van Sweller touches his cap. It's nothing, miss, he says, sturdily, that's what we are paid for, to do our duty. And away he rides. But the story does not end there. As I have said, Van Sweller carried off the park scene to my decided satisfaction. Even to me he was a hero when he forswore, for the sake of his friend, the romantic promise of his adventure. It was later in the day, amongst the more exacting conventions that encompassed the society hero, when we had our liveliest disagreement. At noon he went to Oruna's room and found him far enough recovered to return to his post, which he at once did. At about six o'clock in the afternoon Van Sweller fingered his watch, and flashed at me a brief look full of such shrewd cunning that I suspected him at once. Time to dress for dinner, old man, he said, with exaggerated carelessness. Very well, I answered, without giving him a clue to my suspicions. I will go with you to your rooms and see that you do the thing properly. I suppose that every author must be a valet to his own hero. He affected cheerful acceptance of my somewhat officious proposal to accompany him. 
I could see that he was annoyed by it, and that fact fastened deeper in my mind the conviction that he was meditating some act of treachery. When he had reached his apartments he said to me, with a too patronizing air, there are, as you perhaps know, quite a number of little distinguishing touches to be had out of the dressing process. Some writers rely almost wholly upon them. I suppose that I am to ring for my man, and that he is to enter noiselessly, with an expressionless countenance. He may enter, I said, with decision, and only enter. Valets do not usually enter a room shouting college songs or with St. Vitus's dance in their faces. So the contrary may be assumed without fatuous or gratuitous asseveration. I must ask you to pardon me, continued Van Sweller, gracefully, for annoying you with questions, but some of your methods are a little new to me. Shall I don a full-dress suit with an immaculate white tie, or is there another tradition to be upset? You will wear, I replied, evening dress, such as a gentleman wears. If it is full, your tailor should be responsible for its bagginess. And I will leave it to whatever erudition you are supposed to possess whether a white tie is rendered any whiter by being immaculate. And I will leave it to the consciences of you and your man whether a tie that is not white, and therefore not immaculate, could possibly form any part of a gentleman's evening dress. If not, then the perfect tie is included and understood in the term dress, and its expressed addition predicates either a redundancy of speech or the spectacle of a man wearing two ties at once. With this mild but deserved rebuke I left Van Sweller in his dressing room, and waited for him in his library. About an hour later his valet came out, and I heard him telephone for an electric cab. Then out came Van Sweller, smiling, but with that sly, secret of design in his eye that was puzzling me. I believe, he said easily, as he smoothed a glove, that I will drop in at, for for dinner. I sprang up, angrily, at his words. This, then, was the paltry trick he had been scheming to play upon me. I faced him with a look so grim that even his patrician poise was flustered. You will never do so, I exclaimed, with my permission. What kind of a return is this, I continued, hotly, for the favors I have granted you? I gave you a, a van, to your name when I might have called you, Perkins, or, Simpson. I have humbled myself so far as to brag of your polo ponies, your automobiles, and the iron muscles that you acquired when you were stroke or of your, varsity eight, or, eleven, whichever it is. I created you for the hero of this story, and I will not submit to having you queer it. I have tried to make you a typical young New York gentleman of the highest social station and breeding. You have no reason to complain of my treatment to you. Amy Folliot, the girl you are to win, is a prize for any man to be thankful for, and cannot be equaled for beauty, provided the story is illustrated by the right artist. I do not understand why you should try to spoil everything. I had thought you were a gentleman. What it is you are objecting to, old man? asked Van Sweller, in a surprised tone. To your dining at, five I answered. The pleasure would be yours, no doubt, but the responsibility would fall upon me. You intend deliberately to make me out a tout for a restaurant. Where you dine tonight has not the slightest connection with the thread of our story. You know very well that the plot requires that you be in front of the Alhambra Opera House at 11.30 where you are to rescue Miss Folliot a second time as the fire engine crashes into her cab. Until that time your movements are immaterial to the reader. Why can't you dine out of sight somewhere, as many a hero does, instead of insisting upon an inapposite and vulgar exhibition of yourself? My dear fellow, said Van Sweller, politely, but with a stubborn tightening of his lips, I'm sorry it doesn't please you, but there's no help for it. Even a character in a story has rights that an author cannot ignore. The hero of a story of New York social life must dine at, six at least once during its action. Must, I echoed, disdainfully, why must? Who demands it? The magazine editors, answered Van Sweller, giving me a glance of significant warning. But why? I persisted. To please subscribers around Kankakee, Illinois, said Van Sweller, without hesitation. How do you know these things? I inquired, with sudden suspicion. 
you never came into existence until this morning. You are only a character in fiction, anyway. I, myself, created you. How is it possible for you to know anything? Pardon me for referring to it, said Van Sweller, with a sympathetic smile, but I have been the hero of hundreds of stories of this kind. I felt a slow flush creeping into my face. I thought, I stammered, I was hoping, that is. Oh, well, of course an absolutely original conception in fiction is impossible in these days. Metropolitan types, continued Van Sweller, kindly, do not offer a hold for much originality. I've sauntered through every story in pretty much the same way. Now and then the women writers have made me cut some rather strange capers, for a gentleman, but the men generally pass me along from one to another without much change. But never yet, in any story, have I failed to dine at, seven. You will fail this time, I said, emphatically. Perhaps so, admitted Van Sweller, looking out of the window into the street below, but if so it will be for the first time. The authors all send me there. I fancy that many of them would have liked to accompany me, but for the little matter of the expense. I say I will be touting for no restaurant, I repeated, loudly. You are subject to my will, and I declare that you shall not appear of record this evening until the time arrives for you to rescue Miss Folliot again. If the reading public cannot conceive that you have dined during that interval at some one of the thousands of establishments provided for that purpose that do not receive literary advertisement it may suppose. For aught I care, that you have gone fasting. Thank you, said Van Sweller, rather coolly, you are hardly courteous. But take care. It is at your own risk that you attempt to disregard a fundamental principle in metropolitan fiction, one that is dear alike to author and reader. I shall, of course attend to my duty when it comes time to rescue your heroine, but I warn you that it will be your loss if you fail to send me tonight to dine at. 8. I will take the consequences if there are to be any, I replied. I am not yet come to be sandwich man for an eating house. I walked over to a table where I had left my cane and gloves. I heard the whir of the alarm in the cab below and I turned quickly. Van Sweller was gone. I rushed down the stairs and out to the curb. An empty hansom was just passing. I hailed the driver excitedly. See that auto cab halfway down the block. I shouted. Follow it. Don't lose sight of it for an instant, and I will give you two dollars. If I only had been one of the characters in my story instead of myself I could easily have offered ten dollars or twenty-five dollars or even one hundred dollars. But two dollars was all I felt justified in expending, with fiction at its present rates. The cab driver, instead of lashing his animal into a foam, proceeded at a deliberate trot that suggested a by-the-hour arrangement. But I suspected Van Sweller's design. And when we lost sight of his cab I ordered my driver to proceed at once to. 9. I found Van Sweller at a table under a palm, just glancing over the menu, with a hopeful waiter hovering at his elbow. Come with me, I said, inexorably. You will not give me the slip again. Under my eye you shall remain until 11.30. Van Sweller countermanded the order for his dinner, and arose to accompany me. He could scarcely do less. A fictitious character is but poorly equipped for resisting a hungry but live author who comes to drag him forth from a restaurant. All he said was, you were just in time. But I think you are making a mistake. You cannot afford to ignore the wishes of the great reading public. I took Van Sweller to my own rooms, to my room. He had never seen anything like it before. Sit on that trunk, I said to him, while I observe whether the landlady is stalking us. If she is not, I will get things at a delicatessen store below, and cook something for you in a pan over the gas jet. It will not be so bad. Of course nothing of this will appear in the story. Jove! Old man, said Van Sweller, looking about him with interest, this is a jolly little closet you live in. Where the devil do you sleep, oh, that pulls down. And I say, what is this under the corner of the carpet, oh, a frying pan. 
I see, clever idea. Fancy cooking over the gas. What larks it will be. Think of anything you could eat? I asked. Try a chop, or what? Anything, said Van Sweller, enthusiastically, except a grilled bone. Two weeks afterward the postman brought me a large, fat envelope. I opened it, and took out something that I had seen before, and this typewritten letter from a magazine that encourages society fiction. Your short story, The Badge of Policeman Arun, is herewith returned. We are sorry that it has been unfavorably passed upon, but it seems to lack in some of the essential requirements of our publication. The story is splendidly constructed. Its style is strong and inimitable, and its action and character drawing deserve the highest praise. As a story per se it has merit beyond anything that we have read for some time. But, as we have said, it fails to come up to some of the standards we have set. Could you not rewrite the story, and inject into it the social atmosphere, and return it to us for further consideration? It is suggested to you that you have the hero, Van Sweller, drop in for luncheon or dinner once or twice at, ten or at the, eleven which will be in line with the changes desired. Very truly yours, the editors. One thousand dollars. One thousand dollars, repeated lawyer Tolman, solemnly and severely, and here is the money. Young Gillian gave a decidedly amused laugh as he fingered the thin package of new fifty-dollar notes. It's such a confoundedly awkward amount, he explained, genially, to the lawyer. If it had been ten thousand a fellow might wind up with a lot of fireworks and do himself credit. Even fifty dollars would have been less trouble. You heard the reading of your uncle's will, continued lawyer Tolman, professionally dry in his tones. I do not know if you paid much attention to its details. I must remind you of one. You are required to render to us an account of the manner of expenditure of this one thousand dollars as soon as you have disposed of it. The will stipulates that. I trust that you will so far comply with the late Mr. Gillian's wishes. You may depend upon it, said the young man, politely, in spite of the extra expense it will entail. I may have to engage a secretary. I was never good at accounts. Gillian went to his club. There he hunted out one whom he called Old Bryson. Old Bryson was calm and forty and sequestered. He was in a corner reading a book, and when he saw Gillian approaching he sighed, laid down his book and took off his glasses. Old Bryson, wake up, said Gillian. I've a funny story to tell you. I wish you would tell it to someone in the billiard room, said Old Bryson. You know how I hate your stories. This is a better one than usual, said Gillian, rolling a cigarette. And I'm glad to tell it to you. It's too sad and funny to go with the rattling of billiard balls. I've just come from my late uncle's firm of legal corsairs. He leaves me an even thousand dollars. Now, what can a man possibly do with a thousand dollars? I thought, said old Bryson, showing as much interest as a bee shows in a vinegar cruet, that the late Septimus Gillian was worth something like half a million. He was, assented Gillian, joyously, and that's where the joke comes in. He's left his whole cargo of doubloons to a microbe. That is, part of it goes to the man who invents a new bacillus and the rest to establish a hospital for doing away with it again. There are one or two trifling bequests on the side. The butler and the housekeeper get a seal ring and ten dollars each. His nephew gets one thousand dollars. You've always had plenty of money to spend, observed old Bryson. Tons, said Gillian. Uncle was the fairy godmother as far as an allowance was concerned. Any other heirs? asked old Bryson. None. Gillian frowned at his cigarette and kicked the upholstered leather of a divan uneasily. There is a Miss Hayden, a ward of my uncle, who lived in his house. She's a quiet thing, musical, the daughter of somebody who was unlucky enough to be his friend. I forgot to say that she was in on the seal ring and ten dollar joke, too. I wish I had been. Then I could have had two bottles of brute, tipped the waiter with the ring and had the whole business off my hands. 
Don't be superior and insulting, old Bryson, tell me what a fellow can do with a thousand dollars. Old Bryson rubbed his glasses and smiled. And when old Bryson smiled, Jillian knew that he intended to be more offensive than ever. A thousand dollars, he said, means much or little. One man may buy a happy home with it and laugh at Rockefeller. Another could send his wife south with it and save her life. A thousand dollars would buy pure milk for one hundred babies during June, July, and August and save fifty of their lives. You could count upon a half-hour's diversion with it at Faro in one of the fortified art galleries. It would furnish an education to an ambitious boy. I am told that a genuine Corot was secured for that amount in an auction room yesterday. You could move to a New Hampshire town and live respectably two years on it. You could rent Madison Square Garden for one evening with it, and lecture your audience, if you should have one, on the precariousness of the profession of air presumptive. People might like you, old Bryson, said Gillian, always unruffled, if you wouldn't moralize. I asked you to tell me what I could do with a thousand dollars. You? said Bryson, with a gentle laugh. Why, Bobby Gillian, there's only one logical thing you could do. You can go buy Miss Lotta Laurier a diamond pendant with the money, and then take yourself off to Idaho and inflict your presence upon a ranch. I advise a sheep ranch, as I have a particular dislike for sheep. Thanks, said Gillian, rising, I thought I could depend upon you, old Bryson. You've hit on the very scheme. I wanted to chuck the money in a lump, for I've got to turn in an account for it, and I hate itemizing. Gillian phoned for a cab and said to the driver. The stage entrance of the Columbine Theater. Miss Lotta Laurier was assisting nature with a powder puff, almost ready for her call at a crowded matinee, when her dresser mentioned the name of Mr. Gillian. Let it in, said Miss Laurier. Now, what is it, Bobby? I'm going on in two minutes. Rabbit foot your right ear a little, suggested Gillian, critically. That's better. It won't take two minutes for me. What do you say to a little thing in the pendant line? I can stand three ciphers with a figure one in front of them. Oh, just as you say, caroled Miss Laurier. My right glove, Adams. Say, Bobby, did you see that necklace Della Stacy had on the other night? Twenty-two hundred dollars it cost at Tiffany's. But, of course, pull my sash a little to the left, Adams. Miss Laurier for the opening chorus, cried the call boy without. Gillian strolled out to where his cab was waiting. What would you do with a thousand dollars if you had it? He asked the driver. Open a S loon, said the cabbie, promptly and huskily. I know a place I could take money in with both hands. It's a four-story brick on a corner. I've got it figured out. Second story, chinks and chop suey, third floor, manicures and foreign missions, fourth floor, pool room. If you was thinking of putting up the cap. Oh, no, said Gillian, I merely asked from curiosity. I take you by the hour. Drive, till I tell you to stop. Eight blocks down Broadway Gillian poked up the trap with his cane and got out. A blind man sat upon a stool on the sidewalk selling pencils. Gillian went out and stood before him. Excuse me, he said but would you mind telling me what you would do if you had a thousand dollars? You got out of that cab that just drove up, didn't you? asked the blind man. I did, said Gillian. I guess you are all right, said the pencil dealer, to ride in a cab by daylight. Take a look at that, if you like. He drew a small book from his coat pocket and held it out. Gillian opened it and saw that it was a bank deposit book. It showed a balance of $1,785 to the blind man's credit. Gillian returned the book and got into the cab. I forgot something, he said. You may drive to the law offices of Tolman and Sharp, at, Broadway. Lawyer Tolman looked at him hostily and inquiringly through his gold-rimmed glasses. I beg your pardon, said Gillian, cheerfully, but may I ask you a question? It is not an impertinent one. I hope. 
Was Miss Hayden left anything by my uncle's will besides the ring and the ten dollars? Nothing, said Mr. Tolman. I thank you very much, sir, said Gillian, and on he went to his cab. He gave the driver the address of his late uncle's home. Miss Hayden was writing letters in the library. She was small and slender and clothed in black. But you would have noticed her eyes. Gillian drifted in with his air of regarding the world as inconsequent. I've just come from old Tolman's, he explained. They've been going over the papers down there. They found a—Gillian searched his memory for a legal term—they found an amendment or a postscript or something to the will. It seemed that the old boy loosened up a little on second thoughts and willed you a thousand dollars. I was driving up this way and Tolman asked me to bring you the money. Here it is. You'd better count it to see if it's right. Gillian laid the money beside her hand on the desk. Miss Hayden turned white. Oh, she said, and again, oh. Gillian half turned and looked out the window. I suppose, of course, he said, in a low voice, that you know I love you. I am sorry, said Miss Hayden, taking up her money. There is no use? asked Gillian, almost light-heartedly. I am sorry, she said again. May I write a note? asked Gillian, with a smile. He seated himself at the big library table. She supplied him with paper and pen, and then went back to her secretaire. Gillian made out his account of his expenditure of the thousand dollars in these words. Paid by the black sheep, Robert Gillian, one thousand dollars on account of the eternal happiness. Owed by heaven to the best and dearest woman on earth. Gillian slipped his writing into an envelope, bowed and went his way. His cab stopped again at the offices of Tolman and Sharp. I have expended the thousand dollars, he said cheerily, to Tolman of the gold glasses, and I have come to render account of it, as I agreed. There is quite a feeling of summer in the air, do you not think so, Mr. Tolman? He tossed a white envelope on the lawyer's table. You will find there a memorandum, sir, of the modus operandi of the vanishing of the dollars. Without touching the envelope, Mr. Tolman went to a door and called his partner, Sharp. Together they explored the caverns of an immense safe. Forth they dragged, as trophy of their search a big envelope sealed with wax. This they forcibly invaded, and wagged their venerable heads together over its contents. Then Tolman became spokesman. Mr. Gillian, he said, formally, there was a codicil to your uncle's will. It was entrusted to us privately, with instructions that it be not opened until you had furnished us with a full account of your handling of the $1,000 bequest in the will. As you have fulfilled the conditions, my partner and I have read the codicil. I do not wish to encumber your understanding with its legal phraseology, but I will acquaint you with the spirit of its contents. In the event that your disposition of the $1,000 demonstrates that you possess any of the qualifications that deserve reward, much benefit will accrue to you. Mr. Sharp and I are named as the judges, and I assure you that we will do our duty strictly according to justice, with liberality. We are not at all unfavorably disposed toward you, Mr. Gillian. But let us return to the letter of the codicil. If your disposal of the money in question has been prudent, wise, or unselfish, it is in our power to hand you over bonds to the value of fifty thousand dollars. Which have been placed in our hands for that purpose. But if, as our client, the late Mr. Gillian, explicitly provides, you have used this money as you have money in the past. I quote the late Mr. Gillian, in reprehensible dissipation among disreputable associates, the fifty thousand dollars is to be paid to Miriam Hayden, ward of the late Mr. Gillian, without delay. Now, Mr. Gillian, Mr. Sharp and I will examine your account in regard to the one thousand dollars. You submit it in writing, I believe. I hope you will repose confidence in our decision. Mr. Tolman reached for the envelope. Gillian was a little the quicker in taking it up. He tore the account and its cover leisurely into strips and dropped them into his pocket. It's all right, he said, smilingly. There isn't a bit of need to bother you with this. I don't suppose you'd understand these itemized bets, anyway. 
I lost the thousand dollars on the races. Good day to you, gentlemen. Tolman and Sharp shook their heads mournfully at each other when Gillian left, for they heard him whistling gaily in the hallway as he waited for the elevator. A comedy in rubber. One may hope, in spite of the metaphorists, to avoid the breath of the deadly upas tree, one may, by great good fortune, succeed in blacking the eye of the basilisk. One might even dodge the attentions of Cerberus and Argus, but no man, alive or dead, can escape the gaze of the rubberer. New York is the Kauchuk city. There are many, of course, who go their ways, making money, without turning to the right or the left, but there is a tribe abroad wonderfully composed, like the Martians. Solely of eyes and means of locomotion. These devotees of curiosity swarm, like flies, in a moment in a struggling, breathless circle about the scene of an unusual occurrence. If a workman opens a manhole, if a streetcar runs over a man from North Terrytown, if a little boy drops an egg on his way home from the grocery, if a casual house or two drops into the subway. If a lady loses a nickel through a hole in the lyle thread, if the police drag a telephone and a racing chart forth from an Ibsen Society reading room. If Senator Depew or Mr. Chuck Connors walks out to take the air, if any of these incidents or accidents takes place, you will see the mad, irresistible rush of the rubber tribe to the spot. The importance of the event does not count. They gaze with equal interest and absorption at a chorus girl or at a man painting a liver pill sign. They will form as deep a cordon around a man with a clubfoot as they will around a balked automobile. They have the Fuhrer rubberendi. They are optical gluttons, feasting and fattening on the misfortunes of their fellow beings. They gloat and pour and glare and squint and stare with their fishy eyes like goggle-eyed perch at the book baited with calamity. It would seem that Cupid would find these ocular vampires too cold game for his calorific shafts, but have we not yet to discover an immune even among the protozoa? Yes, beautiful romance descended upon two of this tribe, and love came into their hearts as they crowded about the prostrate form of a man who had been run over by a brewery wagon. William Pry was the first on the spot. He was an expert at such gatherings. With an expression of intense happiness on his features, he stood over the victim of the accident, listening to his groans as if to the sweetest music. When the crowd of spectators had swelled to a closely packed circle William saw a violent commotion in the crowd opposite him. Men were hurled aside like ninepins by the impact of some moving body that clove them like the rush of a tornado. With elbows, umbrella, hatpin, tongue, and fingernails doing their duty, Violet Seymour forced her way through the mob of onlookers to the first row. Strong men who even had been able to secure a seat on the 530 Harlem Express staggered back like children as she bucked center. Two large lady spectators who had seen the Duke of Roxburgh married and had often blocked traffic on 23rd Street fell back into the second row with ripped shirtwaists when Violet had finished. With them. William Pry loved her at first sight. The ambulance removed the unconscious agent of Cupid. William and Violet remained after the crowd had dispersed. They were true rubberers. People who leave the scene of an accident with the ambulance have not genuine caoutchouc in the cosmogony of their necks. The delicate, fine flavor of the affair is to be had only in the aftertaste, in gloating over the spot, in gazing fixedly at the houses opposite. In hovering there in a dream more exquisite than the opiometer's ecstasy. William Pry and Violet Seymour were connoisseurs in casualties. They knew how to extract full enjoyment from every incident. Presently they looked at each other. Violet had a brown birthmark on her neck as large as a silver half-dollar. William fixed his eyes upon it. William Pry had inordinately bowed legs. Violet allowed her gaze to linger unswervingly upon them. Face to face they stood thus for moments, each staring at the other. Etiquette would not allow them to speak. But in the Kauchuk city it is permitted to gaze without stint at the trees in the parks and at the physical blemishes of a fellow creature. At length with a sigh they parted. But Cupid had been the driver of the brewery wagon, and the wheel that broke a leg united two fond hearts. The next meeting of the hero and heroine was in front of a board fence near Broadway. 
the day had been a disappointing one. There had been no fights on the street, children had kept from under the wheels of the street cars, cripples and fat men in negligee shirts were scarce. Nobody seemed to be inclined to slip on banana peels or fall down with heart disease. Even the sport from Kokomo, Indiana. Who claims to be a cousin of ex-Mayor Lowe and scatters nickels from a cab window, had not put in his appearance. There was nothing to stare at, and William Pry had premonitions of ennui. But he saw a large crowd scrambling and pushing excitedly in front of a billboard. Sprinting for it, he knocked down an old woman and a child carrying a bottle of milk, and fought his way like a demon into the mass of spectators. Already in the inner line stood Violet Seymour with one sleeve and two gold fillings gone, a corset steel puncture and a sprained wrist, but happy. She was looking at what there was to see. A man was painting upon the fence, eat bricklets, they fill your face. Violet blushed when she saw William Pry. William jabbed a lady in a black silk raglan in the ribs, kicked a boy in the shin, bit an old gentleman on the left ear and managed to crowd nearer to Violet. They stood for an hour looking at the man paint the letters. Then William's love could be repressed no longer. He touched her on the arm. Come with me, he said. I know where there is a bootblack without an Adam's apple. She looked up at him shyly, yet with unmistakable love transfiguring her countenance. And you have saved it for me? She asked, trembling with the first dim ecstasy of a woman beloved. Together they hurried to the bootblack stand. An hour they spent there gazing at the malformed youth. A window cleaner fell from the fifth story to the sidewalk beside them. As the ambulance came clanging up William pressed her hand joyously. Four ribs at least and a compound fracture, he whispered, swiftly. You are not sorry that you met me, are you, dearest? Me, said Violet, returning the pressure. Sure not. I could stand all day rubbering with you. The climax of the romance occurred a few days later. Perhaps the reader will remember the intense excitement into which the city was thrown when Eliza Jane, a colored woman, was served with a subpoena. The rubber tribe encamped on the spot. With his own hands William Pry placed a board upon two beer kegs in the street opposite Eliza Jane's residence. He and Violet sat there for three days and nights. Then it occurred to a detective to open the door and serve the subpoena. He sent for a kinetoscope and did so. Two souls with such congenial tastes could not long remain apart. As a policeman drove them away with his night stick that evening they plighted their troth. The seeds of love had been well sown, and had grown up, hardy and vigorous, into a, let us call it a rubber plant. The wedding of William Pry and Violet Seymour was set for June 10. The big church in the middle of the block was banked high with flowers. The populous tribe of rubberers the world over is rampant over weddings. They are the pessimists of the pews. They are the guyers of the groom and the banterers of the bride. They come to laugh at your marriage, and should you escape from Hyman's Tower on the back of death's pale steed they will come to the funeral and sit in the same pew and cry over your luck. Rubber will stretch. The church was lighted. A grosgrain carpet lay over the asphalt to the edge of the sidewalk. Bridesmaids were patting one another's sashes awry and speaking of the bride's freckles. Coachmen tied white ribbons on their whips and bewailed the space of time between drinks. The minister was musing over his possible fee, essaying conjecture whether it would suffice to purchase a new broadcloth suit for himself and a photograph of Laura Jane Libby for his wife. Yeah, Cupid was in the air. And outside the church, oh, my brothers, surged and heaved the rank and file of the tribe of rubberers. In two bodies they were, with the grosgrain carpet and cops with clubs between. They crowded like cattle, they fought. They pressed and surged and swayed and trampled one another to see a bit of a girl in a white veil acquire license to go through a man's pockets while he sleeps. But the hour for the wedding came and went, and the bride and bridegroom came not. And impatience gave way to alarm and alarm brought about search, and they were not found. 
and then two big policemen took a hand and dragged out of the furious mob of onlookers a crushed and trampled thing. With a wedding ring in its vest pocket and a shredded and hysterical woman beating her way to the carpet's edge, ragged, bruised and obstreperous. William Pry and Violet Seymour, creatures of habit, had joined in the seething game of the spectators, unable to resist the overwhelming desire to gaze upon themselves entering. As bride and bridegroom, the rose-decked church. Rubber will out. The defeat of the city. Robert Walmsley's descent upon the city resulted in a Kilkenny struggle. He came out of the fight victor by a fortune and a reputation. On the other hand, he was swallowed up by the city. The city gave him what he demanded and then branded him with its brand. It remodeled, cut, trimmed and stamped him to the pattern it approves. It opened its social gates to him and shut him in on a close-cropped, formal lawn with the select herd of ruminants. In dress, habits, manners, provincialism, routine and narrowness he acquired that charming insolence, that irritating completeness, that sophisticated crassness. That overbalanced poise that makes the Manhattan gentleman so delightfully small in his greatness. One of the upstate rural counties pointed with pride to the successful young metropolitan lawyer as a product of its soil. Six years earlier this county had removed the wheat straw from between its huckleberry-stained teeth and emitted a derisive and bucolic laugh as old man Walmsley's freckle-faced Bob abandoned the certain three per diem meals of the one-horse farm for the discontinuous quick lunch counters of the three-ringed metropolis. At the end of the six years no murder trial, coaching party, automobile accident or cotillion was complete in which the name of Robert Walmsley did not figure. Taylor's waylaid him in the street to get a new wrinkle from the cut of his unwrinkled trousers. Hyphenated fellows in the clubs and members of the oldest subpoenaed families were glad to clap him on the back and allow him three letters of his name. But the Matterhorn of Robert Walmsley's success was not scaled until he married Alicia van der Poel. I cite the Matterhorn, for just so high and cool and white and inaccessible was this daughter of the old burghers. The social Alps that ranged about her over whose bleak passes a thousand climbers struggled, reached only to her knees. She towered in her own atmosphere, serene, chaste, prideful, waiting in no fountains, dining no monkeys, breeding no dogs for bench shows. She was a van der Poel. Fountains were made to play for her. Monkeys were made for other people's ancestors, dogs, she understood, were created to be companions of blind persons and objectionable characters who smoked pipes. This was the Matterhorn that Robert Walmsley accomplished. If he found, with the good poet with the game foot and artificially curled hair, that he who ascends to mountain tops will find the loftiest peaks most wrapped in clouds and snow, he concealed his chilblains beneath a brave and smiling exterior. He was a lucky man and knew it, even though he were imitating the Spartan boy with an ice cream freezer beneath his doublet for peeing the region of his heart. After a brief wedding tour abroad, the couple returned to create a decided ripple in the calm cistern, so placid and cool and sunless it is, of the best society. They entertained at their red brick mausoleum of ancient greatness in an old square that is a cemetery of crumbled glory. And Robert Walmsley was proud of his wife. Although while one of his hands shook his guests the other held tightly to his alpenstock and thermometer. One day Alicia found a letter written to Robert by his mother. It was an unerudite letter, full of crops and motherly love and farm notes. It chronicled the health of the pig and the recent red calf, and asked concerning Robert's in return. It was a letter direct from the soil, straight from home, full of biographies of bees, tales of turnips, peons of new-laid eggs, neglected parents and the slump in dried apples. Why have I not been shown your mother's letters? asked Alicia. There was always something in her voice that made you think of lorgnettes, of accounts at Tiffany's, of sledges smoothly gliding on the trail from Dawson to Forty Mile. Of the tinkling of pendant prisms on your grandmother's chandeliers, of snow lying on a convent roof. Of a police sergeant refusing bail. Your mother, continued Alicia, invites us to make a visit to the farm. I have never seen a farm. We will go there for a week or two, Robert. We will, said Robert, 
with the grand air of an associate supreme justice concurring in an opinion. I did not lay the invitation before you because I thought you would not care to go. I am much pleased at your decision. I will write to her myself, answered Alicia, with a faint foreshadowing of enthusiasm. Felice shall pack my trunks at once. Seven, I think, will be enough. I do not suppose that your mother entertains a great deal. Does she give many house parties? Robert arose, and as attorney for rural places filed a demurrer against six of the seven trunks. He endeavored to define, picture, elucidate, set forth and describe a farm. His own words sounded strange in his ears. He had not realized how thoroughly herbicidized he had become. A week passed and found them landed at the little country station five hours out from the city. A grinning, stentorian, sarcastic youth driving a mule to a spring wagon hailed Robert savagely. Hello, Mr. Walmsley. Found your way back at last, have you? Sorry I couldn't bring in the automobile for you, but Dad's bull-tonguing the ten-acre clover patch with it today. Guess you'll excuse my not wearing a dress suit over to meet you, it ain't six o'clock yet, you know. I'm glad to see you, Tom, said Robert, grasping his brother's hand. Yes, I've found my way at last. You've a right to say, at last. It's been over two years since the last time. But it will be oftener after this, my boy. Alicia, cool in the summer heat as an arctic wraith, white as a Norse snow maiden in her flimsy muslin and fluttering lace parasol, came round the corner of the station. And Tom was stripped of his assurance. He became chiefly eyesight clothed in blue jeans, and on the homeward drive to the mule alone did he confide in language the inwardness of his thoughts. They drove homeward. The low sun dropped a spendthrift flood of gold upon the fortunate fields of wheat. The cities were far away. The road lay curling around wood and dale and hill like a ribbon lost from the robe of careless summer. The wind followed like a whinnying colt in the track of Phoebus's steeds. By and by the farmhouse peeped gray out of its faithful grove, they saw the long lane with its convoy of walnut trees running from the road to the house. They smelled the wild rose and the breath of cool, damp willows in the creek's bed. And then in unison all the voices of the soil began a chant addressed to the soul of Robert Walmsley. Out of the tilted aisles of the dim wood they came hollowly, they chirped and buzzed from the parched grass, they trilled from the ripples of the creek ford. They floated up in clear pans pipe notes from the dimming meadows, the whippoorwills joined in as they pursued midges in the upper air. Slow-going cowbells struck out a homely accompaniment, and this was what each one said, you found your way back at last, have you? The old voices of the soil spoke to him. Leaf and bud and blossom conversed with him in the old vocabulary of his careless youth, the inanimate things, the familiar stones and rails. The gates and furrows and roofs and turns of the road had an eloquence, too, and a power in the transformation. The country had smiled and he had felt the breath of it, and his heart was drawn as if in a moment back to his old love. The city was far away. This rural atavism, then, seized Robert Walmsley and possessed him. A queer thing he noticed in connection with it was that Alicia, sitting at his side, suddenly seemed to him a stranger. She did not belong to this recurrent phase. Never before had she seemed so remote, so colorless and high, so intangible and unreal. And yet he had never admired her more than when she sat there by him in the rickety spring wagon. Chiming no more with his mood and with her environment than the Matterhorn chimes with a peasant's cabbage garden. That night when the greetings and the supper were over, the entire family, including Buff, the yellow dog, bestrewed itself upon the front porch. Alicia, not haughty but silent, sat in the shadow dressed in an exquisite pale gray tea gown. Robert's mother discoursed to her happily concerning marmalade and lumbago. Tom sat on the top step. Sisters Millie and Pam on the lowest step to catch the lightning bugs. Mother had the willow rocker. Father sat in the big armchair with one of its arms gone. Buff sprawled in the middle of the porch in everybody's way. 
the twilight pixies and pucks stole forth unseen and plunged other poignant shafts of memory into the heart of Robert. A rural madness entered his soul. The city was far away. Father sat without his pipe, writhing in his heavy boots, a sacrifice to rigid courtesy. Robert shouted, No, you don't. He fetched the pipe and lit it, he seized the old gentleman's boots and tore them off. The last one slipped suddenly, and Mr. Robert Walmsley, of Washington Square, tumbled off the porch backward with Buff on top of him, howling fearfully. Tom laughed sarcastically. Robert tore off his coat and vest and hurled them into a lilac bush. Come out here, you landlubber, he cried to Tom, and I'll put grass seed on your back. I think you called me a dude a while ago. Come along and cut your capers. Tom understood the invitation and accepted it with delight. Three times they wrestled on the grass, side holds, even as the giants of the mat. And twice was Tom forced to bite grass at the hands of the distinguished lawyer. Disheveled, panting, each still boasting of his own prowess, they stumbled back to the porch. Millie cast a pert reflection upon the qualities of a city brother. In an instant Robert had secured a horrid katydid in his fingers and bore down upon her. Screaming wildly, she fled up the lane, pursued by the avenging glass of form. A quarter of a mile and they returned, she full of apology to the victorious dude. The rustic mania possessed him unabatedly. I can do up a cowpenful of you slow hayseeds, he proclaimed, vaingloriously. Bring on your bulldogs, your hired men and your log rollers. He turned handsprings on the grass that prodded Tom to envious sarcasm. And then, with a whoop, he clattered to the rear and brought back Uncle Ike, a battered colored retainer of the family, with his banjo. And strewed sand on the porch and danced, chicken in the bread tray, and did buck and wing wonders for half an hour longer. Incredibly, wild and boisterous things he did. He sang, he told stories that set all but one shrieking, he played the yokel, the humorous clodhopper. He was mad, mad with the revival of the old life in his blood. He became so extravagant that once his mother sought gently to reprove him. Then Alicia moved as though she were about to speak, but she did not. Through it all she sat immovable, a slim, white spirit in the dusk that no man might question or read. By and by she asked permission to ascend to her room, saying that she was tired. On her way she passed Robert. He was standing in the door, the figure of vulgar comedy, with ruffled hair, reddened face and unpardonable confusion of attire, no trace there of the immaculate Robert Walmsley. The corded clubman and ornament of select circles. He was doing a conjuring trick with some household utensils, and the family, now won over to him without exception, was beholding him with worshipful admiration. As Alicia passed in Robert started suddenly. He had forgotten for the moment that she was present. Without a glance at him she went on upstairs. After that the fun grew quiet. An hour passed in talk, and then Robert went up himself. She was standing by the window when he entered their room. She was still clothed as when they were on the porch. Outside and crowding against the window was a giant apple tree, full-blossomed. Robert sighed and went near the window. He was ready to meet his fate. A confessed vulgarian, he foresaw the verdict of justice in the shape of that white-clad form. He knew the rigid lines that a van der Poel would draw. He was a peasant gambling indecorously in the valley, and the pure, cold, white, unthawed summit of the Matterhorn could not but frown on him. He had been unmasked by his own actions. All the polish, the poise, the form that the city had given him had fallen from him like an ill-fitting mantle at the first breath of a country breeze. Dully he awaited the approaching condemnation. Robert, said the calm, cool voice of his judge, I thought I married a gentleman. Yes, it was coming. And yet, in the face of it, Robert Walmsley was eagerly regarding a certain branch of the apple tree upon which he used to climb out of that very window. He believed he could do it now. He wondered how many blossoms there were on the tree, ten millions. But here was someone speaking again. I thought I married a gentleman, 
the voice went on, but. Why had she come and was standing so close by his side? But I find that I have married, was this Alicia talking, something better, a man, Bob, dear, kiss me, won't you? The city was far away. The pride of the cities. Said Mr. Kipling, the cities are full of pride, challenging each to each. Even so. New York was empty. Two hundred thousand of its people were away for the summer. Three million eight hundred thousand remained as caretakers and to pay the bills of the absentees. But the two hundred thousand are an expensive lot. The New Yorker sat at a roof garden table, ingesting solace through a straw. His Panama lay upon a chair. The July audience was scattered among vacant seats as widely as outfielders when the champion batter steps to the plate. Vaudeville happened at intervals. The breeze was cool from the bay. Around and above, everywhere except on the stage, were stars. Glimpses were to be had of waiters, always disappearing, like startled chamois. Prudent visitors who had ordered refreshments by phone in the morning were now being served. The New Yorker was aware of certain drawbacks to his comfort, but content beamed softly from his rimless eyeglasses. His family was out of town. The drinks were warm. The ballet was suffering from lack of both tune and talcum, but his family would not return until September. Then up into the garden stumbled the man from Topaz City, Nevada. The gloom of the solitary sightseer enwrapped him. Bereft of joy through loneliness, he stalked with a widower's face through the halls of pleasure. Thirst for human companionship possessed him as he panted in the metropolitan draft. Straight to the New Yorker's table he steered. The New Yorker, disarmed and made reckless by the lawless atmosphere of a roof garden, decided upon utter abandonment of his life's traditions. He resolved to shatter with one rash, daredevil, impulsive, harebrained act the conventions that had hitherto been woven into his existence. Carrying out this radical and precipitous inspiration he nodded slightly to the stranger as he drew nearer the table. The next moment found the man from Topaz City in the list of the New Yorker's closest friends. He took a chair at the table, he gathered two others for his feet, he tossed his broad-brimmed hat upon a fourth, and told his life's history to his newfound pard. The New Yorker warmed a little, as an apartment house furnace warms when the strawberry season begins. A waiter who came within hail in an unguarded moment was captured and paroled on an errand to the Dr. Wiley Experimental Station. The ballet was now in the midst of a musical vagary, and danced upon the stage programmed as Bolivian peasants, clothed in some portions of its anatomy as Norwegian fisher maidens. In others as ladies-in-waiting of Marie Antoinette, historically denuded in other portions so as to represent sea nymphs and presenting the tout ensemble of a social club of Central Park West housemaids at a fish fry. Been in the city long, inquired the New Yorker, getting ready the exact tip against the waiters coming with large change from the bill. Me, said the man from Topaz City. Four days. Never in Topaz City, was you? I, said the New Yorker. I was never farther west than 8th Avenue. I had a brother who died on 9th, but I met the cortege at 8th. There was a bunch of violets on the hearse, and the undertaker mentioned the incident to avoid mistake. I cannot say that I am familiar with the West. Topaz City, said the man who occupied four chairs, is one of the finest towns in the world. I presume that you have seen the sights of the metropolis, said the New Yorker, for days is not a sufficient length of time in which to view even our most salient points of interest. But one can possibly form a general impression. Our architectural supremacy is what generally strikes visitors to our city most forcibly. Of course you have seen our flat iron building. It is considered. Saw it, said the man from Topaz City. But you ought to come out our way. It's mountainous, you know and the ladies all wear short skirts for climbing an. Excuse me, said the New Yorker, but that isn't exactly the point. New York must be a wonderful revelation to a visitor from the West. Now, as to our hotels. Say, said the man from Topaz City, that reminds me, 
there were 16 stage robbers shot last year within 20 miles of. I was speaking of hotels. Said the New Yorker. We lead Europe in that respect. And as far as our leisure class is concerned we are far. Oh, I don't know, interrupted the man from Topaz City. There were twelve tramps in our jail when I left home. I guess New York isn't so. Beg pardon, you seem to misapprehend the idea. Of course, you visited the stock exchange and Wall Street, where the Oh, yes, said the man from Topaz City, as he lighted a Pennsylvania stogie. And I want to tell you that we've got the finest town marshal west of the Rockies. Bill Rayner he took in five pickpockets out of the crowd when Red Nose Thompson laid the cornerstone of his new saloon. Topaz City don't allow. Have another Rhine wine and seltzer, suggested the New Yorker. I've never been west, as I said, but there can't be any place out there to compare with New York. As to the claims of Chicago I. One man, said the Topazite, one man only has been murdered and robbed in Topaz City in the last three. Oh, I know what Chicago is, interposed the New Yorker. Have you been up Fifth Avenue to see the magnificent residences of our mill? Seen em all. You ought to know Reub Stiegel, the assessor of Topaz. When old man Tilbury, that owns the only two-story house in town, tried to swear his taxes from $6,000 down to $450. 75, Reub buckled on his 45 and went down to see. Yes, yes, but speaking of our great city, one of its greatest features is our superb police department. There is no body of men in the world that can equal it for. That waiter gets around like a Langley flying machine, remarked the man from Topaz City, thirstily. We've got men in our town, too, worth $400,000. There's old Bill Withers and Colonel Metcalf N. Have you seen Broadway at night? asked the New Yorker, courteously. There are few streets in the world that can compare with it. When the electrics are shining and the pavements are alive with two hurrying streams of elegantly clothed men and beautiful women attired in the costliest costumes that wind in and out in a close maze of expensively. Never knew but one case in Topaz City. Said the man from the West. Jim Bailey, our mayor, had his watch and chain and $235 in cash taken from his pocket while. That's another matter, said the New Yorker. While you are in our city you should avail yourself of every opportunity to see its wonders. Our rapid transit system. If you was out in Topaz, broken the man from there, I could show you a whole cemetery full of people that got killed accidentally. Talking about mangling folks up. Why, when Barry Rogers turned loose that old double-barreled shotgun of his loaded with slugs at anybody. Here, waiter called the New Yorker. Two more of the same. It is acknowledged by everyone that our city is the center of art, and literature, and learning. Take, for instance, our after-dinner speakers. Where else in the country would you find such wit and eloquence as emanate from Depew and Ford, N? If you take the papers, interrupted the Westerner. You must have read of Pete Webster's daughter. The Websters live two blocks north of the courthouse in Topaz City. Miss Tilly Webster, she slept forty days and nights without waking up. The doctor said that. Pass the matches, please, said the New Yorker. Have you observed the expedition with which new buildings are being run up in New York? Improved inventions in steel framework and. I noticed, said the Nevadian. That the statistics of Topaz City showed only one carpenter crushed by falling timbers last year and he was caught in a cyclone. They abuse our skyline, continued the New Yorker, and it is likely that we are not yet artistic in the construction of our buildings. But I can safely assert that we lead in pictorial and decorative art. In some of our houses can be found masterpieces in the way of paintings and sculpture. One who has the autre to our best galleries will find. Back up, exclaimed the man from Topaz City. There was a game last month in our town in which $90,000 changed hands on a pair of. Taramtera, went the orchestra. The stage curtain, blushing pink at the name Asbestos, inscribed upon it, 
came down with a slow midsummer movement. The audience trickled leisurely down the elevator and stairs. On the sidewalk below, the New Yorker and the man from Topaz City shook hands with alcoholic gravity. The elevated crashed raucously, surface cars hummed and clanged, cabmen swore, newsboys shrieked, wheels clattered ear-piercingly. The New Yorker conceived a happy thought, with which he aspired to clinch the preeminence of his city. You must admit, said he, that in the way of noise New York is far ahead of any other. Back to the Everglades, said the man from Topaz City. In 1900, when Sousa's band and the repeating candidate were in our town you couldn't. The rattle of an express wagon drowned the rest of the words. The Greater Coney. Next Sunday, said Dennis Carnahan, I'll be after going down to see the new Coney Island that's risen like a phoenix bird from the ashes of the old resort. I'm going with Nora Flynn, and will fall victims to all the dry goods deceptions. From the red flannel eruption of Mount Vesuvius to the pink silk ribbons on the race suicide problems in the incubator kiosk. Was I there before? I was. I was there last Tuesday. Did I see the sights? I did not. Last Monday I amalgamated myself with the Bricklayers' Union. And in accordance with the rules I was ordered to quit work the same day on account of a sympathy strike with the Lady Salmon Canners Lodge No. 2, of Tacoma, Washington. Twas disturbed I was in mind and proclivities by losing me job. Bein already harassed in me soul on account of havin' quarreled with Nora Flynn a week before by reason of hard words spoken at the dairyman and street sprinkler driver's semi-annual ball. Caused by jealousy and prickly heat and that divil, Andy Coglin. So, I says, it will be Coney for Tuesday. And if the shoots and the short change and the green corn silk between the teeth don't create diversions and get me feeling better, then I don't know at all. You will have heard that Coney has received moral reconstruction. The old Bowery, where they used to take your tintype by force and give ye knockout drops before having your palm read, is now called the Wall Street of the Island. The Wienerwurst stands are required by law to keep a news ticker in M, and the donuts are examined every four years by a retired steamboat inspector. The nigger man's head that was used by the old patrons to throw baseballs at is now illegal and, by order of the police commissioner the image of a man driving an automobile has been substituted. I hear that the old immoral amusements have been suppressed. People who used to go down from New York to sit in the sand and dabble in the surf now give up their quarters to squeeze through turnstiles and see imitations of city fires and floods painted on. Canvas. The reprehensible and degradant resorts that disgraced old Coney are said to be wiped out. The wiping out process consists of raisin, the price from 10 cents to 25 cents, and hiring a blonde named Maudie to sell tickets instead of Mickey, the Bowery Bite. That's what they say, I don't know. But to Coney I goes a Tuesday. I gets off the L and starts for the glitterin' show. Twas a fine sight. The Babylonian towers and the Hindu roof gardens was blazin' with thousands of electric lights, and the streets was thick with people. Tis a true thing they say that Coney levels all rank. I see millionaires eatin' popcorn and trampin' along with the crowd. And I see eight dollar a week clothin' store clerks in red automobiles fightin' one another for who'd squeeze the horn when they come to a corner. I made a mistake, I says to myself. Twas not Coney I needed. When a man's sad, tis not scenes of hilarity he wants. Twould be far better for him to meditate in a graveyard or to attend services at the Paradise Roof Gardens. Tis no consolation when a man's lost his sweetheart to order hot corn and have the waiter bring him the powdered sugar cruet instead of salt and then conceal himself, or to have zozukum. The gypsy palmist, tell him that he has three children and to look out for another serious calamity. Price 25 cents. I walked far away down on the beach, to the ruins of an old pavilion near one corner of this new private park, Dreamland. A year ago that old pavilion was standin' up straight and the old-style waiters was slammin' a weak supply of clam chowder down in front of you for a nickel and callin' you, cully, friendly. And vice was rampant 
and you got back to New York with enough change to take a car at the bridge. Now they tell me that they serve Welsh rabbits on Surf Avenue, and you get the right change back in the moving picture joints. I sat down at one side of the old pavilion and looked at the surf spreading itself on the beach, and thought about the time me and Nora Flynn sat on that spot last summer. Twas before reform struck the island, and we was happy. We had tin types and chowder in the ribald dives, and the Egyptian sorceress of the Nile told Nora out of her hand, while I was waiting in the door. That twould be the luck of her to marry a red-headed gassoon with two crooked legs, and I was overrunnin' with joy on account of the illusion. And twas there that Nora Flynn put her two hands in mine a year before and we talked of flats and the things she could cook and the love business that goes with such episodes. And that was Coney as we loved it, and as the hand of Satan was upon it, friendly and noisy and your money's worth. With no fence around the ocean and not too many electric lights to show the sleeve of a black serge coat against a white shirtwaist. I sat with my back to the parks where they had the moon and the dreams and the steeples corralled, and longed for the old coney. There wasn't many people on the beach. Lots of them was feed in pennies into the slot machines to see the interrupted courtship in the movin' pictures. And a good many was talking the sea air in the canals of Venice and some was breathin' the smoke of the sea battle by actual warships in a tank filled with real water. A few was down on the sands enjoying the moonlight and the water. And the heart of me was heavy for the new morals of the old island, while the bands behind me played and the sea pounded on the bass drum in front. And directly I got up and walked along the old pavilion, and there on the other side of, half in the dark, was a slip of a girl sitting on the tumble-down timbers. And unless I'm a liar she was crying by herself there, all alone. Is it trouble you are in, now, miss, says I, and what's to be done about it? Tis none of your business at all, Denny Carnahan, says she, sitting up straight. And it was the voice of no other than Nora Flynn. Then it's not, says I, and we're after having a pleasant evening, Miss Flynn. Have ye seen the sights of this new Coney Island, then? I presume ye have come here for that purpose, says I. I have, says she. Me mother and Uncle Tim they are waiting beyond. Tis an elegant evening I've had. I've seen all the attractions that be. Right ye are, says I to Nora, and I don't know when I've been that amused. After disporting myself among the most laughable moral improvements of the revised shell games I took myself to the shore for the benefit of the cool air. And did ye observe the Durbar, Miss Flynn? I did, says she, reflectin', but tis not safe, I'm thinkin', to ride down them slantin' things into the water. How did ye fancy the shoot the shoots? I asks. True, then, I'm afraid of guns, says Nora. They make such noise in my ears. But Uncle Tim, he shot them, he did, and won cigars. Tis a fine time we had this day, Mr. Carnahan. I'm glad you've enjoyed yourself, I says. I suppose you've had a roarin' fine time seein' the sights. And how did the incubators and the helter-skelter and the midgets suit the taste of ye? I, I wasn't hungry, says Nora, faint. But mother ate a quantity of all of M. I'm that pleased with the fine things in the new Coney Island, says she, that it's the happiest day I've seen in a long time, at all. Did you see Venice, says I. We did, says she. She was a beauty. She was all dressed in red, she was, with. I listened no more to Nora Flynn. I stepped up and I gathered her in my arms. Tis a storyteller ye are, Nora Flynn, says I. Ye ve seen no more of the greater Coney Island than I have myself. Come, now, tell the truth, ye came to sit by the old pavilion by the waves where you sat last summer and made Dennis Carnahan a happy man. Speak up, and tell the truth. Nora stuck her nose against me vest. I despise it, Denny, she says, half crying. Mother and Uncle Tim went to see the shows, but I came down here to think of you. I couldn't bear the lights and the crowd. Are you forgiven, me, Denny, for the words we had? 
"'Twas me fault, says I, I came here for the same reason myself. Look at the lights, Nora, I says, turning my back to the sea, ain't they pretty? They are, says Nora, with her eyes shurneen, and do ye hear the bands playin'? Oh, Denny, I think I'd like to see it all. The old coney is gone, darlin', I says to her. Everything moves. When a man's glad it's not scenes of sadness he wants. Tis a greater coney we have here, but we couldn't see it till we got in the humor for it. Next Sunday, Nora Darlin, we'll see the new place from end to end. Transients in Arcadia There is a hotel on Broadway that has escaped discovery by the summer resort promoters. It is deep and wide and cool. Its rooms are finished in dark oak of a low temperature. Homemade breezes and deep green shrubbery give it the delights without the inconveniences of the Adirondacks. One can mount its broad staircases or glide dreamily upward in its aerial elevators, attended by guides in brass buttons, with a serene joy that alpine climbers have never attained. There is a chef in its kitchen who will prepare for you brook trout better than the White Mountains ever served, sea food that would turn old point comfort, by gad, sa. Green with envy, and main venison that would melt the official heart of a game warden. A few have found out this oasis in the July desert of Manhattan. During that month you will see the hotel's reduced array of guests scattered luxuriously about in the cool twilight of its lofty dining room. Gazing at one another across the snowy waste of unoccupied tables, silently congratulatory. Superfluous, watchful, pneumatically moving waiters hover near, supplying every want before it is expressed. The temperature is perpetual April. The ceiling is painted in water colors to counterfeit a summer sky across which delicate clouds drift and do not vanish as those of nature do to our regret. The pleasing, distant roar of Broadway is transformed in the imagination of the happy guests to the noise of a waterfall filling the woods with its restful sound. At every strange footstep the guests turn an anxious ear, fearful lest their retreat be discovered and invaded by the restless pleasure-seekers who are forever hounding nature to her deepest lairs. Thus in the depopulated caravansary the little band of connoisseurs jealously hide themselves during the heated season. Enjoying to the uttermost the delights of mountain and seashore that art and skill have gathered and served to them. In this July came to the hotel one whose card that she sent to the clerk for her name to be registered read, Madame Heloise Darcy Beaumont. Madame Beaumont was a guest such as the Hotel Lotus loved. She possessed the fine air of the elite, tempered and sweetened by a cordial graciousness that made the hotel employees her slaves. Bellboys fought for the honor of answering her ring, the clerks, but for the question of ownership, would have deeded to her the hotel and its contents. The other guests regarded her as the final touch of feminine exclusiveness and beauty that rendered the entourage perfect. This super-excellent guest rarely left the hotel. Her habits were consonant with the customs of the discriminating patrons of the Hotel Lotus. To enjoy that delectable hostelry one must forego the city as though it were leagues away. By night a brief excursion to the nearby roofs is in order. But during the torrid day one remains in the umbrageous fastnesses of the Lotus as a trout hangs poised in the pellucid sanctuaries of his favorite pool. Though alone in the Hotel Lotus, Madame Beaumont preserved the state of a queen whose loneliness was of position only. She breakfasted at ten, a cool, sweet, leisurely, delicate being who glowed softly in the dimness like a jasmine flower in the dusk. But at dinner was Madame's glory at its height. She wore a gown as beautiful and immaterial as the mist from an unseen cataract in a mountain gorge. The nomenclature of this gown is beyond the guess of the scribe. Always pale red roses reposed against its lace-garnished front. It was a gown that the head waiter viewed with respect and met at the door. You thought of Paris when you saw it, and maybe of mysterious countesses, and certainly of Versailles and rapiers and Mrs. Fisk and Rougy Tinoir. There was an untraceable rumor in the Hotel Lotus that Madame was a cosmopolite, and that she was pulling with her slender white hands certain strings between the nations in the favor of Russia. 
Being a sightiseness of the world's smoothest roads it was small wonder that she was quick to recognize in the refined purlieus of the Hotel Lotus the most desirable spot in America for a restful sojourn during the heat of midsummer. On the third day of Madame Beaumont's residence in the hotel a young man entered and registered himself as a guest. His clothing, to speak of his points in approved order, was quietly in the mode. His features good and regular, his expression that of a poised and sophisticated man of the world. He informed the clerk that he would remain three or four days, inquired concerning the sailing of European steamships, and sank into the blissful inanition of the Nonpareil Hotel with the contented air of a traveller in his favourite inn. The young man, not to question the veracity of the register, was Harold Farrington. He drifted into the exclusive and calm current of life in the Lotus so tactfully and silently that not a ripple alarmed his fellow seekers after rest. He ate in the Lotus and of its patronym, and was lulled into blissful peace with the other fortunate mariners. In one day he acquired his table and his waiter and the fear lest the panting chasers after repose that kept Broadway warm should pounce upon and destroy this contiguous but covert haven. After dinner on the next day after the arrival of Harold Farrington Madame Beaumont dropped her handkerchief in passing out. Mr. Farrington recovered and returned it without the effusiveness of a seeker after acquaintance. Perhaps there was a mystic freemasonry between the discriminating guests of the Lotus. Perhaps they were drawn one to another by the fact of their common good fortune in discovering the acme of summer resorts in a Broadway hotel. Words delicate in courtesy and tentative in departure from formality passed between the two. And, as if in the expedient atmosphere of a real summer resort, an acquaintance grew, flowered and fructified on the spot as does the mystic plant of the conjurer. For a few moments they stood on a balcony upon which the corridor ended, and tossed the feathery ball of conversation. One tires of the old resorts, said Madame Beaumont, with a faint but sweet smile. What is the use to fly to the mountains or the seashore to escape noise and dust when the very people that make both follow us there? Even on the ocean, remarked Farrington, sadly, the Philistines be upon you. The most exclusive steamers are getting to be scarcely more than ferry boats. Heaven help us when the summer resorter discovers that the Lotus is further away from Broadway than Thousand Islands or Mackinac. I hope our secret will be safe for a week, anyhow said madam, with a sigh and a smile. I do not know where I would go if they should descend upon the dear lotus. I know of but one place so delightful in summer, and that is the castle of Count Polinsky, in the Ural Mountains. I hear that Baden-Baden and Cannes are almost deserted this season, said Farrington. Year by year the old resorts fall in disrepute. Perhaps many others, like ourselves, are seeking out the quiet nooks that are overlooked by the majority. I promise myself three days more of this delicious rest, said Madame Beaumont. On Monday the Cedric sails. Harold Farrington's eyes proclaimed his regret. I too must leave on Monday, he said, but I do not go abroad. Madame Beaumont shrugged one round shoulder in a foreign gesture. One cannot hide here forever, charming though it may be. The chateau has been in preparation for me longer than a month. Those house parties that one must give, what a nuisance. But I shall never forget my week in the Hotel Lotus. Nor shall I, said Farrington in a low voice, and I shall never forgive the Cedric. On Sunday evening, three days afterward, the two sat at a little table on the same balcony. A discreet waiter brought ices and small glasses of claret cup. Madame Beaumont wore the same beautiful evening gown that she had worn each day at dinner. She seemed thoughtful. Near her hand on the table lay a small chatelaine purse. After she had eaten her ice she opened the purse and took out a one-dollar bill. Mr. Farrington, she said, with the smile that had won the hotel lotus, I want to tell you something. I'm going to leave before breakfast in the morning, because I've got to go back to my work. I'm behind the hosiery counter at Casey's Mammoth Store, and my vacation's up at eight o'clock tomorrow. That paper dollar is the last cent I'll see till I draw my eight dollars salary next Saturday night. You're a real gentleman, and you've been good to me, and I wanted to tell you before I went. 
I've been saving up out of my wages for a year just for this vacation. I wanted to spend one week like a lady if I never do another one. I wanted to get up when I please instead of having to crawl out at seven every morning, and I wanted to live on the best and be waited on and ring bells for things just like rich folks do. Now I've done it, and I've had the happiest time I ever expect to have in my life. I'm going back to my work in my little hall bedroom satisfied for another year. I wanted to tell you about it, Mr. Farrington, because I, I thought you kind of liked me, and I, I liked you. But, oh, I couldn't help deceiving you up till now, for it was all just like a fairy tale to me. So I talked about Europe and the things I've read about in other countries, and made you think I was a great lady. This dress I've got on, it's the only one I have that's fit to wear, I bought from O'Dowd and Levinsky on the installment plan. Seventy-five dollars is the price, and it was made to measure. I paid ten dollar down, and there to collect one dollar a week till it's paid for. That'll be about all I have to say, Mr. Farrington, except that my name is Mamie Siviter instead of Madame Beaumont, and I thank you for your attentions. This dollar will pay the installment due on the dress tomorrow. I guess I'll go up to my room now. Harold Farrington listened to the recital of the Lotus's loveliest guest with an impassive countenance. When she had concluded he drew a small book like a checkbook from his coat pocket. He wrote upon a blank form in this with a stub of pencil, tore out the leaf, tossed it over to his companion and took up the paper dollar. I've got to go to work, too, in the morning, he said, and I might as well begin now. There's a receipt for the dollar installment. I've been a collector for O'Dowd and Levinsky for three years. Funny, ain't it, that you and me both had the same idea about spending our vacation? I've always wanted to put up at a swell hotel, and I saved up out of my twenty per, and did it. Say, Mame, how about a trip to Coney Saturday night on the boat, what? The face of the pseudo-Madame Heloise Darcy Beaumont beamed. Oh, you bet I'll go, Mr. Farrington. The store closes at twelve on Saturdays. I guess Coney'll be all right even if we did spend a week with the swells. Below the balcony the sweltering city growled and buzzed in the July night. Inside the hotel Lotus the tempered, cool shadows reigned, and the solicitous waiter single-footed near the low windows, ready at a nod to serve Madame and her escort. At the door of the elevator Farrington took his leave, and Madame Beaumont made her last ascent. But before they reached the noiseless cage he said, Just forget that, Harold Farrington, will you? McManus is the name, James McManus. Some call me Jimmy. Good night, Jimmy, said Madam. The lady higher up. New York City, they said, was deserted, and that accounted, doubtless, for the sounds carrying so far in the tranquil summer air. The breeze was south by southwest. The hour was midnight, the theme was a bit of feminine gossip by wireless mythology. 365 feet above the heated asphalt the tiptoeing symbolic deity on Manhattan pointed her vacillating arrow straight, for the time. In the direction of her exalted sister on Liberty Island. The lights of the great garden were out. The benches in the square were filled with sleepers in postures so strange that beside them the writhing figures indoors illustrations of the inferno would have straightened into Taylor's dummies. The statue of Diana on the tower of the garden, its constancy shown by its weathercock ways, its innocence by the coating of gold that it has acquired, its devotion to style by its single. Graceful flying scarf, its candor and artlessness by its habit of ever drawing the long bow. Its metropolitanism by its posture of swift flight to catch a Harlem train, remained poised with its arrow pointed across the upper bay. Had that arrow sped truly and horizontally it would have passed fifty feet above the head of the heroic matron whose duty it is to offer a cast ironical welcome to the oppressed of other lands. Seaward this lady gazed, and the furrows between steamship lines began to cut steerage rates. The translators, too, have put an extra burden upon her. Liberty lighting the world, as her creator christened her, would have had a no more responsible duty, except for the size of it, than that of an electrician or a standard oil magnate. But to, enlighten, the world, as our learned civic guardians, Englished, it, 
requires abler qualities. And so poor liberty, instead of having a sinecure as a mere illuminator, must be converted into a Chautauqua schoolmom, with the oceans for her field instead of the placid, classic lake. With a fireless torch and an empty head must she dispel the shadows of the world and teach it its A, B, C's. Ah, there, Mrs. Liberty! Called a clear, rollicking soprano voice through the still, midnight air. Is that you, Miss Diana? Excuse my not turning my head. I'm not as flighty and whirly-whirly as some. And tis so hoarse I am I can hardly talk on account of the peanut hulls left on the stairs in me throat by that last boatload of tourists from Marietta, Ohio. Tis after being a fine evening, miss. If you don't mind my asking, came the bell-like tones of the golden statue, I'd like to know where you got that city hall brogue. I didn't know that liberty was necessarily Irish. If ye'd studied the history of art and its foreign complications ye'd not need to ask, replied the offshore statue. If ye wasn't so light-headed and giddy ye'd know that I was made by a dago and presented to the American people on behalf of the French government for the purpose of welcoming Irish immigrants into the Dutch city of New York. Tis that I've been doing night and day since I was erected. Ye must know, Miss Diana. That tis with statues the same as with people, tis not their makers nor the purposes for which they were created that influence the operations of their tongues at all, it's the associations with which they become associated. I'm telling ye. You're dead right, agreed Diana. I notice it on myself. If any of the old guys from Olympus were to come along and hand me any hot air in the ancient Greek I couldn't tell it from a conversation between a Coney Island car conductor and a five-cent fare. I'm right glad ye ve made up your mind to be sociable, Miss Diana, said Mrs. Liberty. Tis a lonesome life I have down here. Is there anything doin' up in the city, Miss Diana, dear? Oh, la, 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 no, said Diana. Notice that, la, 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 Aunt Liberty? Got that from, Paris by night on the roof garden under me. You'll hear that, la, 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 at the Café McCann now, along with, Garçon. The bohemian crowd there have become tired of, Garçon, since O'Rafferty, the head waiter, punched three of them for calling him it. Oh, no, the town's strictly on the bum these nights. Everybody's away. Saw a downtown merchant on a roof garden this evening with his stenographer. Show was so dull he went to sleep. A waiter biting on a dime tip to see if it was good half woke him up. He looks around and sees his little pothook's perpetrator. Hum, says he, will you take a letter, Miss de St. Montmorency? Sure, in a minute, says she, if you'll make it an X. That was the best thing happened on the roof. So you see how dull it is. La, la, la. Tis fine ye have it up there in society, Miss Diana. Ye have the cat show and the horse show and the military tournaments where the privates look grand as generals and the generals try to look grand as floorwalkers. And ye have the sportsman's show, where the girl that measures 36, 19, 45 cooks breakfast food in a birch bark wigwam on the banks of the Grand Canal of Venice conducted by one of the Vanderbilts. Bernard McFadden, and the Reverends Dowie and Duss. And ye have the French ball, where the original Coens and the Robert Emmett Sangerbund Society dance the Highland fling one with another. And ye have the Grand Orion Ball, which is the most beautiful pageant in the world, where the French students vie with the Tyrolean warblers in doing the cakewalk. Ye have the best job for a statue in the whole town, Miss Diana. Tis weary work, sighed the island statue, disseminating the science of liberty in New York Bay. Sometimes when I take a peep down at Ellis Island and see the gang of immigrants I'm supposed to light up. Tis tempted I am to blow out the gas and let the coroner write out their naturalization papers. Say, it's a shame, ain't it, to give you the worst end of it, came the sympathetic antiphony of the steeplechase goddess. It must be awfully lonesome down there with so much water around you. I don't see how you ever keep your hair in curl. And that Mother Hubbard you are wearing went out ten years ago. I think those sculptor guys ought to be held for damages for putting iron or marble clothes on a lady. 
that's where Mr. St. Gaudens was wise. I'm always a little ahead of the styles. But they're coming my way pretty fast. Excuse my back a moment, I caught a puff of wind from the north, shouldn't wonder if things had loosened up in Esopus. There, now. It's in the west, I should think that gold plank would have calmed the air out in that direction. What were you saying, Mrs. Liberty? A fine chat I've had with ye, Miss Diana, ma'am, but I see one of them European steamers a sailin' up the narrows, and I must be attendin' to me duties. Tis me job to extend aloft the torch of liberty to welcome all them that survive the kicks that the steerage stewards give em while landin'. Sure, tis a great country ye can come to for eight dollars. Fifty, and the doctor waitin' to send ye back home free if he sees your eyes red from cryin' for it. The golden statue veered in the changing breeze, menacing many points on the horizon with its aureate arrow. So long, Aunt Liberty, sweetly called Diana of the Tower. Some night, when the wind's right. I'll call you up again. But, say. You haven't got such a fierce kick coming about your job. I've kept a pretty good watch on the island of Manhattan since I've been up here. That's a pretty sick-looking bunch of Liberty Chasers they dump down at your end of it. But they don't all stay that way. Every little while up here I see guys signing checks and voting the right ticket, and encouraging the arts and taking a bath every morning. That was shoved ashore by a dock laborer born in the United States who never earned over forty dollars a month. Don't run down your job, Aunt Liberty, you're all right, all right. The Foreign Policy of Company 99 John Burns, hosecart driver of Engine Company No. 99, was afflicted with what his comrades called Japonitis. Burns had a war map spread permanently upon a table in the second story of the engine house, and he could explain to you at any hour of the day or night the exact positions, conditions and intentions of both the Russian and Japanese armies. He had little clusters of pins stuck in the map which represented the opposing forces, and these he moved about from day to day in conformity with the war news in the daily papers. Wherever the Japs won a victory John Burns would shift his pins, and then he would execute a war dance of delight, and the other firemen would hear him yell, Go it, you blamed little, sawed off. Huckleberry-eyed, monkey-faced hot tamales. Eat em up, you little slight o hand, bow-legged bull terriers, give em another of them yalululus, and you'll eat rice in St. Petersburg. Talk about your Russians, say, wouldn't they give you a pain sky when it comes to a scrap of itch? Not even on the fair island of Nippon was there a more enthusiastic champion of the Mikado's men. Supporters of the Russian cause did well to keep clear of engine house number 99. Sometimes all thoughts of the Japs left John Burns's head. That was when the alarm of fire had sounded and he was strapped in his driver's seat on the swaying cart, guiding Erebus and Joe, the finest team in the whole department, according to the crew of 99. Of all the codes adopted by man for regulating his actions toward his fellow mortals, the greatest are these, the Code of King Arthur's Knights of the Round Table. The Constitution of the United States and the Unwritten Rules of the New York Fire Department. The round table methods are no longer practicable since the invention of streetcars and breach of promise suits, and our constitution is being found more and more unconstitutional every day. So the code of our firemen must be considered in the lead, with the golden rule and Jeffries's new punch trying for place and show. The constitution says that one man is as good as another, but the fire department says he is better. This is a too generous theory but the law will not allow itself to be construed otherwise. All of which comes perilously near to being a paradox, and commends itself to the attention of the SPCA. One of the transatlantic liners dumped out at Ellis Island a lump of protozoa which was expected to evolve into an American citizen. A steward kicked him down the gangway, a doctor pounced upon his eyes like a raven, seeking for trachoma or ophthalmia. He was hustled ashore and ejected into the city in the name of liberty, perhaps, theoretically, thus inoculating against kingocracy with a drop of its own virus. This hypodermic injection of Europeanism wandered happily into the veins of the city with the broad grin of a pleased child. 
It was not burdened with baggage, cares or ambitions. Its body was lively built and clothed in a sort of foreign fustian. Its face was brightly vacant, with a small, flat nose, and was mostly covered by a thick, ragged, curling beard like the coat of a spaniel. In the pocket of the imported thing were a few coins, denarii, scudi, kopecks, pfennigs, pilasters, whatever the financial nomenclature of his unknown country may have been. Prattling to himself, always broadly grinning, pleased by the roar and movement of the barbarous city into which the steamship cut rates had shunted him, the alien strayed away from the sea. Which he hated, as far as the district covered by engine company no. 99. Light as a cork, he was kept bobbing along by the human tide, the crudest atom in all the silt of the stream that emptied into the reservoir of liberty. While crossing Third Avenue he slowed his steps, enchanted by the thunder of the elevated trains above him and the soothing crash of the wheels on the cobbles. And then there was a new, delightful chord in the uproar, the musical clanging of a gong and a great shining juggernaut belching fire and smoke, that people were hurrying to see. This beautiful thing, entrancing to the eye, dashed past, and the protoplasmic immigrant stepped into the wake of it with his broad, enraptured, uncomprehending grin. And so stepping, stepped into the path of number 99's flying hose cart, with John Burns gripping, with arms of steel, the reins over the plunging backs of Erebus and Joe. The unwritten constitutional code of the fireman has no exceptions or amendments. It is a simple thing, as simple as the rule of three. There was the heedless unit in the right of way. There was the hose cart and the iron pillar of the elevated railroad. John Burns swung all his weight and muscle on the left rein. The team and cart swerved that way and crashed like a torpedo into the pillar. The men on the cart went flying like skittles. The driver's strap burst, the pillar rang with the shock, and John Burns fell on the car track with a broken shoulder twenty feet away, while Erebus, beautiful, raven black. Best loved Erebus, lay wickering in his harness with a broken leg. In consideration for the feelings of engine company number 99 the details will be lightly touched. The company does not like to be reminded of that day. There was a great crowd, and hurry calls were sent in, and while the ambulance gong was clearing the way the men of number 99 heard the crack of the SPCA. Agents pistol, and turned their heads away, not daring to look toward Erebus again. When the firemen got back to the engine house they found that one of them was dragging by the collar the cause of their desolation and grief. They set it in the middle of the floor and gathered grimly about it. Through its whiskers the calamitous object chattered effervescently and waved its hands. Sounds like a sedlitz powder, said Mike Dowling, disgustedly, and it makes me sicker than one. Call that a man, that hoss was worth a steamer full of such two-legged animals. It's a immigrant, that's what it is. Look at the doctor's chalk mark on its coat, said Riley, the desk man. It's just landed. It must be a kind of a Dago or a Hun or one of them Finns, I guess. That's the kind of truck that Europe unloads onto us. Think of a thing like that getting in the way and laying John up in hospital and spoiling the best fire team in the city, groaned another fireman. It ought to be taken down to the dock and drowned. Somebody go around and get Slavisky, suggested the engine driver, and let's see what nation is responsible for this conglomeration of hair and head noises. Slavisky kept a delicatessen store around the corner on 3rd Avenue, and was reputed to be a linguist. One of the men fetched him, a fat, cringing man, with a discursive eye and the odors of many kinds of meats upon him. Take a whirl at this importation with your jawbreakers, Slavisky, requested Mike Dowling. We can't quite figure out whether he's from the Hackensack Bottoms or Hong Kong on the Ganges. Slavisky addressed the stranger in several dialects that ranged in rhythm and cadence from the sounds produced by a tonsillitis gargle to the opening of a can of tomatoes with a pair of scissors. The immigrant replied in accents resembling the uncorking of a bottle of ginger ale. I have you his name, reported Slavisky. You shall not pronounce it. Writing of it in paper is better. They gave him paper, and he wrote, Demetra Svangsk. Looks like shorthand, said the desk man. 
He speaks some language, continued the interpreter, wiping his forehead, of Austria and mixed with a little Turkish. And, den, he have some Magyar words in a Polish or two, and many like the Romanian, but not without talk of one tribe in Bessarabia. I do not him quite understand. Would you call him a Dago or a Polacker, or what? asked Mike, frowning at the polyglot description. He is a, answered Slavisky, he is a, I think he come from, I think he is a fool, he concluded, impatient at his linguistic failure, and if you pleases I will go back at mine delicatessen. Whatever he is, he's a bird, said Mike Dowling, and you want to watch him fly. Taking by the wing the alien fowl that had fluttered into the nest of liberty, Mike led him to the door of the engine house and bestowed upon him a kick hearty enough to convey the entire animus of Company 99. Demetra Svangsk hustled away down the sidewalk, turning once to show his ineradicable grin to the aggrieved fireman. In three weeks John Burns was back at his post from the hospital. With great gusto he proceeded to bring his war map up to date. My money on the Japs every time, he declared. Why, look at them Russians, they're nothing but wolves. Wipe em out, I say, and the little old jiu-jitsu gang are just the cherry blossoms to do the trick, and don't you forget it. The second day after Burns's reappearance came Demetra Svangsk, the unidentified, to the engine house, with a broader grin than ever. He managed to convey the idea that he wished to congratulate the hosecart driver on his recovery and to apologize for having caused the accident. This he accomplished by so many extravagant gestures and explosive noises that the company was diverted for half an hour. Then they kicked him out again, and on the next day he came back grinning. How or where he lived no one knew. And then John Burns's nine-year-old son, Chris, who brought him convalescent delicacies from home to eat, took a fancy to Svangsk. And they allowed him to loaf about the door of the engine house occasionally. One afternoon the big drab automobile of the deputy fire commissioner buzzed up to the door of number 99 and the deputy stepped inside for an informal inspection. The men kicked Svangsk out a little harder than usual and proudly escorted the deputy around 99, in which everything shone like my lady's mirror. The deputy respected the sorrow of the company concerning the loss of Erebus, and he had come to promise it another mate for Joe that would do him credit. So they let Joe out of his stall and showed the deputy how deserving he was of the finest mate that could be in Horsedom. While they were circling around Joe confabbing, Chris climbed into the deputy's auto and threw the power full on. The men heard a monster puffing and a shriek from the lad, and sprang out too late. The big auto shot away, luckily taking a straight course down the street. The boy knew nothing of its machinery, he sat clutching the cushions and howling. With the power on nothing could have stopped that auto except a brick house, and there was nothing for Chris to gain by such a stoppage. Demetra Svangsk was just coming in again with a grin for another kick when Chris played his merry little prank. While the others sprang for the door Demetra sprang for Joe. He glided upon the horse's bare back like a snake and shouted something at him like the crack of a dozen whips. One of the firemen afterwards swore that Joe answered him back in the same language. Ten seconds after the auto started the big horse was eating up the asphalt behind it like a strip of macaroni. Some people two blocks and a half away saw the rescue. They said that the auto was nothing but a drab noise with a black speck in the middle of it for Chris, when a big bay horse with a lizard lying on its back cantered up alongside of it. And the lizard reached over and picked the black speck out of the noise. Only fifteen minutes after Svangsk's last kicking at the hands, or rather the feet, of engine company no. 99 he rode Joe back through the door with the boy safe, but acutely conscious of the licking he was going to receive. Svangsk slipped to the floor, leaned his head against Joe's and made a noise like a clucking hen. Joe nodded and whistled loudly through his nostrils, putting to shame the knowledge of Slavisky, of the delicatessen. John Burns walked up to Svangsk, who grinned, expecting to be kicked. Burns gripped the outlander so strongly by the hand that Demetra grinned anyhow, conceiving it to be a new form of punishment. The heathen rides like a Cossack, remarked a fireman who had seen a Wild West show, they're the greatest riders in the world. 
the words seemed to electrify Svangsk. He grinned wider than ever. Yes, yes, me Cossack, he spluttered, striking his chest. Cossack, repeated John Burns, thoughtfully, ain't that a kind of a Russian? They're one of the Russian tribes, sure, said the desk man, who read books between fire alarms. Just then Alderman Foley, who was on his way home and did not know of the runaway, stopped at the door of the engine house and called to Burns. Hello there, Jimmy. Me boy, how's the war coming along? Japs still got the bear on the trot, have they? Oh, I don't know, said John Burns, argumentatively, them Japs haven't got any walkover. You wait till Kurapotkin gets a good whack at them and they won't be knee-high to a puddle duxky. Two Renegades In the gate city of the south the Confederate veterans were reuniting. And I stood to see them march, beneath the tangled flags of the great conflict, to the hall of their oratory and commemoration. While the irregular and halting line was passing I made onslaught upon it and dragged from the ranks my friend Barnard O'Keefe, who had no right to be there. For he was a northerner born and bred. And what should he be doing hallooing for the stars and bars among those grey and moribund veterans? And why should he be trudging, with his shining, martial, humorous, broad face, among those warriors of a previous and alien generation? I say I dragged him forth, and held him till the last hickory leg and waving goatee had stumbled past. And then I hustled him out of the crowd into a cool interior. For the gate city was stirred that day, and the hand organs wisely eliminated, marching through Georgia, from their repertories. Now, what deviltry are you up to? I asked of O'Keefe when there were a table and things in glasses between us. O'Keefe wiped his heated face and instigated a commotion among the floating ice in his glass before he chose to answer. I am assisting at the wake, said he, of the only nation on earth that ever did me a good turn. As one gentleman to another, I am ratifying and celebrating the foreign policy of the late Jefferson Davis, as fine a statesman as ever settled the financial question of a country. Equal ratio, that was his platform, a barrel of money for a barrel of flour, a pair of twenty-dollar bills for a pair of boots, a hat full of currency for a new hat, say, ain't that simple compared with W. J. B. S. little old oxidized plank? What talk is this? I asked. Your financial digression is merely a subterfuge. Why were you marching in the ranks of the Confederate veterans? Because, my lad, answered O'Keefe. The Confederate government in its might and power interposed to protect and defend Barnard O'Keefe against immediate and dangerous assassination at the hands of a bloodthirsty foreign country after the United States of America had overruled his appeal for protection and had instructed Private Secretary Cordelieu to reduce his estimate of the Republican majority for 1905 by one vote. Come, Barney, said I, the Confederate States of America has been out of existence nearly forty years. You do not look older yourself. When was it that the deceased government exerted its foreign policy in your behalf? Four months ago, said O'Keefe, promptly. The infamous foreign power I alluded to is still staggering from the official blow dealt it by Mr. Davis's contraband aggregation of states. That's why you see me cakewalking with the ex-rebs to the illegitimate tune about simon seeds and cotton. I vote for the Great Father in Washington, but I am not going back on Mars Jeff. You say the Confederacy has been dead forty years? Well, if it hadn't been for it, I'd have been breathing today with soul so dead I couldn't have whispered a single cussword about my native land. The O'Keefe's are not overburdened with ingratitude. I must have looked bewildered. The war was over, I said vacantly, in. O'Keefe laughed loudly, scattering my thoughts. Ask old Doc Milliken if the war is over, he shouted, hugely diverted. Oh, no. Doc hasn't surrendered yet and the Confederate States. Well, I just told you they bucked officially and solidly and nationally against a foreign government four months ago and kept me from being shot. Old Jeff's country stepped in and brought me off under its wing while Roosevelt was having a gunboat painted and waiting for the National Campaign Committee to look up whether I had ever scratched. The Ticket
Isn't there a story in this, Barney? I asked. No, said O'Keefe, but I'll give you the facts. You know I went down to Panama when this irritation about a canal began. I thought I'd get in on the ground floor. I did, and had to sleep on it, and drink water with little zoos in it, so, of course, I got the Shagers fever. That was in a little town called San Juan on the coast. After I got the fever hard enough to kill a Porto Prince nigger, I had a relapse in the shape of Doc Milliken. There was a doctor to attend a sick man. If Doc Milliken had your case, he made the terrors of death seem like an invitation to a donkey party. He had the bedside manners of a Piute medicine man and the soothing presence of a dray loaded with iron bridge girders. When he laid his hand on your fevered brow you felt like Cap John Smith just before Pocahontas went his bail. Well, this old medical outrage floated down to my shack when I sent for him. He was billed like a shad, and his eyebrows was black, and his white whiskers trickled down from his chin like milk coming out of a sprinkling pot. He had a nigger boy along carrying an old tomato can full of calomel, and a saw. Doc felt my pulse, and then he began to mess up some calomel with an agricultural implement that belonged to the trowel class. I don't want any death mask made yet, Doc, I says, nor my liver put in a plaster of Paris cast. I'm sick, and it's medicine I need, not frescoing. You're a blame Yankee, ain't you? Asked Doc, going on mixing up his Portland cement. I'm from the North, says I, but I'm a plain man, and don't care for mural decorations. When you get the isthmus all asphalted over with that bull weevil prescription, would you mind giving me a dose of painkiller? Or a little strychnine on toast to ease up this feeling of unhealthiness that I have got? They was all sassy, just like you, says old Doc, but we lowered their temperature considerable. Yes, sir, I reckon we sent a good many of ye over to old mortuous Nisi Bonum. Look at Antietam and Bull Run and Seven Pines and around Nashville. There never was a battle where we didn't lick ye unless you was ten to our one. I knew you were a blame Yankee the minute I laid eyes on you. Don't reopen the chasm, Doc, I begs him. Any Yankiness I may have is geographical. And, as far as I am concerned, a Southerner is as good as a Filipino any day. I'm feeling too bad to argue. Let's have secession without misrepresentation, if you say so. But what I need is more laudanum and less Lundy's Lane. If you're mixing that compound gefloxide of gefloxicum for me, please fill my ears with it before you get around to the Battle of Gettysburg, for there is a subject full of talk. By this time Doc Milliken had thrown up a line of fortifications on square pieces of paper, and he says to me, Yank, take one of these powders every two hours. They won't kill you. I'll be around again about sundown to see if you're alive. Old Doc's powders knocked the shagers. I stayed in San Juan, and got to knowing him better. He was from Mississippi, and the red-hottest southerner that ever smelled mint. He made Stonewall Jackson and R. E. Lee look like abolitionists. He had a family somewhere down near Yazoo City. But he stayed away from the states on account of an uncontrollable liking he had for the absence of a Yankee government. Him and me got as thick personally as the Emperor of Russia and the Dove of Peace, but sectionally we didn't amalgamate. Twas a beautiful system of medical practice introduced by old Doc into that isthmus of land. He'd take that bracket saw and the mild chloride and his hypodermic, and treat anything from yellow fever to a personal friend. Besides his other liabilities Doc could play a flute for a minute or two. He was guilty of two tunes, Dixie, and another one that was mighty close to the Sewanee River, you might say one of its tributaries. He used to come down and sit with me while I was getting well, and aggrieve his flute and say unreconstructed things about the North. You'd have thought that the smoke from the first gun at Fort Sumter was still floating around in the air. You know that was about the time they staged them property revolutions down there. That wound up in the fifth act with the thrilling canal scene where Uncle Sam has nine curtain calls holding Miss Panama by the hand. While the bloodhounds keep Senator Morgan treed up in a coconut palm. That's the way it wound up, 
but at first it seemed as if Colombia was going to make Panama look like one of the three dollars. Ninety-eight kind, with dents made in it in the factory, like they wear at North Beach Fish Fries. For mine, I played the straw hat crowd to win. And they gave me a colonel's commission over a brigade of twenty-seven men in the left wing and second joint of the insurgent army. The Colombian troops were awfully rude to us. One day when I had my brigade in a sandy spot, with its shoes off doing a battalion drill by squads, the government army rushed from behind a bush at us. Acting as noisy and disagreeable as they could. My troops enfiladed, left-faced, and left the spot. After enticing the enemy for three miles or so we struck a briar patch and had to sit down. When we were ordered to throw up our toes and surrender we obeyed. Five of my best staff officers fell, suffering extremely with stone-bruised heels. Then and there those Colombians took your friend Barney, sir, stripped him of the insignia of his rank, consisting of a pair of brass knuckles and a canteen of rum. And dragged him before a military court. The presiding general went through the usual legal formalities that sometimes cause a case to hang on the calendar of a South American military court as long as ten minutes. He asked me my age, and then sentenced me to be shot. They woke up the court interpreter, an American named Jenks, who was in the rum business and vice versa, and told him to translate the verdict. Jenks stretched himself and took a morphine tablet. You've got to back up against T.H. Doeb, old man, says he to me. Three weeks, I believe, you get. Haven't got a chew of fine cut on you, have you? Translate that again, with footnotes and a glossary, says I. I don't know whether I'm discharged, condemned, or handed over to the Jerry Society. Oh, says Jenks, don't you understand? You're to be stood up against a dobe wall and shot in two or three weeks, three, I think, they said. Would you mind asking em which, says I. A week don't amount to much after you're dead, but it seems a real nice long spell while you are alive. It's two weeks, says the interpreter, after inquiring in Spanish of the court. Shall I ask em again? Let be, says I, let's have a stationary verdict. If I keep on appealing this way they'll have me shot about ten days before I was captured. No, I haven't got any fine cut. They sends me over to the Calaboza with a detachment of colored postal telegraph boys carrying Enfield rifles, and I am locked up in a kind of brick bakery. The temperature in there was just about the kind mentioned in the cooking recipes that call for a quick oven. Then I gives a silver dollar to one of the guards to send for the United States Consul. He comes around in pajamas, with a pair of glasses on his nose and a dozen or two inside of him. I'm to be shot in two weeks, says I. And although I've made a memorandum of it, I don't seem to get it off my mind. You want to call up Uncle Sam on the cable as quick as you can and get him all worked up about it. Have M send the Kentucky and the Kearsarge and the Oregon down right away. That'll be about enough battleships, but it wouldn't hurt to have a couple of cruisers and a torpedo boat destroyer, too. And, say, if Dewey isn't busy, better have him come along on the fastest one of the fleet. Now, see here, O'Keefe, says the consul, getting the best of a hiccup, what do you want to bother the State Department about this matter for? Didn't you hear me, says I. I'm to be shot in two weeks. Did you think I said I was going to a lawn party? And it wouldn't hurt if Roosevelt could get the Japs to send down the Yellowyum to Skookum or the Ogatasingsing or some other first-class cruisers to help. It would make me feel safer. Now, what you want, says the consul, is not to get excited. I'll send you over some chewing tobacco and some banana fritters when I go back. The United States can't interfere in this. You know you were caught in zurging against the government, and you're subject to the laws of this country. To tell the truth, I've had an intimation from the State Department, unofficially, of course, that whenever a soldier of fortune demands a fleet of gunboats in a case of revolutionary Katzenjammer, I should cut the cable, give him all the tobacco he wants, and after he's shot take his clothes, if they fit me, for part payment of my salary. Consul, says I to him, this is a serious question. You are representing Uncle Sam. 
this ain't any little international tomfoolery, like a Universal Peace Congress or the christening of the Shamrock Four. I'm an American citizen and I demand protection. I demand the Mosquito Fleet, and Schley, and the Atlantic Squadron, and Bob Evans, and General E. Bird Grub, and two or three protocols. What are you going to do about it? Nothing doing, says the consul. Be off with you, then, says I, out of patience with him, and send me Doc Milliken. Ask Doc to come and see me. Doc comes and looks through the bars at me, surrounded by dirty soldiers, with even my shoes and canteen confiscated, and he looks mightily pleased. Hello, Yank, says he, getting a little taste of Johnson's Island, now, ain't ye? Doc, says I, I've just had an interview with the U.S. Consul. I gather from his remarks that I might just as well have been caught selling suspenders in Kishinev under the name of Rosenstein as to be in my present condition. It seems that the only maritime aid I am to receive from the United States is some navy plug to chew. Doc, says I, can't you suspend hostility on the slavery question long enough to do something for me? It ain't been my habit, Doc Milliken answers, to do any painless dentistry when I find a yank cutting an eye tooth. So the stars and stripes ain't lending any marines to shell the huts of the Colombian cannibals, hey? Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light the star-spangled banner has fluked in the fight? What's the matter with the War Department, hey? It's a great thing to be a citizen of a gold-standard nation, ain't it? Rub it in, Doc, all you want, says I. I guess we're weak on foreign policy. For a yank, says Doc putting on his specs and talking more mild, you ain't so bad. If you had come from below the line I reckon I would have liked you right smart. Now since your country has gone back on you, you have to come to the old doctor whose cotton you burned and whose mules who stole and whose niggers you freed to help you. Ain't that so, Yank? It is, says I heartily, and let's have a diagnosis of the case right away, for in two weeks' time all you can do is to hold an autopsy and I don't want to be amputated if I can help it. Now, says Doc, businesslike, it's easy enough for you to get out of this scrape. Money'll do it. You've got to pay a long string of them from General Pomposo down to this anthropoid ape guarding your door. About ten thousand dollar will do the trick. Have you got the money? Me, says I. I've got one chili dollar, two real pieces, and a medio. Then if you've any last words, utter M, says that old Reb. The roster of your financial budget sounds quite much to me like the noise of a requiem. Change the treatment, says I, I admit that I'm short. Call a consultation or use radium or smuggle me in some saws or something. Yank, says Doc Milliken, I've a good notion to help you. There's only one government in the world that can get you out of this difficulty, and that's the Confederate States of America, the grandest nation that ever existed. Just as you said to me I says to Doc, why, the Confederacy ain't a nation. It's been absolved forty years ago. That's a campaign lie, says Doc. She's running along as solid as the Roman Empire. She's the only hope you've got. Now, you, being a Yank, have got to go through with some preliminary obsequies before you can get official aid. You've got to take the oath of allegiance to the Confederate government. Then I'll guarantee she does all she can for you. What do you say, Yank, it's your last chance. If you're fooling with me, Doc, I answers, you're no better than the United States. But as you say it's the last chance, hurry up and swear me. I always did like corn whiskey and possum anyhow. I believe I'm half-southerner by nature. I'm willing to try the Ku Klux in place of the khaki. Get brisk. Doc Milliken thinks a while, and then he offers me this oath of allegiance to take without any kind of a chaser. I, Barnard O'Keefe, Yank, being of sound body but a Republican mind. Hereby swear to transfer my fealty, respect, and allegiance to the Confederate States of America, and the government thereof in consideration of said government, through its official acts and powers. Obtaining my freedom and release from confinement and sentence of death brought about by the exuberance of my Irish proclivities and my general pisonness as a Yank. 
I repeated these words after Doc, but they seemed to me a kind of hocus pocus, and I don't believe any life insurance company in the world would have issued me a policy on the strength of them. Doc went away saying he would communicate with his government immediately. Say, you can imagine how I felt, me to be shot in two weeks and my only hope for help being in a government that's been dead so long that it isn't even remembered except on decoration day and when. Joe Wheeler signs the voucher for his paycheck. But it was all there was in sight, and somehow I thought Doc Milliken had something up his old alpaca sleeve that wasn't all foolishness. Around to the jail comes old Doc again in about a week. I was flea-bitten, a mite sarcastic, and fundamentally hungry. Any Confederate ironclads in the offing? I asks. Do you notice any sounds resembling the approach of Jeb Stewart's cavalry overland or Stonewall Jackson sneaking up in the rear? If you do, I wish you'd say so. It's too soon yet for help to come, says Doc. The sooner the better says I, I don't care if it gets in fully fifteen minutes before I am shot. And if you happen to lay eyes on Beauregard or Albert Sidney Johnston or any of the Relief Corps, wigwag, am to hike along. There's been no answer received yet, says Doc. Don't forget, says I, that there's only four days more. I don't know how you propose to work this thing, Doc, I says to him. But it seems to me I'd sleep better if you had got a government that was alive and on the map, like Afghanistan or Great Britain, or Old Man Kruger's Kingdom, to take this matter up. I don't mean any disrespect to your Confederate states, but I can't help feeling that my chances of being pulled out of this scrape was decidedly weakened when General Lee surrendered. It's your only chance, said Doc, don't quarrel with it. What did your own country do for you? It was only two days before the morning I was to be shot, when Doc Milliken came around again. All right, Yank, says he. Helps come. The Confederate States of America is going to apply for your release. The representatives of the government arrived on a fruit steamer last night. Bully, says I, bully for you, Doc. I suppose it's Marines with a Gatling. I'm going to love your country all I can for this. Negotiations, says old Doc, will be opened between the two governments at once. You will know later today if they are successful. About four in the afternoon a soldier in red trousers brings a paper round to the jail, and they unlocks the door and I walks out. The guard at the door bows and I bows, and I steps into the grass and wades around to Doc Milliken's shack. Doc was sitting in his hammock playing Dixie, soft and low and out of tune, on his flute. I interrupted him at, look away. Look away, and shook his hand for five minutes. I never thought, says Doc, taking a chew fretfully, that I'd ever try to save any blame Yank's life. But, Mr. O'Keefe, I don't see but what you are entitled to be considered part human, anyhow. I never thought Yanks had any of the rudiments of decorum and laudability about them. I reckon I might have been too aggregative in my tabulation. But it ain't me you want to thank, it's the Confederate States of America. And I'm much obliged to M, says I, it's a poor man that wouldn't be patriotic with a country that's saved his life. I'll drink to the stars and bars whenever there's a flagstaff and a glass convenient. But where, says I, are the rescuing troops? If there was a gun fired or a shell burst, I didn't hear it. Doc Milliken raises up and points out the window with his flute at the banana steamer loading with fruit. Yank, says he, there's a steamer that's going to sail in the morning. If I was you, I'd sail on it. The Confederate government's done all it can for you. There wasn't a gun fired. The negotiations were carried on secretly between the two nations by the purser of that steamer. I got him to do it because I didn't want to appear in it. $12,000 was paid to the officials in bribes to let you go. Man, says I, sitting down hard, 12000 how will I ever, who could have, where did the money come from? Yazoo City, says Doc Milliken, I've got a little saved up there. Two barrels full. It looks good to these Colombians. Twas Confederate money, every dollar of it. Now do you see why you'd better leave before they try to pass some of it on an expert? I do, says I. 
Now let's hear you give the password, says Doc Milliken. Hurrah for Jeff Davis. Says I. Correct, says Document and let me tell you something, the next tune I learn on my flute is going to be Yankee Doodle. I reckon there's some Yanks that are not so pison. Or, if you was me, would you try the red, white, and blue? A tempered wind. The first time my optical nerves was disturbed by the sight of Buckingham Skinner was in Kansas City. I was standing on a corner when I see Buck stick his straw-colored head out of a third-story window of a business block and holler, whoa, there. Whoa. Like you would in endeavoring to assuage a team of runaway mules. I looked around. But all the animals I see in sight is a policeman, having his shoes shined, and a couple of delivery wagons hitched to posts. Then in a minute downstairs tumbles this Buckingham Skinner, and runs to the corner. And stands and gazes down the other street at the imaginary dust kicked up by the fabulous hoofs of the fictitious team of chimerical quadrupeds. And then B. Skinner goes back up to the third-story room again, and I see that the lettering on the window is, The Farmer's Friend Loan Company. By and by Strawtop comes down again, and I cross the street to meet him, for I had my ideas. Yes, sir, when I got close I could see where he overdone it. He was re-up all right as far as his blue jeans and cowhide boots went, but he had a matinee actor's hands. And the rye straw stuck over his ear looked like it belonged to the property man of the old homestead company. Curiosity to know what his graft was got the best of me. Was that your team broke away and run just now? I asks him, polite. I tried to stop, M, says I, but I couldn't. I guess they're halfway back to the farm by now. Gosh blame them darn mules, says Strawtop, in a voice so good that I nearly apologized, they're a loose bustin' loose. And then he looks at me close, and then he takes off his hayseed hat, and says, in a different voice, I'd like to shake hands with Parlevo Pickens, the greatest street man in the West. Barring only Montague Silver, which you can no more than allow. I let him shake hands with me. I learned under Silver, I said, I don't begrudge him the lead. But what's your graft, son? I admit that the phantom flight of the non-existing animals at which you remarked, whoa, has puzzled me somewhat. How do you win out on the trick? Buckingham Skinner blushed. Pocket money, says he, that's all. I am temporarily unfinanced. This little coup de rye straw is good for forty dollars in a town of this size. How do I work it? Why, I involve myself, as you perceive, in the loathsome apparel of the rural dub. Thus embalmed I am Jonas Stubblefield, a name impossible to improve upon. I repair noisily to the office of some loan company conveniently located in the third floor, front. There I lay my hat and yarn gloves on the floor and ask to mortgage my farm for $2,000 to pay for my sister's musical education in Europe. Loans like that always suit the loan companies. It's ten to one that when the note falls due the foreclosure will be leading the semiquavers by a couple of lengths. Well, sir, I reach in my pocket for the abstract of title. But I suddenly hear my team running away. I run to the window and emit the word, or exclamation, whichever it may be, viz, woe. Then I rush downstairs and down the street, returning in a few minutes. Dang them mules, I says, they done run away and busted the double tree and two traces. Now I got to hoof it home, for I never brought no money along. Reckon we'll talk about that loan some other time, Jen Lemon. Then I spreads out my tarpaulin, like the Israelites, and waits for the manna to drop. Why, no, Mr. Stubblefield, says the lobster-colored party in the specks and dotted peak vest. Oblige us by accepting this ten-dollar bill until tomorrow. Get your harness repaired and call in at ten. We'll be pleased to accommodate you in the matter of this loan. It's a slight thing, says Buckingham Skinner, modest, but, as I said, only for temporary loose change. It's nothing to be ashamed of, says I, in respect for his mortification. In case of an emergency. Of course, it's small compared to organizing a trust or bridge whist, 
but even the Chicago University had to be started in a small way. What's your graph these days? Buckingham Skinner asks me. The legitimate, says I, I'm handling rhinestones and DR. Oleum Sinopi's electric headache battery and the Swiss warbler's bird call, a small lot of the new queer ones and twos, and the bonanza budget. Consisting of a rolled gold wedding and engagement ring, six Egyptian lily bulbs, a combination pickle fork and nail clipper. And fifty engraved visiting cards, no two names alike, all for the sum of thirty-eight cents. Two months ago, says Buckingham Skinner, I was doing well down in Texas with a patent instantaneous fire kindler, made of compressed wood ashes and benzene. I sold loads of them in towns where they like to burn niggers quick, without having to ask somebody for a light. And just when I was doing the best they strikes oil down there and puts me out of business. Your machine's too slow, now, pardner, they tells me. We can have a coon in hell with this here petroleum before your old flint and tinder truck can get him warm enough to profess religion. And so I gives up the kindler and drifts up here to K.C. This little curtain raiser you seen me doing, Mr. Pickens, with the simulated farm and the hypothetical teams, ain't in my line at all, and I'm ashamed you found me working it. No man, says I, kindly, need to be ashamed of putting the ski bunk on a loan corporation for even so small a sum as ten dollars, when he is financially abashed. Still, it wasn't quite the proper thing. It's too much like borrowing money without paying it back. I liked Buckingham Skinner from the start, for as good a man as ever stood over the axles and breathed gasoline smoke. And pretty soon we gets thick, and I let him in on a scheme I'd had in mind for some time, and offers to go partners. Anything, says Buck, that is not actually dishonest will find me willing and ready. Let us perforate into the inwardness of your proposition. I feel degraded when I am forced to wear property straw in my hair and assume a bucolic air for the small sum of ten dollars. Actually, Mr. Pickens, it makes me feel like the Ophelia of the great Occidental All-Star One Night Consolidated Theatrical Aggregation. This scheme of mine was one that suited my proclivities. By nature I am some sentimental, and have always felt gentle toward the mollifying elements of existence. I am disposed to be lenient with the arts and sciences. And I find time to instigate a cordiality for the more human works of nature, such as romance and the atmosphere and grass and poetry and the seasons. I never skin a sucker without admiring the prismatic beauty of his scales. I never sell a little auriferous beauty to the man with the hoe without noticing the beautiful harmony there is between gold and green. And that's why I liked this scheme. It was so full of outdoor air and landscapes and easy money. We had to have a young lady assistant to help us work this graft, and I asked Buck if he knew of one to fill the bill. One, says I, that is cool and wise and strictly business from her pompadour to her Oxfords. No exto dancers or gum chewers or crayon portrait canvassers for this. Buck claimed he knew a suitable feminine and he takes me around to see Miss Sarah Malloy. The minute I see her I am pleased. She looked to be the goods as ordered. No sign of the three P's about her, no peroxide, patchouli, nor peau de soie, about twenty-two, brown hair, pleasant ways, the kind of a lady for the place. A description of the sandbag, if you please, she begins. Why, ma'am, says I, this graft of ours is so nice and refined and romantic, it would make the balcony scene in Romeo and Juliet look like second-story work. We talked it over, and Miss Malloy agreed to come in as a business partner. She said she was glad to get a chance to give up her place as stenographer and secretary to a suburban lot company, and go into something respectable. This is the way we worked our scheme. First, I figured it out by a kind of a proverb. The best grafts in the world are built up on copybook maxims and psalms and proverbs and Esau's fables. They seem to kind of hit off human nature. Our peaceful little swindle was constructed on the old saying, the whole push loves a lover. One evening Buck and Miss Malloy drives up like blazes in a buggy to a farmer's door. She is pale but affectionate, clinging to his arm, always clinging to his arm. 
anyone can see that she is a peach and of the cling variety. They claim they are eloping for to be married on account of cruel parents. They ask where they can find a preacher. Farmer says, gum there ain't any preacher nigher than Reverend Abel's, for miles over on Connie Creek. Farmeress wipes her hand on her apron and rubbers through her specks. Then, lo and look ye. Up the road from the other way jogs Parlevo Pickens in a gig, dressed in black, white necktie, long face, sniffing his nose, emitting a spurious kind of noise resembling the long meter doxology. Jinx, says Farmer, if thar ain't a preacher now. It transpires that I am Reverend Abijah Green, traveling over to Little Bethel Schoolhouse for to preach next Sunday. The young folks will have it they must be married, for Pa is pursuing them with the plow mules and the buckboard. So the Reverend Green, after hesitating, marries M in the farmer's parlor. And farmer grins, and has insider, and says, gum, and farmerist sniffles a bit and pats the bride on the shoulder. And Parlevo Pickens, the wrong reverend, writes out a marriage certificate, and farmer and farmerist sign it as witnesses. And the parties of the first, second and third part gets in their vehicles and rides away. Oh, that was an idyllic graft. True love and the lowing kine and the sun shining on the red barns, it certainly had all other impostures I know about beat to a batter. I suppose I happened along in time to marry Buck and Miss Malloy at about twenty farmhouses. I hated to think how the romance was going to fade later on when all the marriage certificates turned up in banks where we discounted them. And the farmers had to pay them notes of hand they'd signed, running from three hundred dollars to five hundred dollars. On the fifteenth day of May us three divided about six thousand dollars. Miss Malloy nearly cried with joy. You don't often see a tender-hearted girl or one that is bent on doing right. Boys, says she, dabbing her eyes with a little handkerchief, this steak comes in handier than a powder rag at a fat men's ball. It gives me a chance to reform. I was trying to get out of the real estate business when you fellows came along. But if you hadn't taken me in on this neat little proposition for removing the cuticle of the rutabaga propagators I'm afraid I'd have got into something worse. I was about to accept a place in one of these women's auxiliary bazaars. Where they build a parsonage by selling a spoonful of chicken salad and a cream puff for seventy-five cents and calling it a businessman's lunch. Now I can go into a square, honest business, and give all them queer jobs the shake. I'm going to Cincinnati and start a palm-reading and clairvoyant joint. As Madame Saramaloy, the Egyptian sorceress, I shall give everybody a dollar's worth of good honest prognostication. Goodbye, boys. Take my advice and go into some decent fake. Get friendly with the police and newspapers and you'll be all right. So then we all shook hands, and Miss Malloy left us. Me and Buck also rose up and sauntered off a few hundred miles. For we didn't care to be around when the marriage certificates fell due. With about four thousand dollars between us we hit that bumptious little town off the New Jersey coast they call New York. If there ever was an aviary overstocked with jays it is that Yaptown on the Hudson. Cosmopolitan they call it. You bet. So's a piece of flypaper. You listen close when they're buzzing and trying to pull their feet out of the sticky stuff. Little old New York's good enough for us, that's what they sing. There's enough reubs walk down Broadway in one hour to buy up a week's output of the factory in Augusta, Maine. That makes naughty novelties and the little fine fun oroid gold finger ring that sticks a needle in your friend's hand. You'd think New York people was all wise, but no. They don't get a chance to learn. Everything's too compressed. Even the hayseeds are baled hayseeds. But what else can you expect from a town that's shut off from the world by the ocean on one side and New Jersey on the other? It's no place for an honest grafter with a small capital. There's too big a protective tariff on Bunko. Even when Giovanni sells a quart of warm worms and chestnut hulls he has to hand out a pint to an insectivorous cop. And the hotel man charges double for everything in the bill that he sends by the patrol wagon to the altar where the duke is about to marry the heiress. 
But old bad Volnir Kony is the ideal burg for a refined piece of piracy if you can pay the bunko duty. Imported grafts come pretty high. The custom house officers that look after it carry clubs, and it's hard to smuggle in even a bib and tucker swindle to work Brooklyn with unless you can pay the toll. But now, me and Buck, having capital, descends upon New York to try and trade the Metropolitan Backwoods men a few glass beads for real estate just as the Vans did a hundred or two years ago. At an East Side hotel we gets acquainted with Romulus G. Atterbury, a man with the finest head for financial operations I ever saw. It was all bald and glossy except for gray side whiskers. Seeing that head behind an office railing, and you'd deposit a million with it without a receipt. This Atterbury was well dressed, though he ate seldom. And the synopsis of his talk would make the conversation of a siren sound like a cab driver's kick. He said he used to be a member of the stock exchange, but some of the big capitalists got jealous and formed a ring that forced him to sell his seat. Atterbury got to liking me and Buck and he begun to throw on the canvas for us some of the schemes that had caused his hair to evacuate. He had one scheme for starting a national bank on $45 that made the Mississippi bubble look as solid as a glass marble. He talked this to us for three days, and when his throat was good and sore we told him about the role we had. Atterbury borrowed a quarter from us and went out and got a box of throat lozenges and started all over again. This time he talked bigger things, and he got us to see M as he did. The scheme he laid out looked like a sure winner, and he talked me and Buck into putting our capital against his burnished dome of thought. It looked all right for a kid-gloved graft. It seemed to be just about an inch and a half outside of the reach of the police, and as money-making as a mint. It was just what me and Buck wanted, a regular business at a permanent stand, with an open air spieling with tonsillitis on the street corners every evening. So, in six weeks you see a handsome furnished set of offices down in the Wall Street neighborhood, with the Golconda Gold Bond and Investment Company, in gilt letters on the door. And you see in his private room, with the door open, the secretary and treasurer, Mr. Buckingham Skinner, costumed like the lilies of the conservatory, with his high silk hat close to his hand. Nobody yet ever saw Buck outside of an instantaneous reach for his hat. And you might perceive the president and general manager, Mr. R. G. Atterbury, with his priceless polished pole, busy in the main office room dictating letters to a shorthand countess, who has got pomp and a pompadour that is no less than a guarantee to investors. There is a bookkeeper and an assistant, and a general atmosphere of varnish and culpability. At another desk the eye is relieved by the sight of an ordinary man, attired with unscrupulous plainness, sitting with his feet up, eating apples, with his obnoxious hat on the back of his head. That man is no other than Colonel Tecumseh, once Parlevouv, Pickens, the vice president of the company. No recherche rags for me, I says to Atterbury, when we was organizing the stage properties of the robbery. I'm a plain man, says I and I do not use pajamas, French, or military hairbrushes. Cast me for the role of the rhinestone in the rough or I don't go on exhibition. If you can use me in my natural, though displeasing form, do so. Dress you up, says Atterbury, I should say not. Just as you are you're worth more to the business than a whole roomful of the things they pin chrysanthemums on. You're to play the part of the solid but disheveled capitalist from the far west. You despise the conventions. You've got so many stocks you can afford to shake socks. Conservative, homely, rough, shrewd, saving, that's your pose. It's a winner in New York. Keep your feet on the desk and eat apples. Whenever anybody comes in eat an apple. Let M see you stuff the peelings in a drawer of your desk. Look as economical and rich and rugged as you can. I followed out Atterbury's instructions. I played the Rocky Mountain capitalist without ruching or frills. The way I deposited apple peelings to my credit in a drawer when any customers came in made Hetty Green look like a spendthrift. I could hear Atterbury saying to victims, as he smiled at me, indulgent and venerating, that's our vice president, Colonel Pickens, fortune in western investments, delightfully plain manners. But, could sign his check for half a million, 
simple as a child, wonderful head, conservative and careful almost to a fault. Atterbury managed the business. Me and Buck never quite understood all of it, though he explained it to us in full. It seems the company was a kind of cooperative one, and everybody that bought stock shared in the profits. First, we officers bought up a controlling interest, we had to have that, of the shares at fifty cents a hundred, just what the printer charged us, and the rest went to the public at a dollar each. The company guaranteed the stockholders a profit of ten percent each month, payable on the last day thereof. When any stockholder had paid in as much as one hundred dollars, the company issued him a gold bond and he became a bondholder. I asked Atterbury one day what benefits and appurtenances these gold bonds was to an investor more so than the immunities and privileges enjoyed by the common sucker who only owned stock. Atterbury picked up one of them gold bonds, all gilt and lettered up with flourishes and a big red seal tied with a blue ribbon in a bowknot, and he looked at me like his feelings was hurt. My dear Colonel Pickens, says he, you have no soul for art. Think of a thousand homes made happy by possessing one of these beautiful gems of the lithographer's skill. Think of the joy in the household where one of these gold bonds hangs by a pink cord to the whatnot, or is chewed by the baby, caroling gleefully upon the floor. Ah, I see your eye growing moist, Colonel, I have touched you, have I not? You have not, says I, for I've been watching you. The moisture you see is apple juice. You can't expect one man to act as a human cider press and an art connoisseur too. Atterbury attended to the details of the concern. As I understand it, they was simple. The investors in stock paid in their money, and, well, I guess that's all they had to do. The company received it, and, I don't call to mind anything else. Me and Buck knew more about selling corn salve than we did about Wall Street, but even we could see how the Golconda Gold Bond Investment Company was making money. You take in money and pay back 10% of it. It's plain enough that you make a clean, legitimate profit of 90%, less expenses, as long as the fish bite. Atterbury wanted to be president and treasurer too, but Buck winks an eye at him and says, you was to furnish the brains. Do you call it good brain work when you propose to take in money at the door, too? Think again. I hereby nominate myself treasurer ad valorem, sign die, and by acclamation. I chip in that much brain work free. Me and Pickens, we furnish the capital, and will handle the unearned increment as it incremates. It costs us $500 for office rent and first payment on furniture, $1,500 more went for printing and advertising. Atterbury knew his business. Three months to a minute will last, says he. A day longer than that and we'll have to either go under or go under an alias. By that time we ought to clean up $60,000. And then a money belt and a lower berth for me, and the yellow journals and the furniture men can pick the bones. Our ad's done the work. Country weeklies and Washington hand press dailies, of course, says I when we was ready to make contracts. Man, says Atterbury, as its advertising manager you would cause a Limburger cheese factory to remain undiscovered during a hot summer. The game we're after is right here in New York and Brooklyn and the Harlem reading rooms. They're the people that the streetcar fenders and the answers to correspondence columns and the pickpocket notices are made for. We want our ads in the biggest city dailies, top of column, next to editorials on radium and pictures of the girl doing health exercises. Pretty soon the money begins to roll in. Buck didn't have to pretend to be busy, his desk was piled high up with money orders and checks and greenbacks. People began to drop in the office and buy stock every day. Most of the shares went in small amounts, $10 and $25 and $50, and a good many $2 and $3 lots. And the bald and inviolate cranium of President Atterbury shines with enthusiasm and demerit, while Colonel Tecumseh Pickens, the rude but reputable Croesus of the West, consumes so many apples that the peelings hang to the floor from the mahogany garbage chest that he calls his desk. Just as Atterbury said, we ran along about three months without being troubled. 
Buck cashed the paper as fast as it came in and kept the money in a safe deposit vault a block or so away. Buck never thought much of banks for such purposes. We paid the interest regular on the stock we'd sold, so there was nothing for anybody to squeal about. We had nearly $50,000 on hand and all three of us had been living as high as prize fighters out of training. One morning, as me and Buck sauntered into the office, fat and flippant, from our noon grub, we met an easy-looking fellow, with a bright eye and a pipe in his mouth, coming out. We found Atterbury looking like he'd been caught a mile from home in a wet shower. Know that man? he asked us. We said we didn't. I don't either, says Atterbury, wiping off his head. But I'll bet enough gold bonds to paper a cell in the tombs that he's a newspaper reporter. What did he want? asks Buck. Information, says our president. Said he was thinking of buying some stock. He asked me about 900 questions, and every one of them hit some sore place in the business. I know he's on a paper. You can't fool me. You see a man about half shabby, with an eye like a gimlet, smoking cut plug, with dandruff on his coat collar, and knowing more than J.P. Morgan and Shakespeare put together, if that ain't a reporter I never saw one. I was afraid of this. I don't mind detectives and post office inspectors, I talk to M eight minutes and then sell M stock, but them reporters take the starch out of my collar. Boys, I recommend that we declare a dividend and fade away. The signs point that way. Me and Buck talked to Atterbury and got him to stop sweating and stand still. That fellow didn't look like a reporter to us. Reporters always pull out a pencil and tablet on you, and tell you a story you've heard, and strikes you for the drinks. But Atterbury was shaky and nervous all day. The next day me and Buck comes down from the hotel about 10.30. On the way we buys the papers, and the first thing we see is a column on the front page about our little imposition. It was a shame the way that reporter intimated that we were no blood relatives of the late George W. Childs. He tells all about the scheme as he sees it, in a rich, racy kind of a guying style that might amuse most anybody except a stockholder. Yes, Atterbury was right. It behoveth the gaily clad treasurer and the pearly pated president and the rugged vice president of the Golconda Gold Bond and Investment Company to go away real sudden and quick that their days might be longer upon the land. Me and Buck hurries down to the office. We finds on the stairs and in the hall a crowd of people trying to squeeze into our office, which is already jammed full inside to the railing. They've nearly all got Golconda stock and gold bonds in their hands. Me and Buck judged they'd been reading the papers, too. We stopped and looked at our stockholders, some surprised. It wasn't quite the kind of a gang we supposed had been investing. They all looked like poor people. There was plenty of old women and lots of young girls that you'd say worked in factories and mills. Some was old men that looked like war veterans, and some was crippled, and a good many was just kids, bootblacks and newsboys and messengers. Some was workingmen in overalls, with their sleeves rolled up. Not one of the gang looked like a stockholder in anything unless it was a peanut stand. But they all had Golconda stock and looked as sick as you please. I saw a queer kind of a pale look come on Buck's face when he sized up the crowd. He stepped up to a sickly-looking woman and says, Madam, do you own any of this stock? I put in a hundred dollars, says the woman, faint-like. It was all I had saved in a year. One of my children is dying at home now and I haven't a cent in the house. I came to see if I could draw out some. The circular said you could draw it at any time. But they say now I will lose it all. There was a smart kind of kid in the gang, I guess he was a newsboy. I got in twenty-five, mister, he says, looking hopeful at Buck's silk hat and clothes. Day paid me two fifty a month on it. Say, a man tells me day can't do dat and be on the square. Is dat straight? Do you guess I can get out my twenty-five? Some of the old women was crying. The factory girls was plumb distracted. 
they'd lost all their savings and they'd be docked for the time they lost coming to see about it. There was one girl, a pretty one, in a red shawl, crying in a corner like her heart would dissolve. Buck goes over and asks her about it. It ain't so much losing the money, mister, says she, shaking all over, though I've been two years saving it up, but Jakey won't marry me now. He'll take Rosa Steinfeld. I know Jay, Jay, Jakey. She's got four hundred dollars in the savings bank. A.I., 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 she sings out. Buck looks all around with that same funny look on his face. And then we see leaning against the wall, puffing at his pipe, with his eye shining at us, this newspaper reporter. Buck and me walks over to him. You're a real interesting writer, says Buck. How far do you mean to carry it? Anything more up your sleeve? Oh, I'm just waiting around, says the reporter, smoking away, in case any news turns up. It's up to your stockholders now. Some of them might complain, you know. Isn't that the patrol wagon now, he says, listening to a sound outside. No, he goes on, that's document Whittleford's old cadaver coop from the Roosevelt. I ought to know that gong. Yes, I suppose I've written some interesting stuff at times. You wait, says Buck, I'm going to throw an item of news in your way. Buck reaches in his pocket and hands me a key. I knew what he meant before he spoke. Confounded old buccaneer, I knew what he meant. They don't make them any better than Buck. Pick, says he, looking at me hard, ain't this graft a little out of our line? Do we want Jakey to marry Rosa Steinfeld? You've got my vote, says I, I'll have it here in ten minutes. And I starts for the safe deposit vaults. I comes back with the money done up in a big bundle, and then Buck and me takes the journalist reporter around to another door and we let ourselves into one of the office rooms. Now, my literary friend, says Buck, take a chair, and keep still, and I'll give you an interview. You see before you two grafters from Graftersville, Grafter County, Arkansas. Me and Pick have sold brass jewelry, hair tonic, song books, marked cards, patent medicines, Connecticut Smyrna rugs, furniture polish. And albums in every town from Old Point Comfort to the Golden Gate. We've grafted a dollar whenever we saw one that had a surplus look to it. But we never went after the simoleon in the toe of the sock under the loose brick in the corner of the kitchen hearth. There's an old saying you may have heard, fussily decency of Verney, which means it's an easy slide from the street faker's dry goods box to a desk in Wall Street. We've took that slide, but we didn't know exactly what was at the bottom of it. Now, you ought to be wise, but you ain't. You've got New York wiseness, which means that you judge a man by the outside of his clothes. That ain't right. You ought to look at the lining and seams and the buttonholes. While we are waiting for the patrol wagon you might get out your little stub pencil and take notes for another funny piece in the paper. And then Buck turns to me and says, I don't care what Atterbury thinks. He only put in brains, and if he gets his capital out he's lucky. But what do you say, Pick? Me, says I. You ought to know me, Buck. I didn't know who was buying the stock. All right, says Buck. And then he goes through the inside door into the main office and looks at the gang trying to squeeze through the railing. Atterbury and his hat was gone. And Buck makes M a short speech. All you lambs get in line. You're going to get your wool back. Don't shove so. Get in a line, a line, not in a pile. Lady, will you please stop bleeding? Your money's waiting for you. Here, Sonny, don't climb over that railing, your dimes are safe. Don't cry, sis, you ain't out a cent get in line, I say. Here, pick, come and straighten M out and let M through and out by the other door. Buck takes off his coat, pushes his silk hat on the back of his head, and lights up a reign of Victoria. He sets at the table with the boodle before him, all done up in neat packages. I gets the stockholders strung out and marches, M, single file, through from the main room. 
and the reporter man passes M out of the side door into the hall again. As they go by, Buck takes up the stock and the gold bonds, paying M cash, dollar for dollar, the same as they paid in. The shareholders of the Golconda Gold Bond and Investment Company can't hardly believe it. They almost grabs the money out of Buck's hands. Some of the women keep on crying, for it's a custom of the sex to cry when they have sorrow, to weep when they have joy, and to shed tears whenever they find themselves without either. The old women's fingers shake when they stuff the scads in the bosom of their rusty dresses. The factory girls just stoop over and flap their dry goods a second, and you hear the elastic go, pop, as the currency goes down in the ladies' department of the old domestic Lyle Thread Bank. Some of the stockholders that had been doing the Jeremiah act the loudest outside had spasms of restored confidence and wanted to leave the money invested. Salt away that chicken feed in your duds, and skip along, says Buck. What business have you got investing in bonds? The teapot or the crack in the wall behind the clock for your hoard of pennies. When the pretty girl in the red shawl cashes in Buck hands her an extra twenty. A wedding present, says our treasurer, from the Golconda Company. And say, if Jakey ever follows his nose, even at a respectful distance, around the corner where Rosa Steinfeld lives, you are hereby authorized to knock a couple of inches of it off. When they was all paid off and gone, Buck calls the newspaper reporter and shoves the rest of the money over to him. You begun this, says Buck, now finish it. Over there are the books, showing every share and bond issued. Here's the money to cover, except what we've spent to live on. You'll have to act as receiver. I guess you'll do the square thing on account of your paper. This is the best way we know how to settle it. Me and our substantial but apple-weary vice president are going to follow the example of our revered president, and skip. Now, have you got enough news for today, or do you want to interview us on etiquette and the best way to make over an old taffeta skirt? News, says the newspaper man, taking his pipe out. Do you think I could use this? I don't want to lose my job. Suppose I go around to the office and tell M this happened. What'll the managing editor say? He'll just hand me a pass to Bellevue and tell me to come back when I get cured. I might turn in a story about a sea serpent wiggling up Broadway, but I haven't got the nerve to try them with a pipe like this. A get-rich-quick scheme, excuse me, gang giving back the boodle. Oh, no. I'm not on the comic supplement. You can't understand it, of course, says Buck, with his hand on the door knob. Me and Pick ain't Wall Streeters like you know, M. We never allowed to swindle sick old women and working girls and take nickels off of kids. In the lines of graft we've worked we took money from the people the Lord made to be buncoed, sports and rounders and smart alex and street crowds, that always have a few dollars to throw away. And farmers that wouldn't ever be happy if the grafters didn't come around and play with them when they sold their crops. We never cared to fish for the kind of suckers that bite here. No, sir. We got too much respect for the profession and for ourselves. Goodbye to you, Mr. Receiver. Here. Says the journalist reporter, wait a minute. There's a broker I know on the next floor. Wait till I put this truck in his safe. I want you fellows to take a drink on me before you go. On you? Says Buck, winking solemn. Don't you go and try to make M believe at the office you said that. Thanks. We can't spare the time, I reckon. So long. And me and Buck slides out the door. And that's the way the Golconda Company went into involuntary liquefaction. If you had seen me and Buck the next night you'd have had to go to a little bum hotel over near the west side ferry landings. We was in a little back room, and I was filling up a gross of six-ounce bottles with hydrant water colored red with aniline and flavored with cinnamon. Buck was smoking, contented, and he wore a decent brown derby in place of his silk hat. It's a good thing, Pick, says he, as he drove in the corks, that we got Brady to lend us his horse and wagon for a week. We'll rustle up the stake by then. This hair tonic'll sell right along over in Jersey. Bald heads ain't popular over there on account of the mosquitoes. 
Directly I dragged out my valise and went down in it for labels. Hair tonic labels are out, says I only about a dozen on hand. Buy some more, says Buck. We investigated our pockets and found we had just enough money to settle our hotel bill in the morning and pay our passage over the ferry. Plenty of the, shake the shakes chill cure labels, says I, after looking. What more do you want, says Buck. Slap em on. The chill season is just opening up in the Hackensack low grounds. What's hair, anyway, if you have to shake it off? We pasted on the chill cure labels about half an hour and Buck says. Making an honest livin's better than that Wall Street, anyhow. Ain't it, Pick? You bet, says I. The roads we take. Twenty miles west of Tucson, the Sunset Express stopped at a tank to take on water. Besides the aqueous addition the engine of that famous flyer acquired some other things that were not good for it. While the fireman was lowering the feeding hose, Bob Tidball. Shark, Dodson and a quarterbred Creek Indian called John Big Dog climbed on the engine and showed the engineer three round orifices in pieces of ordnance that they carried. These orifices so impressed the engineer with their possibilities that he raised both hands in a gesture such as accompanies the ejaculation, do tell. At the crisp command of Shark Dodson, who was leader of the attacking force the engineer descended to the ground and uncoupled the engine and tender. Then John Big Dog, perched upon the coal, sportively held two guns upon the engine driver and the fireman, and suggested that they run the engine fifty yards away and there await further orders. Shark Dodson and Bob Tidball, scorning to put such low-grade ore as the passengers through the mill, struck out for the rich pocket of the express car. They found the messenger serene in the belief that the Sunset Express was taking on nothing more stimulating and dangerous than Aquapura. While Bob was knocking this idea out of his head with the butt end of his six-shooter Shark Dodson was already dosing the express car safe with dynamite. The safe exploded to the tune of $30,000, all gold and currency. The passengers thrust their heads casually out of the windows to look for the thundercloud. The conductor jerked at the bell rope, which sagged down loose and unresisting, at his tug. Shark Dodson and Bob Tidball, with their booty in a stout canvas bag, tumbled out of the express car and ran awkwardly in their high-heeled boots to the engine. The engineer, sullenly angry but wise, ran the engine, according to orders, rapidly away from the inert train. But before this was accomplished the express messenger, recovered from Bob Tidball's persuader to neutrality, jumped out of his car with a Winchester rifle and took a trick in the game. Mr. John Big Dog, sitting on the coal tender, unwittingly made a wrong lead by giving an imitation of a target, and the messenger trumped him. With a ball exactly between his shoulder blades the Creek Chevalier of Industry rolled off to the ground, thus increasing the share of his comrades in the loot by one-sixth each. Two miles from the tank the engineer was ordered to stop. The robbers waved a defiant adieu and plunged down the steep slope into the thick woods that lined the track. Five minutes of crashing through a thicket of chaparral brought them to open woods, where three horses were tied to low-hanging branches. One was waiting for John Big Dog, who would never ride by night or day again. This animal the robbers divested of saddle and bridle and set free. They mounted the other two with the bag across one pommel, and rode fast and with discretion through the forest and up a primeval, lonely gorge. Here the animal that bore Bob Tidball slipped on a mossy boulder and broke a foreleg. They shot him through the head at once and sat down to hold a council of flight. Made secure for the present by the tortuous trail they had traveled, the question of time was no longer so big. Many miles and hours lay between them and the spryest posse that could follow. Shark Dodson's horse, with trailing rope and dropped bridle, panted and cropped thankfully of the grass along the stream in the gorge. Bob Tidball opened the sack, drew out double handfuls of the neat packages of currency and the one sack of gold and chuckled with the glee of a child. Say, you old double-decked pirate, he called joyfully to Dodson, you said we could do it, you got a head for financing that knocks the horns off of anything in Arizona. What are we going to do about a hoss for you, Bob? We ain't got long to wait here. 
they'll be on our trail before daylight in the morning. Oh, I guess that cayuse of yourn'll carry double for a while, answered the sanguine Bob. We'll annex the first animal we come across. By jingoes, we made a haul, didn't we? According to the marks on this money there's thirty thousand dollars, dollar fifteen zero 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 apiece. It's short of what I expected, said Sharp Dodson, kicking softly at the packages with the toe of his boot. And then he looked pensively at the wet sides of his tired horse. Old Bolivar's mighty nigh played out, he said, slowly. I wish that sorrel of yours hadn't got hurt. So do I, said Bob, heartily, but it can't be helped. Bolivar's got plenty of bottom, he'll get us both far enough to get fresh mounts. Dang it, Shark, I can't help thinkin', how funny it is that an Easterner like you can come out here and give us Western fellows cards and spades in the desperado business. What part of the East was you from, anyway? New York State, said Shark Dodson, sitting down on a boulder and chewing a twig. I was born on a farm in Ulster County. I ran away from home when I was seventeen. It was an accident my coming west. I was walkin' along the road with my clothes in a bundle, makin' for New York City. I had an idea of goin' there and makin' lots of money. I always felt like I could do it. I came to a place one evenin' where the road forked and I didn't know which fork to take. I studied about it for half an hour, and then I took the left hand. That night I run into the camp of a Wild West show that was travelin' among the little towns, and I went west with it. I've often wondered if I wouldn't have turned out different if I'd took the other road. Oh, I reckon you'd have ended up about the same, said Bob Tidball, cheerfully philosophical. It ain't the roads we take, it's what's inside of us that makes us turn out the way we do. Shark Dodson got up and leaned against a tree. I'd a good deal rather that Sorrel of Yorn hadn't hurt himself, Bob, he said again, almost pathetically. Same here, agreed Bob he was sure a first-rate kind of a crowbait. But Bolivar, he'll pull us through all right. Reckon we'd better be movin' on, hadn't we, Shark? I'll bag this boodle AG in and we'll hit the trail for higher timber. Bob Tidball replaced the spoil in the bag and tied the mouth of it tightly with a cord. When he looked up the most prominent object that he saw was the muzzle of Shark Dodson's. Forty-five held upon him without a waver. Stop your fun neen, said Bob, with a grin. We got to be hittin' the breeze. Set still, said Shark. You ain't goin' to hit no breeze, Bob. I hate to tell you, but there ain't any chance for but one of us. Bolivar, he's plenty tired, and he can't carry double. We been pards, me and you, Shark Dodson, for three year, Bob said quietly. We've risked our lives together time and again. I've always give you a square deal, and I thought you was a man. I've heard some queer stories about you shootin' one or two men in a peculiar way, but I never believed em. Now if you're just havin' a little fun with me, Shark, put your gun up, and we'll get on Bolivar and Vamos. If you mean to shoot, shoot, you blackheart son of a tarantula. Shark Dodson's face bore a deeply sorrowful look. You don't know how bad I feel, he sighed, about that sorrel of yourn breakin' his leg, Bob. The expression on Dodson's face changed in an instant to one of cold ferocity mingled with inexorable cupidity. The soul of the man showed itself for a moment like an evil face in the window of a reputable house. Truly Bob Tidball was never to hit the breeze again. The Deadly Forty-five of the false friend cracked and filled the gorge with a roar that the walls hurled back with indignant echoes. And Bolivar, unconscious accomplice, swiftly bore away the last of the holders up of the Sunset Express, not put to the stress of carrying double. But as Shark Dodson galloped away the wood seemed to fade from his view, the revolver in his right hand turned to the curved arm of a mahogany chair. His saddle was strangely upholstered, and he opened his eyes and saw his feet, not in stirrups, but resting quietly on the edge of a quartered oak desk. I am telling you that Dodson, of the firm of Dodson and Decker, Wall Street brokers, opened his eyes. 
Peabody, the confidential clerk, was standing by his chair, hesitating to speak. There was a confused hum of wheels below, and the sedative buzz of an electric fan. Ahem. Peabody, said Dodson, blinking. I must have fallen asleep. I had a most remarkable dream. What is it, Peabody? Mr. Williams, sir, of Tracy and Williams, is outside. He has come to settle his deal in XYZ. The market caught him short, sir, if you remember. Yes, I remember. What is XYZ quoted at today, Peabody? 185, sir. Then that's his price. Excuse me, said Peabody, rather nervously, for speaking of it, but I've been talking to Williams. He's an old friend of yours, Mr. Dodson, and you practically have a corner in XYZ. I thought you might, that is, I thought you might not remember that he sold you the stock at 98. If he settles at the market price it will take every cent he has in the world and his home too to deliver the shares. The expression on Dodson's face changed in an instant to one of cold ferocity mingled with inexorable cupidity. The soul of the man showed itself for a moment like an evil face in the window of a reputable house. He will settle at 185, said Dodson. Bolivar cannot carry double. The furnished room. Restless, shifting, Fugacious as time itself is a certain vast bulk of the population of the red brick district of the Lower West Side. Homeless, they have a hundred homes. They flit from furnished room to furnished room, transients forever, transients in abode, transients in heart and mind. They sing, home, sweet home, in ragtime. They carry their Lara's E.T. Panades in a bandbox, their vine is entwined about a picture hat, a rubber plant is their fig tree. Hence the houses of this district, having had a thousand dwellers, should have a thousand tales to tell, mostly dull ones, no doubt. But it would be strange if there could not be found a ghost or two in the wake of all these vagrant guests. One evening after dark a young man prowled among these crumbling red mansions, ringing their bells. At the twelfth he rested his lean hand baggage upon the step and wiped the dust from his hatband and forehead. The bell sounded faint and far away in some remote, hollow depths. To the door of this, the twelfth house whose bell he had rung, came a housekeeper who made him think of an unwholesome, surfeited worm that had eaten its nut to a hollow shell and now sought to fill the vacancy with edible lodgers. He asked if there was a room to let. Come in, said the housekeeper. Her voice came from her throat, her throat seemed lined with fur. I have the third floor back, vacant since a week back. Should you wish to look at it? The young man followed her up the stairs. A faint light from no particular source mitigated the shadows of the halls. They trod noiselessly upon a stair carpet that its own loom would have forsworn. It seemed to have become vegetable. To have degenerated in that rank, Sunless air to lush lichen or spreading moss that grew in patches to the staircase and was viscid under the foot like organic matter. At each turn of the stairs were vacant niches in the wall. Perhaps plants had once been set within them. If so they had died in that foul and tainted air. It may be that statues of the saints had stood there. But it was not difficult to conceive that imps and devils had dragged them forth in the darkness and down to the unholy depths of some furnished pit below. This is the room, said the housekeeper, from her furry throat. It's a nice room. It ain't often vacant. I had some most elegant people in it last summer, no trouble at all, and paid in advance to the minute. The water's at the end of the hall. Sprowls and Mooney kept it three months. They done a vaudeville sketch. Miss Bretta Sprowls, you may have heard of her, oh, that was just the stage names, right there over the dresser is where the marriage certificate hung, framed. The gas is here, and you see there is plenty of closet room. It's a room everybody likes. It never stays idle long. Do you have many theatrical people rooming here, asked the young man. They comes and goes. A good proportion of my lodgers is connected with the theaters. Yes, sir, this is the theatrical district. Actor people never stays long anywhere. 
I get my share. Yes, they comes and they goes. He engaged the room, paying for a week in advance. He was tired, he said, and would take possession at once. He counted out the money. The room had been made ready, she said, even to towels and water. As the housekeeper moved away he put, for the thousandth time, the question that he carried at the end of his tongue. A young girl, Miss Vashner, Miss Eloise Vashner, do you remember such a one among your lodgers? She would be singing on the stage, most likely. A fair girl, of medium height and slender, with reddish, gold hair and a dark mole near her left eyebrow. No, I don't remember the name. Them stage people has names they change as often as their rooms. They comes and they goes. No, I don't call that one to mind. No. Always no. Five months of ceaseless interrogation and the inevitable negative. So much time spent by day in questioning managers, agents, schools and choruses. By night among the audiences of theaters from all-star casts down to music halls so low that he dreaded to find what he most hoped for. He who had loved her best had tried to find her. He was sure that since her disappearance from home this great, watergirt city held her somewhere, but it was like a monstrous quicksand, shifting its particles constantly, with no foundation. Its upper granules of today buried tomorrow in ooze and slime. The furnished room received its latest guest with a first glow of pseudo-hospitality, a hectic, haggard, perfunctory welcome like the specious smile of a demi-rep. The sophistical comfort came in reflected gleams from the decayed furniture, the ragged brocade upholstery of a couch and two chairs, a foot-wide cheap pier glass between the two windows. From one or two gilt picture frames and a brass bedstead in a corner. The guest reclined, inert, upon a chair, while the room, confused in speech as though it were an apartment in Babel, tried to discourse to him of its divers tenantry. A polychromatic rug like some brilliant flowered rectangular, tropical islet lay surrounded by a billowy sea of soiled matting. Upon the gay papered wall were those pictures that pursue the homeless one from house to house, the Huguenot lovers, the first quarrel, the wedding breakfast, Psyche at the fountain. The mantle's chastely severe outline was ingloriously veiled behind some pert drapery drawn rakishly askew like the sashes of the Amazonian ballet. Upon it was some desolate flotsam cast aside by the rooms marooned when a lucky sail had borne them to a fresh port, a trifling vase or two, pictures of actresses, a medicine bottle. Some stray cards out of a deck. One by one, as the characters of a cryptograph become explicit, the little signs left by the furnished room's procession of guests developed a significance. The threadbare space in the rug in front of the dresser told that lovely woman had marched in the throng. Tiny finger prints on the wall spoke of little prisoners trying to feel their way to sun and air. A splattered stain, raying like the shadow of a bursting bomb, witnessed where a hurled glass or bottle had splintered with its contents against the wall. Across the pier glass had been scrawled with a diamond in staggering letters the name Marie. It seemed that the succession of dwellers in the furnished room had turned in fury, perhaps tempted beyond forbearance by its garish coldness, and wreaked upon it their passions. The furniture was chipped and bruised, the couch, distorted by bursting springs, seemed a horrible monster that had been slain during the stress of some grotesque convulsion. Some more potent upheaval had cloven a great slice from the marble mantel. Each plank in the floor owned its particular cant and shriek as from a separate and individual agony. It seemed incredible that all this malice and injury had been wrought upon the room by those who had called it for a time their home. And yet it may have been the cheated home instinct surviving blindly, the resentful rage at false household gods that had kindled their wrath. A hut that is our own we can sweep and adorn and cherish. The young tenant in the chair allowed these thoughts to file, soft-shod, through his mind, while there drifted into the room furnished sounds and furnished scents. He heard in one room a tittering and incontinent, slack laughter, in others the monologue of a scold, the rattling of dice, a lullaby, and one crying dully, above him a banjo tinkled with spirit. Doors banged somewhere, the elevated trains roared intermittently, a cat yowled miserably upon a back fence. 
And he breathed the breath of the house, a dank savor rather than a smell, a cold. Musty effluvium as from underground vaults mingled with the reeking exhalations of linoleum and mildewed and rotten woodwork. Then, suddenly, as he rested there, the room was filled with the strong, sweet odor of mignonette. It came as upon a single buffet of wind with such sureness and fragrance and emphasis that it almost seemed a living visitant. And the man cried aloud, What, dear? As if he had been called, and sprang up and faced about. The rich odor clung to him and wrapped him around. He reached out his arms for it, all his senses for the time confused and commingled. How could one be peremptorily called by an odor? Surely it must have been a sound. But, was it not the sound that had touched, that had caressed him? She has been in this room, he cried, and he sprang to rest from it a token, for he knew he would recognize the smallest thing that had belonged to her or that she had touched. This enveloping scent of mignonette, the odor that she had loved and made her own, whence came it? The room had been but carelessly set in order. Scattered upon the flimsy dresser scarf were half a dozen hairpins, those discreet, indistinguishable friends of womankind, feminine of gender, infinite of mood and uncommunicative of tense. These he ignored, conscious of their triumphant lack of identity. Ransacking the drawers of the dresser he came upon a discarded, tiny, ragged handkerchief. He pressed it to his face. It was racy and insolent with heliotrope, he hurled it to the floor. In another drawer he found odd buttons, a theater program, a pawnbroker's card, two lost marshmallows, a book on the divination of dreams. In the last was a woman's black satin hair bow, which halted him, poised between ice and fire. But the black satin hair bow also is femininity's demure, impersonal, common ornament, and tells no tales. And then he traversed the room like a hound on the scent, skimming the walls, considering the corners of the bulging matting on his hands and knees, rummaging mantel and tables. The curtains and hangings, the drunken cabinet in the corner, for a visible sign, unable to perceive that she was there beside, around, against, within, above him, clinging to him, wooing him. Calling him so poignantly through the finer senses that even his grosser ones became cognizant of the call. Once again he answered loudly, yes, dear, and turned, wild-eyed, to gaze on vacancy, for he could not yet discern form and color and love and outstretched arms in the odor of mignonette. Oh, God! Whence that odor, and since when have odors had a voice to call? Thus he groped. He burrowed in crevices and corners, and found corks and cigarettes. These he passed in passive contempt. But once he found in a fold of the matting a half-smoked cigar, and this he ground beneath his heel with a green and trenchant oath. He sifted the room from end to end. He found dreary and ignoble small records of many a peripatetic tenant, but of her whom he sought, and who may have lodged there, and whose spirit seemed to hover there, he found no trace. And then he thought of the housekeeper. He ran from the haunted room downstairs and to a door that showed a crack of light. She came out to his knock. He smothered his excitement as best he could. Will you tell me, madam? he besought her, who occupied the room I have before I came? Yes, sir. I can tell you again. Twas Sprowls and Mooney, as I said. Miss Bretta Sprowls it was in the theaters, but Mrs. Mooney she was. My house is well known for respectability. The marriage certificate hung, framed, on a nail over. What kind of a lady was Miss Sprowls, in looks, I mean? Why? black-haired, sir, short, and stout, with a comical face. They left a week ago Tuesday. And before they occupied it? Why, there was a single gentleman connected with the drain business. He left owing me a week. Before him was Mrs. Crowder and her two children, that stayed four months, and back of them was old Mr. Doyle, whose sons paid for him. He kept the room six months. That goes back a year, sir, and further I do not remember. He thanked her and crept back to his room. The room was dead. The essence that had vivified it was gone. The perfume of mignonette had departed. 
In its place was the old, stale odor of moldy house furniture, of atmosphere in storage. The ebbing of his hope drained his faith. He sat staring at the yellow, singing gaslight. Soon he walked to the bed and began to tear the sheets into strips. With the blade of his knife he drove them tightly into every crevice around windows and door. When all was snug and taut he turned out the light, turned the gas full on again and laid himself gratefully upon the bed. It was Mrs. McCool's night to go with the can for beer. So she fetched it and sat with Mrs. Purdy in one of those subterranean retreats where housekeepers foregather and the worm dieth seldom. I rented out my third floor, back, this evening, said Mrs. Purdy, across a fine circle of foam. A young man took it. He went up to bed two hours ago. Now, did ye, Mrs. Purdy, ma'am? said Mrs. McCool, with intense admiration. You do be a wonder for rentin rooms of that kind. And did ye tell him, then, she concluded in a husky whisper, laden with mystery. Rooms, said Mrs. Purdy, in her furriest tones, are furnished for to rent. I did not tell him, Mrs. McCool. Tis right ye are, ma'am, tis by renting rooms we cape alive. Ye have the raw sense for business, ma'am. There be many people will rajic the rentin of a room if they be too to suicide has been after dyin' in the bed of it. As you say, we has our living to be making, remarked Mrs. Purdy. Ease, ma'am, tis true. Tis just one wake ago this day I helped ye lay out the third floor, back. A pretty slip of a colleen she was to be killin' herself with the gas, a sweet little face she had, Mrs. Purdy, ma'am. She'd a been called handsome, as you say, said Mrs. Purdy, assenting but critical, but for that mole she had a growin by her left eyebrow. Do fill up your glass again, Mrs. McCool. A Philistine in Bohemia. George Washington, with his right arm upraised, sits his iron horse at the lower corner of Union Square. Forever signaling the Broadway cars to stop as they round the curve into 14th Street. But the cars buzz on, heedless, as they do at the beck of a private citizen, and the great general must feel, unless his nerves are iron, that rapid transit Gloria Mundi. Should the general raise his left hand as he has raised his right it would point to a quarter of the city that forms a haven for the oppressed and suppressed of foreign lands. In the cause of national or personal freedom they have found a refuge here, and the patriot who made it for them sits his steed, overlooking their district. While he listens through his left ear to vaudeville that caricatures the posterity of his protégés. Italy, Poland, the former Spanish possessions and the polyglot tribes of Austria-Hungary have spilled here a thick lather of their effervescent sons. In the eccentric cafés and lodging houses of the vicinity they hover over their native wines and political secrets. The colony changes with much frequency. Faces disappear from the haunts to be replaced by others. Whither do these uneasy birds flit? For half of the answer observe carefully the suave foreign air and foreign courtesy of the next waiter who serves your table diot. For the other half, perhaps if the barber shops had tongues, and who will dispute it, they could tell their share. Titles are as plentiful as finger rings among these transitory exiles. For lack of proper exploitation a stock of title goods large enough to supply the trade of Upper Fifth Avenue is here condemned to a mere pushcart traffic. The New World landlords who entertain these offshoots of nobility are not dazzled by coronets and crests. They have donuts to sell instead of daughters. With them it is a serious matter of trading in flour and sugar instead of pearl powder and bonbons. These assertions are deemed fitting as an introduction to the tale, which is of plebeians and contains no one with even the ghost of a title. Katie Dempsey's mother kept a furnished room house in this oasis of the aliens. The business was not profitable. If the two scraped together enough to meet the landlord's agent on rent day and negotiate for the ingredients of a daily Irish stew they called it success. Often the stew lacked both meat and potatoes. Sometimes it became as bad as consomme with music. In this moldy old house Katie waxed plump and pert and wholesome and as beautiful and freckled as a tiger lily. 
She was the good fairy who was guilty of placing the damp clean towels and cracked pitchers of freshly laundered croton in the lodger's rooms. You are informed, by virtue of the privileges of astronomical discovery, that the star lodger's name was Mr. Brunelli. His wearing a yellow tie and paying his rent promptly distinguished him from the other lodgers. His raiment was splendid, his complexion olive, his mustache fierce, his manners a prince's, his rings and pins as magnificent as those of a traveling dentist. He had breakfast served in his room, and he ate it in a red dressing gown with green tassels. He left the house at noon and returned at midnight. Those were mysterious hours, but there was nothing mysterious about Mrs. Dempsey's lodgers except the things that were not mysterious. One of Mr. Kipling's poems is addressed to ye who hold the unwritten clue to all save all unwritten things. The same readers are invited to tackle the foregoing assertion. Mr. Brunelli, being impressionable and a Latin, fell to conjugating the verb amare with Katie in the objective case, though not because of antipathy. She talked it over with her mother. Sure, I like him, said Katie. He's more politeness than twenty candidates for aldermen, and he makes me feel like a queen when he walks at me side. But what is he, I dinno. I've me suspicions. The marnal cum win he'll throt out the picture av his baronial halls and acts to have the week's rent hung up in the ice chist along wid all the rest of them. Tis throw, admitted Mrs. Dempsey, that he seems to be a sort for a dago, and too cultured in his spache for a raw gentleman. But ye may be misjudgin him. Ye should neither suspect any one of bein of noble descent that pays cash and patronizes the laundry riglar. He's the same thricks of Spockin and Blarnian with his hands, sighed Katie, as the French nobleman at Mrs. Toole's that ran away with Mr. Toole's Sunday pants and left the photograph of the Bastille. His grandfather's chattaw, as security for ten weeks' rent. Mr. Brunelli continued his calorific wooing. Katie continued to hesitate. One day he asked her out to dine and she felt that a denouement was in the air. While they are on their way, with Katie in her best muslin, you must take as an entract a brief peep at New York's Bohemia. Tonio's restaurant is in Bohemia. The very location of it is secret. If you wish to know where it is ask the first person you meet. He will tell you in a whisper. Tonio discountenances custom, he keeps his house front black and forbidding. He gives you a pretty bad dinner, he locks his door at the dining hour but he knows spaghetti as the boarding house knows cold veal. And, he has deposited many dollars in a certain banco d, something with many gold vowels in the name on its windows. To this restaurant Mr. Brunelli conducted Katie. The house was dark and the shades were lowered, but Mr. Brunelli touched an electric button by the basement door, and they were admitted. Along a long, dark, narrow hallway they went and then through a shining and spotless kitchen that opened directly upon a backyard. The walls of houses hemmed three sides of the yard. A high, board fence, surrounded by cats, the other. A wash of clothes was suspended high upon a line stretched from diagonal corners. Those were property clothes, and were never taken in by Tonio. They were there that wits with defective pronunciation might make puns in connection with the ragu. A dozen and a half little tables set upon the bare ground were crowded with Bohemia hunters, who flocked there because Tonio pretended not to want them and pretended to give them a good dinner. There was a sprinkling of real Bohemians present who came for a change because they were tired of the real Bohemia. And a smart shower of the men who originate the bright sayings of congressmen and the little nephew of the well-known general passenger agent of the Evansville and Terre Haute Railroad Company. Here is a bon MOT that was manufactured at Tonio's. A dinner at Tonio's, said a bohemian, always amounts to twice the price that is asked for it. Let us assume that an accommodating voice inquires. How so? The dinner costs you forty cents you give ten cents to the waiter, and it makes you feel like thirty cents. Most of the diners were confirmed table deodors, gastronomic adventurers, forever seeking the El Dorado of a good claret, and consistently coming to grief in California. Mr. Brunelli escorted Katie to a little table embowered with shrubbery in tubs, 
and asked her to excuse him for a while. Katie sat, enchanted by a scene so brilliant to her. The grand ladies, in splendid dresses and plumes and sparkling rings, the fine gentlemen who laughed so loudly, the cries of Garçon, and We, oui, Monser, and Hello, Mame, that distinguish Bohemia. The lively chatter, the cigarette smoke, the interchange of bright smiles and eye glances, all this display in magnificence overpowered the daughter of Mrs. Dempsey and held her motionless. Mr. Brunelli stepped into the yard and seemed to spread his smile and bow over the entire company. And everywhere there was a great clapping of hands and a few cries of bravo, and Tonio. Tonio, whatever those words might mean. Ladies waved their napkins at him, gentlemen almost twisted their necks off, trying to catch his nod. When the ovation was concluded Mr. Brunelli, with a final bow, stepped nimbly into the kitchen and flung off his coat and waistcoat. Flaherty, the nimblest garçon among the waiters, had been assigned to the special service of Katie. She was a little faint from hunger, for the Irish stew on the Dempsey table had been particularly weak that day. Delicious odors from unknown dishes tantalized her. And Flaherty began to bring to her table course after course of ambrosial food that the gods might have pronounced excellent. But even in the midst of her Lucullian repast Katie laid down her knife and fork. Her heart sank as lead, and a tear fell upon her filet mignon. Her haunting suspicions of the star lodger arose again, fourfold. Thus courted and admired and smiled upon by that fashionable and gracious assembly, what else could Mr. Brunelli be but one of those dazzling titled patricians, glorious of name but shy of rent money? Concerning whom experience had made her wise? With a sense of his ineligibility growing within her there was mingled a torturing conviction that his personality was becoming more pleasing to her day by day. And why had he left her to dine alone? But here he was coming again, now coatless, his snowy shirt sleeves rolled high above his Jeffreysonian elbows, a white yachting cap perched upon his jetty curls. Tonio! Tonio! shouted many, and the spaghetti! The spaghetti! shouted the rest. Never at Tonio's did a waiter dare to serve a dish of spaghetti until Tonio came to test it, to prove the sauce and add the needful dash of seasoning that gave it perfection. From table to table moved Tonio, like a prince in his palace, greeting his guests. White, jeweled hands signaled him from every side. A glass of wine with this one and that, smiles for all, a jest and repartee for any that might challenge, Truly few princes could be so agreeable a host. And what artist could ask for further appreciation of his handiwork? Katie did not know that the proudest consummation of a New Yorker's ambition is to shake hands with a spaghetti chef or to receive a nod from a Broadway head waiter. At last the company thinned, leaving but a few couples and quartets lingering over new wine and old stories. And then came Mr. Brunelli to Katie's secluded table, and drew a chair close to hers. Katie smiled at him dreamily. She was eating the last spoonful of a raspberry roll with burgundy sauce. You have seen, said Mr. Brunelli, laying one hand upon his collar bone. I am Antonio Brunelli. Yes, I am the great Tonio. You have not suspect that. I love you, Katie, and you shall marry with me. Is it not so? Call me Antonio, and say that you will be mine. Katie's head drooped to the shoulder that was now freed from all suspicion of having received the nightly accolade. Oh, Andy, she sighed, this is great. Sure, I'll marry wid ye. But why didn't ye tell me ye was the cook? I was near tenin' ye down for bein' one of thim foreign counts. The Diamond of Cali The original news item concerning the diamond of the goddess Cali was handed in to the city editor. He smiled and held it for a moment above the wastebasket. Then he laid it back on his desk and said, Try the Sunday people, they might work something out of it. The Sunday editor glanced the item over and said, Hum. Afterward he sent for a reporter and expanded his comment. You might see General Ludlow, he said, and make a story out of this if you can. Diamond stories are a drug. 
but this one is big enough to be found by a scrubwoman wrapped up in a piece of newspaper and tucked under the corner of the hall linoleum. Find out first if the general has a daughter who intends to go on the stage. If not, you can go ahead with the story. Run cuts of the Cohener and J.P. Morgan's collection, and work in pictures of the Kimberly Mines and Barney Barnado. Fill in with a tabulated comparison of the values of diamonds, radium, and veal cutlets since the meat strike. And let it run to a half page. On the following day the reporter turned in his story. The Sunday editor let his eye sprint along its lines. Hum, he said again. This time the copy went into the wastebasket with scarcely a flutter. The reporter stiffened a little around the lips. But he was whistling softly and contentedly between his teeth when I went over to talk with him about it an hour later. I don't blame the bold man, said he, magnanimously, for cutting it out. It did sound like funny business, but it happened exactly as I wrote it. Say, why don't you fish that story out of the W.B. and use it? Seems to me it's as good as the Tamirat you write. I accepted the tip, and if you read further you will learn the facts about the diamond of the goddess Kali as vouched for by one of the most reliable reporters on the staff. General Marcellus B. Ludlow lives in one of those decaying but venerated old red brick mansions in the West Twenties. The general is a member of an old New York family that does not advertise. He is a globetrotter by birth, a gentleman by predilection, a millionaire by the mercy of heaven, and a connoisseur of precious stones by occupation. The reporter was admitted promptly when he made himself known at the general's residence at about 8.30 on the evening that he received the assignment. In the magnificent library he was greeted by the distinguished traveler and connoisseur, a tall, erect gentleman in the early fifties, with a nearly white mustache. And a bearing so soldierly that one perceived in him scarcely a trace of the National Guardsman. His weather-beaten countenance lit up with a charming smile of interest and the reporter made known his errand. Ah, you have heard of my latest find. I shall be glad to show you what I conceive to be one of the six most valuable blue diamonds in existence. The general opened a small safe in a corner of the library and brought forth a plush-covered box. Opening this, he exposed to the reporter's bewildered gaze a huge and brilliant diamond, nearly as large as a hailstone. This stone, said the general, is something more than a mere jewel. It once formed the central eye of the three-eyed goddess Kali, who is worshipped by one of the fiercest and most fanatical tribes of India. If you will arrange yourself comfortably I will give you a brief history of it for your paper. General Ludlow brought a decanter of whiskey and glasses from a cabinet, and set a comfortable armchair for the lucky scribe. The fancigars, or thugs, of India, began the general, are the most dangerous and dreaded of the tribes of North India. They are extremists in religion, and worship the horrid goddess Kali in the form of images. Their rites are interesting and bloody. The robbing and murdering of travelers are taught as a worthy and obligatory deed by their strange religious code. Their worship of the three-eyed goddess Kali is conducted so secretly that no traveler has ever heretofore had the honor of witnessing the ceremonies. That distinction was reserved for myself. While at Sakarampur, between Delhi and Kalat, I used to explore the jungle in every direction in the hope of learning something new about these mysterious fancigars. One evening at twilight I was making my way through a teakwood forest, when I came upon a deep circular depression in an open space, in the center of which was a rude stone temple. I was sure that this was one of the temples of the thugs, so I concealed myself in the undergrowth to watch. When the moon rose the depression in the clearing was suddenly filled with hundreds of shadowy, swiftly gliding forms. Then a door opened in the temple, exposing a brightly illuminated image of the goddess Kali, before which a white-robed priest began a barbarous incantation. While the tribe of worshippers prostrated themselves upon the earth. But what interested me most was the central eye of the huge wooden idol. I could see by its flashing brilliancy that it was an immense diamond of the purest water. After the rites were concluded the thugs slipped away into the forest as silently as they had come. 
The priest stood for a few minutes in the door of the temple enjoying the cool of the night before closing his rather warm quarters. Suddenly a dark, lithe shadow slipped down into the hollow, leaped upon the priest, and struck him down with a glittering knife. Then the murderer sprang at the image of the goddess like a cat and pried out the glowing central eye of Kali with his weapon. Straight toward me he ran with his royal prize. When he was within two paces I rose to my feet and struck him with all my force between the eyes. He rolled over senseless and the magnificent jewel fell from his hand. That is the splendid blue diamond you have just seen, a stone worthy of a monarch's crown. That's a corking story, said the reporter. That decanter is exactly like the one that John W. Gates always sets out during an interview. Pardon me, said General Ludlow, for forgetting hospitality in the excitement of my narrative. Help yourself. Here's looking at you, said the reporter. What I am afraid of now, said the general, lowering his voice, is that I may be robbed of the diamond. The jewel that formed an eye of their goddess is their most sacred symbol. Somehow the tribe suspected me of having it, and members of the band have followed me half around the earth. They are the most cunning and cruel fanatics in the world, and their religious vows would compel them to assassinate the unbeliever who has desecrated their sacred treasure. Once in Lucknow three of their agents, disguised as servants in a hotel, endeavored to strangle me with a twisted cloth. Again, in London, two thugs, made up as street musicians, climbed into my window at night and attacked me. They have even tracked me to this country. My life is never safe. A month ago, while I was at a hotel in the Berkshires, three of them sprang upon me from the roadside weeds. I saved myself then by my knowledge of their customs. How was that, General? Asked the reporter. There was a cow grazing nearby, said General Ludlow, a gentle Jersey cow. I ran to her side and stood. The three thugs ceased their attack, knelt and struck the ground thrice with their foreheads. Then, after many respectful salams, they departed. Afraid the cow would hook? asked the reporter. No, the cow is a sacred animal to the fancigars. Next to their goddess they worship the cow. They have never been known to commit any deed of violence in the presence of the animal they reverence. It's a mighty interesting story, said the reporter. If you don't mind I'll take another drink, and then a few notes. I will join you, said General Ludlow, with a courteous wave of his hand. If I were you, advised the reporter, I'd take that sparkler to Texas. Get on a cow ranch there, and the Pharisees. Fancigars, corrected the general. Oh, yes. The fancy guys would run up against a long horn every time they made a break. General Ludlow closed the diamond case and thrust it into his bosom. The spies of the tribe have found me out in New York, he said, straightening his tall figure. I'm familiar with the East Indian cast of countenance, and I know that my every movement is watched. They will undoubtedly attempt to rob and murder me here. Here, exclaimed the reporter, seizing the decanter and pouring out a liberal amount of its contents. At any moment, said the general. But as a soldier and a connoisseur I shall sell my life and my diamond as dearly as I can. At this point of the reporter's story there is a certain vagueness, but it can be gathered that there was a loud crashing noise at the rear of the house they were in. General Ludlow buttoned his coat closely and sprang for the door. But the reporter clutched him firmly with one hand, while he held the decanter with the other. Tell me before we fly, he urged, in a voice thick with some inward turmoil, do any of your daughters contemplate going on the stage? I have no daughters, fly for your life, the fancigars are upon us, cried the general. The two men dashed out of the front door of the house. The hour was late. As their feet struck the sidewalk strange men of dark and forbidding appearance seemed to rise up out of the earth and encompass them. One with Asiatic features pressed close to the general and droned in a terrible voice. By cast CLO. Another, dark-whiskered and sinister, sped lithely to his side and began in a whining voice. Say, mister, have you got a dime fare a poor feller what? They hurried on. 
but only into the arms of a black-eyed, dusky-browed being, who held out his hat under their noses, while a confederate of oriental hue turned the handle of a street organ nearby. Twenty steps farther on General Ludlow and the reporter found themselves in the midst of half a dozen villainous-looking men with high-turned coat collars and faces bristling with unshaven beards. Run for it, hissed the general. They have discovered the possessor of the diamond of the goddess Kali. The two men took to their heels. The avengers of the goddess pursued. Oh, lordy! Groaned the reporter, there isn't a cow this side of Brooklyn. We're lost. When near the corner they both fell over an iron object that rose from the sidewalk close to the gutter. Clinging to it desperately, they awaited their fate. If I only had a cow, moaned the reporter, or another nip from that decanter, general. As soon as the pursuers observed where their victims had found refuge they suddenly fell back and retreated to a considerable distance. They are waiting for reinforcements in order to attack us, said General Ludlow. But the reporter emitted a ringing laugh, and hurled his hat triumphantly into the air. Guess again, he shouted, and leaned heavily upon the iron object. Your old fancy guys or thugs, whatever you call em, are up to date. Dear General, this is a pump we've stranded upon, same as a cow in New York, hick, see? That's h why the infuriated smoked guys don't attack us, see? Sacred and mal, the pump in and York, my dear general. But further down in the shadows of 28th Street the marauders were holding a parley. Come on, ready, said one. Let's go frisk the old un. He's been showin' a sparkler as big as a hen egg all around 8th Avenue for two weeks past. Not on your silhouette, decided ready. You see, M. rallyin' round the pump? They're friends of Bill's. Bill won't stand for nothin' of this kind in his district since he got that bid to Esopus. This exhausts the facts concerning the Cali Diamond. But it is deemed not inconsequent to close with the following brief, paid, item that appeared two days later in a morning paper. It is rumored that a niece of General Marcellus B. Ludlow, of New York City, will appear on the stage next season. Her diamonds are said to be extremely valuable and of much historic interest. A little talk about mobs. I see, remarked the tall gentleman in the frock coat and black slouch hat. That another streetcar motorman in your city has narrowly escaped lynching at the hands of an infuriated mob by lighting a cigar and walking a couple of blocks down the street. Do you think they would have lynched him? asked the New Yorker, in the next seat of the ferry station, who was also waiting for the boat. Not until after the election, said the tall man, cutting a corner off his plug of tobacco. I've been in your city long enough to know something about your mobs. The motorman's mob is about the least dangerous of them all, except the National Guard and the Dressmaker's Convention. You see, when little Willie Goldstein is sent by his mother for pig's knuckles, with a nickel tightly grasped in his chubby fist. He always crosses the streetcar track safely twenty feet ahead of the car. And then suddenly turns back to ask his mother whether it was pale ale or a spool of eighty white cotton that she wanted. The motorman yells and throws himself on the brakes like a football player. There is a horrible grinding and then a ripping sound, and a piercing shriek, and Willie is sitting, with part of his trousers torn away by the fender, screaming for his lost nickel. In ten seconds the car is surrounded by six hundred infuriated citizens, crying, lynch the motorman. Lynch the motorman, at the top of their voices. Some of them run to the nearest cigar store to get a rope, but they find the last one has just been cut up and labeled. Hundreds of the excited mob press close to the cowering motorman, whose hand is observed to tremble perceptibly as he transfers a stick of pepsin gum from his pocket to his mouth. When the bloodthirsty mob of maddened citizens has closed in on the motorman, some bringing camp stools and sitting quite close to him, and all shouting, lynch him. Policeman Fogarty forces his way through them to the side of their prospective victim. Hello, Mike, says the motorman in a low voice, nice day. Shall I sneak off a block or so, or would you like to rescue me? Well, Jerry, if you don't mind says the policeman, I'd like to disperse the infuriated mob single-handed. 
I haven't defeated a lynching mob since last Tuesday, and that was a small one of only 300 that wanted to string up a Dago boy for selling wormy pears. It would boost me some down at the station. All right, Mike, says the motorman, anything to oblige. I'll turn pale and tremble. And he does so, and policeman Fogarty draws his club and says, Guan would yes. And in eight seconds the desperate mob has scattered and gone about its business, except about a hundred who remain to search for Willie's nickel. I never heard of a mob in our city doing violence to a motorman because of an accident, said the New Yorker. You are not liable to, said the tall man. They know the motorman's all right, and that he wouldn't even run over a stray dog if he could help it. And they know that not a man among them would tie the knot to hang even a Thomas cat that had been tried and condemned and sentenced according to law. Then why do they become infuriated and make threats of lynching, asked the New Yorker. To assure the motorman, answered the tall man, that he is safe. If they really wanted to do him up they would go into the houses and drop bricks on him from the third-story windows. New Yorkers are not cowards, said the other man, a little stiffly. Not one at a time, agreed the tall man, promptly. You've got a fine lot of single-handed scrappers in your town. I'd rather fight three of you than one. And I'd go up against all the gas trust's victims in a bunch before I'd pass two citizens on a dark corner, with my watch chain showing. When you get rounded up in a bunch you lose your nerve. Get you in crowds and you're easy. Ask the Bell Road Guards and George B. Cordelieu and the Tintype Booths at Coney Island. Divided you stand, united you fall. E pluribus nihil. Whenever one of your mobs surrounds a man and begins to holler, lynch him. He says to himself, Oh, dear, I suppose I must look pale to please the boys, but I will, forsooth, let my life insurance premium lapse tomorrow. This is a sure tip for me to play Methuselah straight across the board in the next handicap. I can imagine the tortured feelings of a prisoner in the hands of New York policemen when an infuriated mob demands that he be turned over to them for lynching. For God's sake, officers, cries the distracted wretch, have ye hearts of stone, that ye will not let them wrest me from ye? Sorry, Jimmy, says one of the policemen, but it won't do. There's three of us, me and Daryl and the plainclothes man, and there's only seven thousand of the mob. How'd we explain it at the office if they took ye? Just chase the infuriated aggregation around the corner, Daryl, and we'll be movin' along to the station. Some of our gatherings of excited citizens have not been so harmless, said the New Yorker, with a faint note of civic pride. I'll admit that, said the tall man. A cousin of mine who was on a visit here once had an arm broken and lost an ear in one of them. That must have been during the Cooper Union riots, remarked the New Yorker. Not the Cooper Union, explained the tall man, but it was a union riot, at the Van Astor wedding. You seem to be in favor of lynch law, said the New Yorker, severely. No, sir, I am not. No intelligent man is. But, sir, there are certain cases when people rise in their just majesty and take a righteous vengeance for crimes that the law is slow in punishing. I am an advocate of law and order. But I will say to you that less than six months ago I myself assisted at the lynching of one of that race that is creating a wide chasm between your section of country and mine, sir. It is a deplorable condition, said the New Yorker, that exists in the South, but. I am from Indiana. Sir, said the tall man, taking another chew. And I don't think you will condemn my course when I tell you that the colored man in question had stolen nine dollars and sixty cents in cash, sir, from my own brother. Sweet homes and their romance. Few young couples in the big city of Bluff began their married existence with greater promise of happiness than did Mr. and Mrs. Claude Turpin. They felt no especial animosity toward each other, they were comfortably established in a handsome apartment house that had a name and accommodations like those of a sleeping car. They were living as expensively as the couple on the next floor above who had twice their income. And their marriage had occurred on a wager, a ferryboat and first acquaintance, thus securing a sensational newspaper notice with their names attached to pictures of the Queen of Romania and M. Santos Dumont. 
Turpin's income was $200 per month. On payday, after calculating the amounts due for rent, installments on furniture and piano, gas, and bills owed to the florist, confectioner, milliner, tailor, wine merchant and cab company. The Tuppins would find that they still had $200 left to spend. How to do this is one of the secrets of metropolitan life. The domestic life of the Tuppins was a beautiful picture to see. But you couldn't gaze upon it as you could at an oleograph of Don't Wake Grandma or Brooklyn by Moonlight. You had to blink when you looked at it. And you heard a fizzing sound just like the machine with a scope at the end of it. Yes, there wasn't much repose about the picture of the Tepin's domestic life. It was something like spearing salmon in the Columbia River, or Japanese artillery in action. Every day was just like another, as the days are in New York. In the morning Turpin would take bromo seltzer, his pocket change from under the clock, his hat, no breakfast and his departure for the office. At noon Mrs. Turpin would get out of bed and humor, put on a kimono, airs, and the water to boil for coffee. Turpin lunched downtown. He came home at six to dress for dinner. They always dined out. They strayed from the chop house to chop suedom, from terrace to table d'hote, from Rotskeller to Roadhouse, from cafe to casino, from Maria's to the Martha Washington. Such is domestic life in the great city. Your vine is the mistletoe, your fig tree bears dates. Your household gods are Mercury and John Howard Payne. For the wedding march you now hear only, come with the gypsy bride. You rarely dine at the same place twice in succession. You tire of the food. And, besides, you want to give them time for the question of that souvenir silver sugar bowl to blow over. The Tuppins were therefore happy. They made many warm and delightful friends, some of whom they remembered the next day. Their home life was an ideal one, according to the rules and regulations of the Book of Bluff. There came a time when it dawned upon Turpin that his wife was getting away with too much money. If you belong to the near swell class in the big city, and your income is $200 per month, and you find at the end of the month, after looking over the bills for current expenses, that you, yourself, have spent $150, you very naturally wonder what has become of the other $50. So you suspect your wife. And perhaps you give her a hint that something needs explanation. I say, Vivian, said Turpin, one afternoon when they were enjoying in rapt silence the peace and quiet of their cozy apartment. You've been creating a hiatus big enough for a dog to crawl through in this month's honorarium. You haven't been paying your dressmaker anything on account, have you? There was a moment's silence. No sounds could be heard except the breathing of the fox terrier, and the subdued, monotonous sizzling of Vivian's fulvous locks against the insensate curling irons. Claude Turpin, sitting upon a pillow that he had thoughtfully placed upon the convolutions of the apartment sofa, narrowly watched the riante, lovely face of his wife. Claudy, dear, said she, touching her finger to her ruby tongue and testing the unresponsive curling irons, you do me an injustice. Madame. Toinette has not seen a cent of mine since the day you paid your tailor ten dollars on account. Turpin's suspicions were allayed for the time. But one day soon there came an anonymous letter to him that read. Watch your wife. She is blowing in your money secretly. I was a sufferer just as you are. The place is number 345 Blank Street. A word to the wise, etc. A man who knows. Turpin took this letter to the captain of police of the precinct that he lived in. My precinct is as clean as a hound's tooth, said the captain. The lids shut down as close there as it is over the eye of a Williamsburg girl when she's kissed at a party. But if you think there's anything queer at the address, I'll go there with ye. On the next afternoon at three, Turpin and the captain crept softly up the stairs of number 345 Blank Street. A dozen plainclothes men, dressed in full police uniforms, so as to allay suspicion, waited in the hall below. At the top of the stairs was a door, which was found to be locked. The captain took a key from his pocket and unlocked it. The two men entered. 
they found themselves in a large room, occupied by twenty or twenty-five elegantly clothed ladies. Racing charts hung against the walls, a ticker clicked in one corner, with a telephone receiver to his ear a man was calling out the various positions of the horses in a very exciting race. The occupants of the room looked up at the intruders, but, as if reassured by the sight of the captain's uniform, they reverted their attention to the man at the telephone. You see, said the captain to Turpin, the value of an anonymous letter. No high-minded and self-respecting gentleman should consider one worthy of notice. Is your wife among this assembly, Mr. Turpin? She is not, said Turpin. And if she was, continued the captain, would she be within the reach of the tongue of slander? These ladies constitute a Browning society. They meet to discuss the meaning of the great poet. The telephone is connected with Boston, whence the parent society transmits frequently its interpretations of the poems. Be ashamed of your suspicions, Mr. Turpin. Go soak your shield, said Turpin. Vivian knows how to take care of herself in a pool room. She's not dropping anything on the ponies. There must be something queer going on here. Nothing but Browning, said the captain. Hear that? Thanatopsis by a nose, drawled the man at the telephone. That's not Browning, that's Longfellow, said Turpin, who sometimes read books. Back to the pasture! exclaimed the captain. Longfellow made the pacing to wagon record of 753 way back in 1868. I believe there's something queer about this joint, repeated Turpin. I don't see it, said the captain. I know it looks like a pool room, all right, persisted Turpin, but that's all a blind. Vivian has been dropping a lot of coin somewhere. I believe there's some underhanded work going on here. A number of racing sheets were tacked close together, covering a large space on one of the walls. Turpin, suspicious, tore several of them down. A door, previously hidden, was revealed. Turpin placed an ear to the crack and listened intently. He heard the soft hum of many voices, low and guarded laughter, and a sharp, metallic clicking and scraping as if from a multitude of tiny but busy objects. My God! It is as I feared! whispered Turpin to himself. Summon your men at once, he called to the captain. She is in there, I know. At the blowing of the captain's whistle the uniformed plainclothes men rushed up the stairs into the pool room. When they saw the betting paraphernalia distributed around they halted, surprised and puzzled to know why they had been summoned. But the captain pointed to the locked door and bade them break it down. In a few moments they demolished it with the axes they carried. Into the other room sprang Claude Turpin, with the captain at his heels. The scene was one that lingered long in Turpin's mind. Nearly a score of women, women expensively and fashionably clothed, many beautiful and of refined appearance, had been seated at little marble-topped tables. When the police burst open the door they shrieked and ran here and there like gaily plumed birds that had been disturbed in a tropical grove. Some became hysterical, one or two fainted. Several knelt at the feet of the officers and besought them for mercy on account of their families and social position. A man who had been seated behind a desk had seized a roll of currency as large as the ankle of a Paradise Roof Gardens chorus girl and jumped out of the window. Half a dozen attendants huddled at one end of the room, breathless from fear. Upon the tables remained the damning and incontrovertible evidences of the guilt of the habitués of that sinister room, dish after dish heaped high with ice cream. And surrounded by stacks of empty ones, scraped to the last spoonful. Ladies, said the captain to his weeping circle of prisoners, I'll not hold any of yes. Some of yes I recognize as having fine houses and good standing in the community, with hard-working husbands and children at home. But I'll read ye a bit of a lecture before ye go. In the next room there's a twenty, two, one shot just dropped in under the wire three lengths ahead of the field. Is this the way ye you waste your husband's money instead of helping earn it? Homewood yes. The lids on the ice cream freezer in this precinct. Claude Turpin's wife was among the patrons of the raided room. He led her to their apartment in stern silence. 
There she wept so remorsefully and besought his forgiveness so pleadingly that he forgot his just anger, and soon he gathered his penitent golden-haired Vivian in his arms and forgave her. Darling, she murmured, half-sobbingly, as the moonlight drifted through the open window, glorifying her sweet, upturned face, I know I done wrong. I will never touch ice cream again. I forgot you were not a millionaire. I used to go there every day. But today I felt some strange, sad presentiment of evil, and I was not myself. I ate only eleven saucers. Say no more, said Claude, gently as he fondly caressed her waving curls. And you are sure that you fully forgive me, asked Vivian, gazing at him entreatingly with dewy eyes of heavenly blue. Almost sure, little one, answered Claude, stooping and lightly touching her snowy forehead with his lips. I'll let you know later on. I've got a month's salary down on vanilla to win the three-year-old steeplechase tomorrow, and if the ice cream hunch is to the good you are it again, see? The Caliph, Cupid and the Clock Prince Michael, of the electorate of Vialuna, sat on his favorite bench in the park. The coolness of the September night quickened the life in him like a rare, tonic wine. The benches were not filled. For park loungers, with their stagnant blood, are prompt to detect and fly home from the crispness of early autumn. The moon was just clearing the roofs of the range of dwellings that bounded the quadrangle on the east. Children laughed and played about the fine sprayed fountain. In the shadowed spots fawns and hemadryads wooed, unconscious of the gaze of mortal eyes. A hand organ, Philomel by the grace of our stage carpenter, fancy, fluted and droned in a side street. Around the enchanted boundaries of the little park street cars spat and mewed and the stilted trains roared like tigers and lions prowling for a place to enter. And above the trees shone the great, round, shining face of an illuminated clock in the tower of an antique public building. Prince Michael's shoes were wrecked far beyond the skill of the carefulest cobbler. The ragman would have declined any negotiations concerning his clothes. The two-week stubble on his face was gray and brown and red and greenish-yellow, as if it had been made up from individual contributions from the chorus of a musical comedy. No man existed who had money enough to wear so bad a hat as his. Prince Michael sat on his favorite bench and smiled. It was a diverting thought to him that he was wealthy enough to buy every one of those close-ranged, bulky, window-lit mansions that faced him, if he chose. He could have matched gold, equipages, jewels, art treasures, estates and acres with any Croesus in this proud city of Manhattan and scarcely have entered upon the bulk of his holdings. He could have sat at table with reigning sovereigns. The social world, the world of art, the fellowship of the elect, adulation, imitation, the homage of the fairest, honors from the highest, praise from the wisest, flattery, esteem, credit, pleasure. Fame, all the honey of life was waiting in the comb in the hive of the world for Prince Michael, of the electorate of Vialuna, whenever he might choose to take it. But his choice was to sit in rags and dinginess on a bench in a park. For he had tasted of the fruit of the tree of life, and, finding it bitter in his mouth, had stepped out of Eden for a time to seek distraction close to the unarmored, beating heart of the world. These thoughts strayed dreamily through the mind of Prince Michael, as he smiled under the stubble of his polychromatic beard. Lounging thus, clad as the poorest of mendicants in the parks, he loved to study humanity. He found in altruism more pleasure than his riches, his station and all the grosser sweets of life had given him. It was his chief solace and satisfaction to alleviate individual distress, to confer favors upon worthy ones who had need of succor. To dazzle unfortunates by unexpected and bewildering gifts of truly royal magnificence, bestowed, however, with wisdom and judiciousness. And as Prince Michael's eye rested upon the glowing face of the great clock in the tower, his smile, altruistic as it was, became slightly tinged with contempt. Big thoughts were the prince's. And it was always with a shake of his head that he considered the subjugation of the world to the arbitrary measures of time. The comings and goings of people in hurry and dread, controlled by the little metal moving hands of a clock, always made him sad. By and by came a young man in evening clothes and sat upon the third bench from the prince. 
For half an hour he smoked cigars with nervous haste, and then he fell to watching the face of the illuminated clock above the trees. His perturbation was evident, and the prince noted, in sorrow, that its cause was connected, in some manner, with the slowly moving hands of the timepiece. His Highness arose and went to the young man's bench. I beg your pardon for addressing you, he said, but I perceive that you are disturbed in mind. If it may serve to mitigate the liberty I have taken I will add that I am Prince Michael, heir to the throne of the electorate of Violuna. I appear incognito, of course, as you may gather from my appearance. It is a fancy of mine to render aid to others whom I think worthy of it. Perhaps the matter that seems to distress you is one that would more readily yield to our mutual efforts. The young man looked up brightly at the prince. Brightly, but the perpendicular line of perplexity between his brows was not smoothed away. He laughed, and even then it did not. But he accepted the momentary diversion. Glad to meet you, prince, he said, good-humouredly. Yes, I'd say you were incognito all right. Thanks for your offer of assistance, but I don't see where your butting in would help things any. It's a kind of private affair, you know, but thanks all the same. Prince Michael sat at the young man's side. He was often rebuffed but never offensively. His courteous manner and words forbade that. Clocks, said the prince, are shackles on the feet of mankind. I have observed you looking persistently at that clock. Its face is that of a tyrant, its numbers are false as those on a lottery ticket, its hands are those of a bunco steerer, who makes an appointment with you to your ruin. Let me entreat you to throw off its humiliating bonds and to cease to order your affairs by that insensate monitor of brass and steel. I don't usually, said the young man. I carry a watch except when I've got my radiant rags on. I know human nature as I do the trees and grass, said the prince, with earnest dignity. I am a master of philosophy, a graduate in art, and I hold the purse of a fortunatus. There are few mortal misfortunes that I cannot alleviate or overcome. I have read your countenance, and found in it honesty and nobility as well as distress. I beg of you to accept my advice or aid. Do not belie the intelligence I see in your face by judging from my appearance of my ability to defeat your troubles. The young man glanced at the clock again and frowned darkly. When his gaze strayed from the glowing horologue of time it rested intently upon a four-story red brick house in the row of dwellings opposite to where he sat. The shades were drawn, and the lights in many rooms shone dimly through them. Ten minutes to nine, exclaimed the young man, with an impatient gesture of despair. He turned his back upon the house and took a rapid step or two in a contrary direction. Romain. Commanded Prince Michael, in so potent a voice that the disturbed one wheeled around with a somewhat chagrined laugh. I'll give her the ten minutes and then I'm off, he muttered, and then aloud to the prince, I'll join you in confounding all clocks, my friend, and throw in women, too. Sit down, said the prince calmly. I do not accept your addition. Women are the natural enemies of clocks, and, therefore, the allies of those who would seek liberation from these monsters that measure our follies and limit our pleasures. If you will so far confide in me I would ask you to relate to me your story." The young man threw himself upon the bench with a reckless laugh. "'Your Royal Highness, I will,' he said, in tones of mock deference. "'Do you see yonder house, the one with three upper windows lighted?' Well, at six o'clock I stood in that house with the young lady I am, that is, I was, engaged to. I had been doing wrong, my dear prince, I had been a naughty boy, and she had heard of it. I wanted to be forgiven, of course, we are always wanting women to forgive us, aren't we, prince? I want time to think it over, said she. There is one thing certain. I will either fully forgive you, or I will never see your face again. There will be no halfway business. At half past eight, she said, at exactly half past eight you may be watching the middle upper window of the top floor. If I decide to forgive I will hang out of that window a white silk scarf. You will know by that that all is as was before, and you may come to me. 
If you see no scarf you may consider that everything between us is ended forever. That, concluded the young man bitterly, is why I have been watching that clock. The time for the signal to appear has passed twenty-three minutes ago. Do you wonder that I am a little disturbed, my prince of rags and whiskers? Let me repeat to you, said Prince Michael, in his even, well-modulated tones, that women are the natural enemies of clocks. Clocks are an evil, women a blessing. The signal may yet appear. Never, on your principality, exclaimed the young man, hopelessly. You don't know Marion, of course. She's always on time, to the minute. That was the first thing about her that attracted me. I've got the mitten instead of the scarf. I ought to have known at 8.31 that my goose was cooked. I'll go west on the 11.45 tonight with Jack Milburn. The jig's up. I'll try Jack's ranch a while and top off with the Klondike and whiskey. Good night, er, er, Prince. Prince Michael smiled his enigmatic, gentle, comprehending smile and caught the coat sleeve of the other. The brilliant light in the prince's eyes was softening to a dreamier, cloudy translucence. Wait, he said solemnly, till the clock strikes. I have wealth and power and knowledge above most men, but when the clock strikes I am afraid. Stay by me until then. This woman shall be yours. You have the word of the hereditary prince of Vialuna. On the day of your marriage I will give you one hundred thousand dollars and a palace on the Hudson. But there must be no clocks in that palace, they measure our follies and limit our pleasures. Do you agree to that? Of course, said the young man, cheerfully, they're a nuisance, anyway, always ticking and striking and getting you late for dinner. He glanced again at the clock in the tower. The hands stood at three minutes to nine. I think, said Prince Michael, that I will sleep a little. The day has been fatiguing. He stretched himself upon a bench with the manner of one who had slept thus before. You will find me in this park on any evening when the weather is suitable, said the prince, sleepily. Come to me when your marriage day is set and I will give you a check for the money. Thanks, your highness, said the young man, seriously. It doesn't look as if I would need that palace on the Hudson, but I appreciate your offer, just the same. Prince Michael sank into deep slumber. His battered hat rolled from the bench to the ground. The young man lifted it, placed it over the frozy face and moved one of the grotesquely relaxed limbs into a more comfortable position. Poor devil, he said, as he drew the tattered clothes closer about the prince's breast. Sonorous and startling came the stroke of nine from the clock tower. The young man sighed again, turned his face for one last look at the house of his relinquished hopes, and cried aloud profane words of holy rapture. From the middle upper window blossomed in the dusk a waving, snowy, fluttering, wonderful, divine emblem of forgiveness and promised joy. By came a citizen, rotund, comfortable, home-hurrying, unknowing of the delights of waving silken scarfs on the borders of dimly lit parks. Will you oblige me with the time, sir? Asked the young man, and the citizen, shrewdly conjecturing his watch to be safe, dragged it out and announced. Twenty-nine and a half minutes past eight, sir. And then, from habit, he glanced at the clock in the tower, and made further oration. By George! That clock's half an hour fast. First time in ten years I've known it to be off. This watch of mine never varies a. Uh. But the citizen was talking to vacancy. He turned and saw his hearer, a fast receding black shadow, flying in the direction of a house with three lighted upper windows. And in the morning came along two policemen on their way to the beats they owned. The park was deserted save for one dilapidated figure that sprawled, asleep, on a bench. They stopped and gazed upon it. It's Dopey Mike, said one. He hits the pipe every night. Park bum for twenty years. On his last legs, I guess. The other policeman stooped and looked at something crumpled and crisp in the hand of the sleeper. Gee, he remarked. He's doped out a fifty-dollar bill, anyway. Wish I knew the brand of hop that he smokes. And then, rap, 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 
went the club of realism against the shoe soles of Prince Michael, of the electorate of Violuna. Makes the whole world kin. The burglar stepped inside the window quickly, and then he took his time. A burglar who respects his art always takes his time before taking anything else. The house was a private residence. By its boarded front door and untrimmed Boston ivy the burglar knew that the mistress of it was sitting on some oceanside piazza telling a sympathetic man in a yachting cap that no one had ever understood her sensitive. Lonely heart. He knew by the light in the third-story front windows, and by the lateness of the season, that the master of the house had come home, and would soon extinguish his light and retire. For it was September of the year and of the soul, in which season the house's good man comes to consider roof gardens and stenographers as vanities. And to desire the return of his mate and the more durable blessings of decorum and the moral excellencies. The burglar lighted a cigarette. The guarded glow of the match illuminated his salient points for a moment. He belonged to the third type of burglars. This third type has not yet been recognized and accepted. The police have made us familiar with the first and second. Their classification is simple. The collar is the distinguishing mark. When a burglar is caught who does not wear a collar he is described as a degenerate of the lowest type, singularly vicious and depraved. And is suspected of being the desperate criminal who stole the handcuffs out of Patrolman Hennessy's pocket in 1878 and walked away to escape arrest. The other well-known type is the burglar who wears a collar. He is always referred to as a raffles in real life. He is invariably a gentleman by daylight, breakfasting in a dress suit, and posing as a paperhanger, while after dark he plies his nefarious occupation of burglary. His mother is an extremely wealthy and respected resident of Ocean Grove, and when he is conducted to his cell he asks at once for a nail file and the police gazette. He always has a wife in every state in the Union and fiancés in all the territories. And the newspapers print his matrimonial gallery out of their stock of cuts of the ladies who were cured by only one bottle after having been given up by five doctors. Experiencing great relief after the first dose. The burglar wore a blue sweater. He was neither a Raffles nor one of the chefs from Hell's Kitchen. The police would have been baffled had they attempted to classify him. They have not yet heard of the respectable, unassuming burglar who is neither above nor below his station. This burglar of the third class began to prowl. He wore no masks, dark lanterns, or gum shoes. He carried a .38 caliber revolver in his pocket, and he chewed peppermint gum thoughtfully. The furniture of the house was swathed in its summer dust protectors. The silver was far away in safe deposit vaults. The burglar expected no remarkable hull. His objective point was that dimly lighted room where the master of the house should be sleeping heavily after whatever solace he had sought to lighten the burden of his loneliness. A touch might be made there to the extent of legitimate, fair professional profits, loose money, a watch, a jeweled stickpin, nothing exorbitant or beyond reason. He had seen the window left open and had taken the chance. The burglar softly opened the door of the lighted room. The gas was turned low. A man lay in the bed asleep. On the dresser lay many things in confusion, a crumpled roll of bills, a watch, keys, three poker chips, crushed cigars, a pink silk hair bow, and an unopened bottle of bromo seltzer for a bulwark in the morning. The burglar took three steps toward the dresser. The man in the bed suddenly uttered a squeaky groan and opened his eyes. His right hand slid under his pillow, but remained there. Lay still, said the burglar in conversational tone. Burglars of the third type do not hiss. The citizen in the bed looked at the round end of the burglar's pistol and lay still. Now hold up both your hands, commanded the burglar. The citizen had a little, pointed, brown and gray beard like that of a painless dentist. He looked solid, esteemed, irritable, and disgusted. He sat up in bed and raised his right hand above his head. Up with the other one, ordered the burglar. You might be amphibious and shoot with your left. You can count too, can't you? Hurry up, now. 
Can't raise the other one, said the citizen, with a contortion of his lineaments. What's the matter with it? Rheumatism in the shoulder. Inflammatory? Was. The inflammation has gone down. The burglar stood for a moment or two, holding his gun on the afflicted one. He glanced at the plunder on the dresser and then, with a half-embarrassed air, back at the man in the bed. Then he, too, made a sudden grimace. Don't stand there making faces, snapped the citizen, bad-humoredly. If you've come to burgle why don't you do it? There's some stuff lying around. Excuse me, said the burglar, with a grin. But it just socked me one, too. It's good for you that rheumatism and me happens to be old pals. I got it in my left arm, too. Most anybody but me would have popped you when you wouldn't hoist that left claw of yours. How long have you had it? inquired the citizen. Four years. I guess that ain't all. Once you've got it, it's you for a rheumatic life, that's my judgment. Ever try rattlesnake oil? asked the citizen, interestedly. Gallons, said the burglar. If all the snakes I've used the oil of was strung out in a row they'd reach eight times as far as Saturn, and the rattles could be heard at Valparaiso, Indiana, and back. Some use Chisolem's pills, remarked the citizen. Fudge, said the burglar. Took M five months. No good. I had some relief the year I tried Finkelham's extract, balm of Gilead poultices and Potts's pain pulverizer, but I think it was the buckeye I carried in my pocket what done the trick. Is yours worse in the morning or at night? asked the citizen. Night, said the burglar, just when I'm busiest. Say, take down that arm of yours, I guess you won't, say. Did you ever try Blickerstaff's blood builder? I never did. Does yours come in paroxysms or is it a steady pain? The burglar sat down on the foot of the bed and rested his gun on his crossed knee. It jumps, said he. It strikes me when I ain't looking for it. I had to give up second-story work because I got stuck sometimes halfway up. Tell you what, I don't believe the bloomin' doctors know what is good for it. Same here. I've spent a thousand dollars without getting any relief. Yours swell any? Of mornings. And when it's goin' to rain, great Christopher. Me, too, said the citizen. I can tell when a streak of humidity the size of a tablecloth starts from Florida on its way to New York. And if I pass a theater where there's an East Lynn matinee going on, the moisture starts my left arm jumping like a toothache. It's undiluted, Hades, said the burglar. You're dead right, said the citizen. The burglar looked down at his pistol and thrust it into his pocket with an awkward attempt at ease. Say, old man, he said, constrainedly, ever try Opadeldoc. Slop, said the citizen angrily. Might as well rub on restaurant butter. Sure, concurred the burglar. It's a salve suitable for little Minnie when the kitty scratches her finger. I'll tell you what. We're up against it. I only find one thing that eases her up. Hey. Little old sanitary, ameliorating, lest we forget booze. Say, this job's off, excuse me, get on your clothes and let's go out and have some. Excuse the liberty, but, ouch. There she goes again. For a week, said the citizen. I haven't been able to dress myself without help. I'm afraid Thomas is in bed, and. Climb out, said the burglar, I'll help you get into your duds. The conventional returned as a tidal wave and flooded the citizen. He stroked his brown and gray beard. It's very unusual, he began. Here's your shirt, said the burglar, fall out. I knew a man who said Ombre's ointment fixed him in two weeks so he could use both hands in tying his foreign hand. As they were going out the door the citizen turned and started back. Like to forgot my money, he explained, laid it on the dresser last night. The burglar caught him by the right sleeve. Come on, he said bluffly. I ask you. Leave it alone. I've got the price. Ever try witch hazel and oil of wintergreen? 
The Love Filter of Icky Schoenstein The Blue Light Drug Store is downtown, between the Bowery and First Avenue, where the distance between the two streets is the shortest. The Blue Light does not consider that pharmacy is a thing of bric-a-brac, scent and ice cream soda. If you ask it for painkiller it will not give you a bonbon. The Blue Light scorns the labor-saving arts of modern pharmacy. It macerates its opium and percolates its own laudanum and paragoric. To this day pills are made behind its tall prescription desk, pills rolled out on its own pill tile, divided with a spatula, rolled with the finger and thumb. Dusted with calcined magnesia and delivered in little round pasteboard pillboxes. The store is on a corner about which coveys of ragged plumed, hilarious children play and become candidates for the cough drops and soothing syrups that wait for them inside. Icky Schoenstein was the night clerk of the blue light and the friend of his customers. Thus it is on the east side, where the heart of pharmacy is not glacé. There, as it should be, the druggist is a counselor, a confessor, an advisor, an able and willing missionary and mentor whose learning is respected. Whose occult wisdom is venerated and whose medicine is often poured, untasted, into the gutter. Therefore Icky's corniform, bespectacled nose and narrow, knowledge-bowed figure was well known in the vicinity of the blue light, and his advice and notice were much desired. Icky roomed and breakfasted at Mrs. Riddle's two squares away. Mrs. Riddle had a daughter named Rosie. The circumlocution has been in vain, you must have guessed it, Icky adored Rosie. She tinctured all his thoughts, she was the compound extract of all that was chemically pure and officinal, the dispensatory contained nothing equal to her. But Icky was timid, and his hopes remained insoluble in the menstruum of his backwardness and fears. Behind his counter he was a superior being, calmly conscious of special knowledge and worth. Outside he was a weak-kneed, purblind, motorman-cursed rambler, with ill-fitting clothes stained with chemicals and smelling of socotrine aloes and valerianate of ammonia. The fly in Icky's ointment, thrice welcome, Pat Trope, was Chunk McGowan. Mr. McGowan was also striving to catch the bright smiles tossed about by Rosie. But he was no outfielder as Icky was. He picked them off the bat. At the same time he was Icky's friend and customer. And often dropped in at the blue light drug store to have a bruise painted with iodine or get a cut rubber plastered after a pleasant evening spent along the Bowery. One afternoon McGowan drifted in in his silent, easy way, and sat, comely, smooth-faced, hard, indomitable, good-natured, upon a stool. Icky, said he, when his friend had fetched his mortar and sat opposite, grinding gum benzoin to a powder, get busy with your ear. It's drugs for me if you've got the line I need. Icky scanned the countenance of Mr. McGowan for the usual evidences of conflict, but found none. Take your coat off, he ordered. I guess already that you have been stuck in the ribs with a knife. I have many times told you those dagos would do you up. Mr. McGowan smiled. Not them, he said. Not any dagos. But you've located the diagnosis all right enough, it's under my coat, near the ribs. Say. Icky, Rosie and me are going to run away and get married tonight. Icky's left forefinger was doubled over the edge of the mortar, holding it steady. He gave it a wild rap with the pestle, but felt it not. Meanwhile Mr. McGowan's smile faded to a look of perplexed gloom. That is, he continued, if she keeps in the notion until the time comes. We've been laying pipes for the getaway for two weeks. One day she says she will, the same evening she says Nixie. We've agreed on tonight, and Rosie's stuck to the affirmative this time for two whole days. But it's five hours yet till the time, and I'm afraid she'll stand me up when it comes to the scratch. You said you wanted drugs, remarked Icky. Mr. McGowan looked ill at ease and harassed, a condition opposed to his usual line of demeanor. He made a patent medicine almanac into a roll and fitted it with unprofitable carefulness about his finger. I wouldn't have this double handicap make a false start tonight for a million, he said. I've got a little flat up in Harlem already, with chrysanthemums on the table and a kettle ready to boil. 
and I've engaged a pulpit pounder to be ready at his house for us at 9.30. It's got to come off. And if Rosie don't change her mind again. Mr. McGowan ceased, a prey to his doubts. I don't see then yet, said Icky, shortly, what makes it that you talk of drugs, or what I can be doing about it. Old man Riddle don't like me a little bit, went on the uneasy suitor, bent upon marshalling his arguments. For a week he hasn't let Rosie step outside the door with me. If it wasn't for losin' a boarder they'd have bounced me long ago. I'm makin' twenty dollars a week and she'll never regret flyin' the coop with Chunk McGowan. You will excuse me, Chunk, said Icky. I must make a prescription that is to be called for soon. Say, said McGowan, looking up suddenly, say, Icky, ain't there a drug of some kind, some kind of powders that'll make a girl like you better if you give em to her? Icky's lip beneath his nose curled with the scorn of superior enlightenment. But before he could answer, McGowan continued. Tim Lacey told me he got some once from a croaker uptown and fed M to his girl in soda water. From the very first dose he was ace high and everybody else looked like thirty cents to her. They was married in less than two weeks. Strong and simple was Chunk McGowan. A better reader of men than Icky was could have seen that his tough frame was strung upon fine wires. Like a good general who was about to invade the enemy's territory he was seeking to guard every point against possible failure. I thought, went on Chunk hopefully, that if I had one of them powders to give Rosie when I see her at supper tonight it might brace her up and keep her from reneging on the proposition to skip. I guess she don't need a mule team to drag her away, but women are better at coaching than they are at running bases. If the stuff'll work just for a couple of hours it'll do the trick. When is this foolishness of running away to be happening? asked Dicky. Nine o'clock, said Mr. McGowan. Supper's at seven. At eight Rosie goes to bed with a headache. At nine old Parvenzano lets me through to his backyard, where there's a board off Riddle's fence, next door. I go under her window and help her down the fire escape. We've got to make it early on the preacher's account. It's all dead easy if Rosie don't balk when the flag drops. Can you fix me one of them powders, Icky? Icky Schoenstein rubbed his nose slowly. Chunk, said he, it is of drugs of that nature that pharmaceutists must have much carefulness. To you alone of my acquaintance would I entrust a powder like that. But for you I shall make it, and you shall see how it makes Rosie to think of you. Icky went behind the prescription desk. There he crushed to a powder two soluble tablets, each containing a quarter of a grain of morphia. To them he added a little sugar of milk to increase the bulk, and folded the mixture neatly in a white paper. Taken by an adult this powder would ensure several hours of heavy slumber without danger to the sleeper. This he handed to Chunk McGowan, telling him to administer it in a liquid if possible, and received the hearty thanks of the backyard Lachinvar. The subtlety of Icky's action becomes apparent upon recital of his subsequent move. He sent a messenger for Mr. Riddle and disclosed the plans of Mr. McGowan for eloping with Rosie. Mr. Riddle was a stout man, brick dusty of complexion and sudden inaction. Much obliged, he said, briefly, to Icky. The lazy Irish loafer. My own room's just above Rosie's. I'll just go up there myself after supper and load the shotgun and wait. If he comes in my backyard he'll go away in a ambulance instead of a bridal chaise. With Rosie held in the clutches of Morpheus for a many hours deep slumber, and the bloodthirsty parent waiting, armed and forewarned, Icky felt that his rival was close, indeed, upon discomfiture. All night in the blue light drug store he waited at his duties for chance news of the tragedy, but none came. At eight o'clock in the morning the day clerk arrived and Icky started hurriedly for Mrs. Riddle's to learn the outcome. And, lo! As he stepped out of the store who but Chunk McGowan sprang from a passing street car and grasped his hand, Chunk McGowan with a victor's smile and flushed with joy. Pulled it off, said Chunk with Elysium in his grin. Rosie hit the fire escape on time to a second, and we was under the wire at the reverends at 9 colon 31 fourth. She's up at the flat, she cooked eggs this morning, in a blue kimono, Lord. 
how lucky I am. You must pace up some day, Icky, and feed with us. I've got a job down near the bridge, and that's where I'm heading for now. The, the, powder, stammered Icky. Oh, that stuff you gave me, said Chunk, broadening his grin. Well, it was this way. I sat down at the supper table last night at Riddles, and I looked at Rosie, and I says to myself, Chunk. If you get the girl get her on the square, don't try any hocus pocus with a thoroughbred like her. And I keeps the paper you give me in my pocket. And then my lamps fall on another party present, who, I says to myself, is Phelan, in a proper affection toward his common son-in-law. So I watches my chance and dumps that powder in old man Riddle's coffee, see?